Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants, to the advancement of thy glory, and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Good morning, everyone. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute and returns to order as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I will call the clerk. Private Senators Bill's order of the day number 47, Australian Education Legislation Amendment <coughs> Prohibiting Indoctrination of Children Bill 2020, Presumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Hanson, um, Senator Hanson from the screen. Thank you very much. Um, the purpose of this legislation is to give parents the legal right to protect their children from indoctrination at school. Educators argue there is no need for legislation to protect children from indoctrination because school children can use their critical thinking skills. That is a cop out because students are no match for an adult using their positional power to instruct. Parents have the responsibility to decide how their children will be educated, provided it is in the best interest of the children. Parents want their children educated, not indoctrinated. Firstly, the bill seeks to prevent indoctrination by placing an obligation on the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority to develop a balanced curriculum for states and territories to adopt. This is currently not the case in many subject areas, including climate. The current climate curriculum states as fact that near surface temperatures are increasing, sea levels are rising and mountain glaciers are melting. Further, the Australian curriculum says most agree that human activity is responsible for the majority of measured global warming. Climate science is far from settled, however, with no one knowing the climate sensitivity to increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Secondly, the bill seeks to tie federal education funding to the existence of state and territory legislation which prohibits indoctrination in schools. Gender fluidity theory is widely taught in schools even though it is a medical and scientific fact that inheritance from your father of a Y chromosome makes you a biological male and inheritance of an X chromosome from your father makes you a biological female. Most parents do not support the prom promotion of gender fluidity theory being taught in schools, and they are quite right because it is dangerous. Parents can move their children to another school or homeschool them, but they ought to have the right to challenge indoctrination where it, it occurs. I am going to use climate studies and gender studies as two examples of why we need the laws proposed in this bill. In 2007, Mrs Stuart Dimmick challenged the way climate studies were being taught in English secondary schools where the government had beliefs identical to the ones now being taught to our children. The court had the power to look at Mr Dimmick's concerns because section 406 and 407 of the UK Education Act 1996 dealt with indoctrination in schools. The case concerned teaching materials described as the English Secondary Schools Climate Pack, which included Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth. Two graphs presented in the film relate to 650,000 year time period. One graph shows increasing CO2 and the other increasing temperature. 
Al Gore says the two graphs provide evidence that increasing CO2 has caused increasing global temperature. The judge did not agree. Finding the two graphs simply showed increasing CO2 and increasing temperature had occurred over the same time period. The two graphs equally support the two opposing theories at the centre of the climate debate. Firstly, increasing CO2 is causing an increase in global temperature. And secondly, increasing global temperature is causing increasing CO2. Either Gore made an interpretive um, mistake, interpretive mistake, or like the writers of the Australian curriculum, decided to support one of the theories about global warming. Al Gore is a climate crusader. He had no obligation to present both sides of the debate. In the UK, teachers and schools are obliged to present verifiable facts and provide a balanced presentation of theories which explain those facts. Unfortunately, Australian teachers and schools are not under the same legal obligation. The British government gave an undertaking to the court to correct all the factual areas in the film, including Al Gore's mistake. These three, three years after the inconvenient truth case finished and the judgment had been written, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, owned up to a shocking scientific fraud concerning the melting of the Himalayan glaciers. If the judge had known that a media release from an activist group was the source of the scientific claim that the Himalayan um, glaciers were melting, he would not have relied on the IPCC documents tendered to the court as evidence. Sadly, Australian teachers and schools are still relying on IPCC reports, which make claims that are not supported by science. The IPCC is a repeat victim of dodgy scientists and dodgy science, meaning that the IPCC can no longer be considered an authoritative source on climate. The Australian climate curriculum would benefit from the study of the inconvenient truth case, Glacier Gate and Climate Gate scandals, because students need to be open to the possibility they will be misled and lied to by scientists. So how did teachers and teacher unions in the United Kingdom respond to the findings of the High Court of England? They were outraged that the teacher guidance notes were rewritten to include references to all the errors in the film. They were further outraged that the court found teachers were not experts in climate studies and would be required to warn pupils that there were other scientific opinions on global warming and that students should not necessarily accept the views in Al Gore's film. The largest teachers union in Wales questioned the right of any judge to say what should be taught in schools and how. I expect this attitude is widespread here in Australia because educators feel they know better than parents. The growing lack of quality education provided means that some students are worried about the future of planet Earth. These indoctrinated young people believe the severity of the current bushfire season is, a, is attributable to man-made global warming. But like Al Gore, they lack the necessary critical thinking or research skills to discover the real reason. The real reason for the tragic loss of life and property in the past few months is the direct result of the government's failure to reduce fuel on the floor of national parks and the government's failure to allow landowners to clear their properties. Exaggeration about global warming comes from groups like Extinction Rebellion, who want to replace capitalism with socialism. Their environmental interests are just a means to that end. I now want to turn to gender theory indoctrination in schools it involves some teachers and schools pushing the idea that a child's bisexual sex, biological sex, does not determine whether you are male or female. It is based on the theory of gender fluidity pioneered by Alfred Kingsley, who believed children were sexual from birth and the age of consent should be lowered to seven. The fathers of transgender theory, Dr. Harry Benjamin and Dr. John Money, liked Dr. Alfred Kingsley's theory of gender fluidity and his ideas. They ruined the lives of an unknown number of children, including the Rhymer twins, but still some teachers and schools in Australia are, are attempting to encourage gender confusion among children. These teachers and schools have had some success because gender confusing confusion is increasing among young children and teenagers. 
Even the Australian Medical Association is worried about the dramatic increase in children seeking hormone and surgical treatment for gender confusion. In Queensland, it has been reported that the number of children and teenagers seeking hormone treatment has increased by 330% in the past five years. The preoccupation with gender identity by some teachers and schools is correlated with an increase in children identifying as transgender, which is why I say these educators are transgendering our children. So how do educators create gender confusion at school? In Queensland, some teachers are reading stories like the gender fairy to four and five year old children. The gender fairy shows young children that they can choose their gender because their body parts don't make them a boy or a girl. In Western Australia, some eight year olds are spending learning time dressing up as the opposite sex, using a government supplied box of dress up clothes. By the time these students are in year nine, they will have a new vocabulary based on gender diversity theory. And they will have been taught the art of sex texting and advanced sexual techniques. In Queensland, the government has decided that parents cannot be allowed to know whether the Safe Schools program has been taught in a school their child attends. The Safe Schools Coalition has labelled Queensland parents homophobic and transphobic and says the government's decision to keep the program secret from parents is justified. Well, I don't agree. Advocates for the Safe Schools program say this program and others like it promote equality of opportunity and combat bullying at school. In practice, nothing could be further from the truth because girls are being bullied into losing their rights. Students who do not show the required level of enthusiasm for the radical LGBTQI agenda, including materials like the gingerbread person, are humiliated and embarrassed by teachers, according to reports from parents. School policies in every state and territory are based on the belief it would be discriminatory to separate biological males from girls with whom they share the same gender identity. Transgender policies in the education system mirror policies underpinning the laws in Australia where biological sex has been redefined to include chosen gender identity. These policies provide a small number of transgender people with rights at the expense of the majority, particularly girls and women. The following recent case came before a Canadian court but could just as easily have come before the Human Rights Commission in Australia. Jessica Yariv now identifies as a transgender woman. Jessica has also sought relationships with underage girls. In 2018, Jessica complained to the British Columbia Human Rights Tribunal because several women in beauty salons had declined to provide waxing and other beautician services to Jessica's male genitals. Jessica argued that the women were guilty of transphobic discrimination. The case was lost in 2019 in part because the court found Jessica was motivated by money and revenge on South East Asian women who held ideas hostile to LGBTQI people. The point I want to make is that the redefinition of a person's biological sex as gender identity and law will be abused. Policies makers say they don't, they want to protect minorities. There is nothing wrong with that. But when educators protect the rights of a minority by stripping girls of their rights, then something is wrong. We all see that in the decision of education bureaucrats to provide unisex toilets at the Fortitude Valley State Secondary College. I understand the school, which opened in 2020, has now changed its unisex toilet policy and returned to segregated toilets. This decision followed angry protests from parents and students, but that does not end the matter. The Queensland government needs to explain why boys and girls aged 12 and 13 had to give up their right to dignity, safety and privacy. It is to accommodate the needs of one transgender child who may attend the school. If the school suggests that all they are doing is creating the same situation as the children have at home, I can tell them that explanation met with outrage at another school. The decision to force children to use unisex toilets is just part of a larger plan to get children preoccupied with gender issues. 
Other policies which aid gender preoccupation include gender neutral uniforms, library policies by gender theory affirming books, and teachers putting gender theory stories in, on reading lists. How did we get to the situation where schools are preoccupied with gender theory issues? It begins with the belief that our experience is rooted in our membership of gender group and that membership of that gender group makes it more likely we will suffer discrimination and oppression. These left-leaning elites see life as one long battle of identity groups for social justice. Identity politics causes division and undermines democracy which is precisely what socialists and progressives want because it undermines our democracy, which is based on common interests. We need to stop that kind of indoctrination at schools where it starts. In 2017, President Trump rolled back the gen transgender rights put in place by Obama. We should do the same. Our children deserve an education that will allow them to reach their potential and will, as the late Roger Scruton, Group stated, provide a society with a store of knowledge to be passed from one gender generation to another. We want our children educated for life and not indoctrinated so they can be controlled by others. And we need laws to guarantee parents' rights to challenge indoctrination. Australian 15 year olds are falling behind their counterparts on global tests of literacy and numeracy. The curriculum is overcrowded. I suggest teachers and schools focus on the basis so our children don't leave school with skill levels three years behind their global counterparts. In my view, parents should be required to give their consent to their children's participation in the teaching of LGBTQI and theory. Parents do not have the right, but they can move their children to any another school or home school them. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Hanson. Senator Chandler. Thank you, uh, rather, Madam Deputy President. Our schools play a central role in equipping young Australians with the knowledge and skills they will need success to successfully participate in the workforce and make their own way in the world. This government understands that we need to ensure children are provided with the right skills and the right knowledge to get the best out of their education. And the best way to ensure the Australian curriculum is working to provide this necessary knowledge and necessary skills base to Australian students is promoting discipline-specific knowledge in key areas such as maths, science, English and technology. This government has a sharp focus on decluttering the curriculum where appropriate to ensure teachers can get, can get on with teaching the fundamental skills to students, the skills that students will need to prepare them for the future. We are committed to working with the states and the territories to support quality schooling for all students and the provision of successful pathways to further education, training and employment once students complete their learning. The government is already working to ensure the Australian curriculum is providing students with the skills that they will need to have a successful education and success in the workforce and their community post-education. And there is no more important time for us to be considering this uh, as right now when we are experiencing uh, an economic crisis due to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. While the federal government of the day, of, of any day, plays an important role in education nationally, it is vital in considering this private senator's bill before us today to be clear about the primary role of state governments to deliver education. The states run schools in their respective jurisdictions and where there are instances of schools or individual teachers teaching something that is against the curriculum or is just simply inappropriate or wrong, it's primarily the state governments and their education departments which need to take responsibility for putting a stop to that. And that is largely the issue that the government has with this bill and the method it is proposing for attempting to regulate content in schools around the country. To ensure that the Australian curriculum is working for students, the Morrison Coalition government formally commenced a review of the curriculum in July this year. The terms of reference were agreed at the 12th of June 2020 meeting of Education Council of Federal, State and Territory Education Ministers and will be undertaken by the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Recording Authority, ACARA. 
This review is an important step forward in addressing concerns that the curriculum, the Australian curriculum, is not providing students with contemporary knowledge and essential skills and in lifting Australia's performance in literacy, numeracy and science. Given the central role which states play in delivering education, as I said earlier, having primary responsibility for running state schools, this seems to be the most appropriate way to improve the Australian curriculum and ensure that those improvements actually flow through to the students in schools, regardless of which state they live in. Yes. This review will declutter the Australian curriculum so it better serves students' needs and promotes academic excellence. ACARA has undertaken extensive research and monitoring of the existing curriculum and will be engaging with teachers and stakeholder groups. ACARA will report on its progress with the initial learning areas of mathematics and technology to be considered by Education Council in June 2021 and all other learning areas in September 2021. The review of the curriculum, as I said, Madam Deputy President, is an integral part a very important part of what the Australian government is doing to support quality education in Australia. In regard to the bill that we are debating here today, the government has concerns about the practical effects of what this is proposing. The bill would give the Commonwealth the power to make federal education funding to a state or territory conditional on the state or territory having laws in force that prohibit a staff member at a school promoting partisan views or activities to students and require a staff member at a school when teaching a subject to ensure that there is a balanced presentation of opposing views in relation to that subject. I spoke in my maiden speech, Madam Deputy President, about my own experience with civics education from a wonderful teacher at my primary school who insisted that it was possible for us to learn about how Australian uh, political systems and Australian parliaments operate without necessarily providing us with a partisan view on that operation, and I certainly stand by that. Students at school should not be subjected to partisan political views in a learning environment from any side of political thought. One of the most important reasons why we have civics education at school is so our young kids can learn about how politics operates and, I hope, uh, later in life determine their own views on what they think about the world and how they think the world operates. It shouldn't be imposed upon them by someone um, providing that education. Under Australia's constitutional arrangements, the states and territories have responsibility for education in their jurisdictions and any compliance with the balanced presentation of opposing views proposed in the bill would fall to them in the first instance. But requiring the teaching of two different views on a range of issues also opens up the possibility of unintended consequences. We wouldn't want to see a situation where a teacher or a school has been teaching a particular subject absolutely correctly and appropriately but suddenly feel compelled by this legislation to also present an alternative interpretation or view, which most parents would agree is clearly incorrect. There are also legal considerations to take into account in regards to this proposed bill that we're debating today. This bill does not provide clarity on what constitutes a balanced presentation of opposing views, which is a subjective and uh, legal standard and therefore difficult to implement. The proposed amendments to the Australian Education Act 2013, I'm advised, run a substantial risk of being subject to constitutional and other legal challenges and may be difficult to interpret, implement, comply with and enforce. As I said earlier, Madam Deputy President, it is important that state governments take responsibility for the content taught in their state schools. And parents have a right to expect that their children are being taught factual content, along with basic skills in, school in core subjects, such as reading, writing, mathematics and science. And as I said, there is no more important time for us to be considering the alignment of the skills and training that our young people receive in this country and how that skills and training will prepare them eventually for the workforce than during uh, very difficult economic times that we now find ourselves in. 
But from time to time, we do see examples around the country where a school or an individual teacher strays from this concept uh, that children should be taught factual content, and parents quite rightly express concerns with that. One of the areas where I believe it is incredibly important for children to be taught factual, age-appropriate information is in the area of science and biology. I've spoken in the Senate a number of times previously about institutions and elements of our bureaucracy that repeatedly conflate gender identity with sex, to the point where some of these bureaucrats can't even tell you what the definition of a woman is. There is very good reason for parents to be concerned about what will be taught to children in schools when government agencies like human rights commissions present misleading information about differences between the two sexes and the laws that are in place to protect sex-based rights and services. As an example that's been raised with me since I've taken an interest in this subject, the Queensland Human Rights Commission advises schools that it is not lawful for school athletics carnivals to operate on the basis of sex because an athletics carnival does not count as competitive sport. This is official advice from the Queensland Human Rights Commission to Queensland schools, yet it is so clearly wrong. Both the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act and the Queensland Anti-Discrimination Act clearly allow for sport for children 12 years and older to be operated based on sex. It's absolutely beyond dispute that boys of that age have inherent biological advantages over girls. And to suggest that a school athletics carnival isn't competitive is just farcical. We also know that there have been numerous examples of schools in Australia teaching students unapproved content about gender fluidity, materials like the gender-bred person. And parents are entitled to be concerned about this when there is significant contention in the medical community about why there has been such a dramatic rise in the number of young children, particularly and sadly girls, seeking medical intervention to block puberty or change their bodies to affirm their identified gender. So in terms of schools having a responsibility to be accurate in what they teach and avoiding teaching opinion or activism and presenting it as fact, well, that is certainly a concern that is raised often with me and I suspect all parliamentarians. And I've spoken about these concerns in this place many, many times. But this bill that we are debating here today does not seem to be the right way to deal with that issue. It's certainly important for parents to be engaged in their child's education and to be comfortable that what is being taught to their children is accurate and appropriate. To achieve that, there needs to be a joint approach between state governments, the federal government, education departments, schools, principals, teachers. But given the legal issues that have been raised about the constitutionality of this bill that we're debating here today, as well as the practical considerations about how it could really be implemented, I do not think that this bill can be supported. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Labor opposes this bill. These amendments would undermine evidence-based teaching in our schools and would allow the teaching of fringe conspiracy theories to Australian kids. The curriculum taught to Australian kids should be formed by evidence and expertise. While it's important for students to learn about opposing political views, this bill extends to opposing views on science and historic events as well, and could theoretically include any event over which opposing views allegedly exist. Our kids need to be learning the facts about science and history, not about conspiracy theories. The bill is offensive to teachers, who, like other essential workers, have been working incredibly hard during this pandemic. This bill is damaging, poorly drafted and should not be passed. It is not surprising, but it is disappointing, that One Nation is debating this bill today, when One Nation gets an opportunity to present legislation to the national parliament, this is what they choose to prioritise. In the middle of a recession, in the middle of the worst jobs crisis since the Depression, all that they care about are these tired culture wars. They're putting all of their energy 
into the content of education classes, but they go missing when Queenslanders are losing their jobs. Why aren't they talking about the hundreds of jobs lost in Rockhampton at the Central Queensland University? Why aren't they talking about the government's push to make mine workers permanent casuals? One Nation love to profess their support for workers, but when they have a chance to actually help them, they present us with this. This discussion on these issues is always devoid of fact, and it's about spreading conspiracy theories and creating fear and division. Because we, we know what this bill is really about. And we know from the contribution of the government center, senator before this what this bill is really about debating. We need to understand how we got to this point. What has led to the introduction of this bill and an environment where it would be considered possible to debate conspiracy theories in this parliament? In this parliament. We know part of Senator Hanson's motivation is to fuel outrage, which is self-serving, wholly aimed at whipping up Facebook clicks and media reporting. It is not about supporting Queenslanders. But the other reason that we got here is this. It has become necessary for these crossbench senators to compete with the conservative views within the Liberal Party, because the true Liberal Party is far from modern or liberal. These so-called modern liberals are unable to stand up to the hard right of their party room. The Liberal Party is being taken over by the hard right, as we saw from media reports of branch stacking in the Victorian Liberal Party designed to punish and purge socially progressive MPs. Senator Hanson hasn't introduced this legislation in a vacuum. We know that there are climate change deniers in the Liberal Party room. That is why they haven't taken any credible action on climate change, ever. Liberal Senator, Senator Rennick has accused the Bureau of Meteorology of changing temperature records to fit a global warming agenda. On this side of the chamber, we believe in science and we trust scientists. We don't try to peddle discredited conspiracy theor theories but we know that that is happening in the Liberal Party room. We also know that while public support for marriage equality silenced many hard-right conservatives on gay relationships, the hard-right of the Liberal Party jockeying to outdo each other when it comes to pre-selection is still at its core deeply opposed to LGBTI equality. Liberal Senator, Senator Chandler, has made at least two speeches in the Senate since the COVID-19 crisis began on these issues, trying to veil her transphobic views as faux feminist values. In her second reading speech on this bill, Senator Hanson said, when educators protect the rights of a minority by stripping girls of their rights, something is wrong. Well, we know where Senator Chandler's getting her speeches from because she said in a speech to the Senate, I stand with J.K. Rowling and millions of women around the world who are determined to ensure our rights as women are not traded off in the name of diversity. Liberal Senator, Senator Stoker, has an active petition on her website. She says, how can you stand up to the transgender agenda? She's asking people to sign this petition. And she says on that website, these issues are not hypothetical. They are coming up for debate in the parliament and in our public discourse all of the time. Well, these debates are happening, but they are happening because the Liberal Party is having them, because they are giving speeches and creating petitions and endorsing views of this kind in the middle of an economic crisis when youth unemployment is skyrocketing, especially in regional Australia, because fueling self-serving outrage to protect their own jobs is more important to them than protecting the jobs of young Australians. The biggest concern for young people and their parents right now 
is the huge surge in youth unemployment. They're concerned about how they're going to get a job or the quality of the TAFE course that they're considering or whether there'll be enough university places for them. Parents and kids aren't sitting up at night worrying about the lack of conspiracy content in their local school. They're worrying about their jobs, the jobs of their kids, whether they'll have jobs in the future. Will they get the same opportunities that other generations have had? It occurs to me that there may have been some contributions to this debate today that are incredibly hurtful to young people, especially young LGBTI youth, their friends and their families. So I want to finish today on a positive note. Last Friday was Wear It Purple Day. Wear It Purple Day is about showing LGBTIQ young people that they have a right to be proud of who they are. It is about creating safe spaces in schools and universities, workplaces and public spaces to show LGBTIQ young people that they are seen and they are supported. 75% of LGBTI youth in Australia will be bullied because of their identity and 80% of those people will experience that bullying at school. These kids are vulnerable. They are at risk of suicide. It was only three years ago that they watched a public debate take place about whether their relationships were worth the same as their peers. And we are here again, debating their worthiness, their existence and equality. Well, I was one of those kids once, and now I am standing in the Senate to tell them this important message. They have every right to be proud of who they are, and they have every right to feel safe and to feel supported. Because can I tell you, if you're an LGBTI kid, it doesn't just get better, it gets really awesome. Labor opposes this bill. Thank you, Senator. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise on behalf of the Greens to speak to the Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the indoctrination of children's bill 2020, which has been introduced by Senator Hanson of One Nation. The bill amends the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority Act 2008 to require ACARA to ensure that school education provides what the bill refers to as a balanced presentation of opposing views on political, historical and scientific issues. It also amends the Australian Education Act 2013 to make financial assistance to states and territories conditional on them having certain laws in force that would also prohibit what Senator Hansen calls indoctrination in schools. Can I just say that the Greens vehemently oppose this bill? This bill is transphobic. This bill is anti-science. This bill has nothing to do with historical issues that Senator Hansen wants to talk about. Let's just start at first principles. There is no doubt that there is benefit ensuring, in ensuring that Australian schooling exposes students to diverse viewpoints, to diverse perspectives, and enriches them through a comprehensive education. Students benefit from having their thinking challenged and from considering ideas and subjects through multiple lenses. But let's be clear that ensuring this is not the intention nor the anticipated outcome of this piece of legislation that we are debating here today. This is a dangerous and pathetic piece of legislation. There is no more or less to say about it. It is an attempt to force a rewrite of the curriculum to require teaching of climate denialism and harmful conservative ideas of gender and sexuality. I have to say, Senator Hansen's tabled second reading speech on this bill was not given much attention at that time, and probably for good reason, but reading it back and listening to the Senator this morning, it's clear how much of this push for so-called balance is driven by her contempt for transgender people. This is nasty stuff. 
this bill is pretty hate-filled and it will hurt and damage our LGBTQI community. Here is the right-wing victim complex at its most paranoid and on display for all to see. Senator Hansen seems convinced that our schools are brainwashing children by teaching them about the signs of climate change, for instance. Senator Hansen honestly believes that sinister education department officials are plotting to turn our children into communists and revolutionaries. This bill is nothing more than a publicity stunt and a poorly considered attempt to bully teachers and curriculum developers into feeling that they aren't doing their jobs unless they jam the curriculum full of right-wing conspiracy theories. Obviously, neither Senator Hansen nor anyone in this chamber has any direct power over what goes into the curriculum. The curriculum should be based on independent evidence and expertise, not Senator Hansen's latest bigoted thought bubble. And as for Senator Chandler, there is absolutely no reason for parents to be concerned about what is being taught in schools. I think this should be very clear to every single person in this chamber. This bill belongs nowhere but in the bin. Senator Hansen's spurious claims that human-caused climate change is unsubstantiated and schools teach gender fluidity and realignment to infants can go with this bill in the bin. It's vital that every child learns the reality of the climate crisis, the truth of Australia's settler colonial past, and how to have respectful relationships in the context of a comprehensive sex education in schools. Teachers working with educational experts do a great job of supporting students, often working without the resources they need. They certainly don't need one nation's meddling and bullying. The Greens oppose this bill. Thank you, Senator. Yeah. Senator Van. I also rise to speak on the Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the indoctrination of children bill of 2020. And as my fellow senators, from this side of the chamber at least, have already stated, the government will not be supporting this bill, no matter how well intentioned the senators from one nation think they are being. Now, that's not to say I don't have some sympathy for what they're trying to achieve. All too often I've had complaints from parents and heard from their children about being scared to death at school by lessons on climate change. Not just the fact, but by the socialist green left on how they should be scared. And scaring of children is not something that should happen in the, in the classroom. Madam Acting Deputy President, there is no doubt that we believe that schools, universities and vocational training institutions all play a central role in equipping all Australians with the knowledge and skills they will need to live and work successfully in the 21st century. In many ways, the challenges of the current COVID-19 environment, with disrupted learning, remote classes, fragmented assessments, has meant that getting an education, getting that education delivery right, is fundamentally important for properly equipping Australians for the challenges of the modern world. But it is interesting, Madam Acting Deputy President, that when you talk to parents, there is still a strong em emphasis from them on the key skills of reading, literacy and numeracy, or as we used to say, reading, writing and arithmetic. As a result, the government is wary about a growing push for soft skills at the expense of disciplined, specific, no disciplined, specific knowledge. We know that well-developed, deep subject matter knowledge is the key to success in today's modern society. As such, this government believes that there, is, that there needs to be a focus on providing the foundations for deep learning within Australia's, Australia's national curriculum, equipping the next generation with the deep foundation skills needed. This can be done by simplifying and decluttering the education environment. Focusing on the basics, as I said before, reading, literacy and numeracy. 
to ensure that Australia's children, especially those from the early years to year 10, get the basics right. This simplifying of the learning environment not only ensures that children acquire the foundations for deep learning that will ensure that they gain the skills early to have successful professional lives, but will also support teachers. This simplification ensures that teachers can get on with teaching the basic and frees them from excessive red tape, something that I'm sure Senators Hanson and Roberts will be very supportive of. Madam Acting Deputy President, this bill crafted by One Nation would preoperatively give the Commonwealth the power to make federal education funding to a state or territory conditional on that state having laws in force that require a number of things. Firstly, it would prohibit a staff member at a school promoting partisan views or activities to students, and it would require a staff member at a school, when teaching a subject, to ensure that there is a balanced presentation of opposing views in relation to that subject. Unfortunately, the bill does not provide clarity on what constitutes a balanced presentation of opposing views. As I'm sure the good senators from Queensland know, the determination of what constitutes balance is a subjective test and is awfully difficult to implement even as a legal standard, let alone as a teaching standard. The proposed amendments put forward by Senator Hanson to the Australian Education Act 2013 run a substantial risk of being subject to constitutional challenges. As I'm sure this chamber is aware, subjective tests are hard to prove and in a difficult to interpret and comply with or enforce. One of the situations that we do not want to see with our education system is that teachers are wasting their time dealing with disgruntled parents who are upset about the level of balance provided within the classroom. By imposing such subjective tests, you are guaranteeing that teachers right across the country will be spending half their days justifying their class's subject matter rather than teaching children to justify their math problems. As we move into a world where STEM subjects are going to be more, uh, more vital and more important, I know what I would rather our teachers to be doing. Under Australia's constitutional arrangements, state and territory governments are responsible for ensuring the delivery and regulation of school education to all children within their jurisdictions. And that is why, Madam Acting Deputy President, we must work in partnership with our state and ter territory counterparts to achieve the best results for our children, not dictating to them as one nation would wish the federal government to do. Now, I am not going to say that such a partnership is an easy thing to do. To get the balance right, it requires the, requires the involvement of governments, parents, teachers and, of course, the students themselves. However, it would never just focus back on the age-old debates of funding of schools, debates exacerbated by the Gillard government's much lauded but never funded Gonski review on school funding. But, as this government has done, it should focus on the content and quality of education students are receiving and the skills and knowledge of those teaching it. That is why, in 2017, the government commissioned the review to achieve educational excellence in Australian schools. The report called for a prioritisation of learning progressions for literacy and numeracy in curriculum development in early years of schooling, so to ensure the core, function, core foundations for learning are developed by all children by the age of eight. The report recognised that school education needs to maximise individual learning growth and attainment to ensure every student is ready to succeed in a changing world. Following on from that process, Australian Curriculum Foundation to Year 10 review formally commenced in July this year, despite the challenges, of the, uh, despite the challenges on the education system uh, of COVID-19. The terms of reference of this review were agreed at the 12th 
12th of June 2020 meeting of the Educational Council of Federal, State and Territory Education Ministers. The Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority is tasked to undertake this review. The review will declutter the Australian curriculum so it better serves students' needs and promotes academic excellence. Although the review aims to concentrate content in all learning areas, priority will be given to the prim primary years. This process is an important step forward in addressing an overcrowded curriculum and in lifti lifting Australia's performance in literacy, numeracy and science. Madam Acting Deputy President, what this bill fails to do, though, is recognise that curriculum is only part of what makes a great education system. Part of it is also about those people who seek to have a career in teaching by encouraging them into the profession, ensuring proper training and rewarding those who achieve high standards in delivering that education. Despite the objections of, of some in the teaching unions, this government is committed to supporting teachers to go back to basics, focusing on literacy, numeracy and developing students' understanding of essential content. Without these foundational building blocks, it makes it difficult to develop strong educational outcomes down the track. The Morrison government has implemented and continues to implement national reforms to improve the quality of initial teaching education. This includes reforms focused on the strengthening selection requirements for those entering initial teacher education programs, as well as providing confidence in those graduating from initial teacher education. All those studying teaching must meet clear literacy and numeracy benchmarks before graduation and through the introduction of final year teaching performance assessments, demonstrate that they have the practical skills to, required to be classroom ready. Even in these unprecedented times, maintaining an expectation of high quality teaching is vitally important. As such, the requirement for initial teacher education students to meet the standard of the literacy and numeracy test prior to graduation remains in place. Under the National School Reform Agreement, all governments are working together to develop national teacher workforce strategy, which will further strengthen the teaching workforce. Many schools in regional, remote, low socioeconomic areas experience significant challenges attracting staff and finding teachers with the subject expertise they need. The Australian government is investing $28.7 million in our future teaching workforce by funding the High Achieving Teachers Program. The program provides two alternative pathways into teaching for high achieving university graduates. In 2020, 150, 170 participants with the experience and qualifications from a range of industries commenced the program. In 2021 and 2022, the program will attract, and tr will attract and train a further 280 new teachers. These high achieving individuals will work closely, so will work exclusively with schools experiencing teacher workforce shortages, including in regional, rural and remote communities. Unfortunately, COVID-19 has impacted the delivery of the program in schools in 2020. Both, provide, both providers are working with the Australian government, state and territory governments and partner schools to continue to support the education of Australian secondary school students through this unprecedented time. As you can see, Madam Acting Deputy President, through the hard work of Minister Tien and working in partnership with states, parents, community and students, the Morrison government is working to modernise, simplify and declutter current education system, working closely with industry to ensure that our children are equipped with the skills today for the jobs of tomorrow, bringing education back to the basics, reading, literacy and numeracy, getting the foundations right for deep learning within key areas. 
The bill proposed by Senator Hanson does not support the government agenda. It will do nothing to support the education of our children, and as such, the government won't be supporting it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Ayres. Uh, thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. I um, had uh, the opportunity this morning to listen to um, Senator Green and Senator Faruqi and Senator Van's speeches in relation to the bill and thought I might just reflect um, briefly on, on Senator Van's contribution. I, I thought that it was a thoughtful contribution to the debate. Um, and it did strike me that while I probably largely disagree with many of the conclusions that Senator Van reaches, I do think it underscores how important it is how we disagree and how important it is that in this place we spend a bit of time reflecting on how important it is that we decide carefully upon what it is that we're going to disagree about. See, I think a debate about the curriculum in education, the balance between the hard skills that Senator Van was talking about, um, he said colloquially reading, writing and arithmetic, but I think he would concede goes more broadly across the sciences and geography and um, a, a proper appreciation of the uh, English literature and the, and the um, and the great things that can happen for students in the study of English literature, um, but also you know, the balance between those issues across to uh, how much we value critical thinking and the spirit of inquiry and research skills. I mean, those are useful things that this place could spend its time debating and considering. I also think that those contributions from speakers before me that emphasise how difficult these unprecedented times and the necessary public health response have made it for students, particularly students in year 11 and 12. And I just do want to say to those students and their teachers, um, particularly in Victoria but across the country, where uh, uncertainty uh, has made studying much harder where um, accessing uh, content through Zoom lessons or whatever the platform is that, uh, that schools are using uh, has, made, uh, has made their work more difficult. And I think all of us in this place uh, should uh, send a message to those students and their teachers that we appreciate their work, that we wish them the best, that no matter how this year goes and how next year goes, those students will be supported, um, <clears throat> and those teachers which should, should be supported, and that we should value um, their work. Now, Labor opposes the amendment because it undermines evidence-based teaching. Uh, it would mandate the teaching of conspiracy theories in our schools. It appears to have, on the face of it, significant constitutional difficulties. And even if you accepted Senator Hanson's outline of the desired intent of the bill, it's very unlikely that it would be able to achieve its objectives. Now, we should be focused on the overall performance of our schools in this place. We should be focused on a quality of access to a top quality education. We should be focused on inclusion, including all of our students in the school system in a decent, high-quality education where they feel valued and supported and they can make choices about deepening their study, acquiring the skills uh, that will support them in their later lives. We should be about excellence, equity and participation. This preoccupation by some with matters of sex, gender and climate change as the focus of, of what the parliament should be talking about is unnecessarily prurient. It is an effort by some to frighten people in the Australian community and create division and indeed hatred where there should be excellence 
equality, inclusion and a focus on making sure all of our kids in the school system are looked after. Uh, that means low-income families, disadvantaged families, regional families should all have an equal go. All kids should be included, regardless of their gender or gender identity, their sexuality, their background. It is a confusing and challenging time for kids, particularly around issues of gender and sexuality. It is hard enough for adolescents without making it worse, without us in this place making it tougher for kids. The curriculum taught in our schools should be based on evidence and expertise. This amendment would undermine evidence. It would undermine evidence-based teaching and would allow fringe conspiracy theories to be taught in our schools. The teaching of science is vital to our national interest. There should be more science, more maths, more evidence-based material taught, not less. Now there comes on a, on a, from a fringe of conservative politics, a bit overrepresented in this place, a fringe of conservative politics, a challenge to empiricism, a challenge to rationality in the post-enlightenment era. These characters want to return to a sort of pre-Copernican middle-aged era where one person's superstition has as much value as scientific inquiry, and we should not indulge it. It might be in some people's temporary political interest to indulge it, but we should not indulge it. And we've seen over the past months the acceleration of climate change denialism being weaponised and fuelled by some in the Liberal and National Party. We've seen an acceleration in this unprecedented period of anti-vax conspiracy theories, 5G conspiracy theories. We've seen Mr Kelly, uh, who's an enthusiastic proponent of conspiracy theories, uh, and we've seen his conduct over the course of the last few months. Now, never forget that Mr Kelly uh, was Scott Morrison's preferred candidate in the recent Cook pre-selection. And that there was an enormous effort to overwhelm the local voters in Cook who had just... enough of Mr Kelly's blatant... Sorry, Senator Ayres, I think you mean Hughes. Hughes, I do. I do. I get my, I get my shire seats confused sometimes. Their, their boundaries change so often uh, that it's uh, sometimes difficult to know whether you're in Cook or whether in Hughes. Uh, sometimes their local members appear indistinguishable, um, and one wonders whether the views of their local members are the same, because otherwise why would Mr Morrison, Madam Acting Deputy President, have fought so hard to get this climate-denying, hydroxychloroquine conspiracy theorist back into the parliament over the views of locals? It's hard to understand. Mr Kelly, of course, threatened to go to the crossbench, arguably where he belongs, and he's done enormous damage to the standing of the Liberal Party, and the damage continues. Now, he has spent a significant part of his parliamentary career on late-night television uh, as an avid climate denialist. He's probably done more than anybody in the House of Representatives to wreck successive governments' efforts to have a coherent energy policy in Australia. His uh, climate denialism, I mean, if you're worried about power bills going up, think about Craig Kelly. Uh, if you're worried about emissions going up, think about the member for Hughes. If you're worried about investment in generation capacity going down, well, you can think about Mr Kelly again. He's done more than anybody else. But more concerningly, more immediate is his conduct and behaviour in relation to conspiracy theories that undermine the public health effort. Last week, he was promoting theories uh, in relation to 
Compulsory COVID vaccinations for everybody coming soon, he posted. No, you're not dreaming, and this is not a sci-fi novel, he said. That video's title, shared by the biggest oversharer of uh, far-right memes in Australian politics, its title is Bill Gates says everyone has to get his vaccination. The week before, he said that the Premier of Victoria should go to prison for 25 years. Uh, now, there hasn't been a moment where the Minister for Health or the Prime Minister has rebuked uh, Mr Kelly. No one has made any effort in the leadership of the Liberal Party uh, to send out a clear message uh, that these sorts of ideas are rejected by the leadership and by the parliament in here. Nobody's done it. So you do wonder what the commitment of the Liberal and National Party really is to science, what the commitment of the Liberal and National Party really is to evidence, and what the commitment of the Liberal and National Party really is to focusing on the real needs and public confidence in the public health effort that is so needed to fight back against the COVID-19 virus. Mr Kelly is more protected than the koala bear is protected. His meme was shared by Mr Evans, um, a cook who is an avid conspiracy theorist about 5G and all sorts of things. The health ministers declined to comment. And last week, there was an enormous effort in the House of Representatives uh, to defend Mr Kelly from a censure motion brought on uh, by Mr Bowen. Instead of rejecting this madness, the government has shielded Mr Kelly from criticism. Instead of clarifying the issues, the government has obscured the issues. Now, students if, if Scott Morrison and the Liberal Party won't act in the interests of science and evidence, well, the school system becomes even more important. School students should leave school with the skills and the facts and the critical thinking capacity to be able to reject this kind of behaviour. Now, um, I have enormous respect for teachers and for teachers all over the country who are working hard in our schools to deliver an inclusive, excellent education. Um, the Liberal and National Party think teachers are the enemy, part of some you know, cultural Marxist plot to undermine education standards. We should be elevating teachers and supporting them, not denigrating them in this place. There is a base political strategy at operation here. It's all about donations and clicks on the internet. And it's not just a one nation strategy. There are members of the government parties who engage in this behaviour, who want to frighten people and encourage fear and division make wild claims about what is taught in our schools, which on closer examination turn out not to be true. But the modus operandi is to just keep making the claim. So the claim is made, it is refuted, and then we move on to the next claim. There is a bewildering blizzard of misinformation out there. The purpose here is not to change the law. The purpose is to add to the confusion. The Minister for Education should be there in the House of Representatives setting the record straight, uh, and his representative here should be doing the same thing. When haven't we made progress really on some of these questions? Many Australians are uncomfortable with frank discussions of sex and gender. Fair enough. But the dial has shifted in the right direction. Kids feel included. They feel loved and looked after 
in our schools? Why on earth are people in this place making it harder? Why on earth are we trying to shift the dial back from acceptance to rejection? Now, I realise that Thank I've uh, you, run uh, out of time, Madam Acting Senator Deputy Ayres. President. I have Senator Walsh on the speaking list, but. Uh, Are you seeking leave to continue your, Seek leave to continue my no, remarks. your remarks? Thank you. Um, yes, that's in agreement. Um, Clark, I understand we now move on to the next um, private member's bill. General business order of the day number two, freedom of information legislation amendment, improving access and transparency bill 2018, second reading debate. Senator Patrick. Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Before I speak to this bill, I want to share some, uh, briefly some FOI philosophy. I'll quote from uh, James Madison in, in 1822 when he said that a popular government without popular information or the means of acquiring it is but a, a prologue, prologue to a farce or a tragedy or perhaps both. Knowledge will forever govern ignorance and a, a people who mean to be their own governors must arm themselves with the power that knowledge gives. We'll move forward uh, 150 years to uh, 1976 and one Malcolm uh, Fraser as, uh, as the Prime Minister, as he was then. If the Australian electorate is to be able to make valid judgments on government policy, it should have the greatest access to information possible. How can any community progress without continuing an informed and intelligent debate? How can there be debate without information? Wise words. People are granted access to information through our FOI Act. It provides, by way of statute, a default right to information. Indeed, it is for government to say why well, you can't have the information uh, rather than for a citizen to say why they should. That is the purpose of the Freedom of Information Act 1982. But unfortunately, the implementation of the Act is broken. You just have to wander up to uh, level two of this building and speak to journalists. Who, who want FOI information to help them do their job of gov keeping government to account, but also it's necessary for accurate reporting. And yet uh, many of them will simply tell you that it's a, it, that, that it's a uh, process that simply isn't worthwhile conducting. And that's an indictment. FOI, if you ask constituents, they're uh, uncomfortable, uncomfortable about FOI as well. Now, some constituents just seek access to information about themselves, and they're entitled to do that. They're entitled to know what it is that government uh, has on record about them, and indeed the FOI Act does provide them with rights to uh, annotate records if they think they are incorrect. But it's also necessary for citizens if they want to contribute to debates, and I have helped constituents with FOI when they're trying to understand why government is doing what it's doing. And that can, it can be at the local, uh, state uh, or federal government level. And of course, we're focused today on the federal government level. Unfortunately, what happens when you uh, submit an FOI is that departments make cavalier claims that deny access, and then they seek to wear the applicant down through process, be it an internal review, an information commission review or then extending up to the AAT. Now, the number of FOIs is rising. It's not like it's a, uh, uh, you know, it's, a, uh, it's a dying requirement. In actual fact, people are more interested in information than they have been in the past. You can look at the number of information commissioner reviews. Now, just to be uh, uh, sure that everyone understands what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about FOI applications, but the applications to the Information Commissioner when they are denied access. 
In 2011-12, uh, there were 456 applications for uh, an information commissioner review. In 17-18, that number had moved uh, almost doubled to 801 applications. Now, not all of those applications go to decision. Just by uh, uh, submitting an application to the information commissioner, sometimes the department will reconsider, and throughout the process they may reconsider. So we saw in 11-12, uh, uh, whilst there were 456 applications, only about 25 uh, applications went to final decision, and in 2017-18 uh, we were up to 123 decisions. Okay, that's almost uh, uh, one every couple of days, uh, which is relevant to what I'm going to talk about a little bit later in terms of under-resourcing of the information commissioner. Now, finalisation times. How long does it take to get access to FOI uh, with the information commissioner? So, uh, typically, uh, 30 days is the initial application time. You can then go through an internal review if you want to, or you can send it to the information commissioner if you've been denied access. Uh, about 39 per cent of applications are completed within uh, 120 days. 47 per cent are completed within six months. The number rises to 69 per cent by the time we're talking about uh, reviews completed under nine months, and under 12 months, 84 per cent. So if you do go through this process, and these, these numbers are 2017-18 numbers, uh, you'll find that uh, you may well be waiting a year. And indeed, uh, there are 16 per cent of applications in 17-18 that were longer than a year in progression. That's 97 applications, 97 people who wanted access to information, who wanted timely access to information, have been waiting for over a year for the information commissioner to complete her review. So there's something wrong, and my bill seeks to uh, deal with some of those things that are wrong. The first thing my bill does is requires the government to fill the three offices of the Australian Information Commissioner. That is the Information Commissioner, the Privacy Commissioner, and the Freedom of Information Commissioner. So there are three commissioners in statute, and unfortunately, only one of them is filled. This bill uh, passed in 2010. Uh, professor McMillan, very honourable uh, law uh, professor, was the Information Commissioner, and he had James Popple, Mr. James Popple, as the FOI uh, uh, Commissioner, and Timothy Pilgrim was the uh, was the Privacy Commission Commissioner, and they started up the office. They they commenced doing training across government. They uh, produced uh, guidelines. They worked very hard. Then, in 2014, the Abbott government tried to disband the office of the Australian Information Commissioner. That was rejected by the Senate. So, what happened then? The Abbott government starved them of funds. Uh, many may recall articles in the paper where Professor Macmillan was working from home, almost uh, no staff uh, supporting him. Thankfully, uh, Mr Turnbull, when he became Prime Minister, uh, relented, and uh, uh, since then we have seen an increase in funding uh, occurring. However, we didn't uh, ever fill those additional positions. The, the, uh, the um, information commissioner uh, from about 2014 was only one person, Mr Timothy Pilgrim, um, and interestingly a person without a degree, and I'll talk about that shortly. Uh, we've had since March 2018 Miss Angeline Fork. She has, uh, has, does have a degree, uh, and, but unfortunately what's happened is she's been loaded up with additional work. Things like the Open Government Partnership, additional privacy tasks. We'll recall that during COVID Safe, she was engaged to look at privacy related issues. She's got to be one of the hardest working uh, public servants around. Uh, I don't like the fact that uh, information commissioner reviews uh, take a long period of time, but I don't 
uh, necessarily blame uh, Ms Falk. I think she does the best with what she can, which is why we need to fix things. We do need to have three commissioners, the Information Commissioner, the, the uh, Privacy Commissioner and a dedicated Freedom of Information Commissioner. So the office is under-resourced. We should allow citizens, if they want to, having been dissatisfied with the department, to bypass the Information Commissioner, to pay their $920 and go straight to the AAT. That should be permitted, and that's what this bill seeks to do. And if the Information Commissioner gets to a point where she can't make a decision within 120 days, it should be a free pass to the AAT, which is a much larger and better resourced organisation. That's what this bill asks. This bill also asks for uh, or prevents agencies from making submissions to FOI decision reviews that have not been advanced by the agency in its own decision-making process, so that it can't switch exemptions halfway through. That would prevent the current practice of uh, where you have a, uh, an applicant who is quite successful, eats away at a particular exemption, and the government just sticks their hand up and says, well, we're going to make a new one. Now, I can see Senator Stoker sitting there uh, quite concerned that I'm suggesting we interfere with the way in which merit reviews are run, de novo, but, um, uh, you know, because it's a, a, it's, a, it's a legal principle. But right now there is abuse in this area. I'll give you one example. I had an FOI with the Prime Minister, uh, uh, application made to the Prime Minister. 2000, October 2018 I made the request. The Prime Minister's office made the uh, a decision on a really complex and nuanced uh, piece of law, an erroneous argument relating to jurisdiction. Now, of course, I went to the Information Commissioner, and the Information Commissioner looked at it over a period of time, uh, and uh, it took uh, her about six months to work out that she didn't want to touch it with a barge pole, and so she denied the review for the purpose of allowing me to go to the AAT. So I take the matter to the AAT, I pay my $920, I go to the AAT, and the, as soon as I get there, what does the Commonwealth do? They abandon the argument that they had. They realised it was so erroneous it wasn't going to stand up. And they present another argument uh, uh, based around uh, parliamentary privilege. Somehow the executive was proposing a legal argument that parliamentary privilege must be recognised as protective of uh, an action by the executive to prevent something being tabled and debated in the parliament. Now, the Bill of Rights in, uh, 19, uh, in 1688 was signed after the hanging of, uh, of King Charles, after a uh, uh, 1649 trial in Westminster Abbey by Prosecutor Mr Cook with the approval of Mr Cromwell. That was done for, uh, because they wanted to prevent the king from interfering with the parliament. Now we have the AGS arguing for some reason that uh, uh, parliamentary privilege somehow protects the king or the executive when, uh, when he seeks to censor the parliament. Article 9 of the Bill of Rights, I remind people, it says that the freedom of speech or debates or proceedings in the parliament ought not to be impeached or questioned in any court or place out of parliament. And yet they tried to abuse that. They wanted to mount an argument in, in relation to that. So the matter was elevated. It was elevated to a, to a presidential member, to Justice, the Honourable Justice White. Now it turns out he knows a lot about parliamentary privilege. He's dealt with the matter. And so what happened a day before the hearing? The Commonwealth pulled out. Because that's their strategy. They, they raise a, an exemption, then they, then they abandon it. It's all about making sure that when information is, is provided to a person, it's provided late, when the, when the value of the information has diminished considerably. Now that matter is still before the AAT on just standard FOI stuff now, and a decision, um, uh, decision is pending, and uh, I suspect I'll be informing the chamber of that particular decision. Now I've lodged over 180 FOIs in my time as a senator, and I know exactly the tactics that they play. We also need to make sure that the, the Information Commissioner has a legal degree, or well, the FOI Commissioner has a legal degree. Mr Pilgrim did not, and I don't cast any dispersions upon Mr Pilgrim, but we should have lawyers sitting in the role of, uh, 
uh, of people who are making these decisions. It's a requirement of the law that the Freedom of Information Commissioner uh, has to, but we don't have one of those. It's filled by an Information Commissioner who doesn't have to have uh, a law degree. Angeline Fork, the current one, uh, current Information Commissioner, does. And it also requires uh, uh, agencies to, uh, to, to not publish FOIs until about 10 days. After a journalist has gone through all of this, the last thing they want to do is have their story taken away from them. We need 10 days in the legislation. Uh, we also need to make sure things like external costs are disclosed so we can see how much the government is spending trying to keep information from people. This bill fixes a number of issues that slow down the FOI process. A well-informed citizenry is, the, li is uh, the lifeblood of democracy, and in all arenas of government information, particularly timely information, is the currency of power. Uh, clear dissatisfaction amongst FOI users. Something needs to be done, and this bill is a good start. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Ah, FOI, freedom of information, a topic that excites and thrills us all. Oh, hang on. Sorry, wrong speech. FOI excites and thrills almost nobody. But yet it is really important to transparency and accountability of government. And so here we are speaking on the Freedom of Information Legislation Amendment Improving Access and Transparency Bill. Now, the government supports the general intent of this bill to make government more transparent and more accountable, to assist citizens and the media to access information under the law and to improve the effectiveness of Australia's freedom of information laws. However, despite that good intention, the measures contained in this bill just don't achieve those objectives and, in some cases, would unnecessarily duplicate laws and unnecessarily duplicate obligations that already exist. That's why a bipartisan report, Labor and the Coalition working together, um, of the Senate Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee recommended that this bill not be passed by the Senate outlining a number of unnecessary and duplicative requirements. Now, if it were um, the case that the coalition's support of this bill reflected some grand conspiracy to hide information, as no doubt um, some other senators would suggest, then it simply wouldn't have had that bipartisan attitude displayed. And I think that's an important point to make. So let's go through what the bill does and step through some of the reasons why it just doesn't do what it sets out to do. First, the bill includes a requirement for the National Archives of Australia to publish more detailed information about expenditure on legal advice for requests to records. On its face, it doesn't sound bad, but the requirement would largely duplicate existing reporting requirements for legal expenses that exist under the Legal Services Directions of 2017 while also creating a reporting obligation that would be inconsistent with whole-of-government arrangements that apply under those directions. The second thing the bill does is that it requires the Australian Information Commissioner to have legal qualifications to review freedom of information decisions. Now, I'd suggest that's a requirement that is entirely unnecessary. It is often not essential for senior public servants or for statutory officers who make decisions that have a legal impact to themselves hold legal qualifications. And it's quite common practice for decisions made at all levels of the public service to be made in, in technical matters or in procedural matters um, that have a legal impact. But the idea that that means everyone in the public service should be a lawyer um, is one that is misplaced indeed. Even if it were necessary to um, sometimes access legal information in order to make these decisions, it's also true to say that people within an office, um, for instance the Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner, 
um, might have legal qualifications to support the person who is running the show. So I'll give you an example. The former Information and Privacy Commissioner, Mr Timothy Pilgrim, a person um, held in such high regard that they've been he's been recognised with the Public Service Medal, um, successfully made a large number of freedom of information review decisions, despite not himself having legal qualifications. And he did so in a manner that maintained the respect and dignity of the office um, and in a way that was, for all relevant purposes, legally sound. I can't help but think um, Australians would be less than enthused if we started applying more and more obligations to put more and more lawyers at every level of the public service. And I say that with full disclosure, being one myself. Third, the requirement that agencies publish details about freedom of information requests on their FOI disclosure logs between 10 and 14 days after granting access, as opposed to current arrangements which require publication within 10 days would actually slow down the publication of information on FOI disclosure logs. Additionally, nothing under the current FOI laws prevents an agency or minister from proactively releasing information as long as there are no other legal restrictions preventing the release of that data. If this requirement was enacted, there could actually be uncertainty about whether the provision prevents an agency or a minister from otherwise releasing information that is subject to the provision before the 10-day minimum disclosure log publication time frame had expired. And we wouldn't want to provide disincentives to the free disclosure of information. Fourth, the bill exempts parliamentarians from charges under the Freedom of Information Act. Criminal charges, that is. Now, the existing public interest test that must be applied to freedom of information charges decisions is flexible enough to deal appropriately with the circumstance where we are dealing with requests from parliamentarians. Subject, subsection 29 sub 5 of the Freedom of Information Act provides that ministers and agencies, in responding to an applicant who is contesting a charge for access, must take into account whether the access to the document is in the general public interest in determining whether or not to reduce, uh, for instance, a penalty or to impose a charge. Sorry, reduce a charge, not a penalty. Beg your pardon. Um, now, I doubt it could be said that exempting parliamentarians from criminal accountability of any kind would pass the pub test for Australians in the street. Maybe that means Australians in the pub, in any event. Fifth, the bill prevents agencies and ministers from relying on arguments that were not relied upon during an initial FOI access decision during a later information commissioner review. Now, that proposal isn't consistent with the efficient and effective operation of the information commissioner review framework. If information has come to light um, by the time of that review, then there's no obvious reason why that additional information shouldn't be able to be taken into account in an effort to make a decision that is as good as is possible on the basis of the data that is to hand at that moment in time, particularly given that this process is in large part about avoiding the need to take matters like this to court. For example, the FOI Act provides that the purpose of an information commissioner review is to determine the correct or the preferable decision in the circumstances, and it allows the information commissioner to access all of the relevant information, all of the relevant material, in making that review decision. Additionally, what's proposed at item 11 of this bill would frustrate the ability of an information commissioner to consider all relevant material to reach a correct and preferable decision when doing so on review. Sixth, this bill allows applicants to apply directly to the AAT, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, for review of a freedom of information decision or to apply to the AAT 
where the information commissioner would take longer than 120 days to complete a review. Now, this would significantly increase the AAT's already high workload, and it would undermine the objective of facilitating FOI review decisions in a timely way. Any significant increase in the workload of the AAT resulting from the proposed amendments would adversely affect the AAT's ability to finalise matters that are already on its books. And so, in turn, this is likely to lead to longer finalisation timeframes and increased backlogs across the workload of the AAT, which, as we know, covers many different disciplines. Additionally, the proposal to make transfers exempt from AAT applications is inconsistent with the AAT's current fee exemption reasons, which are at the moment regarding matters like financial hardship or particular vulnerabilities of the applicant. There's also scope for this provision to be misused by some applicants who are seeking to avoid paying AAT application fees. Now, Madam Acting Deputy President, you know I am always for reducing the cost of people's access to government. I'm always for reducing um, the, the cost to Australians of dealing with red tape. Indeed, we should be removing as much of that red tape as is possible. But these particular fees do at times play an important role in deterring vexatious litigation. And that's important because the taxpayer bears the cost of running um, the courts and resourcing the people needed to deal with those many vexatious claims before the AAT. And so I'll turn to the final thing that this bill does, and that is that it requires agency annual reports to include information about external legal expenses that relate to freedom of information requests. Now, again, this would unnecessarily duplicate existing reporting arrangements which require agencies to provide this information to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Since we have recently touched on red tape, this is another example of a place where we simply don't need to burden it even more. Each time we impose more reporting requirements, each time we impose more administrative um, burdens, there is a cost associated with it. And ultimately, those costs are passed on to people who want to make FOI applications. Those costs are passed on to people who want to use our legal system. And so, while they might be well-intentioned, we should tread with caution in circumstances where the imposition of this additional requirement really doesn't add anything to the information that is available on the public record. The government remains steadfast in its support for transparency, for the value of the freedom of information arrangements, and for providing substantial funding to the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner so that it can do its job of making sure Australians can access important information from governments. For instance, in the 2018-19 budget, $25.1 million was provided to enhance the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner's enforcement capability and to enable it to effectively oversee increased Privacy Act penalties and new online privacy rules. A further $2.6 million has been committed over five years to ensure expanded Medicare data matching activities that occur do so in compliance with the Privacy Act and other laws that protect Medicare, Medicare benefits schedule and pharmaceutical benefits schedule data. So while the objectives of transparency, accountability, freedom of information are ones that are highly valued and they are objectives that are shared by this government, the measures contained by this bill simply don't achieve those otherwise noble objectives. And so I urge members of the Senate not to support this bill, not because we don't think transparency is important, of course we do, but because, sadly, this bill doesn't assist in achieving those important objectives. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This bill seeks to address some of the failings of the Freedom of Information system as it has been operating for the last seven years under the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government. Clearly, 
Senator Patrick is frustrated about the way in which the government continues to trash the freedom of, a, of information system, and Labor shares Senator Patrick's frustration. There is no doubt that the freedom of information system, designed to make the government more accountable to the people that elected them, has been absolutely trashed over the last seven years of this government. This government hates scrutiny. This government has, basic, has contempt for basic notions of accountability. This is a government that prefers to operate in the shadows. It is not difficult to see why, because every time some light does find a way in, Australians do not like what they see. Whether it's sports rorts, Angus Taylor's latest outrage, the awarding of contracts worth hundreds of millions of dollars to, to companies headquartered in beach shacks, or the government's shocking, scandalous record on aged care. The Morrison government does not want Australians to know what, is it, what it is up to. And make no, mis no mistake, that is why the government hates our FOI laws and treats those laws with such contempt. That is also why the government continues to starve the Information Commissioner of resources, so that it takes the Commissioner so long to review a rejected Freedom of Information request that the applicant just gives up. Murray, is that why you're in the majority report? Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Scar. If Senator Scar chooses to listen to the rest of my contribution, he might have an answer to that question. I understand he's a bit agitated about FOI. The Morrison government has resisted our FOI laws for the same reasons they resisted the Banking Royal Commission. The Morrison government has resisted our FOI laws for the same reasons they have resisted establishing a genuine national integrity commission of the kind that Labor has pledged to create. Because they fear transparency, fear accountability, fear the Australian public knowing what they are really up to. This bill by Senator Patrick is well intentioned and many of the proposals it put for, puts forward warrant close examination. For example, the bill would require the government to fill all three offices of the Australian Information Commissioner, the Privacy Commissioner and the Freedom of Information Commissioner, rather than forcing the Information Commission to fill all three roles as the, the current government is requiring it to do. That is something the Labor Party has been calling on the government to do for some time. The bill would also allow FOI review applicants to elect to have their matter bypass the Information Commissioner who can take more than a year to make a decision on controversial issues to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. While we understand why Senator Patrick has put forward that proposal, it is a proposal that, in our view, treats a symptom rather than addressing the underlying issue, which is that this government has starved the Australian Information Commissioner of the resources she needs to review FOI decisions. If we were to shift more of the burden of reviewing these decisions onto the AAT, the government will simply do the same thing to the tribunal, starve the FOI division of resources. Fundamentally, the biggest problem with the current freedom of information system is not the law, it's the current government, a government that is at war with accountability, a government at war with transparency, a government at war with itself. Labor has a strong track record of respecting our FOI laws and will do so again if we are returned to government. Indeed, I will now say a little about Labor's proud record on FOI. We in Labor understand that freedom of information laws are an important aspect of a healthy democracy because they give the Australian public and media access to information about what the government, elected by the Australian people, is doing in their name. Labor has long championed FOI laws, with the establishment of a Commonwealth FOI Act a part of Labor's policy platform since 1972, when Gough Whitlam first called for such laws in a speech when he was opposition leader. Though these laws were not passed for another decade, it is yet another example of the reformist vision that characterised Gough Whitlam and reinforced his place in history as a great leader of this nation. Since FOI laws were first introduced in Australia in the 1970s, Labor has worked to strengthen these laws to improve transparency in government and to champion the public's right to know. Prior to the 2007 election, 
the Federal Labor Party made an election commitment to substantially overhaul the FOI Act as part of its policy platform to restore trust and integrity in government after the secrecy and abuses of public trust that characterised the later Howard years. Labor's commitments were set out in the policy document titled Government Information – Restoring Trust and Integrity. When elected in 2007, Labor fulfilled its election commitment to restore the public's right to know. Labor engaged in extensive consultations on the proposed changes to our FOI laws in 2008 and 2009, including through a parliamentary inquiry by the Senate Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. The reforms were passed into law by Parliament in May 2010. A key part of these improved laws was the establishment of the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. This office was created to provide independent oversight of the FOI regime and to champion freedom of information across government. This reform was applauded by the public, by legal experts and by the media. In speaking on Labor's reforms to FOI law in this place on 13 May 2010, Senator Ludwig noted that the passage of the FOI Act was a milestone for Australia. The Rudd government continues to recognise that we are responsible and accountable to the people we serve. For this reason, when we were in opposition, we committed to overhauling the FOI Act and we have delivered on this promise. This legislation expressly recognises that giving the Australian community access to government-held information strengthens Australia's representative democracy, recognises the role that this object serves to increase public participation in government processes and increases accountability in the government's activities. But since this Liberal government took power in 2013, they have been at war with freedom of information, at war with transparency, at war with accountability to the Australian people who elected them. So Senator Patrick is to be congratulated for his bringing forward this bill, which demonstrates his belief that FOI laws need to be strengthened and the need to undo some of the harm that the Morrison government has done to our democracy in its trashing of FOI and its obsession with secrecy and cover-up. However, Senator Scar, the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee examined this bill closely, and based on the expert evidence presented, the committee found that a number of the measures would not achieve their intended outcomes. Ultimately, the committee recommended against passing this bill. Labor accepts the committee's recommendation and will not be supporting the bill at this time, but we do look forward to further engagement with Senator Patrick on these important issues. Thank you, Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Freedom of Information Legislation Amendment Improving Access and Transparency Bill of 2018. And we do so in the context that this is the least transparent government in history. They do everything possible to resist scrutiny. They systemically obfuscate. And when they're backed into a corner or people are getting dangerously close to an inconvenient truth, they try the dead cat strategy. So under this government, it's freedom from information rather than freedom of information. And so we are um, very pleased this bill's coming on for debate today. The suspension of parliamentary sittings this year has really emphasised the critical role that parliament plays as an oversight and accountability mechanism. FOI laws are a core component of a transparent and accountable government, and they allow timely access to information so that uh, the community, the media, um, other political parties can understand and scrutinise government decisions. But the current FOI regime has been systematically undermined. Some applicants are having to wait more than 12 months and pay exorbitant fees only to receive heavily redacted documents. This is not how robust democracies are meant to work. The Greens believe that national FOI laws need to be strengthened to facilitate proper scrutiny and to encourage well-informed public debate uh, on issues that affect the nation. And this bill is a step in that direction and we will be supporting it. Um, I note that FOI laws haven't been comprehensively reviewed since 
uh, I believe it's 1994. So we actually need a full root and branch uh, review. And when the government made a commitment to the National Action Plan for Open Government in 2016, and then a recommitment uh, to the second National Action Plan in 2018, there was some hope for greater accountability. Um, but sadly, we've seen absolutely no action. And in fact, we've gone backwards. And this continues to be one of the most secretive governments in Australia's history. They reject the premise of the question. It's the Canberra bubble. They don't answer questions or they come back months and months later with answers that are so massaged and workshopped that they're meaningless. They refuse FRI requests or they redact them beyond utility. The other tactic that's been frequently used and abused in recent times is the delegation of decision-making functions to bodies like the National Cabinet, um, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, um, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, the National COVID Coordinating Commission. Delegation to those sorts of bodies is making it harder and harder for the public to access information because frequently those bodies are not subject to FOI laws. In 2013, Dr Alan Hawke recommended a comprehensive review of Australia's FOI regime. Um, but sadly, Dr Hawke's recommendations have been ignored, much as they were for our environmental laws, I might add. Um, and in fact, the Abbott government proposed to abolish the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, which is, of course, a body that reviews FOI decisions. Um, but the Senate blocked him from doing so. Uh, so we had to settle for, uh, Abbott had to settle for slashing the Information Commissioner's funding. So they've now got fewer than half their previous staff, and yet they have a 72% increase in complaints. And so, of course, the Office of Information Commissioner has been unable to properly discharge its functions. It's under-resourced and overworked. The Guardian's transparency project has described the culture of secrecy within government departments as, uh, I quote, being aided by flawed freedom of information regime beset by delays, understaffing, and unnecessary obfuscation. The key findings of that transparency project's uh, research include the fact that at least 20 agencies have reduced the size of their FOI team. Um, NAIF, the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, has rejected 99.4% of the FRI requests that it's received. That's got to be a record, and people will remember that this is the same body uh, that approved lending Adani $1 billion in taxpayer funds, and the same body that's currently working behind the scenes to support gas pipelines for this government's misguided gas-led recovery. Um, but the Transparency Project have also uh, collated that more than 2,000 FOI requests have taken longer than three months uh, past the statutory timeframe to be finalised, and the Department of Home Affairs is a serial offender in not meeting statutory timeframes. Uh, perhaps that won't surprise anyone. Many documents have lost relevance by the time they're released, if they are released at all. And in the past year, the Office of Information Commissioner has found that the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Department of Human Services and the AFP have unreasonably and inexplicably delayed FOI decisions, which of course raises concerns that those agencies are holding back information based on political cycles. Uh, the ANAO also found a 68.4% increase since 2012 in the number of exemptions relied on by various agencies to FOI disclosure. Now, the Department of Environment and Energy was criticised for falling months behind in updating its FOI disclosure log. Um, but thankfully, from answers that I've received to questions in estimates, that problem seems to have been rectified. But timely access to information should be the cornerstone of any government, no matter what political flavour it is. And yet this is a government determined to hide information. The Your Right to Know campaign, which is championed by media organisations, provides more examples of the sorts of information that is being denied to the public including the scale of abuse and neglect in the aged care sector, 
uh, whether Australians are fighting as mercenaries in the bitter conflict in Yemen, uh, communications between Australia and the UK about uh, journalist Julian Assange awarding a $1 billion government travel contract to AOT, who are a subsidiary of Hello World, which of course was run by then Federal Liberal Party Treasurer and former Treasurer uh, Joe Hockey was a shareholder in Hello World. And I think they also gave a freebie to uh, Senator Cormann for a while there. FOI applications from journalists pursuing that story were repeatedly delayed on a number of uh, different grounds. Senator, Senator Scar, I think you have an opportunity uh, next to uh, tip your own bucket. Thanks, uh, Thank uh, you. Acting Deputy President. I'll, I'll continue on. I believe I didn't hear that interjection. Um, it's one benefit from being remote. You don't get to hear all of the wonderful interjections. Anyway, um, carrying on, the, um, the reasons for delay for FOI were um, uh, multitudinous. First, it was commercial and confidence, and then it would uh, compromise DFAT operations overseas, uh, and then releasing the information would be contrary to the public interest, and then it was a complex case. So after more than six months and an appeal, heavily redacted documents were finally released, but the delay meant that the 2016 election had already happened, and the controversy had uh, lost some of its significance. Um, some of the other uh, issues that the Your Right to Know campaign have emphasised have been kept hidden by, by poor FOI laws include uh, details of kids being kept in adult watch houses, which is sadly still the case, um, and even a request for the menu from the Parliament House dining room was caught in months and months of to and fro. Uh, I, it boggles the mind. And then, of course, we get to the persistent secrecy over political donations. While most states and territories have recognised the importance of transparency and require disclosure uh, of donations within between seven and 21 days, political donations at the federal level can be kept secret for as long as 12 months. People would know they get disclosed on the 1st of February every calendar year. Fees remain prohibitive for small not-for-profits and for media. In a particularly agrarious example, the Australian Conservation Foundation was asked to pay almost $500 for documents showing that internal discussions on leaving climate change out of the government's 2015 intergenerational report, that's almost 500 bucks. And after paying that fee, ACF got the documents with 241 of the 243 relevant pages deemed exempt and the remaining two pages partially redacted, and that cost almost 500 bucks. Without a robust FOI process, many details of concerning government behaviour only come to light through the bravery of whistleblowers. And of course, our whistleblower protection legislation also needs to be strengthened. Exposing sources and journalists um, relying on them to significant legal risk. Just ask um, Annika Smethurst, uh, Dan Oryx, Sam Clark, Witness K, and Bernard Caleri, Richard Boyle, and many others. The culture of refusal and delay has resulted in a significantly higher workload for the Office of the Information Commissioner, but they are chronically underfunded and delays are banking up. In a response to a recent application for review uh, submitted by my Senate colleague, Senator Faruqi, the Office of Information Commissioner said, and I quote, you will be advised about the next steps in the Information Com Commission review process once your application has been assessed by a senior member of the FOI team. Unfortunately, the AOIC has received an increase in the number of IC review applications, and we're endeavouring to process these as soon as practicable. The assessment by a senior member of the FOI team can take eight to 12 weeks, and sometimes longer, depending on the complexity of the issues raised in the IC review. Due to the number of IC review applications on hand, uh, allocation to review uh, to a review officer may take up to 12 months. The Act does not specify a time for completion of an IC review. The time taken will depend on a number of factors, depending on the complexity of your review." End quote. Well, clearly a delay of up to 12 months to even allocate an application for review uh, to, a, to a particular officer is absolutely outrageous and unjustifiable. Without additional support to both internal FOI officers 
um, and to the Office of Information Commissioner, agencies have no real incentive to proactively share information with the Australian people, uh, which I'm sure suits the government down to the ground. The chronically underfunded FOI regime that we have makes it next impossible for the public to stay informed about what its government is up to. The Greens will be supporting this bill as a step in the right direction to making FOI laws work, uh, to give Australians access to information and not to facilitate government further hiding information. And we will continue to call for measures to hold this government to account, whether they be stronger, enforced and independently administered ministerial standards, whether they be lower thresholds and real-time disclosures for political donations, or whether that be a strong independent federal corruption watchdog. This is the least transparent government in history. It's the candle bubble. We reject the premise of the question. Cabinet incompetence has been such an overused uh, exemption to our FOI laws. You wheel something through the cabinet room and out it goes again. And hey, presto, we don't need to tell anybody about it. The Prime Minister's ministerial standards, you wouldn't even know if he's applying them. Although, I mean, you just look at the uh, litany of scandals and it's pretty clear they're not being applied. But the process is so opaque. You have to seek uh, to find out when they've been enforced. You don't get told uh, the process process that's been used. Sports rorts is a perfect example there. We still don't have the Gatians report. There's absolutely no transparency about the enforcement or otherwise of those ministerial standards. And we still have no federal corruption watchdog. It's been almost one year since the Greens bill for a federal corruption watchdog passed the Senate. Almost a year. It still hasn't been brought on for debate in the House. And the government initially used the excuse that, well, they're doing their own bill, but they described that bill in February of last year as imminent. That's 18 months ago, their uh, Integrity Commission bill was imminent. When I asked the minister about this uh, unjustifiable uh, delay, his excuse was the global pandemic, which has been on foot for six months. And yet 18 months ago, the bill was imminent. So this excuse absolutely does not hold water. And this government just can't hack scrutiny. Um, it wants its ministers to be able to continue to engage in uh, disreputable and often uh, conflicts of interest sort of conduct. And it wants to continue doing so with impunity. We've seen executive powers used uh, far more than is uh, safe and robust for our democracy in this calendar year. And the least we can do is tighten up FOI laws to make sure that members of the public and the media um, can access the information that they need when they need it at an affordable price. So the Greens will be supporting this bill um, and we commend it to the Chamber. Thank you, Senator Waters. Yeah. Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It's a real shame on occasions when you come into this place and someone uses parliamentary privilege just to gratuitously tip a bucket on someone. And it's a real shame on a number of levels. It's a real shame on a number of levels. Firstly, it's a shame because it, uh, it denigrates everything else they say. Because as soon as someone, any of us, come into this place and just gratuitously tip a bucket on someone else, it just denigrates from everything else that's said in that, in this case, the 15 minutes that Senator Waters from my home state of Queensland just spoke. And that's a real shame because in that speech there may have been some points for us all to reflect on, but the reality is because the opportunity was taken under parliamentary privilege to tip a bucket on, on amongst others, and, and there was a whole shopping list of people who got the bucket unceremoniously tipped upon them, uh, was the honourable leader of the government in the Senate. And that's a great shame, and I think uh, my fellow senator from Queensland should reflect on that. And that's all I have to say in response to her speech. With respect to Senator Patrick, I have great regard and admiration for Senator Patrick, and I think he performs an outstanding uh, service in this place in terms of uh, raising issues which should be reflected upon by this place. He is an avid user of the Freedom of Information Act process. 
No, there's no buts, Senator McKim. Absolutely no buts. I'll take that interjection. No, no buts. I can disagree with someone. I can. I, Senator Scar, can disagree with someone on on points of policy, but also have respect for them. I have difficulty having respect for people, though, who come into this place and use parliamentary privilege to tip a bucket. But I have respect for Senator Patrick, and he has used the FOI Act process. To, with great accomplishment on a number of occasions, and he should be commended for that. In fact, in preparation for my contribution on this legislation, I actually read one of the more recent decisions uh, Senator uh, Patrick led the uh, Information Commissioner to make with respect to the disclosure of information in relation to the National Submarine Project. And it uh, was certainly a good way to prepare myself for this debate and to understand the intricacies of freedom of information legislation. So I do commend him on his contribution to this debate. I commend him for the work he's done in relation to the bill. And there are many themes and points which he's raised in his contribution, and which is the intent underlying a lot of this bill, that I agree with as well. However, uh, on a, whilst there's that respect, as a matter of policy, there are things that I, I disagree with, and I will turn to those shortly. Uh, one point I would make, though, just generally with respect to all the comments that have been made on this debate so far, is senators should remember that the FOI Act process provides that commercial parties, third parties, private citizens have a right to raise objections with respect to the disclosure of information with, under the FOI Act processes. It is not just government. It is not just government, it is not just the executive that can raise issues with respect to the disclosure of information under the FOI Act. Third parties whose information is referred to in FOI Act applications can also object. And they have a right to object under, under the process, as Senator Patrick would well know. They have a right to object under the processes under the FOI Act, and that is consistent across all jurisdictions in Australia. They have a right to object, and their objections need to be considered, and the rule of law needs to apply. So it is simply not the case that this is only about the applicant and government. It also can concern, concern third parties, and that case which Madam Deputy President I referred to earlier with respect to Naval Group. Naval Group actually objected to the disclosure of some of that information that was the subject of Senator Patrick's application, and their concerns, their objections had to be considered and given weight to, and ultimately a decision was made as the Commissioner saw appropriate under the Act. So I think that is something we need to bear in mind in relation to this legislation. With respect to the other senator from Queensland who made a contribution on this debate, Senator Watt, I can certainly respect his contribution to this debate far more than the uh, Senator Waters from the Greens. And I would say to Senator Watt um, that whilst your boyhood hero, Gough Whitlam, no doubt supported FOI Act legislation, it was one of my heroes, Malcolm Fraser, who actually brought it home in 1982 in a Commonwealth sense. So it was actually a Commonwealth government that introduced the FOI Act. Uh, into uh, the Australian Parliament in 1982. Second point I'd like to make in rela relation to Senator Watt's contribution, he talked about resourcing, and I think it's, it's a key point, to be frank. It's absolutely a key point. If we are going to have an FOI regime, there needs to be appropriate resourcing provided for it. And it doesn't matter who's in government, uh, there needs to be that appropriate resourcing. When I read the committee report, if you go to this is the report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, page 9, and I go to paragraph 2.9 and I quote, When asked whether there needed to be more resources at both the early resolution stage as well as at a later stage to enable more information commissioner reviews to be finalised earlier, Ms Falk stated, and I quote, At this point in time, that's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing that where I need to focus is on working with government to increase the officer's resources to increase the capacity at the case officer level and potentially the executive level. If that were to be increased and then have a flow-on effect to more information commissioner reviews being required of the commissioner and that being something that's not manageable within other functions, then that would be something that I would bring to the attention of government." End quote. So that's the actual, those are the actual words from the information commissioner in the report, which do not, uh, in my view, in my respectful view, do not support uh, the characterisation of this matter by Senator Watt from my home state of Queensland. 
Having responded to some of the contributions made by other senators in this place, uh, I'd uh, now like to make my own, provide my own observations to the Senate with respect to this matter. Firstly, I believe, and I believe passionately, that freedom of information legislation at all levels of government is absolutely essential to the workings of an open, transparent liberal democracy. Absolutely, absolutely no question about that. I think it yields scrutiny of government, I think it yields in, in, informed debate, and I think it gives the public knowledge and information in relation to government spending, which of course is the spending of taxpayers' money. So no argument from me with respect to the importance of freedom of information, and I think we've seen case and case again where information has been divulged through the freedom of information uh, process. It is a very powerful tool to keep government and executive, no matter what party, to account. And in doing this, the Information Commissioner has a key role regarding the consideration of exemptions. And I think it's worthwhile noting that there are two types of exemptions. There's the unconditional exemption or the conditional exemption, which is subject to a public interest test. In relation to unconditional exemptions, these cover things such as matters affecting national security, the disclosure of trade secrets and federal cabinet documents. And I must say, I must say, I share the reservations of some other speakers with respect to at all levels of government, of no matter what their political party, whether or not uh, the federal cabinet or state cabinet in my home state of Queensland, whether or not state cabinet exemptions have been used in a way that perhaps was not intended. With respect to the conditional exemptions, these concern things such as information about deliberative processes. And coming back to Senator Patrick's most recent uh, successful, I should say, review of a decision, that was one of the matters which was considered. And in 5 0. I'm, I'm not surprised. You've had lots of practice. I'd be disappointed if you're less than 5 0. In relation to conditional exemptions, I must say they have to be balanced against the public interest. And the Act does provide guidance with respect to that public interest weighting, the scale that has to apply in terms on the one hand, in one hand you're looking at scrutiny, and on the other hand you're looking as to whether or not things such as deliberative processes would be impacted in such a way as to, uh, as to mean it was, was against the public interest for information to be disclosed. And on this point, we must remember what are the factors which should not be taken to be against the public interest in terms of disclosure. Factors which should not be taken into consideration include embarrassment, misunderstanding or confusion. So they are no excuses for refusing to release information. And can I commend the Information Commissioner in relation to the judgment I referred to before? I think it was a very uh, good judgment and it certainly uh, uh, acted as a tutorial for me in terms of getting up to speed with, uh, with this debate. I now turn to the report of the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Committee, which recommended against, recommended against adoption of this bill. However, it did uh, say, as I've been saying during this contribution, that there were elements of this bill which are certainly worthy, at least in terms of their intent. I have spoken about the need for there to be adequate resources with respect to the support of FOI Act uh, processes, and I think that is an important point. One point Senator Patrick tax, uh, touched on was the need to have legal qualifications. And I did reflect on this uh, as I was reading the case, and it seemed to me that, to some extent, at first blush, what is perhaps needed more than a lawyer is common sense and practicality. Because I think a lot of these concepts where someone will say, well, this is commercial incompetence, or this is something which is going to impact the deliberative processes of an executive agency. You really need a bit of common sense and practicality to make that assessment. And I can't see any reason why whoever the decision maker is, provided that they have access to appropriate legal advice, why that decision maker can't actually make that decision based on common sense and practica practicality. And examples have been given with respect to a previous holder of a relevant commissioner position, Mr Timothy Pilgrim, who did not have a legal qualification but who apparently discharged his obligations uh, quite professionally in this regard. So I, I don't agree that you need to have a legal qualification. I don't believe that lawyers are the answers, answer to everything. Uh, I think in this case, provided there is access to appropriate legal advice, there could in fact be some benefit 
in terms of someone who's got a bit more experience, practical experience, in making a, a judgment as to whether or not something should be exempt or not exempt. With respect to the timing on publication, I think Senator Patrick makes a very good point with respect to uh, the position of journalists. And I think it is fair, fair to say that if a journalist has spent a terrific amount of time, uh, invested resources making an FOI Act application, that it would be disappointing for that journalist, having got to the end of the process, to have actually managed to procure the relevant documents through that process, for those processes, for those documents to be dumped in the public domain without the journalist first having an opportunity to review them and to uh, do whatever the journalist uh, thought they should do with those documents. However, as I understand it, there are guidelines in place which are meant to take into account factors such as that. Um, I'm happy uh, to hear whether or not those guidelines are working as they're intended to work or not, but certainly the information I've been provided with is that there are guidelines which are there in order to take into account, um, take into account matters relating to the timing of disclosure. But in that regard, we should always remember that once it's been de decided that the document should be made public, then they should be made public. They should be made public. And to some extent, it is then outside the realm of the original applicant. It's a matter for the uh, polity, if you like, at large. It's a matter for the community at large to have an interest for those documents to be made public. So I think the two elements need to be, uh, need to be weighed. But it is a matter which I think, um, given how nuanced the discussion could be in a particular case, it is a matter which could be more appropriately dealt with in the guidelines. And the charges, I do note with respect to charges, uh, that section 29.5 of the Freedom of Information Act provides that an applicant can contest a charge for access uh, on basis, and that will be considered on the basis of whether access is in the general public interest. Again, I'd be interested to know uh, how that works out in practice, but there is a process there. There is a process there for charges to be waived, and I think there is a bit of a tension on the one hand seeking additional resources for Freedom of Information Act processes and, on the other hand, raising questions over whether or not there should be charges involved in terms of accessing those documents. Because certainly in some cases Freedom of Information Act applications can be extremely wide-reaching and uh, cover huge amounts of documents. And I think uh, the two competing interests need to be balanced in a reasonable way. And the last point I'd like to make is with respect to uh, referrals to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, it does concern me. It does concern me whether or not that, uh, that proposal is simply a matter of kicking the can down the jurisdictional road. So all you're doing is, is feeding into another uh, traffic block, if you like, um, congestion down the jurisdictional path, uh, and you're simply pushing the uh, issue down to the uh, AAT uh, when, if there is an issue, it needs to be resolved earlier in the phase. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Chisholm, you've got about three minutes, I think. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, I uh, think that it is an opportune time to be having a debate on this issue, given uh, the role Parliament has played this year uh, and the constraints in which we have been dealing. And I think uh, the uh, commentary that was provided by the Senate President, no less, last week uh, around Parliament and its uh, ability to provide scrutiny of government. Um, it is an opportune time today to be discussing this bill. Uh, I acknowledge the words of Senator Watt earlier, who outlined uh, Labor's uh, position on this bill, uh, and I also uh, acknowledge the Legal and Constitutional uh, Committee uh, report into this, which was done in the last term of Parliament, so before I became a member of that committee. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, the work of Senator Patrick in this regard, and whilst I, I often find things that I disagree with Senator Patrick on, uh, and uh, very rarely would I ever say anything nice about him inside or outside this chamber, but um, he is well-intentioned, uh, very determined, uh, relentless and indeed principled on these matters, and I know, having dealt with him in the last parliament around um, OPDs and such forth, uh, Senator, uh, Senator uh, Patrick uh, always had a principled decision on those where he would provide support to those 
uh, on every occasion that I think I went to him on something like that. So he is uh, very consistent. Uh, and I think that what we've seen through the course of this year, and I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the work that I've been doing as the chair of the uh, inquiry into uh, the granting of sports funding as well. Uh, every opportunity the government have to avoid scrutiny, uh, to avoid transparency uh, and to avoid accountability, um, they basically look for every opportunity they have to exploit that. Uh, and there's been no better example that I have been involved with this year uh, than in regards to the inquiry into the granting of sports funding, which saw the resignation of a minister, no less, but still the government uh, are reluctant to release the documents as to the decision making that they had. So whether it be the infamous colour coded spreadsheet, um, we still do not have access to that. So what was provided to us was a redacted copy that basically blacks out all the information that is relevant to us to go about doing our job. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. The time for this debate has expired. We'll be in continuation. So at 12.20, we have an explanation by Minister, and I call uh, Minister Birmingham. Thanks, De Deputy President. And I thank the Senate for the opportunity to speak in response to Senator Patrick's questions and take the opportunity to correct some of the fundamentally incorrect statements in his original motion that brought this matter to the chamber. Senator Patrick notes that the government denied the Senate access to water valuation documents used to inform the purchase of water from Eastern Australia Agriculture in 2017. That is not actually the case. The government complied with the order of 16 November 2017 and released documents to the Senate on 12 February 2018 to assert that the minister made an improper public interest immunity claim, as has been done, is simply false. The documents were released in a redacted form to protect the commercial interests of the Commonwealth. Assessments of the potential impact of releasing details of evaluation is made on a case-by-case -case basis. The valuation documents used to inform the purchase of overland flow water entitlements from Eastern Australia Agriculture in 2017 were assessed in February 2018 as containing commercially sensitive information. It is now, Deputy President, two and a half years since the tabling of those redacted documents, a significant period of time. Logically, valuations become less commercially sensitive as they become more dated and less relevant to any negotiations or decisions of the day being made by government. In light of this, in association with a request under the Freedom of Information Act, the department considered the commercial value of the documents now to have reduced, and so it recently released further material. It is simply a question of the passage of time since the documents were first tabled. If the Senate made the request via an order for the production of documents now, then the valuations would have been released without commercial information redacted as they have been under the Freedom of Information Act. Despite the Senator's efforts to undermine confidence in the recovery of water for the environment, he has been unable to identify any nefarious acts in relation to these purchases. More importantly, the Australian National Audit Office recently completed an audit of exactly the purchases that the Senator is claiming were overpayments. And they have found that the department and the government did not pay more than the market rate for that water. The Senate has ordered the government to explain why the Commonwealth paid more than the independent valuer's range. To repeat and to be very clear, the government did not overpay. The ANAO found that all strategic water purchases, including the water purchased from Eastern Australia Agriculture, were at or below the market rate identified by independent market valuations. I quote Deputy President from the Auditor General, Auditor General Report No. 2, 2020-21 Performance Audit, Procurement of Strategic Water Entitlements, page 9. Quote, the price the department paid for water entitlements was equal to or less than the maximum price determined by valuations. The valuation provided for standard overland flow entitlements of the type purchased provided a market value range 
of $1,100 per megalitre to $2,300 per megalitre. The valuation also clearly stated that the department should be prepared to pay 10 to 30 per cent above the standard market rate, i.e. up to $3,000 per megalitre for, and I quote from the valuation, properties of a high standard that have achieved above average levels of water use efficiency in this region. In fact, the department paid less than the top end of the expanded valuation range provided for in the valuation and purchased some 28,740 megalitres of nominal overland flow entitlements for $2,745 per megalitre, reflecting the nature of the property. This was based on the department conducting a full and rigorous assessment of all available information. Senator Patrick and others in this place have desperately tried to besmirch the name of ministers and of the hard-working and dedicated public servants delivering the Basin Plan and undertaking the recovery of water. However, the ANAO investigated these matters and found no evidence of improper dealings. What the senator, and I note Senator Patrick is attempting to besmirch the Auditor General through interjections as well. What the senator should be mindful of are the environmental benefits for the Colgoa floodplains and the Lower Balon River, including the Narran Lakes, a Ramsar listed wetland of international importance. That, as part of the Basin Plan, is what this water was purchased with an intent of delivering for. The Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder recently estimated that 95 gigalitres of water contributed to flows in the Lower Balon at the start of 2020, including from the overland flow licences purchased from Eastern Australia Agriculture. These were the most significant inflows to the Narran Lakes since 2013. The Narran Lake Nature Reserve Ramsar site supports 40 migratory bird species, including 19 listed under international agreements, and threatened species such as the Australasian bittern, Murray cod and the winged peppercress. As we recover from COVID-19, sites like this wetland of significant importance will attract domestic travellers, travellers who will see Australia's flora and fauna on display because of water recovered and used to benefit the environment because of this government's work in delivering the Basin Plan. More importantly than those tourism and travel benefits and economic dividends, of course, is the reality that the work under the Basin Plan to recover this water is delivering the environmental benefits intended through supporting wetlands of this world-class nature and the species that depend upon them. Our government is getting on with the job of delivering the Basin Plan. We are delivering for the environment, for communities and for farmers, notwithstanding the many difficulties faced in the delivery of that plan. We will not be distracted by ill-founded beat-ups, conspiracy theories or those who seek to shamelessly and shamefully undermine confidence in the Basin Plan, which is one of the most important environmental measures this parliament has put in place. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, President. Minister. Senator Patrick. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I move to take note of the minister's response. Now, I want to find a uh, talk about the context of, uh, of this OPD and how we, how we got there and some things that, happened, that have happened along the way. Uh, I refer senators to my first speech uh, when I spoke of the work that the Senate does other than legislation. I talked about it uh, probing and checking the administration of laws, of keeping itself and the public informed and of its requirement to insist on ministerial accountability for government administration with words so relevant as, uh, they, to us that they are quoted in Odgers, US President Woodrow Wilson described the infor informing role of the Congress, stating, it is the proper duty of a representative body to look diligently into every affair of government and to talk much about what it sees. It is meant to be the eyes and the voice and to embody the wisdom and the will of its constituents. Unless Congress have and uses every mean means of acquainting itself with the acts and the disposition of the administrative agents of government, the country must be helpless to learn how it is being served. 
The philosopher, philosopher John Stuart Mill, quoted with approval in the High Court case of Egan and Willis, summarised the task as to watch and control the government to throw light of publicity on its act. Applied uh, to the Senate, these principles make it clear that our role is not just to review and pass legislation. Indeed, President Wolf, uh, Wilson stated the informing function of Congress should be preferred even to its legislative function. In the House of uh, Representatives, the government has a majority usually, and so that function is not performed there. Governments can never be relied on to supervise and scrutinise themselves. The Senate must take note. Uh, this, uh, the, must note that this role is most serious. The Constitution, particu particularly Section 49, grants the Senate powers to carry out this function. And I also talked about OPDs. And I said, all too often, orders for productions of documents are being met with contempt. An order for production gets made. The government advances an argument for the public interest immunity, however tenuous that argument might be. Invariably, the Senate does not accept the public interest immunity claim and the government insists on it uh, and refuses to provide the documents. And then the Senate does nothing except weaken itself. In those cases where the Senate's arguments are strong for the documents to be produced, the Senate weakens itself by not using its powers to insist upon production. Now I just want to go to a few examples that are relevant to this government's uh, um, allergy to transparency, but also uh, in criticism of the Senate itself. On the 7th of, uh, 17th of November 2014, there was an OPD uh, seeking access to any documents produced by macroeconomics.com.au uh, as a result of a particular tender, including economic modelling and other examination of potential economic impact of the C-1000 submarine project on the Australian economy, amongst other subjects. Now, that was refused to the Senate on the grounds it was commercial, sorry, cabinet in confidence. Now, this is the document. This is the cabinet in confidence document. And you might reasonably ask, how is Senator Patrick holding a, commercial, a cabinet in confidence document? And the answer to that question is, because I got it under FOI. Sadly, I got it under FOI, denied by this chamber, by this government, as cabinet in confidence. On the 9th of October 2016, the Senate ordered the production of the design and mobilisation contract signed between the Commonwealth of Australia and DCNS on the 30th of September 2016. Now it was refused to the Senate on the grounds that it was commercially uh, confidential and involved national security. And yet here I am holding it. It contains national security information, yet I'm holding it here. How am I holding it? Because I got it under FOI. It was refused to the Senate, but I got it under FOI. We're starting to see the pattern. How about the future frigate contract, the tender that went out, the tender where the government desperately did not want the Australian public to understand that they had sidelined two Australian companies in the tender. So there was an OPD in relation to this. The OPD on the, on the 4th of September 2017, seeking access to the tender documents. Again, I'm holding it here, not because the, because the government complied with the Senate's orders, not because the Senate insisted upon uh, its uh, its right to receive the documents, but because I got them under FOI. Here we have the Australian Industry Plan, something you would think is quite a reasonable document to be in the public domain. It's DCNS's commitment or Naval Group's commitment to uh, what they will do with Australian industry should, uh, should they win the submarine contract, which they, they, they then, of course, did. So, when they won the competition, I asked to see this. I asked the Senate, and the Senate gave me support for an order for production of documents to provide this, and it was denied. Public interest immunity prevented me from getting access to it. Well, here's the decision of the Information Commissioner that eventually had it released to me. 
Now, it did go further to the AAT, but eventually the Commonwealth uh, backed down and agreed, and we end up with this in the public domain now. It's a sad state of affairs. Now, there's another uh, uh, OPD, an OPD on the 20, uh, 20th of June 2018, that seeks to find out what the cost uh, or what the price offered to Australia was for 12 French submarines. That's a reasonable thing to ask, to understand what was their offer, particularly in circumstances where we've got a project that went from something between 8 and 33 billion back in 2009 to 89 billion dollars now. The Senate asked the government by way of OPD to hand over the documents. When they didn't, uh, the minister was asked to come and explain uh, the circumstances, Minister Payne at the time, when she was Defence Minister. We had a debate on it on the 17th of September 2018 as to why there was a public interest immunity claim. And the government stood up, Senator Payne stood up, so Senator Fawcett stood up and gave, a, gave the Senate a lecture as to why this was confidential. Now, I don't have that document, but, I, but what I do have it in my hand is a decision made on the 13th of this month that requires the Department of Defence to hand it over to me. Again, the Senate ordered the production of this document. It was refused, and I'm about to get it under FOI, assuming the government, the government doesn't appeal it, which will simply cost more, and I'll get it anyway. I also have a document here which is marked protective and sensitive. It's a, an Auditor General's report into the Army's protected mobility vehicle light. This is a document that the, Auditor, that the Attorney General issued a Section 37 certificate to censor the Parliament from having. Now, there's a matter before the AAT. I'm awaiting a decision on full release of this document, but already I have information in here that was denied to both houses of parliament because the attorney general issued a certificate saying it was sensitive. Can everyone see what's happening here? The Senate orders uh, the production of documents so that it can do its job, it can do its oversight job, its most important job. And yet the documents don't get returned to us. They don't get returned to us, and then someone like me can go and get them under FOI. And that's exactly what happened in the case uh, of the current motion that we're referring to, the valuation uh, in relation to Watergate, Clyde and uh, Kiora properties. On the 16th of November 2017. The Senate ordered the production of water valuations. Now I know that because uh, I, I lodged the motion on the 15th of November, my very first day in the Senate, and we were refused the documents. Uh, Senator Birmingham is correct; some uh, some information flowed to us, in fact, quite a lot. But the critical information. What the actual valuations were was hidden. We went for a second round, and another set of documents were tabled uh, on, the, on the 26th of October after a bit of uh, negotiation with the government. But still, the valuations were kept secret. And of course, uh, the minister says, "Well, they were kept secret because they were confidential. They were commercially sensitive." These were valuations. Now, anyone who bought, buys a house knows that when you get a valuation on a house, sure, you might want to keep that hidden from the, the, uh, the people you're purchasing it from, but after you've bought your house, it's irrelevant. It has no meaning. The market price has been set. In this instance, we had the, the, uh, the, the uh, Commonwealth purchasing, proper, purchasing water, $80 million worth of taxpayers' money. For, 290, uh, sorry, for 29 gigalitres at a price of 27.45 per gigalitre, 2,745 per gigalitre. Now, many thought, many thought, and still think that that's expensive for overland flow water. There are other valuations in the same valley that say that water is worth nothing. 
Okay, so that's what they pay. They were open about that. They, they responded to questions. But I wanted to see the valuations. I wanted to see whether it fit with, fitted within the, within the ranges recommended by the valuer. And they withheld it. They withheld it um, uh, both in the OPD and in questioning. And they withheld it when I first FOI'd it as well. The department did not want to know that the value range was nothing uh, like uh, what they paid for it. Okay? The, the valuation which I have here now, released to me under FOI, not under an order of production, says that the value should be somewhere between $1,100 and $2,300 per megalitre, yet we paid $2,745. Now, Mr Birmingham makes the statement that somewhere in the valuation they were talking about paying between 10 and 30 per cent uh, extra for high quality properties. And he's correct, it is in there. But it's in there as they work their way through trying to get to the final position, which they, which they then state, which is really clear that this water is worth somewhere between $1,100 and $2,300. That includes all of those factors, including the, the, the view on uh, whether or not it's worth 10 or, or 30 per cent more. The government paid outside of the value range. And I will be asking questions. I'm sure there will be many people asking questions at estimates as to how they came to that conclusion, because it's either maladministration, incompetence or fraud. This is taxpayers' money. This this might be embarrassing, and look, I have the greatest respect for the, the Auditor General, the greatest of respect, and I think there's been an error made, and I will give uh, him the opportunity to answer my questions as to how he, he thinks that it was within the range. It's clear it is not within the range if one looks at the valuation. So we're in the chamber talking about two things today. One of them is that we paid extra for water. That extra taxpayers' money that didn't need to be paid. And we should always be concerned about that. But we're also in this chamber today talking about the ability of the Senate to do its job properly. And there should never be a case where an OPD is made and denied on public interest grounds that then at some stage uh, later a citizen is able to FOI. It it actually puts shame on the government and it puts shame on the Senate for not actually standing up for itself. And we need to think about that. We need to think about how we do our job properly. And it doesn't matter whether you are on the government side or on the opposition side or on the crossbench. We have a duty to conduct oversight. And whatever we do uh, whilst uh, Labor sits on this side will affect the Liberal Party when they are in opposition when they want to hold the government to account. It's an important principle. Sadly, the government has made false public interest immunity claims and, sadly, the Senate has let them do it. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deputy President. And, uh, I rise to make a contribution that echoes much of the sentiment that's been put on the record today by Senator Patrick. Um, I do want to make a couple of opening remarks about Senator Birmingham's response, and, and let me say that, you know, having um, having watched Senator Birmingham in action for some years here in in this chamber, I've come to know that the more slowly and deliberately he speaks, the more it looks like he's actually trying to cover up, and that's what comes out afterwards. We saw a very slow, deliberate, and careful response to this order for production of documents debate uh, that we're having, because I believe the minister and his government is chronically addicted to covering up, covering up everything that they possibly can. And that's why they don't produce the documents that the Senate needs to do our job on behalf of the Australian people, to critique, to observe, to ask questions based on fact about what's going on in this country. But the cover-up is on day in and day out from those opposite. Mr Senator Birmingham was a 
claiming that this is just an attempt to besmirch the ministers. Look, you don't have to have. Uh, you don't have to have an event like this in the Senate to know that the government has very much bespurched ministers in their ranks. You've only got to look at Minister Angus Taylor, who attacked the people of New South Wales, defending his family business against the environmental concerns, attacked the truth of councillors on the Sydney, on the Sydney uh, Council. And his government stood up for him and helped him and covered over Minister Stuart Robert and RoboDebt. Just here, this is, this is just a handful of papers that's come through my office today. Claims for the minister has made a public interest immunity claim with respect to any legal advice obtained in relation to the income compliance program and to the circumstances surrounding any legal advice obtained in relation to the income compliance program. That means that's the cover up for a robo debt. This government is so void of integrity that it doesn't see that covering up information about what they did to the Australian people in raising illegal debts, they say telling us anything here in the Senate about that is against public interest. What a crock! What a load of rubbish! This government has made an art form of acting against the public interest and an art form of then attempting to cover it up at every, every single turn. I particularly like to focus on this minister, the Minister for Water, Northern Australia and Resources, Minister Birmingham, uh, because of his incompetent and overzealous use of public interest immunity claims to shut down government transparency. The Murray-Darling Basin is a wonderful and critical feature of Australia's agricultural and environmental legacy. Its rivers provide homes and breeding areas to countless animals and plants, and its waters also help irrigate fields of citrus, grapes, rice and cotton, as well as one-fifth of all Australian dairy farms. It matters to this nation. It matters to me as a senator for New South Wales. It is a place of pride in our psyche as Australians. The Murray-Darling Basin Plan is teetering. Its solid pillars of environmental science, respect for Indigenous communities and sustainable irrigation are being swept away by a tsunami of corruption, opaque regulations and a market lack of faith in this bureaucracy. Too many scandals, years of drought without water for most licences and the lack of transparency in the water market have left many irrigation communities teetering on the brink. Their anger is evident in protests like the one held last year at Parliament House or the one on the, Tocumul, uh, on the river at Tocumwell Show that Australians will not accept, they will not accept cover-ups or insider deals anymore. They're sick of the cover-ups. They're sick of this government trying to pull the wool over their eyes. People from the country parts of Australia are too hard-working, too decent to be treated in this disdainful way by this Liberal National Party government. I ask the minister, please, as the tide of social licence ebbs, end these cover-ups. End the bogus public interest immunity claims. End your government's war on truth and accountability and allow the river communities to actually hear what's really going on. Nearly three long years ago, the Senate ordered the production of all documents relating to water purchases across the Murray-Darling Basin from 1 January 2017. The community has a right to know. These documents were provided to the Senate, but they were heavily redacted. Now, for people following the debate at home who don't pay much attention to what goes on, basically a big redacted document is one that's got most of the toner from the copier, the printer, all over it. It's just a black, blanked out document. What they blanked out included the valuations of the Clyde and Keora purchases in Queensland. Despite denying full disclosure to the Senate, the department since released these valuations to a private citizen under freedom of information laws. So what we're talking about here today is a government that refuses arrogantly, intransigently, to come before the Senate, to put documents before the Senate, the senators of this great nation, of all its states, to interrogate the truth, because the truth doesn't matter to them. Hiding the truth is what matters to this government. How can it possibly be that the government is so afraid of this Senate, 
so allergic to accountability that it will redact duly ordered documents to the Senate, yet can release them to members of the public. That is the ultimate insult to senators duly elected to this place, and through them an insult to the nation of Australia and its great citizenry. I don't for one moment begrudge the disclosure of the valuations to any citizen of the country, but it's this government's contempt of the Senate through these bogus public interest immunity claims that, should have, that really have to be explained today. How can a PII claim be valid to the upper chamber of the Australian parliament but not valid for information to be delivered to an ordinary Australian citizen? How on earth does the government expect people to swallow that? It just doesn't pass the pub test. And it's because this minister and all ministers of this Liberal National Party government are at war with transparency. And in doing so, they are at war with the best interest of Australia. They have no shame in trying to cover up their failings. In this case, the questionable spend of tens of millions of dollars of taxpayers' money for water licences from a company company that was co-founded by fellow, a fellow member of their cabinet. You know, it's the old boys' club. Well, there's a few more women around the chamber, thank God for that, but the old boys' club seems to linger longer. It's past its use-by date. Australians are sick of it. We're over this insider trading that is the hallmark of this government's practices. I applaud Senator Patrick for his tireless work on government accountability in this and other matters. And I note several examples that he's mentioned provided to me of uh, claims that this government have put uh, forward to avoid disclosure of documents or decisions, only to be later forced to provide them by uh, the Information Commissioner due to their initial reasoning, reasoning being fundamentally flawed. And this is what this is how, it, how this is how they roll. They hope that people don't understand all of the plays, all of the language, all of the practices of this Senate, and they hide in that space between what ordinary Australian people know and what journalists who come through this place, who churn through this place, they, they rely on a lack of deep knowledge of how the place operates. And in that space, they seek to hide. They want to hide about the Collins Submarine Macroeconomic Report. They refuse to offer that as an order of production of documents because they said it was cabinet in confidence. But it was released. It was released to a private citizen under FOI. And I believe this cabinet in confidence document is in the hands of Senator Patrick right now in the chamber. He can get that as a private citizen, but this government denied the Senate to have access to it. This is a total disgrace. And there are very many more examples. The submarine design and mobilisation contract, the future frigate tender and the other matters to which Senator uh, Patrick has referred today. Now, to me, as a citizen of this great nation, why is any of this information not allowed to be released to the Senate under the appropriate orders, yet able to be provided to members of the public, even if its production has originally been classified as possible damage to national security. Because when somebody actually sat still, the Information Commissioner had a look at this without the rush and the push. It didn't meet the test. It just didn't meet the test. How is it not in the public's interest to know if their money is being spent wisely? when it comes to buying back tens of millions of dollars in water entitlements from a Cayman Island-based entity through opaque tender processes. I would think that that's in the Australian's, Australian citizens' interest to know that. Why did the government seemingly fail to obtain value for money with a company desperate to sell these entitlements? The Australian public has a right to know, and their duly elected representatives should be treated with the respect that trust entails. As a duty senator to most of Western New South Wales and for many river communities that depend on the plan, I demand, I demand on behalf of the citizens of New South Wales that the government be upfront with the members of this chamber. 
This is not just a one-off case of poor judgment. It's a systemic issue. These PII claims are thrown up like paper roadblocks, obstructing our work here for months and months and, in sometimes, some cases, years, Deputy President, through what is revealed now by the release of documents by the Information Commissioner, Commissioner clearly, ultimately, specious reasoning. But it gets the job done that the government wanted to do. It's a deceptive government that hides its failures in darkness. This, this lot over here, they clock on day in, day out. They continue to collect money as they pass go, and they are treating the Australian people like mushrooms. Loads of manure and lots of darkness. That is both their policy and their practice. They think they win. They think they win when the public moves on, when journalists move on, when the momentum dies and the government regains from a brief and piercing shaft of sunlight interrogating their disgraceful practices. I tell you what happens when a government is addicted to darkness and to hiding the truth and preventing the truth from being told in this place. I tell you what happens. What's happening right now in aged care is what happens. Today, 412 Australians in aged care settings are not with us. Their families are mourning their loss. Their families are desperately seeking answers to how this could happen to somebody they loved and somebody that they put into a place that was subject to the scrutiny of the federal parliament under the minister. And the reason it's happening is because this government has hidden and hidden and hidden for years and years, seven years of long government neglect of the aged care sector, seven years of failing to respond to reports, seven years of ignoring the plight of decent, hard-working Australians who did nothing wrong except become older and find their way into an aged care setting. And they're running and hiding from that as well. This is a government of darkness and denial. This is a government that refuses to tell the truth. This is a government that hides documents that this chamber needs to hold it to account. It's replete in every single policy area. Robo-debt. Hundreds of thousands of Australians served up with debt. This government, to this day, refuses claims public interest immunity, claims that it is not in the public interest to know if it took legal advice before it hurt all those lives. In this place, on this very day, we have been debating the impact of that decision. Just a couple of weeks ago, I put on the record the suicide of two young men. There are many more who have just lost hope because of the actions of this government. And I dare say, if decent scrutiny was applied, if we had access to the documents that we need, if we had a government that showed some decency and remorse for its failings, we might have a lot more of those 421 Australians alive in aged care. We might not have the terrible trauma that has been inflicted on people across this country because of robo-debt. And we might have a better idea about what went on in the Murray-Darling Basin sales. This is a disgrace. It's got to stop. Thank you, um, Senator O'Neill. I intend to go to Senator Hanson Young, then Senator Davey, and then uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you. Chair, I uh, rise to um, take note of the minister's statement um, earlier today in relation to the government's failure to be transparent and upfront with this chamber. It's the Senate's job to inquire into what the government is up to. It's the Senate's job to make sure the government of the day is held to account. It's the Senate's job to make sure bureaucrats in the public service are doing their job. It's the Senate's job to make sure that we inform ourselves of the decisions that are being made, the reasons uh, taxpayers' money is being spent uh, in certain, under certain programs and in certain ways. It is our job. It's actually why we have Senate inquiries. It's why we have Senate estimates. 
It is why we have a process in this chamber each sitting day to ask the questions the community needs to know and wants to know from the executive. That is our job. This government is obsessed with cover-up, with secrecy and has a sheer arrogance and contempt for not just the powers and the role of the Senate but also the public's right to know. It's the public's right to know how much this government wants to spend of their money on a, on a cosy deal negotiated by Barnaby Joyce at the time, the former water minister. The public has a right to know what Mr Joyce was up to. The public has a right to know what the impact of a piece of legislation passing this House would mean. That's why we have Senate inquiries. But this government is obsessed with secrecy and with hiding from public scrutiny. The fact that day after day after day in this place the government denies access to documents and information that this Senate asks for is a disgrace. The Senate is not a rubber stamp for the government. The government may be annoyed by the role that the Senate plays. They may wish that the Senate would just get out of the way. Well, tough luck. It is our job to hold this government to account. It is our job to make sure we are fully abreast of the decisions that are being made. It is our job to get the information that the public deserves to have. And in this particular case, what we know is that a special cosy deal that was negotiated by the former water minister, Barnaby Joyce, spent too much money purchasing the water. And this, of course, is the government that says that they are the arbiters of all wisdom when it comes to budgets and the economy. Mr Joyce crows about the fact he's the only accountant in this place. And yet he signed off on a deal where he spent too much money, more money than was required, for a company that his mate in Cabinet, Mr Angus Taylor, has connection to. It's all very cosy on that side, on the front bench. All very cosy indeed. No wonder this government doesn't want the public to know what has been going on. No wonder this government is obsessed with secrecy. It's all okay in their nice little cosy circle on the front bench to scratch each other's back and you know, pay each other's bills and snuggle, snuggle. But they just don't want the public to know what they're up to. And that is why in this place, Time after time after time, they are in contempt of Senate orders. This, this particular water purchase is just one example. Only in the last sitting period, this Senate asked for a number of reviews and reports in relation to the Water for Fodder program. And despite this Senate asking for that documentation to be tabled and released and given to us so that we could do our job, it wasn't. And in fact, it wasn't released until it was given as an exclusive drop to a journalist weeks later, after they had been in contempt of the Senate. So the Senate wasn't allowed the information, but they gave it to their mates at News Corp. It is contempt not just for the Senate, it is contempt for the Australian people. Because this is the Australian people's right to know what is going on and it is our job as senators to get them that information. Last week, this government blocked the Senate from sending a piece of legislation to a Senate inquiry. The government wants to rush in their environment law changes to make it easier for the big corporations to dig more mines cut down more trees and put more profits in the banks 
the bank balances of Rio Tinto and others. And this government stopped this Senate chamber from being able to refer this legislation to a simple inquiry. The arrogance and the cover-up of this government grows day by day. Well, the Australian community should be very, very wary that every time this government says no to information being revealed or a Senate inquiry occurring or a particular bureaucrat appearing before a Senate hearing, every time this government says no, the Australian people are becoming more and more aware that that means there is something being covered up. Of course, this government had stops federal and senior bureaucrats are appearing in front of state-based royal commissions even, whether that's the Ruby Princess or the Murray-Darling Basin Royal Commission. This government doesn't want the truth out there. They just say, no, we're not answering any questions. We're not even going to show up. The obsession with secrecy is palpable. And you've got to ask why. What are they hiding? Why are they covering this up? Why are they denying the Australian people's right to know what on earth is going on by denying this chamber the ability for us to do our jobs? Former Water Minister Barnaby Joyce obviously thought that this money was his own personal piggy bank. He could spend whatever he wanted, give it to his mates, no accountability. No wonder he didn't want the Senate to get into this. No wonder this government has covered up these documents for so long. These bogus claims of public interest immunity just to not answer questions is just becoming more and more of a joke. In my home state in South Australia, more and more voters are voting against the major parties. More and more voters are saying, no, we don't want this their way or the highway. We actually want people in this place who are prepared to hold the government to account, to keep the bastards honest. That is our job. And we will not be denied it. However long it takes, we will stand up and call you out. However long it takes, we will stand up and make sure the public know what is going on in their names and with their money. And you may try to gag debates, you may try and block Senate inquiries, you may try and stop documents from being released. But in the end, the truth always wins out. And we will hold you to account. And we will make sure the public has the full information of what you are doing in their name and with their money. You can't trust this government. You just can't trust them. You can't trust them with aged care. You can't trust them with issues of transparency. And you certainly can't trust them with the environment or water. We've got the, the, the most recent water minister, Keith Pitt, who's just carried on the long legacy of carrying that National Party mantle for this government, holding the water portfolio and keeping the public in the dark. And of course, what do we, what do we know that Mr Pitt is more focused on at the moment than doing his job as water minister? He's trying to knock off the current deputy prime minister. He wants his job. That's what he's more interested in. He is more interested in knocking off 
Mr McCormack so he can have the job for himself than he has anything to do with managing the Murray-Darling Basin or making sure that the public know what's going on. This government is obsessed with themselves. Obsessed with themselves. And why do they cover it up? Because they don't want anyone to know that all they care about is self-interest, paying off their mates and keeping each other in a job. It's pathetic. It doesn't matter how many times you deny us in this place as senators on the crossbench from asking the questions, we will keep asking. We will keep pushing for the information to be out there. The self-obsessed, secrecy-obsessed, power-obsessed government on this side Keep going. The public see through it. They, will, they see what you are doing. And ultimately, it will be your own downfall. But stopping this place from doing our job, no, nah, you're never going to get away with it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Daly. Thank you. Uh, and uh, just before I, I start through you, Chair, I note um, Senator O'Neill earlier today referred to uh, Senator Birmingham as the Minister for Water Resources in Northern Australia. He is not that minister. He represents that minister in this chamber, but he has his own uh, portfolio responsibilities, and I'd like to get that on the record. Um, talking about what we're talking about today, an order of a production of doc documents that was originally lodged in 2017, and at the time. The decision was made that parts of the information requested had an element of commercial sensitivity. And that seems to be what the furor is about. But let me explain why commercial sensitivity in an issue such as the water market is so real. Because back in 2010, the Financial Review noted that before the government began its buyback pro process, prices for permanent water licences were trading at around 50 per cent less than when the government started purchasing water. So government actions in the water market have an impact. So it is quite right that we take time between releasing commercial information about water prices to let the market restabilise. But I, I note Senator Patrick and his friends on the other side, they want to talk about the government doing dodgy deals and the government keeping things in house. Well, I note that there's been a lot of shared talking points on the other side today, and they have obviously done a deal. Because when they talk about water purchases and wanting openness and transparency about government water purchases, they've drawn a line. At 1 January 2017. Well, why is that? Why is that? Is that because back in uh, 2010, when the Financial Review did its investigation over the impact of government actions in the water market, they were particularly interested in a purchase by the government from the Twynham Agricultural Company? $303 million deal that the Financial Review found was at least a $40 million premium across all of the water licences purchased, one bulk lot of water licences. We, we are talking about licences across multiple valleys that Twina got a premium in order. In the Macquarie, they got a 9 per cent premium. In the Lachlan, they got a nearly 9, 10 per cent premium. Uh, sorry, that was the Guida. In the Lachlan, a 17 per cent premium. And in the Murrumbidgee, they got a premium. But the crossbenchers and the opposition don't want to investigate that water purchase. Why is that? Because that was a purchase done under former Water Minister Penny Wong. 
That, I agree with you, Senator Patrick. Two wrongs don't make a right. But what we have done as a government is learnt from the way Labor conducted their water purchases. In fact, Labor themselves changed their own water purchase processes to a round of blind tenders. And it was found that blind tenders did not have the same negative impact on the water market as, uh, as the open tenders that were so prevalent in the early days. But another water purchase that we could talk about um, is the purchase of Tural Station and Tural, Tural Station's water holdings, which was done back in 2008 with no tender. The day before a public auction, the New South Wales and federal governments. Yeah. Order. I, I blind tender, but this was done quietly and they turned Tural Station into a national park. One of the differences between the premium paid on Kiora's water licence and what we learnt from the Tural Station experience is that. Part of the contract for Kiora was they had to decommission their levy banks, on-farm levy banks, to ensure the water was returned. Because even though the purchase at Tural Station occurred in 2008, even as late as last year, 2019, with good rainfall for the first time in years up in the northern basin, and an estimate of 20, 23,000 megalitres of water from localised rainfall flowing down the Warrego River, a mere 600 megalitres a day managed to get from the other side of Tural Station because the levee banks are still in place. The levee banks were never removed. If we're talking about what is efficient use of taxpayers' money, we need to look at that. Because leaving those levy banks there has meant that no water flows back to the Darling, unlike then Minister Penny Wong's assertions that it would lead to at least 20 gigalitres a year in extra flows down the Darling River and 80 gigalitres a year when there's flood. That has not occurred. And that water still gets captured by the infrastructure on Tural Station which now the New South Wales government is looking at upgrading so that it can water the ecological wetlands that have evolved there over the hundred years of levee banks existing on that station. So was that a good and efficient purchase of water if the intention was to get water down the Darling? I mean, if the intention was to keep and maintain those wetlands on Tural Station, all well and good. But that was not how the deal was sold to the Australian public at the time. At the time, it was said that it was going to restore the health of the Darling River, and the water doesn't get to the Darling River. So let's think of that. We've had water purchases right back from 2008. So if we're going to investigate water purchases, we have to investigate every single one of them, not just pick a random date in time that suits the purposes of a conspiracy theory of the crossbench and the Greens, but look at all of them. Go right back to the very beginning of water purchases, because what we have seen time and time again, time Order. and time again, what we have seen Order. is water purchase tenders or water recovery programs that open up and the opportunistic ones take advantage of it. The stressed farmers who have their backs against the wall take advantage of it. But the people who are left hurting at the end of the day are the farmers that remain who, unlike Johnny Carl Betzer, can't take their $303 million and go and purchase land in South Africa and start farming in a whole new nation, who are left behind trying to compete in the water market against the uh, huge and enormous almond developments that have blossomed in South Australia, have blossomed in northwestern Victoria and are now blossoming in sections of New South Wales 
all downstream of natural delivery constraints like the Barma choke, like the Lower Goulburn choke. The water can't get through, but, and those people are left competing and struggling. Meanwhile, the purchase that Senator Patrick wants us to focus on today, the Kia Ora and Clyde purchases, are actually having great environmental outcomes. They are effective because, as I said before, they decommission the infrastructure. They now allow the natural flows to flow down the river. And we heard at Senate estimates this year that around 100 gigalitres made it to the internationally recognised wetlands uh, associated with Narran Lakes. And I might add that water delivery uh, had great outcomes for bird life, including the Australasian bittern. And where else do we get good outcomes for the Australasian bittern, which is an endangered species? On our rice farms. And the Rice Growers Association should be commended for the environmental and ecological work they've done to help with the Australasian bird breeding events in the Riverina, and now we're seeing it at the Narran Lakes wetlands, which is a fantastic use of environmental water. And it is getting down the river. The $80 million purchase of this river represented 30 per cent of the water needed to be recovered in that, in that valley. 30 per cent. We keep getting told by the Greens and, and by others that we need to get on and deliver the basin plan. So when we undertake a purchase that is consistent with the valuation, that requires decommissioning to ensure we get the environmental and ecological outcomes we want, and that we do a big lump sum at once, we're getting slammed for it. And let's also bear in mind how, how many water licence holders there are in the part of the river re relevant to Narran Lakes. There's four, and we've purchased one of them out. So when you have such a limited pool of contenders and no one else is expressing an interest, you can't go out, the way water works, you can't go out with a basin-wide water tender program and expect to get outcomes in the Narran Lakes when you're purchasing water from a river that goes nowhere near it. And it was purchased within the valuation, as highlighted by Senator Birmingham in his response. It was, it was a, a purchase that covered the, the value of the water, it covered the decommissioning, and it was a highly sensitive area of the river. Tick, tick, tick. It ticked every box. The only reason why Rex Patrick has a bee in his bonnet is because when he first lodged his order of production of documents, it was so close to the time of the purchase occurring, it was deemed commercially sensitive. And I get that. I support Order. ensuring that our government actions do not impact on the water market. And this is why the Commonwealth Environmental Water Pro Holder has open and transparent processes for operating in the market. This is why we saw such negative impacts on the water market through open purchase tenders, which even the Labor Party walked away from because the impact on the water market was negative and it was having a negative impact on our farmers and a negative impact on their ability to produce the food and fibre our nation needs. So I say, um, Senator Patrick, that I, I understand your frustration and obviously it's an ongoing frustration. As I said before, you've shared your talking points about all of the uh, FOI successes you've had over the past with all of your colleagues over on that side. However, when we're in government and we are responsible, we need to make sure that we proceed with caution so we don't negatively impact on the jobs and the businesses of the people we represent. Thank you. Thank, uh, sorry, Senator McKenzie, I do have Senator Roberts uh, via the, the virtual parliament. 
Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I seek to take note of the Minister's response. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I note that there is a reason this matter will not go away. And it is not just the dogged pursuit of this scandal by Senator Patrick, for which he is to be com complimented and commended. I've spent many weeks during the Murray-Darling Basin listening to locals who are telling me that this deal is crook. The government purchased water licences that had been assembled into one line by a local company called Eastern Australian Agriculture that Mr Angus Taylor formed and owned and registered in the Cayman Islands before selling out to unknown buyers. Mr Joyce, as minister, bought this for the government or on behalf of the government. This is the case of the Liberal and National Party working closely together. No split here, Mr Acting Deputy President. So let me share the, the context and facts so the people can make up their minds themselves. This was not real water, Mr Acting Deputy President. It was overland flow, meaning the water can only be taken if the condomine Boulogne Valley is in flood. By its very nature, overland flow is unreliable water. A qualifying flood occurs once every five years on average. So this is lower security than low security. This is why overland flow is the cheapest form of permanent water license, the cheapest. The Australian National Audit Office gave this water a very generous valuation in the range $1,100 to $2,300 per megalitre. It's also worth noting that the unredacted valuation document advised the Commonwealth that a price in the lower end of that range would be appropriate. Most likely because the actual value of this water in the market at the time was between $750 to $950 a megalitre. This is based on the only previous large sale of overland flow water in the Lower Boulogne in 2008 for just $800 a megalitre. This is also despite the water being valued on Eastern Australian agriculture's own books at just $950 a megalitre. In a move that makes a joke of good governance, the government paid $2,745 per megalitre. That's almost three times three times what it was valued on Eastern Australian agriculture's books and way over double what the Australian uh, auditor, Australian National Audit Office valued it as. Much attention has been given to who Eastern Australian agriculture are, so I don't need to go there as well. I would just like to point out that water flows into the Murray-Darling Basin in 2020 are exactly equal to their long-term average. The whole premise of this purchase of reduced inflows caused by climate change requiring urgent government action is statistical rubbish. It is nonsense. One Nation agrees that there are substantially reduced flows coming, coming from the northern rivers into the Darling and then into Menindee Lakes. This is not coming from climate change and it is not being caused by farmers taking water for which they have a legitimate license. These reduced flows are being caused by illegal floodplain harvesting. The Minister is not doing enough to restore the integrity of water licences in the basin and through that restore environmental flows that are being hijacked by illegal floodplain harvesting. The question now is, why did the government buy this water at all? The water was purchased by the Commonwealth towards environmental flows under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. The infant that was born out of the Water Act, water Act of 2007 that's now doing so much damage in this country. What does not make sense, Mr. President, is that flood flows are environmental flows. This periodic flooding waters native vegetation in an entirely natural cycle. Australian flora, as most people understand, has evolved to thrive on only receiving a good drink every few years, followed by long periods with only the natural rainfall to tide them over to the next flood. The government, has effectively bought environmental flows for use in a flood and paid $80 million of taxpayer money to do it. $80 million to pay for environmental flows in a flood. What extra good would that little bit of new environmental water do in amongst all that environmental flood water flowing down the river in a major flooding event? Nothing. It won't do a thing. 
The only way this water could have been useful to the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office is if the water was stored in a public dam and then released after the drought to produce environmental flows at the discretion of the Commonwealth Environmental Water Office. Once water is stored in this manner and released at the discretion of the owner, this is not overland water. That's general security water. So here's the problem with doing that. The license attached to overland water only allows the water to be, only allows that water to be used on the property that the license belongs to. It has no legal standing once it's removed from the property. The Commonwealth government was prepared to pay $1,800 per megalitre over the market, that's three times what the market, for 27,000 megalitres of water because it had every intention of quietly reclassifying overland water into general security water. Where are the approvals for that? Where's the business case? Where's the due diligence? Where is the environmental impact study to show that watering forests outside of their natural cycle does any good at all? The Office of the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder has been watering the balm of forest, for example, non-stop for 18 months now. It has never been allowed to dry out as it naturally would. The result, thanks to the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder, has been devastating to the nat natural environment. Trees are dying, native grasses are dying, the floor of the forest is black with rancid, dead water. At no time has this aspect of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan been reviewed. The Minister's Department has allowed water purchases that were not needed at a price that borders on criminal incompetence. The Minister's Department has treated the terms of their water licence as a joke and set out on an unsupervised, unaccountable vandalism of the natural environment. Meanwhile, the government's mates are laughing all the way to the bank. What a scandal. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And uh, I also seek to take note uh, in this debate around really listening to the contributions this morning. It is the implementation of the Murray-Darling Basin Plan that I was probably the only person in this debate that was actually in this place at that time when, under the former Labor government uh, in 2012, Basin State signed off on a plan to, as was made at the, at the time, achieve a triple bottom line. Remember the old, good old triple bottom line? You still included the economy and how it affected humans, uh, and you brought in consideration of environmental outcomes. And as I've seen this plan roll out in the communities that I represent in the, in the Southern Basin, obviously, but to a broader extent national party communities right throughout regional uh, eastern seaboard, uh, it hasn't achieved the outcomes that were sought. The environment has been uh, favoured, shall we say, over the um, economies, the health and the future of rural and regional basin communities. And the fun fact was this wasn't the, the Murray-Darling Basin Plan wasn't Moses coming off the mountain with a couple of tablets carved into stone, never to have been changed. The Ten Commandments back then are still the Ten Commandments today. That plan was meant to be adaptive and flexible because what we knew then was that we didn't have the data and the information available to be making such prescriptive uh, factors and, and, and prescriptive pulling numbers really out of the air in many cases about what the environment really needed, uh, what the irrigated uh, agriculture sector needed, etc. Because the reality is, as we've rolled out those infrastructure projects and we've gotten better uh, with our technology and we've gotten better with our metering of, of these waterways. We're getting a lot better data, and we're realising, uh, to Senator Roberts' point, that we may be watering environmental assets at a really, really bad time for those environmental assets. I've been on the ground uh, in the Barmer Forest. It's a, it's a tragedy what's happening there. Wet feet of gums in a country where you don't stay wet as a tree roots. Like it's not, we're, 
we haven't evolved that way. And yet, because again of uh, inappropriate application of the plan, uh, we're seeing really negative and unintended environmental, social and economic impacts uh, across the board. So I would be calling on all basin states to remember that the basin plan was to be adaptive and to not be evangelical and fundamentalist about how uh, this plan is, is rolled out. We've been highlighting in regional Victoria a whole lot of issues in the recent um, past. The conflict of interest for un unregulated water brokers, that there's scant rules to guard against behaviour, to manipulate water prices. Well-resourced corporate entities are gaining unfair advantage over family farms by manipulating the complexity of the water trading market. That's the reality. That's what, it's not me just saying. It's the actual ACCC review, the interim report recently handed down. The different regimes within basin states makes it very difficult for irrigators to ensure that the market works for them. And the hugely detrimental impact the expansion of the almond industry has had on delivering existing entitlement. And when we talk about, you might have heard in the debate today, uh, natural constraints such as the Barmer choke, etc. Trying to get uh, deliverable water that somebody has a share for down the river to be used in irrigated agriculture has been put under incredible pressure because we have allowed, um, we've allowed unmitigated development of almond plantations uh, downstream of the Varmachoke. And that's why we've been calling for a moratorium on those developments until we can actually understand the impact. Victoria state Labor government has done the right thing and has put a moratorium on it. But what that has meant is the South Australian and the New South Wales state governments uh, are now allowing those developments to go ahead. State Basin ministers could act right now to stop these developments occurring and putting untold pressure on the deliverability for in existing entitlement holders, and I call them to act in the interests of our communities out in regional uh, Australia. I guess we've all been calling that uh, there, this is complex, it is very opaque, and we do need to make sure the market is fairer, more transparent and better regulated, not just for the environment but for the over 9,200 irrigated agriculture businesses in the basin. The basin's home to 2.6 million people, producing billions of dollars worth of fabulous food product uh, that we export around the world. And to prioritise, as has been happening over the last uh, you know, eight years, to prioritise environmental assets over human outcomes, I think, is a great tragedy. We've heard a lot about um, the potential issues about oversight, etc. And it's not just the Senate. I'm a great believer in the Senate holding the executive to account, and we've all had some great examples of how that's occurred. But in our democracy, it's not just this chamber and our committees that can hold executive government to account. The fourth estate, the media, has a fundamental role in actually ensuring that the public debate is well informed. Uh, and I just am reminded throughout this debate about an article Aaron Patrick um, from the Fin Review wrote, which I think really highlights the importance. Um, it is topical on this, this particular issue itself, but it also the importance of the media. It's um, entitled Soggy Scandal Doesn't Hold Water. But the article outlines how distorted the debate has been publicly. So there were claims um, on Twitter, hello, um, tomorrow is the big day for transparency and accountability in our biggest river system. Uh, they're talking about the, auditor, the acting auditor general finishing examining uh, this particular issue uh, of the $3.1 billion program. But instead, and I quote from the article, acting auditor general uh, Mellor, who is accountable to parliament, not the government, concluded exactly the opposite. This wasn't the hidden smoking gun. Joyce was kept in the dark by his department on key facts. The price 
The prices weren't above commercial valuations, and the scheme, which is driven by environmentalists, has obtained almost all the 2,075 gigalitres of water targeted to revive wetlands and bird sanctuaries in Australia's most important river system. The Acting Auditor General's conclusion received cursory coverage, unlike the original Watergate story. And so here we have a journalist actually doing his job, reporting the facts, not letting emotions override and perceived political um, motives, being an activist, shall we say, but actually reporting on the facts uh, and ensuring that the public is kept informed of what the Acting Auditor General actually had to say about this. Um, and so I would uh, commend the media for continuing to do this. Look, I've been here as the Labor Party um, implemented the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, and their management of water and water recovery has been incredibly damaging to our communities. Remember the Swiss cheese effect? We had water being bought out by uh, the Labor Party Senate leader when she was uh, water minister, Senator Wong, in horrific volumes for an outrageous amount of money. Stranded assets as water was purchased here, there, everywhere, no strategic intent, uh, and we're still dealing with the fallout of those purchases uh, that long ago. She made the largest water purchase ever, $303 million in the Murrumbidgee. It was the Labor government who embarked on a campaign of damaging direct water purchases from our irrigators, and we've, the, there is a litany of responses. Our government has commissioned a piece of work uh, by Robbie Sefton on um, the socio-economic impacts of these buybacks on our communities, and it is clear, it is unequivocal. We know it because we live there, but it is here, tabled in the Senate, that it has had a significant detrimental impact on people's lives and livelihoods. You can't ignore the data and you cannot take any more water from our irrigated agriculture communities. The 450 gig will not be coming from our farmers, will not be coming from the Southern Basin irrigated agriculture communities. Enough is enough. You've taken enough. Uh, there will be no more. And we're unapologetic about uh, standing up for our regional communities. And what they do best, which is produce fabulous clean green food. So we're calling uh, for the Murray-Darling Basin Authority to be split into separate entities, scrapping the 450 gigalitres of water recovery, no new extraction licences to be issued, um, you know, unless we can actually guarantee there's no increased risk to existing entitlement holders. And state governments need to get serious about that. We are very concerned in the southern basin about the floodplain harvesting practices in the northern basin, which Senator uh, Roberts touched on, that do actually impact on flows through the system. We need to get serious, as the Inspector General for the Murray-Darling Basin um, Plan outlined in his report, that we need to meter that properly. We need to actually get the data and understand what's happening. because. There is a lot of mistrust, and rightfully so, through basin communities about the role of governments uh, in how this plan has been implemented. And the ACCC interim report that was just handed down recently, no surprises there to basin communities, no surprises uh, in its recommendations and further work plan on what's actually needed. We need to regulate these water brokers. We need to understand what's happening with foreign ownership of our most precious asset, water. And we need to make sure that we've got improved transparency. I want to see regional communities grow and prosper and thrive, and they cannot do that unless they have access to uh, water. It's that fundamental. And we need to make sure that as we roll out a plan that all state basin ministers agreed to in 2012 and the federal government at the time under Kevin Rudd, I think it was, but who could be sure? It did change a lot back then. Um, signed up to. I, I noticed you're smiling, Senator. You were there too. Um, but that it actually delivers on its intent. It was not ever meant to be a plan 
only for the environment and only for South Australia. It is a plan to continue the productive capacity of regional communities right throughout uh, the Murray-Darling. Thank you. Thank you, Senator McKenzie. Are there no other speakers on this matter? The question is that the Senate take note of the explanation by the minister. Those of that opinion say aye. Those uh, against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business orders of the day number one, coronavirus economic response package, JobKeeper payments amendment bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I rise to speak on the uh, coronavirus economic response package, JobKeeper payments amendment bill of uh, 2020. Um, the Labor Party is uh, supporting this bill, um, uh, but that's not to say we think that the uh, bill is perfect. It isn't. Um, we have some serious concerns about parts of the legislation. Uh, concerns my colleague <coughs> and very good friend, uh, Tony Burke, the Shadow Minister for Industrial Relations, outlined in some detail in his speech in the, uh, the other place. Um, <coughs> and let's start at the beginning, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, it was the Labor Party and the unions that first called on the government to implement a wage subsidy, an idea they ridiculed, uh, ridiculed until they saw the Centrelink queues, the tragic face of their original and wrong decision to simply consign workers onto welfare. Eventually they saw uh, what everyone else saw, including uh, business and employer groups, the need for a wage subsidy. So they came up with job seeker, uh, sorry, job keeper. <coughs> Uh, somewhat flawed and involving the biggest costing bungle in budget history, uh, but still a much needed lifeline to businesses and uh, millions of people employed by them in this country. But they said it would end in September. <coughs> Pretty optimistic uh, as it turns out. And Labor again, uh, with unions and employer groups, had to tell them uh, that it needed to be extended. Everyone could see that there would be no miraculous snapback, as uh, Prime Minister Morrison so famously boasted. Uh, but again they said no, and again, thankfully, they overcame their natural stubbornness and changed their mind. So we are supporting the legislation because we support the extension of JobKeeper. As the Shadow Treasurer uh, has often said, the JobKeeper wage subsidy is a very good idea being badly implemented. Too many Australians are left out and left behind, some accidentally uh, but regrettably many quite deliberately. From day one we've said that the scheme should be better targeted so that the people who really need it uh, can get it but we don't waste taxpayers' money. And we were very concerned about the government's plan to rip this support out from the economy for all workers and industries at the end of September. It made no sense at all. So we welcome the extension of JobKeeper for a further six months. However, as I said in my <coughs> earlier, despite completely supporting uh, the extension of JobKeeper, Labor has some serious concerns about the bill. That's because the government has seen fit to introduce some extreme elements into the bill. I'm referring to the uh, uh, extension of the emergency industrial relations powers to businesses who no longer qualify for government JobKeeper support. As expected, the bill contains provisions that ex uh, extend the timing of the JobKeeper enabling stand-down direction that are currently set, out, set to re be repealed on uh, September 28th. These provisions were included in the original JobKeeper legislation and back in April we were told they were critical to ensure the JobKeeper payments could be operationalised and that these powers could only be used for that purpose. Now, In this bill, <coughs> the government wants us to agree to those same emergency powers being extended to employers who had previously qualified for JobKeeper. Uh, but were now no longer eligible, the so-called legacy employers. By the very definition, legacy employers are those the government 
considers having recovered sufficiently to no longer need government support. And although they are sufficiently recovered to no longer need government support, they can use the fact that they may still have a 10 per cent decline to cut uh, hours of their workers by as much as 40 per cent. Mr Acting Deputy President, the government has not made the case as to why these extraordinary emergency industrial relations powers are necessary at this time. That is, uh, why Labor uh, will be moving to ensure only businesses still eligible for JobKeeper can um, access these extreme powers. The government claims these powers are modified and have safeguards. One of these supposed safeguards is that the employer cannot reduce a worker's hours by more than 40 per cent. But this so-called so safeguard Will, resi will result in many low-paid workers, including in the retail industry, <coughs> experiencing a very substantial pay cut. A 40 per cent reduction in hours for workers <coughs> on the minimum wage would mean that they would lose $300 a week from their normal wage uh, of currently $750 per week under the job seeker, uh, the job keeper rate. And there are many workers who are paid just above the minimum wage. In fact, anyone earning less than uh, $32 per hour who has their hours cut by 40 per cent will be worse off than they have been under the JobKeeper Mark I. How is this fair? Uh, I would ask uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. This creates a situation where a worker, at a time when the businesses they work for is doing better, uh, will seek to have their pay cut. Um, the attempt to extend emergency industrial powers to employers who don't receive JobKeeper is of extreme concern to the Labor Party. Back in April, when we were passing the original JobKeeper legislation, uh, we were told these flexibilities were critical to, uh, the opera to operationalise the JobKeeper payments. We were told that these provisions could only be used by JobKeeper eligible businesses. Now we're told it's essential uh, that it be extended to businesses no longer eligible for JobKeeper. Um, we can see what's next. That is the government testing out their future plans for industrial relations, a trial for how their flexibility dream uh, might look like and work. <coughs> And next, the government will move for them to be made uh, a permanent feature of this legislation. The government will claim <clears throat> that it's all in the name of saving jobs, when it is in fact an attack on decent, secure jobs of ordinary Australians. That's why Labor will move its amendments, <clears throat> firstly to remove the extension of JobKeeper flexibilities to the employers the government themselves have determined no longer uh, need assistance, uh, and for which the government <coughs> has made no case. And second, should that not be agreed to, we will move an amendment that ensures no employee who has had their hours cut will drop below the job, seek, uh, the job keeper rate. We, we sincerely hope senators support this amendment to protect some of our lowest paid workers from bearing the cost of a business recovery when the government has wiped its hands of those people. Australians have worked together to, com to combat the virus, but uh, <clears throat> more work must be done by the Morrison government to ensure that our hardest hit Australians are not left out and left behind in this recovery. Thank you, Senator Farrell. I think, Senator Faruqi, that you are next up, and uh, while I'll just let you uh, walk to your position and I'll speak slowly uh, while you're doing that. Uh, are you at a point of order? Yes. Uh, yes. I just wanted to not yeah. call your attention no, to anything. Excellent. That's, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mr Acting nice Deputy President. Nicely. Thank you. Senator Faruqi. I rise on behalf of the Greens to speak to the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020. The bill extends the prescribed period of operation for the coronavirus payment framework 
which allows JobKeeper to be extended until March of next year. It also enables the ATO to share some JobKeeper payment information with the Commonwealth, state and territory government agencies. The bill extends the temporary JobKeeper Fair Work provisions in Part 6-4C of the Fair Work Act, except for those relating to annual leave until next March. Much of the detail will be le left up to delegated legislation. The Greens have been supportive of the JobKeeper wage subsidy and are on record having pushed for a wage guarantee from very early on in the COVID-19 crisis. My Greens colleague in the other place, the member for Melbourne, Adam Band, said in speaking to this bill last week, when the crisis started to hit, the Greens were the first party in Parliament to call for some form of wage and job guarantee. We made it very clear that the government's initial response shoveling billions out of the door to help business was only part of the response. Has JobKeeper been a success? Well, it's been really a mixed bag. There's no doubt that millions of people who would otherwise be out of work have benefited from the scheme. Plenty of businesses have accessed it and it has allowed them to stay afloat and keep their staff on board. This is, of course, a good thing. However, there are many cracks in the system and things haven't been smooth sailing. Unconscionably, temporary visa holders were locked out of the scheme. This set Australia apart from other countries in how we have taken care of members of the community who don't happen to be citizens or permanent residents. It has created a tiered system of residence in this country. And frankly, we should be ashamed. Businesses with reliable, hardworking, highly skilled employees have been unable to receive JobKeeper payments for their staff. It's nonsensical and it's spiteful and just plain wrong. Also infamously locked out have been casuals employed for less than 12 months, arts and creative industry workers and our public university staff. And shamefully, early learning and care workers were the first to be kicked off the JobKeeper payment last month. It was reported last week that Crown Resorts has received at least $111 million in JobKeeper payments, but our public universities have not received a single cent. This chamber very narrowly voted down my disallowance motion, which would have scrapped the rules, excluding some of the universities from accessing JobKeeper payments. But the government dug its heels in, and university job losses continue to mount in the thousands upon thousands. And I have to say, it has been incredibly devastating for our universities, who are already gra grappling with the loss of international students um, that will cause financial pay pain, not only this year, but the next few years, and possibly much of this decade. On top of that, we have the government choosing this moment to introduce a bill that will cut university funding even more. You really can't make this stuff up. Let me be clear, the Greens support the extension of JobKeeper. There is no other option than to continue to provide a wage subsidy. JobKeeper has provided much needed support to many thousands of people. But there were real problems and gaps in the original package, and there are big flaws in this bill as well. We have serious concerns with this bill, and the related proposals. As I understand the Labour Party and others on the crossbench uh, will do, I will also uh, move amendments uh, in the Senate to make this bill more equitable for people. And I will identify some of these issues that I've highlighted at this point. And I will have to say more about the legislation at the committee stage. This bill creates what is effectively a new category of employee. This is someone who is employed by a business that was eligible for JobKeeper payments and could access the emergency industrial relations powers that give businesses the power to reduce their hours. But now the business turnover has improved somewhat and they are no longer eligible for wage subsidy. In this scenario, the government won't provide JobKeeper for the business, but will continue to allow them to follow the emergency powers and reduce their employees' hours. Um, as my colleague Adam Band put it in the other place, there will be a category of businesses that, on the one hand, the government thinks are doing so well that they don't need to give JobKeeper to their employees. 
but on the other hand, are apparently doing so badly that they can cut their employees' pay. This is perverse and, and a cynical outcome, and we will be looking at amendments to change this at the committee stage. The bill would force workers to foot the bill for businesses recovery by letting legacy employers cut workers' hours by up to 40 per cent. For shift workers, it would mean the loss of even more than 40 per cent of their income if they lose hours subject to penalty rate loading. For a government to do this in the midst of a recession is nothing short of cruel. Another objectionable part of the new JobKeeper proposal I would point out is its creation of a two-tiered system of payment where people employed at less than 20 hours per week will receive a much lower payment than those employed with more hours. Those who are far more likely to be in insecure or part-time work are far more likely to be women, and they will see their payments cut. Women are already bearing the brunt of the economic impacts of the pandemic, so much so that economists have said we are in a pink-collar recession. So much so that women have lost their jobs twice as fast as men when the economy was shut down. Women are overrepresented as casual workers and in industries most affected by shutdowns like retail and hospitality. Women are underrepresented in the Order. few Senator industries. Senator Faruqi, you will be in continuation. We will go to questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. How many residents in aged care have passed away due to COVID-19, and when did the minister first become aware that 33 deaths of older Australians in residential aged care had not been reported until today? Why did it take until August for the Commonwealth to change its reporting obligations for deaths in aged care facilities? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, so the number of Australians who have passed away as of 8 a.m. this morning uh, in, in residential aged care is 457, uh, Mr President, unfortunately, and each one of those uh, is an absolute tragedy, and my condolences go to um, every family uh, of those who have passed away from COVID-19 to date. Mr President, uh, for a period of time now, the uh, Australian government has been working with the Victorian government through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre to reconcile the data uh, that is held in the Victorian systems with, with respect to infections and also deaths. Uh, as of the 12th of August this year, by agreement with the Victorian government through the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, we have been using the Victorian data uh, and understanding that uh, that data would need to be reconciled. Uh, I, I became aware of the difference in the numbers this morning uh, when we were advised from Victoria that they would be announcing that reconciliation. I wasn't aware of what uh, the, the difference in numbers might be specifically until this morning and I received that advice through from uh, the Secretary of my department this morning. Uh, and uh, my understanding, Mr President, is that the reconciliation process and the recording of COVID-19 uh, deaths in aged care uh, will continue. The Victorians are still working on that process as they manage the uh, process through their FES system and their births, deaths and marriages records. Uh, and so uh, we're uh, working closely with them through VARC to continue that reconciliation process. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. Today, the Minister for Health announced additional funding to, to uh, support the COVID-19 aged care crisis. Why has it taken the deaths of more than 457 Australians in aged care and seven months of the COVID-19 crisis for the Morrison government to finally provide these resources? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Well, Mr President, uh, the announcement that Minister Hunt and I made today was an extension of existing programs uh, to provide continued support to the aged care sector through the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, so, the, the first round of the, so the first round was of the uh, uplift for uh, aged care providers was announced back in May. 
the retention bonus for uh, workforce was announced in March. The program to ap apply for one worker, one site was announced uh, in conjunction with the Victorian government last month. And so the, the measures that we announced today were actually an extension, a continuation of our plan to help the aged care sector work, manage through the COVID-19 outbreak. Senator Gallagher, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, considering tracking deaths from COVID-19 should be a critical element of basic pandemic planning, how on earth is it possible that you did not know exactly how many older Australians in residential aged care had passed away from COVID-19 until today? Senator how Col oh. Order. My apologies. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I explained in my answer to the primary question, uh, by agreement with the Victorian government, we have since the 11th of August been using the Victorian data to reconcile Order. deaths in Victoria, Mr President. Uh, we, we had an understanding that there were some differences in the data, and Mr President, that those, dif well, those differences have actually been publicly reported for a period of time. So, so we, are, we, we this, the Australian government and the Victorian government, understood that there would be required to be a reconciliation to understand that. Uh, we've provide, we made a requirement that aged care providers report all of that information into the Victorian system, Mr. President. And so that work has continued cooperatively. Uh, there are some differences in the way that uh, some of these, some of the deaths are classified. Uh, and we continue to work our way through that process, Mr. President, cooperatively with, with Victoria. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator McKenzie. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Last Friday at the Daily Telegraph's Bush Summit, the Prime Minister acknowledged the heavy burden of restrictions on Australians, particularly in regional communities, who are limited in seeking access to essential and life-saving health care, education, or work and for farmers their own property to manage crops and care for livestock. As a strong critic of the one-size-fits-all approach taken by state and territory governments on border closures, I welcome the Prime Minister's call for relative risks to be assessed on the whole. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the steps the National Cabinet is taking to secure a national approach from state and territory governments on the definition of hotspots. Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I thank Senator McKenzie uh, for that question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Australia is not built uh, to have internal borders. That is why our government is focused on keeping Australia as open as possible while managing the health and economic challenges that COVID-19 presents. Border management must continue to be informed by the public health advice, which is why we are determined to get a hotspot definition based on that medical advice. Based on that medical advice. National Cabinet Order. has asked the Australian Health Protection Principal Committee Order. to develop a common understanding of a hotspot across jurisdictions. The IHPPC will consider appropriate movement restrictions relating to a hotspot based on medical advice. This work is ongoing and will provide people who are living in those areas clear guidance on where and when they can access health services or where restrictions may mean they have to find alternative arrangements. States do not have to wait, of course, for national cabinet to bring forward Order. common sense, practical and compassionate solutions uh, to their border Order issues. On my left. As Pratt. New South Wales, as the uh, Barry Jicklin governor in New South Wales has already Senator shown Pratt. by announcing a border bubble with Victoria, States can enact sensible exemptions, compassionate exemptions, common sense, practical exemptions right now by listening to and working with local communities in affected areas. The health challenge is significant, but we ask all state governments to continue to work constructively to resolve issues affecting the economic recovery. We need to ensure relevant exemptions are in place and applied consistently and efficiently so that disruptions to critical services for border residents and all other Australians are minimised as much as possible. We are doing everything possible to help our border communities and the agricultural industry in particular get through this pandemic, and we call Order. on all Senator to Coleman. join us in that effort. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you. The impacts on border residents being unable to access essential health care, jobs 
or schooling is continue to de detrimentally impact many residents and their families. Is the minister aware of any risks to achieving a nationally clear, scientifically sound, fair and reasonable approach to defining hotspots? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, we have seen widely reported examples of hardship order. for residents Senator in rural and regional border communities. Such impacts should, of course, be minimised whenever possible. Uh, decisions Kendealy. on border restrictions must be informed by public health advice. As I said last week, ultimately these are matters for the states and territories, but it is up to them to set out the medical advice, informing their decisions Senator and to ensure there is a genuine public health upside in return for the restrictions and costs imposed Order. on individual Australians and on our communities. There is no script or no rule book on how best to deal with this pandemic, but it is critical that decisions are made order on the basis on my left. of advice. Sorry, Senator Cormann, I have Senator Billick experts. on a point of order. On a point of order, Senator Billick. Uh, Mr. President, I really sincerely cannot hear what the minister is saying, even though I might not want to hear it. I might not like uh, it. I, and I, 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 from I, that side. Well, I, I can only order. Well, that's a charming episode of finger pointing there across the chamber from both sides. I might say. Um, order. Interjections. There's a lot of noise coming from the chamber. I was attempting to not interrupt the speaker and call order. Please show your colleagues some courtesy. Senator Cormann. The National Cabinet has asked the IHPPC to develop the consist a consistent approach to hotspot management and, and to ensure that the needs of border residents are pro properly catered for. As the Prime Minister said on Friday, there will be a hotspot definition. Hopefully, it's a definition agreed by the states and territories. Alternatively, there will be a Commonwealth definition based on science and Order, evidence. Senator Cormann. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you. I acknowledge the Nationals' calls for an agricultural workers' code as a priority and welcome the Prime Minister's announcement at the Bush Summit on progress being made to give effect to this very important initiative. Can the minister please outline the intended protections of an agricultural workers' code and update the Senate on the progress of this work? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, the Australian government recognises the challenges that communities and farmers have faced over the past few months as a result of COVID-19 and domestic movement restrictions. On 21 August, the National Cabinet agreed to the development of an agricultural workers' code to be considered at National Cabinet at its next meeting. The Code recognises the importance of ensuring that farmers, seasonal workers, agricultural services such as vets and agricultural business can continue to operate in a COVID-19 safe manner. Uh, the Minister for Agriculture, Water and Environment is leading the development of the Code, which would be enforced by states and territories through, the public health, through their public health orders. The fundamental objective of the Code will be to provide consistency across jurisdictions in the application of movement restrictions, uh, including any national hotspots definition developed, and indeed simple and practical definition of critical primary industries, and set out appropriate measures necessary to manage COVID-19 risks. Order. As always, we we'll focus on protecting people's livelihoods. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Today, the Minister for Health announced additional funding to stop the COVID-19 aged care crisis. Why has it taken the deaths of more than 457 Australians in aged care and seven months of the COVID-19 crisis for the Morrison government to finally provide these additional resources? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks for the question, Senator Keneally. Um, as I said in the previous question, Minister Hunt and I announced this morning uh, $563 million to extend existing measures that were, um, were supporting the aged care sector. Uh, the, the suggestion that we've waited until now, uh, quite frankly, um, doesn't, doesn't make sense given that these measures, Mr President, were put in place to support the sector. Uh, and what we did this morning, today, was, was we actually extended existing measures to continue the support that we already had in place for an additional six months in most of those cases, Mr. President. So, early in the pandemic, we made some decisions, uh, we resourced those decisions, and we announced the funding to support those. Today, what we did was to extend those provisions, given the fact that we remain in a COVID-19 pandemic. We have particular circumstances with respect to Victoria that require additional support. And the sector nationally 
remains under pressure. So what we did, Mr. President, was we announced an extension to existing programs so that the support required from the, for the sector throughout the pandemic, uh, the support required as part of our plan, could be continued for a further period of time so that, uh, so, so that the sector did have the support required and continues to have the support required as the pandemic continues. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. Given the minister admitted he only realised he hadn't got it right as a result of the outbreak at St Basil's in July, six months into the COVID-19 crisis, will he guarantee that the funding announced today by Minister Hunt will be enough to get it right? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Again, Senator Keneally chooses to misuse my words in a way that I didn't utter them, and it demonstrates the continued dishonesty of the Labor Party in asking questions in this place, Mr President. Mr President, the, the announcements that I made today with Minister Hunt are a continuation of existing programs, Mr President. They're a continuation of existing programs and existing support that was put in place to support the sector through the COVID-19 outbreak. And we will continue to provide resources, as I've said, Mr President, on a number of occasions uh, through the duration of the pandemic outbreak. We will continue to provide additional support as required. We got to a, a stage, Mr President, where the existing reports were due to expire, supports were due to expire. Uh, we assessed that they needed to be continued, Mr President, so we made the decision to continue them. And Minister Hunt and I announced them today. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. In October last year, in October last year, the government received the interim report of the Royal Commission into Aged Care, and it was titled "Neglect." Why is the minister continuing to withhold the resources necessary to implement these recommendations from the report titled "Neglect" and prevent further neglect and avoidable deaths in the aged care system? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the government has not withheld support from the sector. Uh, the, announcements, the announcements that we made today, Mr. President, were specifically related to assisting the sector manage their way through COVID-19. But, Mr. President, uh, on the suggestion of the Royal Commission and uh, coming out of the report that was made by the uh, Royal Commission in November last year, there were a number of additional resources supplied to the sector that the Royal Commission suggested. And that included an additional 10,000 home care packages. It included some resources to ensure that medication management and the, and the use of uh, chemical restraints were minimised. It included some funding to ensure that young people going into residential aged care were minimised. So, Mr President, uh, we have continued to put additional resources to the aged care sector. And as the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, and as I've said, we will continue to do that at every opportunity. Order, Senator Colbeck. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. President. And my question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Can the Minister please outline how the Morrison government is extending and continuing its support for the aged care sector as part of our plan to assist the sector in responding to community transmission of COVID-19? Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President, uh, and thanks, Senator Van, for the question. Mr President, today the government announced a further $563 million in a package of measures to support senior Australians and aged care from COVID-19. These additional targeted measures mean that since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr President, the Australian government has provided over $1.5 billion to support senior Australians in aged care. This includes continuation of measures to support providers and the su support the choice of senior Australians. As part of this package, up to $245 million will be provided for a second payment of the lump sum COVID-19 support payment, Mr. President, to residential aged care providers. Residential providers in, uh, in metropolitan areas will get $975 per resident, and all other providers will receive $1,435. Dollars, Mr. President. This funding will be used by providers to fund and support enhanced infection control capability, including through an on-site clinical lead 
quite importantly. Funding will also, may also be used to address other COVID-19 related costs, such as increased staffing costs, communications with families and managing visitation arrangements. Mr. President, this additional support will, uh, will be provided to all mainstream residential, residential aged care providers, also to Indigenous and multi-purpose services. The Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission will be undertaking risk assessments and audits to ensure that providers are prepared for an outbreak. This funding supports providers with this preparedness. Mr. President. In addition to the risk assessments and audits, providers will report in their end of year financial year returns on how the support was used in overcoming additional COVID-19 related costs. Senator Van, a supplementary question. Can the minister please outline how the government is continuing to support the aged care workforce at this time? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the package announced today further builds on specific measures that we've announced previously to support the aged care workforce at this time, Mr. President. Continuing the aged care workforce uh, retention payment program for eligible frontline direct care staff, recognising the particular role Order. that they play in looking after our most uh, uh, vulnerable Australians, Mr. President. So this, the, we're extending the bonus for a further period to support direct care workforce and encourage retention at a cost of $154.5 million. In addition, we're supporting aged care providers and workers who may be affected by the single worker, single site principle, Mr. President, in hotspot areas in regions in Victoria with up to $92.4 million in funding. Mr. President, we're also extending this support from an initial eight weeks to 12 weeks in recognition of the prolonged situation in Victoria and to allow providers to claim for a longer period. Uh, Order, Senator enable... Colbeck. Senator Van, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the government's further ongoing support for senior Australians in residential aged care who are homeless, seniors at risk of homelessness, and also Indigenous Australians in aged care? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Van, for the question. The additional $245 million Mr. President, of funding to the sector includes additional support that will be provided to all mainstream residential aged care, the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Flex, uh, Flexible Aged Care Program, NATSIFLEX, Indigenous Program and Multipurpose Services. This measure also extends the 30 per cent increase in the viability supplement for both residential care and home care and the homeless supplement in residential care by a further six months at a cost of $26 million. The increase in the viability supplement will also assist home care providers uh, and their consumers. Mr. President. In addition, the Australian government has committed an additional $71.4 million to support older, older Australians who temporarily relocate from residential aged care facilities to the community to live with their families as a precaution against COVID-19. Senator Seward. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Minister, through you, President, next month, when there Order. will be 1.8 million people on the job seeker payment and youth allowance, the government will cut the coronavirus supplement by $300 a fortnight. Last week, Treasury predicted the effective unemployment rate will hit 13 per cent by the end of the year. How many people are expected to default on their mortgage and be in rental stress when, firstly, the supplement reduces by $300 a fortnight in September and, secondly, if the job seeker rate goes back to $40 a day in December? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Seward, for your question. Uh, and can I also acknowledge that you announced your uh, retirement at the end of this session, uh, come the end of this parliament, and, uh, and acknowledge the great work that you've done on behalf of the people you represent. Um, in, in response to your, the principal part of your question in relation to changes that are being made to both the, the job seeker and job keeper payments, but particularly the job seeker payment at the end of September, um, Senator, you and as well as everybody else was in this chamber uh, back in March when we made the decision to put in place the coronavirus supplement for a period of six months. It was very clear at the time we were voting for a temporary payment. In July, um, a decision was made by the government that we believe that the time 
for the removal of that temporary supplement um, was not at the end of September. And so we have sought, and through an instrument in this place, to extend the elevated level of support to those people who find themselves unemployed past the end of September until uh, December. At the same time, we've also put in place uh, an income, in, uh, increased income-free area, because we recognise, Senator Seward, that the jobs market is still very shallow, but it is starting to open up. And we want to encourage people who find themselves unemployed as a result of coronavirus to actually take the steps to start re-engaging with the workforce so that we can hopefully get them re-employed as quickly as possible. And the one thing that we do know <clears throat> Senator Seward, on the point of order. I understand I did a bit of preamble, but we're now down to 30 seconds left in the time to answer the question. The minister's come nowhere near my question, which was how many will be defaulting or in rental stress when the supplement is cut? Okay. Senator Seward, no. I'll say again. Um, when questions contain a preamble, the minister can be directly relevant to part of a question. That was the second part of your question. The minister is being directly relevant to other parts of your question, in my view. Um, Senator Seward, a minister can be directly relevant to assertions and a preamble to a point made at the end of a, of a longer question that is within standing orders. So I can't direct the minister how to answer a question nor which part of it to answer. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And, and as I said, Senator Seward, um, past the end of September, we are intending to continue to provide elevated levels of support to people who find themselves unemployed, whether they were unemployed before the coronavirus um, hit or as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, because we on this side of the chamber understand we have a responsibility to balance uh, providing the level of elevated support people need, as well as making sure that we provide the incentive for them to re engage with the workforce because the best Order, thing we can Senator do Rustin, is get them back the into work. Expired. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Uh, thank you. I'd just no. like to say, thank the Minister for her comments about me uh, retiring at the end of my uh, term. Um, I'd just like to reassure the chamber that I'll be here for quite a while to give you that. Uh, hold you to account. The latest research from ANU shows that the coronavirus supplement almost eliminated poverty amongst job seeker recipients and the reduction of the job seeker payment will mean that 740,000 people are pushed into poverty. Minister, how is this conscionable? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and I have no doubt that you will continue to hold us to account in the time that you have left here, Senator Seward. Um, but um, in relation to your question around the elevated levels of support that were put in place back in March by this government, um, it was clear at the time that we recognised that we had before us an absolutely unprecedented situation. And we put in place these supports to help Australians to get from one side of the coronavirus pandemic to the other. Clearly, as the pandemic has rolled out, we have seen different things happen in different states. But the one thing that we have started to see in the majority of Australia, our economy is starting to open up again and we're starting to see jobs created. It is the responsibility of government, as I said before, to manage the balance between providing elevated levels of support in recognition that people are still doing it quite tough as a result of the coronavirus. Um, coronavirus pandemic, but at the same time, we need to make sure that people understand they need to re-engage with the workforce because getting a job Order, is the Senator best way Rustin. out. Senator C, with a final supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Through you, uh, Mr. President, Minister, at the COVID hearing not long ago, you said that to make any changes to the ongoing structural nature of our welfare system when we're in such a state of uncertainty would be completely irresponsible. How is it irresponsible to guarantee that you won't drop people back into poverty on $40 a day? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Um, and I, th I think that everybody in this chamber recognises that we are in quite unprecedented times, and we are still in them. There is absolutely no doubt that the end of this corona pande coronavirus pandemic, when it's going to end and what it's going to look like when it ends, is still remains something that we are unsure of. So, therefore, the government has remained flexible and to make sure that the temporary nature of the, the provisions that we put in place recognise the constantly changing conditions that this pandemic is presenting to the Australian 
Australian economy. You only have to look in Victoria to realise that there we have a particular set of circumstances down there, uh, and we've seen the announcements today in aged care, to directly deal with those particular instances. But what we have to do as a government is that we have to manage our way through this pandemic, putting in place the provisions that are required at the time. And when we get to a situation where we understand what the new normal looks like, that is the time to make structural change. Senator Farrell. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Uh, on 27 February, uh, Sport Australia told the Select Committee on the Administration of Sports Grants it would provide the legal advice um, underpinning former Minister Mackenzie's authority to make decisions in the Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program. But last week, the Sports Australia uh, informed the Select Committee it would not provide the advice as the Minister for Sport had made a claim of public interest immunity. When did the Minister make that decision and on what basis does he make the claim of public interest immunity? Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the uh, decision to make uh, a public Im interest immunity uh, exemption was made some time ago, Mr. President. And, uh, Mr. President, on behalf of the government, I claimed public interest immunity in relation to Support Australia's uh, legal advice, as the release of this advice could prejudice uh, pending legal proceedings, Mr. President. Uh, additionally, it's been the long-standing practice of Australian governments over many decades on both sides of politics, Mr. President, to uh, not to disclose the fact or content of privileged legal advice. This practice has previously uh, been outlined by uh, many colleagues in the chamber, uh, including the Honourable Gareth Evans QC, uh, who said, or, nor is it the practice or has it been the practice over many years for any government to make legal, available legal advice from its legal advisers made in the course of normal decision-making process of government. For good practical reasons associated with good government and also as a matter of fundamental principle, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, in my view, my claim of public interest immunity was based on good and sound grounds, uh, long standing a practice on governments, of governments from both persuasions of politics. Uh, and, Mr. President, uh, the government maintains that it's not in the public interest to depart from this established position. It's Order. integral that privileged legal Senator advice provided to the Commonwealth remains confidential. Order. Senator Farrell, a supplementary question? Yes, I do have one. Thank you, uh, Mr President. Uh, in March, the minister admitted he had been coached by Mr Morrison's staff before appearing to give evidence uh, on the sports rort scandal. Has the minister or his office discussed the public interest immunity claim with Mr Morrison or his office? And if so, why? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Firstly, can I reject the assertion about any activity or conversation between uh, my office, me, and the Prime Minister's office? Yeah. Mr. President. So I, 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 reject, I reject the assertion Order. of being coached. And again, Mr. President, Labor continue to make things up, Mr. President. And that's just because Labor says it doesn't make it so, Mr President. Yes, I had a meeting with the Prime Minister's office, uh, but it wasn't about coaching, Mr President. Mr President, uh, I, made, on my I made the decision on to my... claim public immunity, Mr President. Order. I made... Order on my left. Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. I can't hear you due to the interjections. Please continue. Mr President, I made the decision to claim public, public inter, interest immunity based on well-founded grounds and hysterical, historical context of, uh, de, of decision makers in this parliament over a Order, considerable Senator period Colbert, of time. Order, time for the answers expired. Senator Farrell, a final supplementary question. Uh, yes, I do have another question. Thank you, Mr uh, President. Uh, why is the minister refusing to explain to Australians the basis upon which the government claims that former Minister Mackenzie had authority to make decisions under the sports rorts scheme. Uh, what is he hiding? Senator Colbeck. 
Mr. President, uh, as I've said in the two former questions, uh, I claimed public interest immunity over legal advice on long-standing grounds that have been applied by governments of both political persuasions over a considerable period of time, uh, and I believe, Mr. President, uh, that I had good grounds to do that, and I made the public interest Im immunity question uh, decision appropriately. We're going to Senator Roberts remotely. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Minister Senator Cormann. In 2016, 17, 19 and 20, I cross-examined CSIRO's climate research team on four presentations to me. That revealed CSIRO has never said carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. CSIRO admitted today's Order. temperatures are not unprecedented. Order. Sorry. Um, I've asked repeatedly last week for interjections to not occur, and they came from both sides of the chamber, and I might say they, com they commenced on the opposition side. They should not have been responded to from the government side. Senator Roberts, I'm, go I'm going to ask for stone silence in the chamber, and I'm going to ask Senator Roberts to repeat his question so that the minister may hear it and address it. Senator Roberts, can you please recommence your question? From the start, Mr President? Yes, from the start. Thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. In 2016, 17, 19 and 20, I cross-examined CSIRO's climate research team on four presentations to me. That revealed CSIRO has never said carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger. CSIRO admitted today's temperatures are not unprecedented. CSIRO's cited papers do not show rate of temperature rise is unprecedented. CSIRO has never quantified any specific impact from human carbon dioxide. CSIRO relies on unvalidated, erroneous models. CSIRO relied on discredited papers. CSIRO showed little understanding of papers cited. CSIRO admits to no due diligence on reports and data. CSIRO allows politicians to misrepresent CSIRO without correction. Fifteen highly respected international scientists verified our conclusions. What is the basis for the government's climate and energy policies? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr uh, President. Uh, the basis uh, of our commitment is, uh, as, as part of the international community, doing our bit to help reduce global greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, that's the basis. We are committed uh, to a sensible uh, climate change policy which uh, appropriately balances environmental protection uh, with um, economic responsibility. That has always been our position. Uh, and uh, as a country, uh, we uh, have not only met, but we, are, we have exceeded or are exceeding our emissions reduction targets uh, agreed to in Kyoto, and, and we are on track and have a plan uh, to meet our emissions reduction targets uh, agreed to in Paris. I mean, we are a good global citizen. Uh, there is a global challenge that uh, needs to be addressed, and we are doing our bit sensibly and responsibly and proportionately. Uh, to contribute uh, to meeting that challenge. In relation to the CSIRO specifically, uh, the CSIRO is a national treasure. It undertakes essential science and research which improves our lives and helps grow our economy. CSIRO stands behind its researchers and the integrity of the research produced by them. Uh, they have demonstrated uh, record, their demonstrated record of scientific excellence is underpinned by their commitment to the full and transparent participation uh, in the scientific peer review process, which results in evidence-based science of the highest quality, including making data publicly available. Uh, CSIRO is in the top 0.1% of the world for its four core fields of science and in the world's top 1% for the other 14 fields. They rank in the top three of the world, uh, world's national science agencies for impact. And I note that uh, the CSIRO has provided briefings to Senator Roberts uh, in the past, and I also note that Senator Roberts has asked a number of questions which CSIRO has responded to and will, of course, continue to respond to uh, moving forward. Um, I hope that that appropriately addresses uh, Senator Roberts' question. I, I thank senators for their courtesy during Senator Roberts' question, and I ask for it again. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. Thank you. Your ministers for climate and energy and preceding Liberal Nationals and Labor Greens governments claim that climate and renewable energy policies are based on CSIRO advice. Yet CSIRO's climate team admitted to me that CSIRO has never stated carbon dioxide from human activity is a danger and when asked for the source of that political claim suggested I ask politicians and ministers. On what basis is your government claiming we need to cut the carbon dioxide from farming, industry, transport and driving cars? 
Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you know, there is a, a recognised global challenge which uh, we believe needs to be uh, appropriately addressed uh, in a global fashion through an appropriately uh, comprehensive global arrangement. And Australia, as a responsible uh, international citizen, uh, is committed to doing its bit, and that is precisely what our government is doing. Under our government, uh, emissions are coming down. And electricity prices are also coming down. And you know, we, are, we are keeping the lights on, bringing electricity prices down, and helping to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions in a way that is uh, economically responsible. Uh, and we are very proud uh, of our record, and we, we remain committed to that as the appropriate way forward. Senator Roberts, a final supplementary question. Thank you. The CSIRO climate research team's position ultimately relies on unvalidated and erroneous computer models that are not suitable as a basis for policy, in implying falsely that they have confidence in the models, yet have never assigned a quantitative calculated confidence level, CSIRO has misled you. Will your government hold an independent inquiry into the so-called science that is supposedly the basis of your climate and energy policies? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Mr. President. I, I think I've clearly stated uh, the basis for the government's uh, decision-making in relation to these areas. And I might just say again that as Australians, we are rightly proud of the CSIRO. The CSIRO uh, is a world-class organisation. Now, that doesn't mean that every bit of research uh, is uh, you know, immediately uh, right on the mark. But the CSIRO, like any scientific uh, organisation, understands that any research has to be appropriately tested and peer-reviewed, uh, and they are absolutely committed to the appropriate uh, rigours and transparencies uh, that apply uh, to any scientific organisations of this nature, and that is, of course, appropriate. Uh, we, we, uh, completely and we completely support the important work the CSIRO does and, and continue to stand by it. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is investing in mental health support for Australians through the COVID-19 pandemic? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Henderson for the very important question. And of course, during the course of the COVID-19 pandemic, mental health has been a challenge not just in Australia but around the world. The Morrison government recognises that the ongoing restrictions in place to stop the spread of COVID-19 are having a significant impact on the mental health of Australians, but in particular, as Sarah Henderson well knows, or Senator Henderson well knows, in particular in communities in Victoria, who continue to be subject to severe lockdown measures. Mr President, since March of this year, the government has announced a number of emergency response measures to support the mental health and wellbeing of Australians through COVID-19. Access to telehealth services under the Medical Benefits Scheme has been expanded to include mental health, allied health professions and general practice. From 16 March to 16 August 2020, over 5.4 million medical benefits scheduled subsidised mental health services were accessed with 35.1 per cent of mental health services delivered by telehealth. We're also investing in our frontline mental health services through our $74 million COVID-19 mental health support package, with $3 million for a dedicated mental health and wellbeing program for frontline workers, $10 million in funding to support older Australians through a community visitor scheme. $6.8 million for the expansion of Headspace Digital Work and Study Service, $10 million to establish the Coronavirus Wellbeing and Support Line, and $14 million to bolster the capacity of mental health providers such as Lifeline and Beyond Blue. We also have a $48 million National Mental Health and Wellbeing Pandemic Response Plan. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. What additional assistance is the government providing to Victoria as second stage lockdowns force Australians back into isolation, potentially cutting them off from family and social supports? Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And as Senator Henderson has said, uh, Victorians, in some part, they're doing it really tough, and the government understands the severe nature of the COVID-19 restrictions in parts of Victoria. And uh, we have therefore provided additional assistance to Victorians at this time. 
with including the doubling of funding for the Better Access Plan to increase access to mental health practitioners through Medicare. For support for young people through youth support, there is $12 million for service surge capacity to Victorians, including $5 million for Headspace, with a particular focus on those in Year 11 and Year 12. Across all of Victoria, we are funding an additional 10 Medicare-subsidised psychological therapy sessions for people who are affected by the further restrictions or who are in quarantine or required to self-isolate and have already used the 10 existing sessions that they have. We're also establishing 15 dedicated mental health clinics across Victoria, and our Senator McKenzie Order, will Senator place Cash. no sixer in rural and regional areas. The answer has expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Uh, Minister, what is the government's understanding of the impacts that additional lockdowns are having on Victorians, and where can people access support services if they need it? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, the government is closely monitoring mental health service usage to respond quickly and lessen the mental health impacts of COVID-19 and the recovery phase. In the past four weeks, Victorian access to support services was 90 per cent higher than the rest of the country for Beyond Blue, 22 per cent higher for Lifeline and 5 per cent higher for the Kids Helpline. We're also, though, in light of this, uh, in conjunction with the Victorian government, we have agreed to establish a new Victorian mental health task force to ensure the latest initiatives are implemented as quickly as possible. And this is important additional assistance, of course, for Victorians at this time. In terms of the Beyond Blue Coronavirus Wellbank Support Service, it's available to all Australians needing support through the COVID-19 pandemic and can be accessed via telephone or online. And are through Order, these services. Senator Cash, time for the answer has expired. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Today, Minister Hunt announced $92.4 million in funding to prevent aged care workers from working at multiple facilities. Will the minister guarantee that aged care workers will no longer work at multiple facilities? If not, why not? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, today, Minister Hunt and I announced a number of measures to support the aged care sector to um, manage the COVID-19 outbreak. One of those measures, Mr. President, was to support a negotiated agreement between the aged care sector and the unions in Victoria to uh, ensure that one worker could work at one site, Mr. President. Uh, Mr President, that agreement is not inclusive of the entire aged care sector. And of course, Mr President, there are some workers who we do require to work across more than one site. Mr President, so includes our ADF nurses who go into a number of facilities to provide assistance to the aged care sector when our facility is under stress. It also includes, Mr President, our OSMAT teams that go in to provide assistance to aged care facilities when they're under stress. It also includes uh, the Sonic and uh, Aspen testing teams that are required to go in to do the testing for providers. Mr President, uh, and it doesn't include, uh, as a part of that program, agency nurses who are required for surge workforce capacity across the aged care sector in Victoria. So it supports workers who are employed normally by aged care providers to work in one facility. And the, the point of the program and the support that we're providing is to ensure that workers aren't work worth worse off by the fact that they are uh, asked to work across one site. So, Mr President, this is a continuation of that, pro of that process and the announcement that I made with Minister Hunt this morning extends the period of that program from eight weeks to 12, to 12 weeks, acknowledging the ongoing circumstances of the pandemic in Victoria. Senator McCarthy, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that the A Matter of Care, Australia's aged care workforce strategy delivered to his government two years ago, recommended a national database of workers? Why has the Morrison government ducked the report and sat on it instead of taking action that would have better prepared its aged care system for the COVID pandemic? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. In, uh, contrary to uh, the question from Senator McCarthy. The government is actually ac actioning that particular proposal right now. Uh, the consultation process Order. has completed. 
uh, and we are working with the sector to provide a national workforce identification and registration process uh, and incorporating into that process uh, uh, qualification requirements that might be required for providers uh, f that providers would need for their workforce across the sector. So, Mr. President, it's not true to say that we're not actioning that uh, recommendation. We, in fact, are. Senator McCarthy, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Why has it taken more than 1,800 cases of COVID-19 in aged care, the deaths of 457 older Australians in aged care, and seven months for the Morrison government to finally provide support? For aged care workers. Senator Colbeck. Again, Mr. President, I have to say that I can't agree with the premise of the question put by Senator McCarthy, because we've been providing support to workers for in aged care since March, Mr. President, since early in the aged care pandemic, Mr. President. So maybe, Order maybe, on my left. maybe Labor are a bit Order. concerned that they are so late to the party on, the, on, on this issue that they've only discovered aged care in recent weeks, Mr. Order. President. But we have been working with the aged care sector in this country since January to, to assist them and to prepare them for COVID-19, Mr. President. Uh, so we've been, we, we've been working and providing advice and support to this sector on COVID-19 since January, and the measures that Mr. Minister Hunt and I announced today were in fact a continuation of existing measures that we'd put in place previously in recognition of the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic continues. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister advise the Senate of the defence outcomes from the recent Osmin meetings with her US counterpart? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator McMahon for the question and also for her unwavering support for the ADF right across the Northern Territory. So thank you. Uh, Mr. President, the United States and Australia are experiencing profound changes in our geostrategic circumstances. So now, more than ever, we must place a premium on ensuring our alliance continues to serve both our nation's interests. At Osmin this year, the Foreign Minister and I did just that. We delivered outcomes to ensure the alliance is best placed to respond to these challenges. At Osmin, Secretary Esper and I agreed to three new defence outcomes. These build on our substantial engagements over the past year. Firstly, we signed a statement of principles on alliance defence cooperation and force posture priorities in the Indo-Pacific. This builds on our force posture cooperation over the past decade, and it will drive the next decade of our cooperation. Secondly, Mr. President, we announced our intent to develop a US-funded, commercially operated strategic military fuel reserve in the Territory. This is a significant step in strengthening our supply chain resilience. Thirdly, we agreed to further deepen our defence science and technology cooperation. This includes hypersonics, electronic warfare and also in space-based capabilities. This will ensure the alliance maintains our capability edge. Colleagues, our alliance is in great shape, but we can never ever take it for granted. Both nations share a vision for a region that is secure and that is prosperous, one in which the sovereign interests of all states, large and small, are respected. Yeah. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Thank you. Can the minister update the Senate on the initiatives to deepen defence cooperation in the Indo-Pacific? Senator Reynolds. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and again, thank you, Senator McMahon. At Osmin, we agreed to deepen regional cooperation. Our forced posture cooperation is a tangible demonstration of our shared interests and our mutual deep engagement in our region. The Statement of Principles re-established a working group to develop recommendations to advance cooperation both in Australia and also in our shared region. A modified marine rotational force in Darwin has proceeded this year and it's gone very smoothly despite the challenges of COVID-19. This is truly a testament to the adaptability and also to the strength of our alliance. We continue to strengthen our shared ability to contribute to regional stability. Our alliance remains a major force for stability and security in our region. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the defence industry outcomes secured during Ausmin, and how this will support Australian workers and help drive the road to economic recovery? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator McMahon, for the question. And I particularly thank you for your support for defence industry in the Northern Territory. Yeah. Mr President, a key priority was to secure new outcomes for Australian industry and also for Australian workers. Outcomes that build on the 15,000 Australian businesses and 70,000 Australian workers already benefiting from our investment in defence. At Osmin, we agreed to reduce barriers to industrial base integration, including Australian participation in US supply chains. And there is no better example of this than the 50 Australian companies that are already contributing to the global F-35 program. On this side of the chamber, we are committed to further developing our bilateral defence trade and to working together on export controls. Greater maintenance, re greater maintenance repairs and overhaul of US platforms in Australia will mutually strengthen our capabilities Order, and Reynolds. also our resilience. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Tragically, more than 457 aged care residents have died from COVID-19, and there are now more than 951 active cases in residential. Order. We're talking about 951 active. Order, Senator Henderson. I'd like to hear Would you Senator like to Wong's stand up question. And defend him? Order, Senator Wong. Please ignore I'd the interjection. Like I've called Senator Henderson to order. Please Tragically, continue. I might start again if I may, Mr. President. As, as leader, I'll give you that. Thank you. Senator Tragically, Wong. more than 457 aged care residents have died from COVID-19, and there are now more than 951 active cases in residential aged care. A 77-year-old St Basil's resident who did not contract COVID-19 died after suffering dehydration and malnutrition, which accelerated her dementia and led to her death. Doctors have described her situation as a case of neglect. How many Australians have died in aged care this year, not as a, as a result of COVID-19, but as a result of neglect? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Um, it is quite tragic that Labor seek to try and play politics with the Order. passing of Order. senior Australians in, um, in residential aged care, Mr, Mr. President. And Order. And, Mr President, um, there are about 60,000 Australians who die in residential aged care on an annual basis, uh, unfortunately, but uh, that's one of the functions of residential aged care. Uh, I don't have statistics on Order. Mr President, Mr. President uh, and, and the, the objective of the Australian aged care system is to provide all residents in residential aged care with a high quality of care uh, uh, across the nation. That is, the, that is the, the focus and the purpose of our residential aged care system and the regulatory framework that supports order. it, Mr Senator President. But as we Sen know, Senator Colbeck, up Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. Direct relevance. I ask this minister how many Australians have died as a consequence of neglect in the context, particularly, if I may say, of a report entitled Neglect handed down by His Royal Commission. If he's not able to answer the question, could he take it on notice? I'm listening carefully to the minister's answer. Um, in my view, if he is talking about people passing away in aged care, um, he doesn't have to adopt the terminology or the assumption of the question, but he does have to limit himself to that particular topic to be directly relevant. I think he is at the moment, but I will listen carefully. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I was saying, Mr President, uh, we all acknowledge that there are things that need to be improved about the aged care sector in this country. That's why we're having a Royal Commission, Mr President. That's why one of the first acts of this Prime Minister, Prime Minister Morrison, Order. was to call a Royal Commission, Mr President. And I've heard 
Labor MPs trotting around this place over the last few days claiming that they supported it when they didn't, Mr President, order. including then Leader order. Mr Senator Short. Colbeck on a point of order. Senator Wong on a point of order. Point of order, direct relevance. How many Australians have died in aged care this year as a result of neglect? It is a reasonable question. I'd ask the minister to return Senator, to it. Senator Cormann on the point of order. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I think that what uh, Senator Colbeck was explaining uh, is that it's not actually a black and white question to why Senator Wong is seeking to frame it, and he was making precisely that point. He was, he was addressing very directly uh, the fact he was, very, he was addressing very directly that uh, this is not a question that can be answered in the way that uh, you know, Senator Wong is seeking to do for political reasons. On the, on the, on the point of order, order, on the point of order, I'm not Senator Wong on the point of order. On the point of order, dismissing a question that goes to facts as not being relevant because it's politics is really not uh, is not so consistent with the standing uh, I'm not the, the motive of a particular question uh, is not for me to make an observation on there are times to debate it um, Senator Wong I would normally have pulled the minister up on the Royal Commission issue but you did raise it in your previous point of order so I was giving him some um, discretion to deal with that point that was raised um, as I've said before I think if the minister is confining his answer, to the passing away of people in aged care, then he is being directly relevant, and I'm listening carefully, and he seems to be. So I'll call on the minister to continue. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. So across across the country, as I said earlier, Mr. President, there are about 60,000 people who pass away in residential aged care on an annual basis. Uh, the, the whole purpose of our system, Mr. President, is to provide a, a system that is supportive, uh, that provides a high quality of care, uh, and uh, this government clearly has an ambition to improve that quality of care. That's why we're undertaking the process that we're currently undertaking. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. The former Minister for Sport, Senator McKenzie, resigned as a result of the sports rort scandal. This minister has ignored the interim report of the Royal Commission entitled Neglect, the warnings from the Northern Hemisphere, the warnings from experts and unions, the warnings of Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March and Newmarch House in April, and more than 457 aged care residents have died from COVID-19. Minister, why haven't you resigned? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, the government since January has worked closely with the aged care sector, firstly on preparedness, Mr President, uh, and then we have resourced the sector in that preparedness, and we've continued to provide oversight of the sector to ensure that a they are prepared, but also if they're not, there's additional measures that are put in place. Mr. Order, Mr. President, and and that's what this government will continue to do, Mr. President. The Labor Party can play its political gotcha games all it likes, but what we will continue Order. to do is exactly Order. what we have done today, announcing left. additional resources and measures to support the sector uh, as it works its way through the COVID-19 pandemic. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Under Prime Minister Howard, when one person died connected to the kerosene bath scandal, former Minister Bronwyn Bishop lost her job. Under this minister, aged care residents are so neglected, one had ants crawling from open wounds and residents are dying of neglect. Why doesn't this minister resign? Why doesn't he allow someone like former Shadow Minister for Mental Health and Ageing and senior senator from New South Wales, Fearavanti Wells, to replace him? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. What I will continue to do and what the government will continue to do is to follow the medical advice to provide uh, the systems and the resources that are available to the aged care sector so that they can, they can manage the COVID-19 pandemic and ensure that uh, senior Australians get the care that they deserve. That's what we've done in Victoria by, by partnering Order. with the Victorian government to establish the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, and that's what we've done today by the announcements that I've made, along with the minister, to ensure uh, that the sector has Order. the resources that it needs. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Motions to take note of answers, Senator Callagher. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of uh, questions from Labor senators to Minister Colbeck today in question time. 
Well, today in question time we had the full display of the inadequate performance of this government and this minister on aged care. 457 older Australians have passed away, with more than 400 of those in the last six weeks alone. Thousands of residents of aged care have contracted the virus. Hundreds have been evacuated uh, from their homes, often dehydrated, malnourished and soiled. The system is so fragile that the Defence Forces had to be called in to help provide basic care to older Australians because the system couldn't do it without their help. The criticism we have of this government and this minister is not that they didn't stop COVID-19, but our criticism is, and the questions we asked today to hold this minister account were they failed to plan properly, and once COVID-19 got into aged care facilities, they failed to prevent the spread. They knew older Australians were particularly vulnerable to COVID-19. They knew the aged care system and the residential aged care system were, was broken. They knew the workforce was fragile, it's casualised, and workers work across multiple sites. They knew community transmission was rising in June, and yet it took until late July for the Commonwealth to pull together the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre. They knew that personal and clinical care would be one of the first areas where care impacted for residents. They knew PPE was short. They knew back in May when 1,350 aged care providers requested PPE from the government. That was back in May. Surely that would have set off an alarm bell that maybe the sector wasn't as prepared as they had thought it was. And today, earlier today, we find out that there are 33 more older Australians who had resided in residential aged care who had passed away and the Commonwealth didn't even know. The government that funds and regulates a system of care for older Australians in this country didn't even know. Can you imagine that happening in any other system where care is provided? Can you imagine it happening in the childcare system where you just wouldn't know what was happening to the, the children that were using your services? It would seem to me that tracking the number of people who had passed away from COVID-19 in the middle of the worst pandemic in 100 years would be a pretty basic and fundamental element of any pandemic planning exercise. Right from the get-go, I would have assumed that the government that regulates and funds the sector would have wanted to know some basic information, like how many people were contracting the virus, how many people were passing away from it. But it seems that it wasn't until August they put in place a system to audit that. You know, six months in, they start thinking, oh, actually, we better make sure that some of these numbers of people who have passed away actually um, add up. This minister's failure in his portfolio of aged care is real. It's a failure to lead, a failure to reform, a failure to prepare, a failure to protect, a failure to plan. But most of all, it's a failure to properly care for vulnerable Australians who deserved better. Now, we hear a lot from the minister in question time of the government trying to play catch up. They were trying to spin their way out. We've got more money going here and more money going there, but the facts won't change. The minister knew the sector was vulnerable since he took on this job in May last year. I have no doubt that his incoming brief provided him with information that said this sector is vulnerable. Not only is it caring for vulnerable Australians, but there's a whole range of issues about how the system runs that makes it vulnerable. And then there was the Royal Commission called. Surely that would have set off alarms in the minister's head. He gets reports from his department. He knows, and that is our issue today, and that is our issue with his performance, is he knew in May last year, he knew how vulnerable it was. The reports from the Northern Hemisphere were shocking. And yet we see them playing catch up today, six months in, and nearly 500 people have paid the price 
for that failure to plan Senator and Gallagher, protect. Your time has expired. Senator Canavan. Thank you, Deputy uh, President. Um, <clears throat> the, the government's absolute priority here in this space is to protect the safety of residents and to provide uh, quality care to those in aged care facilities. It should be uh, a priority of all uh, Australian governments uh, to do that. And of, and of course, we express deep sympathy for those who have lost lo loved ones through this terrible pandemic uh, and those that are, have had to live with a fallout of a, of a terrible outcome that has occurred and particularly centred around Victoria, but not only, only uh, there through the last few months. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge too up front, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, it is right, it is right and proper that the opposition come into this place and ask us questions on these issues. Uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, ter terrible outcomes uh, for Australians uh, through the pandemic, and it's right that we convene Parliament to allow uh, the opposition to hold the government to account on these issues, to ask questions on behalf of uh, particularly those affected families and residents, uh, and to get answers, to get answers uh, from the government on those things. And, and Minister Colbeck, uh, I think over the last week now, has almost ta taken every question, almost every question from the opposition over that week. And the government is open and transparent about what it is doing, what it has done, and, and where it has gone wrong as well. And we do acknowledge things have gone wrong from time to time. We would prefer things to have gone uh, better than they have. But of course, uh, this, uh, this pandemic, the coronavirus, has overwhelmed uh, uh, many governments. Uh, uh, and many plans that were in place. The plan that was put in place for the aged care, centre, aged care facilities back uh, in January uh, uh, has had to have been updated and renewed given the special circumstances of this pandemic. Now, while I acknowledge the, I acknowledge the, uh, the correctness of the opposition bringing questions in this place uh, on this issue, they would have, the opposition would have a lot more credibility, a lot more credibility if they held the same account, the same uh, uh, accountability to the Victorian Labor government as they're seeking to do here uh, in this place. Calls for people to resign this place aren't, uh, aren't echoed uh, for errors and missteps that have occurred in Victoria, which may I say seem on a much, much larger scale and indeed are the origins of all of these problems. Uh, come from the deficiencies of the Victorian government. We still saw yesterday. We saw the bizarre, uh, bizarre situation yesterday of Mr. Albanese, the leader of the opposition, uh, calling for uh, uh, coalition ministers to resign, but at the same time continuing to defend the disastrous decisions of the Andrews government. Uh, disastrous, given as the Daily Telegraph puts it today, Albo's blind spot on Dan uh, puts it nice and succinctly. Uh, uh, the Daily Telegraph points out. Uh, that, that yesterday on the ABC, Mr Albanese was defending, defending the Victorian government's shocking record on tracking and tracing, not just the hotel quarantine system, that's a whole other story, but, but on, the, on the tracking and tracing system in Victoria, which has clearly not been up to scratch. But, but Mr. Albanese, Mr Albanese is running a protection racket for the Labor Party, not a proper accountability mechanism for all Australian governments. Uh, if only, if only, Madam Acting President, the, uh, the Victorian Parliament could, could hold their government, the Victorian people could hold their government to as, to as much as an account as what is occurring here in Canberra. We have convened the federal parliament. We've brought people all around the country with different quarantine arrangements, uh, uh, different border restrictions, but we've made it work because it's right and proper to have the parliament here uh, to answer these questions. Yet the Victorian parliament refuses to sit, or the Victorian government refuses to allow the Victorian Parliament to sit to some sort of modern-day King Charles, uh, uh, the, the Victorian Premier is saying no, he's not allowing the Parliament to sit. And just like King Charles, the only way he's going to reconvene Parliament is to give himself more executive powers uh, so that he doesn't have to have Parliament back again. In fact, I had a look at it last week, Madam Deputy President. The Victorian Parliament, by my calculations, has sat, has sat uh, for, roughly, for, I think, seven days in the last five months, around 150 days since the coronavirus took off and, and necessarily took, caused some disruption to parliamentary sittings. But it, it, despite parliaments all around Australia, all around the world, finding a way to sit, finding a way to do things remotely uh, through this uh, new and modern world, uh, uh, the Victorian government continues to hide from the people, continues to hide from accountability, and the Labor Party here federally are complicit in providing uh, that protection. Now, I won't have time, Madam Deputy President, to talk a little bit more, which I would have loved to about some of the things that we are doing to, to fix the situation in Victoria. My colleague Senator Rennick might take some of that up, but we are making sure we provide substantial assistance to the aged care sector to help with increased staffing, uh, to deal with the issues of course, of having to displace staff when a, 
when an outbreak occurs in a, in a facility and to provide the defence force where possible. And we'll continue to do that because our focus remains on providing adequate quick care uh, to those in this Thank terrible you, situation. Senator Canavan, your time has expired. Senator Carr. Yes, uh, Madam Deputy President, the question time today highlighted the fact that the minister was now acknowledging the tragic deaths of some 457 uh, people in our aged care facilities across the country. And what was particularly remarkable was that he said that there were 33 people that he didn't know uh, about as the minister, and this had to be reported. And uh, as a consequence, that uh, was, uh, I find, it quite an extraordinary proposition, particularly in the case where we're talking about uh, Victoria, where I found out, uh, I've checked today, uh, my uh, advice is that uh, of uh, those uh, 420 Victorians in aged care facilities had passed away during this crisis. Um, those uh, figures, the minister suggested, needed further work. The Victorian Age Response Centre and they, uh, had to clearly needed to do further work to reconcile the figures, he said. So the 420 the numbers that the Victorians are using today uh, stands in contrast to the 457 that the Commonwealth is still using. What's particularly of concern to me is that the deaths that have occurred, the tragic deaths that have occurred, have entirely been within Commonwealth managed facilities. Entirely. There's been not one death in a Victorian government run facility. Not one death. So all of these facilities have been in centres that you would have thought the Commonwealth would have had a direct line of advice on. Now, of course, the Victorian government publicly government run facilities, the public facilities, and unlike the private ones, are man, have mandated minimum staffing requirements. And so the question arises around quality. The question arises around the deregulation of private facilities, which I think is at the core of much of the quality issues, doesn't arise. Now we know that many groups, public, private, not for profit, play a role in providing care for our aged Australians. But what is absolutely critical is that it's the Commonwealth Government that has overall responsibility, a proposition that the Prime Minister has acknowledged uh, on many occasions. What, within that context, is a simple proposition that has set up a Royal Commission and has then sought to ignore that Royal Commission and the advice that that Royal Commission has provided to him in terms of its interim report, and as recently as the 24th of August, where the Royal Commissioners have said that currently the Australian government has no care quality outcome reporting for its home care and reports are only on a three indicators for its residential care. And had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would not have known much earlier and have suffered for many people would have been avoided. And of course, Senator Ferrari Venti Welch has been uh, referred to today by Senator Wong in her question, made it very clear in her submission to the Royal Commission that the aged care sector is on the brink of collapse. And I quote again, there needs to be a clear direction for the government to stop tinkering on the edges to undertake real structural reform. The coalition had promised real reform of the sector and regrettably instead had become a merry-go-round of ministers with a lack of stability, inertia and a de demonstrated by the aged care sector design and its operation. So by any standards, this minister and the previous uh, government's uh, arrangements, that is conservative government's arrangements, should have resigned. But it's not just this minister that should be held in uh, terms of his responsibilities here. The question of the role of the health minister himself comes into question. He's the senior cabinet minister. He's the minister for, responsible for responsibility at the cabinet table. And why has he left these vital tasks to the junior minister when there have been so many warning signs, so many examples? of the failure, the neglect, the administrative neglect of this system to the point where they don't even know how many people have died as a result of their failures. At every level, the Prime Minister who's tried to dodge this issue, cut funding, pretend it's someone else's problem, as we heard yet again here today, try to blame somebody else, the Health Minister, 
the junior minister. This is a government that has resided over a tragedy, a shocking tragedy. This is a government that should front up to its responsibilities and should acknowledge that there Thank needs you, to be Senator fundamental Carr. change Your in this approach. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I think it's time we had a look at the facts, uh, because it turns out, you see, that on the weekend, uh, Victoria's Chief Medical Officer Brett Sutton admitted that people dying with COVID are being counted as people dying from COVID, particularly those in aged care and palliative care. And I quote, anyone who is a confirmed case who dies is classified amongst co coronavirus deaths, so it doesn't have to be definitely from coronavirus. And in some instances, you know, in aged care, there would have been some residents who were already receiving palliative care who became infected with coronavirus. So um, it's not definite about whether or not they've died with or from coronavirus. And I have to say that upon seeing the video, I was quite shocked by this because I would have thought governments would have a duty of care to properly disclose the number of deaths from COVID. You know, why are people already in palliative care? being counted as a COVID death? And more to the point, why isn't the Victorian Labor government telling the truth? It's a total abuse of power to curtail people's liberties without proper disclosure. And what about those opposite us? Are they going to apologise to the minister for the slurs in the pylon in this chamber, in particular inferring that these deaths were avoidable when in some cases it appears that they weren't? And instead of asking Minister Colbeck to resign, why don't they demand Daniel Andrews or the Premier Victoria to resign? He was the one who failed to contain community transmission. He was the one who didn't have enough contact traces, unlike New South Wales, who was much better prepared. The Andrews Labor government failed to have enough contact traces. Even worse, he was the one who pulled staff from St Basil's with only a day's notice leaving the federal government to come in and clean up the mess. I mean, wouldn't you make sure you had appropriate staffing in place before leaving these residents to fend for themselves? Or wouldn't you get the residents into hospitals so they could be cared for? The whole point of the lockdown in March was so that state governments could get their health systems up to speed to deal with COVID. So can someone tell me that some state governments, in particular Victoria and Queensland, are using the police force and not the health system to deal with COVID? Because you can't help the weak by tearing down the strong. You don't lock down the economy indefinitely without an exit plan. The state premiers need to lay out an exit plan. The fact is there have been minimal cases of COVID in all states except Victoria. But I can tell you what is out there, and we're not getting much information on this. And it's interesting. I know that uh, those opposite us have been attacking uh, Minister Colbeck for not having information to hand. Well, I've been chasing up information for the last five months now as to uh, the number of people dying from su suicide, depression, uh, homelessness, and things like that. And a lot of that, most of that uh, information comes from state governments, and a, a lot of it hasn't been forthcoming. And I find it very frustra frustrating every day to listen to these uh, press conferences by state premiers rattling off uh, numbers to do with COVID, but they seem to ignore every other health impact or every, every other uh, uh, impact on society um, that's also going on. I mean, it's about time state premiers started to look at the overall picture and not just uh, looked at COVID, uh, because in my view, some of this stuff's to actually try and divert attention from uh, what I'd have to say has been poor mismanagement of the health system, in particular in Queensland. Now, I'll quote you some numbers on Queensland. There are now 2,774 patients waiting longer than is safe for surgery. Now, I should add that a lot of those patients were waiting pre-COVID because the Labor Party in Queensland has destroyed our health system. The, the queue of Queenslanders forced to wait longer than the clinically recommended time for surgery is now 20 times longer than it was before the pandemic. The Rural Doctors Association of Australia came out two weeks ago and said the border closures were creating a second healthcare crisis. Well, that didn't turn out to be an understatement, did it? We've now seen the death of a baby 
thanks to Anna Palaszczuk's confusing border laws that led to the delay in the mother and the baby getting adequate medical attention. I've seen the Queensland Labor Party do some pretty low things over the years, introduce poker machines, close over 30 maternity wards in the regions, record waiting lists for surgery, ambulance ramping and record crime rates. But I don't think I've seen Thank anything you, as Senator callous Rennick. as what Anna Palaszczuk has done. Expired. And I do remind you once again, it is a broad ranging uh, discussion and you were mostly on topic, which was to take note of answers um, from Senator Colbeck. So I'd ask you to bear that in mind in future. Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. 457 aged care residents have died. 457. Older Australians with families, friends, children and grandchildren, and there are loved ones who are grieving. What is happening in our aged care homes is a national tragedy, a national disgrace. And the Morrison government has no plan to address the crisis in aged care. The Morrison government needs to fix the home care crisis now. And the reality of this government's aged care mess means the waiting time to receive high-level care at home is almost three years. And at the front line of this crisis are the workers. They deserve to know, when they show up for a shift, that there will be adequate protective equipment for them. They shouldn't have to choose which hand to put a glove on. And they deserve training in infection control for their protection and the protection of those they care for. And yet, as the Herald Sun today reported, federal aged care authorities are in the dark over whether staff are working at more than one home. This is despite a report two years ago recommending a national database of workers. A matter of care, Australia's aged care workforce strategy delivered to this government two years ago recommended a national database of workers. Such a database would help aged care authorities monitor if aged care workers are working at more than one home. And during a pandemic, this is invaluable information. Many aged care workers work at multiple aged care facilities and, unfortunately, have spread the virus. They felt they could not call in sick if they felt unwell, and in fact, some were told they must come to work even if they were sick. This is a broken system. And it's this government that has sat on that report instead of taking action. It's so clear the warnings were there, and there are still no answers from Senator Colbeck. The Royal Commission's interim report into aged care quality and safety entitled Neglect was tabled on 31 October 2020. 31 October. That report found the aged care system fails to meet the needs of its older, vulnerable citizens. In Darwin, in the Northern Territory, powerful evidence was heard about the stark challenges faced by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. This included challenges of poverty, food insecurity, difficulties accessing services, lack of culturally safe and secure services and the distance from services. And overall, the report found that a fundamental overhaul of the design, objectives, regulation and funding of aged care in Australia is required. It does not deliver uniformly safe and quality care, is unkind and uncaring towards older people, and in too many instances it neglects them. For First Nations people, we look at our old people as our elders. We treat them with utmost respect, knowing that they carry a wealth of knowledge of our stories, our stories as a people, our stories as a family. And today we hear 457 elders of our Australian community have died. And still we do not see any accountability with this government. No changes in the care for our elders, our elder Australians, no care in the desperate need for what has to happen now 
but not even the recognition of what they could have done so much sooner. The warnings were definitely there. Aged care is a federal responsibility, full stop. This government has withheld support from the sector. You are responsible for aged care, and you haven't protected our elders from this coronavirus. Scott Morrison has no plan to address the crisis in aged care. Anthony Albanese does have a plan. It includes the introduction of minimum staffing levels, adequate supplies of personal protective equipment, better training for staff and infection control, as well as a better surge workforce strategy. The Australian public has lost confidence in Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I just remind you to refer to those in the other place by their correct titles. So the question is that the motions moved by Senator Gallagher be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answer from Minister Rustin to my question regarding JobSeeker. A specific question was about how many people are likely to default on their mortgage or not be able to pay their rent and be in rental stress when the job seeker payment is cut by $300 a fortnight. And the minister couldn't answer because they don't know. They haven't bothered to look at how this cut of $300 a fortnight is going to impact on 1.8 million job seekers and those on youth allowance, and in fact the 2.2 million Australians who are getting the coronavirus supplement because it's going to have a devastating impact. And we heard that today when we heard from the Ben Phillips from the ANU and the work that they've been doing, looking at the fact that 740,000 people are going to be dropped back into poverty at the end of September when $300 are cut from the supplement. We are still going to be in economically difficult times for a very long time to come. So cutting the coronavirus supplement by $300 a fortnight is going to have substantial impact not only in dropping people back below the poverty line, but it is also going to have a devastating impact on our economy. Where are people that are in rental stress going to be living? They, in fact, are going to be homeless. What happens when people have to start defaulting on their home loans? Now, if you look at the work, the ANU work that's been done, poverty has substantially been reduced in this country thanks to the coronavirus supplement, down to 6 per cent. Down to 6 per cent. That's absolutely enormous. So not only has that supplement kept people uh, out of poverty, it's helped our economy. Those people who are going to be now have $300 less a fortnight will be significantly impacted by the cut in the supplement. And of course the minister once again, once again would not confirm that they will not drop the job seeker payment back to $40 a day. And the fact that she says it would be irresponsible to guarantee that they, that, uh, to do that at the moment, to actually uh, confirm that they won't be dropping it down to $40 a day, it's in fact irresponsible not to. It's absolutely irresponsible. Because I can't think of a world at the moment where it's ever going to be economically justifiable to drop people onto $40 a day. There's no future world where somebody's going to be able to survive on $40 a day. So it's in fact very irresponsible of this government not to confirm to people, not to give people certainty that they will not be dropping people on $40 a day because it simply is not livable. And the government knew that when they came in in March and, in, and announced that they were going to increase and put in place the coronavirus supplement. And we know what an amazing impact that has had on the community. It's dropped poverty. It's dropped the level of poverty in this country. People are able to put food on the table. They're able to pay their rent. They're able to meet, pay some of their debts. They're actually able to get to the dentist. Somebody's told us that they're able to get to the dentist. Other people have been able to um, start eating much better. 
They don't have to choose between paying their bills and putting food on the table. They don't have to go without food. They're able to buy their medications because during the inquiry into New Start and our job seeker, we heard very clearly how people are making the choice not to take their medication because they can't afford it. It is literally a choice between taking your medication and putting food on the table for your kids. So, of course, parents are making the choice to go without their medication so that they can feed their kids. That is what this government is going to drop our community back to at the end of September and, even worse, at the end of December, when the government will not guarantee that they won't drop people onto $40 a day. This is causing enormous anxiety and stress to those that are trying to survive on JobSeeker. The government can help those people help their stress, help their anxiety and their mental health by saying, we promise you we will never ever drop you back to $40 a day, because that is unconscionable in this country. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to notices of motion. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fiavanti Wells. Uh, Madam Deputy President, pursuant to notice given on 27 August 2020 on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw notices of motion proposing the disallowance of three legislative instruments as set out in the list circulated in the chamber. Thank you, uh, Senator Fiavanti Wells. Are there any notices, other notices of motion? Okay, so I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Dean Smith. Uh, it's not, but I do have. Uh, <laughs> I am seeking leave, though, to move a motion relating to leave of absence of senators, if I may. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Pre Deputy President. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators due to COVID-19 travel restrictions. Senator Hanson, Senator Roberts, Senator Roberts and Senator MacDonald. Thank you. Any other... Um, there's no other postponements rearranged? No, I'll call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Um, business of a Senate number one in Senator, Senator Hanson Young's name for today to the 1st of September. Business of a Senate number two in Senator O'Neill's name for today to the 2nd of September. Business of a Senate number three in Senator Waters' name for today to the 10th of November. Business of a Senate number four in Senator Steele John's name for today to the 1st of September. Business of a Senate number five in Senator Faruqi's name for today to the 1st of September. General business number 361 in the name of Senator Kitching for the 1st of September, postponed to the 8th of December. General business number 718 standing in Senator Waters' name for today to the 3rd of December. General business number 753 standing in Senator McCarthy's name for today to the 6th of October. And committees have lodged extension notifications as indicated at item 11 on today's order of business. Thank you. So I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of uh, formal business, and uh, we will start with general business notice of motion number 724, standing in the name of Senator Mariel Smith. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 724 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator thank, Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government is committed to a competitive automotive sector in Australia, and we want to make sure we have a level playing field for all participants, repairers, consumers, dealers and manufacturers. This includes making sure independent repairers have fair access to the information they need to do their job, and the government is actively considering the design of a mandatory scheme and how it might operate, taking into account the issues and perspectives raised by businesses and consumers during the consultation. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 724 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 751, standing in the name of Senator Eyre. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy 
President, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 751 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator. Oh, there's an objection. Okay. So we will now move to uh, general business. Notice of motion number 756, standing in the name of Senator O'Sullivan. Senator Smith. Thank you very much. I ask that general business notice of motion number 756, uh, standing in the name of Senator O'Sullivan, relating to an extension of time for the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Family Law System, be taken as Family Law System to report, be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Smith. I move the motion. So, Senator Seawitt. I think Senator Waters wants to seek leave to make a short statement. Sure. Uh, Senator Waters. Oh, beg your pardon, just let me seek uh, a agreement for that. Is, um, yes? Yes? Uh, um, Hi, leave, leave is granted for one minute, Senator uh, Waters, but we are having trouble with the audio. so. Um, we'll just give you a couple of seconds. We might have to ask. S <laughs> I'm s yeah, I'm sorry, Senator Waters. Um, that's not going to be possible. Um, so we'll now. Mo so um, yes, Senator. Please. I'm wondering if I could seek leave for Senator Waters to be able to incorporate her statement into Hansard. Once I've shown it to the whips. Uh, yes, with the concurrence of the whips. Thank, Thank you. you. That'll be incorporated. So I think um, I'm now putting 756. So the question is that general business notice of motion 756, standing in the name of Senator O'Sullivan, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Well, now, yes, Senator Smith. Uh, we're incorporating Senator Waters' state, one-minute statement because of the technical interruption. Yes. That, that's right. Thank you. And that's with concurrence of the whips. Yes. So we will now move to general business notice of motion number 758, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. I seek leave to amend general business notice of motion number 758 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Um, is is there any yes? So that's fine, Senator Fruki, with the um, amendment. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber, and I ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Fruki. I move the motion as amended. Senator Dunningham. To make a short statement. Is leave granted? Yeah. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunning. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. The Australian Government supports the welfare of animals exported by sea. We have already released a summary of uh, MVQ8 Independent Observer Report and Additional Voyage Report and agreed to supply the full report to the Senate. The Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment released its decisions relating to exemptions for the export of live, uh, livestock rather, during the Northern Hemisphere summer in June. An appeal against the 13 June decision to grant an exemption was dismissed by the Federal Court on the 16th of June. Uh, these were decisions taken by an independent regulator, and it's important that uh, independence is respected. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 758, as amended, standing in the name of Senator Fruki, be agreed. To those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to um, general business notice of motion number 759, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Senator Seawitt. President, I ask that general business notice of motion number 759 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, under this government, an additional $8.6 million has been provided to the WGEA through the 2018 Women's Economic Security Statement uh, to improve workplace gender reporting. WGEA's new reporting and data management system is due to be fully implemented by March uh, 2021 next year. 
In setting employment terms and conditions, the Fair Work System, as introduced by the former Labor government, incorporates the, principles, uh, the principle rather, of equal remuneration and provides mechanisms for uh, independent Fair Work Commission to adjust terms and conditions, including on work value grounds. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Gallagher. I leave to make a short statement. Just leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator uh, thank Gallagher. You. Uh, Labor will be um, opposing this motion, and although we understand the intent of it and we support a large part of it, however, um, as I've made in this comments in this chamber on a number of occasions, we don't think that our policy agenda um, sh should be um, determined by Greens' motions in, during formal business in the Senate. There are a number of clauses under Section B, including Section B1, B5, B6 and to some degree B7, uh, which um, would have large uh, fiscal implications which need to be considered. And, you know, we go through our own processes for that, but it's not determined by the Greens party and it's not determined during a part of the program which is meant to be non-controversial um, and a way of dealing with business quickly. These, I mean, Senator Waters shakes her head, but the fact is there are content in this um, motion which would benefit from uh, debate, which is not allowed during this time of the program. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 759, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Um, I believe the noes have it. So we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 757, standing in the way Thank you, Button. Standing in the name of Senator Watt, Senator Urquhart. Been in the way. Thank you, Deputy President. Before asking that the motion be taken as formal, I wish to inform the Chamber that Senators Chisholm and Green will also sponsor the motion. I ask that General Business Notice of Motion Number 757 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. It's only Monday. Can I seek leave to make a short statement? Uh, I believe leave is granted for one minute. Thank Senator you very Dunningham. much. Uh, both the purpose and the substance of the Commonwealth's intervention in the High Court matter are misdescribed in this motion. The government believes employers must pay all their employees their proper entitlements, but it's unfair and economically damaging to require employers to pay twice. The Attorney General's Department has assessed the cost to the Australian economy of paying twice as between $18 billion and $40 billion. The government has intervened to encourage the proper resolution of the double payment issue, and the government has attempted to legislatively, legislatively extend award casual conversion provisions to the coal industry, but later has refused to support it. Further, ABS data shows the incidence of both casual employment and employment by labour hire firms in the mining sector were at times higher under the former Labor government. In the workplace reform process, the government is also seeking a path to remedy the significant uncertainty created by Labor's failure to insert a definition of casual employment in the Fair Work Act. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. And I believe Senator Roberts is seeking the call. Senator Roberts. Are you still muted, Senator Roberts? Just try again. Senator Roberts. Um, Senator Roberts, unfortunately, we can't hear you. Um, so I will. Do you want to just double check that your uh, microphone is on? Just give me a thumbs up if it's on. It is on. Okay. Sadly, we can't hear you. So I'm going to put the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 757 standing in the name of Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. That concludes our general business motions. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 18 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Chisholm. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. 
The decision by the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, to turn his back on his accountability and responsibility to this parliament on the families, children, grandchildren, siblings and friends of each and every one of the older Australians who has died in aged care as a result of COVID-19 and on the 200,000 Australians in aged care and those who put themselves at risk every day to care for them. And that's signed by Senator Chisholm. Is the proposal supported? Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly, and I call Senator Bilek. Deputy President, as of 8am this morning, 457 older Australians have died, either in residential aged care or other aged care settings, as a result of COVID-19. They have died in circumstances where their families and loved ones were unable to hold them, unable to comfort them and unable to say a proper goodbye. Over 120 residential aged care facilities have now had COVID-19 outbreaks, including at least 10 facilities that have had more than 100 infections. The government had months, months to plan for an outbreak in aged care, and they did nothing. One of the most damning indictments of their performance was given by the Aged Care Royal Commission. Let me remind people once again what the commissioners said, and I quote, Had the Australian government acted upon previous reviews of aged care, the persistent problems in aged care would have been known much earlier and the suffering of many people could have been avoided. And I quote the commissioners to make the point that it's not just Labor that has been saying this. The government's own appointed commissioners have criticised their failure to plan for an aged care outbreak. Even the New South Wales Liberal government released a report saying that the Morrison government had no plan to deal with what has happened in aged care. And I also remind those opposite some of this statement made by the council assisting the commissioner, Peter Rosen QC, about the government's attitude following the New March House outbreak. And I quote, a degree of self-congratulation and even hubris was displayed by the Commonwealth government. Failure to plan, hubris and self-congratulation. That's what we've heard stated by the Aged Care Royal Commission. We've also heard of the errors and the delays in communicating with relatives about whether their loved ones were dead or alive. And despite the numerous warnings the government had about communication issues, both from Newmarch House and Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreaks, they still failed to fix these issues when further outbreaks occurred. With three months to learn from the failures in the Newmarch House outbreak, it's astounding that exactly the same issues were repeated in the St Basil's outbreak. The minister had three months to learn from what happened at Newmarch House, yet he still failed to put in place plans for the sector. Given these failings, I wonder how the relatives of the hundreds of older Australians who have died felt when the minister turned his back and walked out of the chamber during the debate on his mishandling of the crisis. I wonder how those relatives of older Australians who had come close to death felt after they'd gone through the pain and uncertainty of not knowing where their relatives were or what condition they were in? And how did they feel when confronted with Mr Morrison's response to being told that Australia's aged care sector has one of the highest COVID-19 death rates in the world? When Mr Morrison was confronted with this tragic fact, he said, when it rains, everyone gets wet. I mean, seriously? Seriously? What an insensitive sort of comment to make. What a glib, insensitive and stupid response to this national tragedy. It's the kind of response, however, that typifies this government's attitude to the aged care COVID-19 outbreak. No care, no plans and no responsibility. When Minister Colbeck turned his back and walked out of the chamber last week, he turned his back on the more than one million Australians who are receiving aged care, 
their families and the 360,000 workers who care for and support them. And while the minister can walk out of the Senate chamber, he cannot turn his back and walk away from his and his government's disastrous handling of the COVID-19 outbreak in aged care. He can try and run and he can try and hide, but he cannot do it forever. The Prime Minister continues to claim that he's got confidence in the minister, but Mr Morrison's actions actually speak volumes when he cut the minister out of key decisions relating to managing the outbreak in aged care. And there's no way of spinning this. Mr Morrison has shown his lack of confidence in Senator Colbeck by effectively demoting him. You would think that, that the stage, at this stage where the crisis is and the amount of scrutiny that the minister and the government are under, that they would have got a handle on what is happening in aged care, but they haven't. Around half of the active cases in Victoria are in aged care settings, but the failures are still continuing. And the Morrison government has no idea how many aged care workers in Victoria are working across multiple sites. We still don't have assurances that all workers have access to adequate PPE and that they've completed the PPE use and infection control training. I mean, that is Thursday last week, only one in four had, and it's still voluntary, as I understand. I'm happy to be corrected if it's been made compulsory since Thursday, but maybe someone could tell me. But why is it not compulsory? It's bizarre. There are still new infections in aged care in Victoria which point to an obvious lack of adequate infection control. And senators on the opposite side of the chamber claim that Labor is making this a political issue. The minister himself accused us of playing games. Let me tell everybody listening, nothing could be further from the truth. It's our job as the opposition to highlight the government's aged care failings and demand some accountability for them. It's our job to call on this government to do better, and it's also our job to offer constructive suggestions as to how they can do better, because in doing so, there is a chance we can save lives. And the Shadow Minister for Health, Julie Collins, the member for Franklin, has done an amazing job. Sorry, the Shadow Minister for Aged Care um, sorry, um, has done an amazing job, an amazing job in over the last seven years trying to hold this government to account for the litany of issues around aged care and the concerns she's had in aged care. Um, and I just want to take my hat off to um, Shadow Minister Collins and to say thank you for the work, Julie. Uh, I think without your hard work, the aged care sector would be in a much worse situation than it is now, and thank you for holding the government to account. There are thousands of families out there with relatives in aged care who expect us to take up this issue on their behalf. They're afraid. They're afraid for their relatives, their mothers, fathers, grandmothers, grandfathers, aunts and uncles, and they want some assurances that those people are safe. And as I mentioned last week in this place, according to a recent survey, 54 per cent of people with loved ones in aged care want to get them out. This shocking statistic is a clear demonstration of the level of fear that Australians have about the state of aged care and the level of distrust in the government's ability to manage this outbreak. Residents and their families are not the only ones who are scared. We've got aged care workers who are scared too. They're dealing with the fear of being infected day in, day out, while trying to work in an aged care system which is under the most incredible pressure. It's underfunded. They can't get appropriate PPE. They worry about going home to their families and maybe infecting them. It's, just, it's completely unreasonable for this government to not take responsibility and to not be able to have dealt with it over the past few months. The emotional toll this um, crisis is taking pushes those workers to exhaustion. And all those workers are looking for is an assurance that the government overseeing the sector they work in, the Australian government, is looking out for their health and safety. They want to hear that the government has a clear plan to end the COVID-19 outbreak in aged care and to prevent further outbreaks in the sector. 
and that is what Labor wants too. We are simply looking for action. We are looking to this government to take responsibility for their role in managing the COVID-19 outbreak in aged care. We are raising these issues here to help save lives. And that's why we've done more than just criticise, more than just point out the failings of those opposite. We have outlined a positive plan, a positive plan to address the crisis. Mr Albanese outlined Labor's eight-point plan on aged care to the National Press Club last week. And I hope those opposite have taken time to read and consider the eight points. But just in case they haven't, I'll quickly go through them. Minimum staffing levels in residential aged care. Reduce the home care package waiting list so more people can stay in their homes for longer. Ensure transparency and accountability of funding to support high quality Order. care. Senator Billick, your time has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, you know, the Senate's a funny place. Labor come here. They ask their questions at question time and they say, oh, there's not enough funding for aged care. And Coalition announces more funding for aged care. And they go, oh, it's not really funding for aged care. Well, what is it, a ham sandwich? <laughs> and then they say, ooh, another announcement, mockingly, like to announce more funding for aged care is something less than what they were asking for only a day ago. Then they harass the minister, demanding an apology for everything, and then when he does offer a sincere, heartfelt, deeply held apology, well, they double down again, offering cover for dodgy Dan Andrews, hoping that if they attack him enough, no one will notice the dog's breakfast going on in Victoria. But the Australian people are a whole lot smarter than they give them credit for. And so I'm going to go to the facts. Facts are very uncomfortable for those opposite, Madam Deputy President. Facts are very uncomfortable, but I'm going to go to some. So how about this? The percentage of lives—this really matters, Madam Deputy President—the percentage of lives lost, very tragically, of course, among those in residential aged care in Australia is 0.18 per cent. Now, all lives that are lost are tragic, and nobody resiles from that. But at 0.18 per cent of the residential aged care population, remembering, Madam Acting Deputy President, that these are people who are fragile. Many of them are in residential aged care to help them through a palliative process. Many of them are complex cases managing a number of illnesses, many of which have the potential themselves to end life. None of this is to dismiss the seriousness of COVID-19, of course, but it is to acknowledge the fact that the challenge presented by managing deaths in the residential aged care context is different to managing it in the broader community. So we're at 0.18 per cent. Let's compare that to Canada. The same circumstances, residential aged care residents, 1.5 per cent. That's six times the Australian rate. Let's go to France as a comparison. There, the equivalent figure is 2.4 per cent. 2.4 per cent of the residential aged care population have passed away. That is 1,300 per cent of the Australian figure. So, uh, order. Madam Acting Deputy President, yes, um, I, was, I was just trying to find the relevant standing order, which is why it took a bit of time. But under point of order, under um, standing order 193.3. Uh, which says a senator shall not use offensive words against either House of Parliament or a House of a State or Territory Parliament or any member of such House or against a judicial officer and all imputations or improper motives and all personal reflections on those Houses, members or officers should be considered highly disorderly. Um, and I would just urge ask you to consider that with um, the contribution from Senator Stoker referring to dodgy Dan Andrews. I will remind senators of the standing order as raised by Senator Gallagher, please. 
Um, Madam Chair, are you asking me to withdraw? Perhaps, perhaps, Madam Acting Deputy President, I could offer this accommodation. I could clarify what I meant. Happy to withdraw uh, and clarify. Senator Stoker, you could refer to the Premier of Victoria by his correct title and move on. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Oh. Senator Polly. Acting Deputy President, I ask you, under that standing order, to ask Senator Stoker to withdraw her comment. I made a I made a ruling. Senator Stoker, if you could please continue with your remarks and clarify the correct title for the Premier of Victoria, Victoria as you were referring to him. Thank you very much. Um, I was referring to the Premier of Victoria and the political cover that those opposite were seeking to give, and I withdraw any reference to Dodgy Dan. Thank you, Senator. Thank please you. continue. And so, in their um, craven attempts to provide political cover for the Premier for Victoria and his epic fails to manage the COVID-19 virus, they seem to ignore the comparative performance of the Australian aged care population on this measure. So I had mentioned before I was um, interrupted um, that the Australian rate of lives lost among the residential aged care population is, quite sadly, 0.18 per cent. In France, it is 2.4 per cent, or over 1,300 per cent of the Australian figure. Let's go to Spain. It is 2.5 per cent. In Ireland, 3.2 per cent. In Italy, 3.2 per cent. In Austria, 4.9 per cent of the residential aged care population, 1,600 per cent of the rate we have here in Australia. Now, this is absolutely enormous. And when we compare the fact that in the United Kingdom, 16,598 older people who are residents of residential aged care have passed away, 5.3 per cent of their entire aged care residential population. That's 3,000 per cent. It's a little bit rich for those people opposite to be playing this, this flip-flopping game where they say there's not enough funding. Then they say, oh, that announcement, that, that's not real funding. That's just re-announcing old measures. What we have in place here is a plan devised in January, implemented in the months following, for which funding has been the subject of an announcement of an enormous extension today to show that we are committed to managing this difficult situation as best as it possibly can be to protect Australia's older people. Because it's very easy for those opposite to have an awfully short memory. When we came to government, how much was the budget for residential aged care? Sorry for aged care, it was $13 billion. Now, when we go to the year just completed, res the, the funding for aged care in this country was $22 billion. It will continue to grow to $23 billion and $24 billion and the $25 billion mark for each year of the forward estimates. Aged care funding in this country is increasing by over a billion dollars every year. That's not just inflation, Madam Acting Deputy President. Those are significant investments in our ageing population and continual improvement of the standard of care that Australian families can expect when they come to depend upon residential aged care to help them through some of the most difficult times of life. Since the 2018 to 19 budget, this government has invested $3 billion into home care packages to support more Australians living in their homes for longer. We've released 14,275 new residential aged care places. We're investing $5.3 billion 
from 1 July through to June 2022 for existing Commonwealth Home Support Program service providers so that they've got continuity of service for the 840,000 people they assist across Australia. And we've invested $21.9 million for the cost of operating My Aged Care. We've provided $320 million in a boost for residential care subsidies, and we've given providers almost $50 million for a business improvement fund to help them to assist them through financial difficulty to prioritise helping them get the assistance they need to run those operations well in a long-term viable way and, of course, helping with some of the unique challenges that come with operating a residential aged care service in regional, rural and remote areas of Australia. There's an ongoing 30 per cent increase to the viability supplement to support services that operate in rural and regional Australia. And can I tell you, there are unique challenges that operate in rural and regional Australia for the provision of aged care. And an example I can give you is this. Most of the time, in order to be viable, an aged care centre needs to have a certain number of residents to get the economies of scale, to use um, a, a somewhat crass term, needed to make it economical to be able to provide a high level of care to all of those people who are resident. But in a place like Dolby, for instance, where there is an outstanding aged care centre being run by the local Rotarians with the assistance of council, the smaller population of that town means that the per head cost is much higher. The local community pitches in to make sure that a service can stay in the local area because it's important to keep families connected to one another. This government recognises those challenges by providing additional funding through these special funds to acknowledge some of the financial challenges that come from operating a service of this kind in rural and regional areas, because we understand that it's important to keep families together. And can I tell you, the Dolby Aged Care Service is an outstanding quality aged care residential home with cheerful residents living a good life in a beautiful country environment. Those are the kinds of services we are supporting all around the country, and so we will not be lectured to by those opposite who underperformed persistently during their time in government, and we stand by senior Australians through the Order, toughest Senator days Stoke, of their your life. time has expired. Senator Seawett. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a contribution to this uh, debate on aged care. Well, if we had a plan in January, it's failed. It's failed. I dispute that we had a plan, but if we did have a plan, I don't know that government should be shouting it from the rooftops, given that it, it has failed and we have had so many people, older Australians, die in aged care. We've had health care workers become extremely ill from COVID, and we have not prepared adequately. This comes to an aged care sector that I would very strongly argue was in crisis before even COVID got here, and we were not well set up to deal with it. And I wanted to go through what was, in fact, one of the later in, uh, reports into aged care, and it particularly was looking at clinical care in aged care. And for me, it underlines what the problems are in aged care and one of the reasons why we're in the position that we're in now. The report, as an intro to the last chapter where the report made a number of recommendations, talks about residential aged care is a hybrid model of service delivery or delivery awkwardly straddling the divide between being a health facility and support accommodation. The problem with this approach is that it is people who fall in the gap, people who are vulnerable, frail and aged, and who often lack an advocate who is both aware of their needs and is in a position to ensure their rights. It goes on. There is a lack of clarity where the dividing line is between personal and clinical care. Who should be responsible for delivering these different types of care? And who should be responsible for the standards of care? 
Until we resolve the fundamental problem of defining what we want from residential care facilities, no regulatory framework will be able to resolve these issues. This lack of definition is not only felt at the service level, it is evident within policies, operational guidelines and funding frameworks within the Department of Health itself, which lack clarity and are often contradictory in how aged care is defined. It goes on. There, there has been a move to make residential facilities more comfortable for residents, reflecting that the facilities are, for all intents and purposes, their home. However, it appears that this has been conflated with a move to reduce the clinical rigour of services in that home. A lack of form formality in appearance should not result in any lack of formality in clinical services. There are significant gaps in the current framework for the delivery of clinical services in residential aged care facilities, and poor clinical care for older Australians has too often been the result. While the single quality framework is a positive step forward, much more needs to be done to promote a higher quality of care for people living in residential care facilities. The committee then said that the committee considers aged care stands at a crossroad. The committee was right when it said that. Aged care did stand at a crossroad. Crossroads, and I'd argue that it's gone across those cross crossroads into a disaster when you, can, when you look at COVID. The government noted most of the recommendations from this committee, and we were discussing that in this place last Thursday when we were talking about the government's response to those recommendations. If the government had implemented those recommendations, if they'd taken note and moved on clinical care, I argue that we'd be in a much better position now We'd have a plan to actually deal with, age, deal with COVID and stopping it getting to aged care. And really, can we stop exercising the argument or using the argument that just because it's been rampant in other places means it's okay for it to be rampant here? It's not okay. It's not okay for so many people to have passed away due to COVID in our aged care facilities. It's not okay that we have so many healthcare workers who have caught COVID. And of course, we put paid to that notion of, oh, it's, they're bringing it in. No, they're catching it in aged care facilities. We have, it has been able to demonstrate that it could be kept out of aged care facilities if there's appropriate measures taken, if people had a plan. There's no plan to keep it out of aged care facilities. Once again today, and for, I should say, while I don't, of, of course, I welcome any expenditure going into aged care, I consider the money that was uh, committed today, the, the um, $563.3 million, is a down payment on what is needed to address these very, very significant issues. We heard just last week that around $3.5 billion is needed to address the issue. And that money and those initiatives are basically that money is basically extending current initiatives. It's not addressing the fundamental, one of the fundamental flaws in the system, which is making sure we have a workforce that is A, funded to the level that you need to deliver the care, which is at least four hours and 18 minutes. For, for, so from a start, we're behind the eight ball because we don't have a workforce that is of sufficient size to actually meet the need, let alone be able to do a surge workforce when you have people um, that uh, unfortunately do get sick. So we need the funding for a start to go into the proper level of care, and we need a minimum level of care in terms of staffing ratios. We are still having an argument in this country that we might need a nurse on 24 7 for crying out loud. Honestly, that is the level of debate that we were having. We were still trying to argue that, let alone get a prop proper ratios to enable proper care, let alone getting the four hours and 18 minutes. Then we've got to make sure that we have adequate training. I remember providers coming to our hearing, and I'm sure Senator Polly does too, coming to our hearing and saying, we can't the staff that we are hiring are insufficiently trained. You could go and get a Cert 3 or 4 off the internet, for crying out loud, without putting your hands on a patient or a resident. That needs to change. We need to be making sure 
that, that infectious disease control is mandatory? And how about making sure the retention bonus, which was uh, funded, uh, increased uh, additional funding provided for that, extends to not just direct care workers? And don't get me wrong, direct care workers are absolutely essential, but so are the people that keep the place running. So are the people that are um, working in the kitchen, that are gardening, providing auxiliary support services. They are also important and absolutely essential for the good running of good aged care facilities. And let's start having a look at the level of profit that is been, being made from providing care to older, vulnerable Australians. And if you look at the report, the, the, some of the work that was, came out of UQ just last week, looking at the, good, at looking at the quality of care, over ele only 11 per cent of its facilities were found to have the best quality of care. And that was based on consumer experience, compliance with official standards and use of medications. 78 per cent were in the middle and 11 per cent provided uh, poorer care. Smaller and government aged care were more likely to have high quality services. So I think we need to have a good, hard look at aged care in this country. And it's not as if the government hasn't had so many recommendations. You've got the Polaris report on workforce that has very good recommendations about how to improve the workforce. Where are we in, to impl in implementing that? Not very far along the road. We not only need to make sure that we are providing funding for the sorts of things that the government outlined today, but we need a massive level of funding injected into our workforce. We need to be training that workforce, and we need to agree that in aged care facilities these days, we are providing clinical care. They are sub-acute facilities, and we need to make sure that we hold these providers to account on clinical care. Because that argument was still being had during the inquiry, whether these facilities provide clinical care. Well, we know right now that yes, they do. We need to substantially shake up the game here, and we can't wait for the Aged Care Royal Commission to provide its recommendations. While they are going to be very, very important, it doesn't take Einstein to work out that we need a significant investment in our workforce. We need to increase care substantially, so let's get on with doing that right now. Cough up the $3.5 billion now. Do not wait for the Aged Care Royal Commission. You can start on it now. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Walsh. Acting Deputy President, well, last Thursday, the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, turned his back on this chamber. And it wasn't just us he turned his back on. He turned his back on the aged care residents he has failed to protect. He turned his back on their families, their children and grandchildren. He turned his back on the aged care workers who were understaffed and overworked in this crisis. He turned his back on all of those who count on him to do his job and do it well. He turned his back on his accountability, not only to this parliament, but to the Australian people. He turned his back when he needed to front up. He needed to front up to the crisis in aged care. He needed to front up to the families, front up to the workers, front up to the community, front up and take responsibility, not walk away. All of last week, we saw Minister Colbeck repeatedly dismiss concerns about the crisis in aged care and declare to this chamber just how well he's dealing with it. But that is not real life. In the real world, aged care is in deep crisis. 457 aged care residents have now lost their lives to this pandemic, to this virus. And many of these residents would not have had the chance to say goodbye to their friends, to say goodbye to their families to see their loved ones one final time before their death. Many would not have been able to spend their final moments with their spouses, their children, their grandchildren, and this crisis is heartbreaking. 
It is an absolute tragedy. And yet the minister has the audacity to tell this chamber that he is doing a great job, that his performance is a high watermark, a high watermark. This is the same minister who isn't even across the basic detail of his portfolio. And this is the minister that we need, we need, the Australian people Order. need, to have a plan to deal with COVID-19 outbreaks in aged care, in aged care. The responsibility of Order. this minister that we're talking about, the minister who has no plan, no plan to keep residents safe, to keep them protected. We have known about coronavirus for a long Order. time now. We knew it was deadly. We knew that aged care facilities were particularly vulnerable to outbreaks. But proper protections were not put in place by this minister or by this government. Proper protection was not afforded to the residents of aged care in this country. Proper protections were not put in place. And then back in April, we had our first aged care outbreaks. Absolutely no lessons were learned, and Minister Colbeck did not act. There was no audit done of access to PPE. There was piecemeal infection control training, and there was no proper workforce strategy Order, put in Senator place. Van. Aged care workers have described just how short-staffed and overworked they have been, and as a result, history repeated itself in Victorian aged care homes. And aged care royal commissioners appointed by this government, appointed by this government, have pointed to how evidence was ignored, how plans were not put in place, and how, tragically, if action had been taken, this crisis could have been prevented. How, Order, if action had been taken by this minister, by this government, this crisis could have been prevented. And that is a pretty damning uh, assessment Urquhart of this minister's of response to Senator the. Walsh. Point of order, Madam Deputy uh, President, Acting Deputy President, you have asked the Senator on, I think, three or at least four occasions, to uh, that uh, noted that interjections are disorderly, and he has continued to disregard your ruling. Interjections. Into that. Yes, Senator Urquhart, interjections are disorderly. Senator Van, on the point of order. Sorry, uh, 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 Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I do recognise that they are disorderly, but I've taken a lead from the other side during question time, who would get reminded constantly. Uh, Senator Van, that's not a debating point. I repeat my previously stated position that interjections are disorderly. Senator Walsh, if you could please continue, and if the chamber could respect her right to contribute to this debate. Thank you. The Royal Commissioners have given a damning assessment of this minister's response to this crisis, and yet still we are struggling to get the details of a full plan for aged care from this minister and from this government. Now, Labor has released our plan for aged care. So where is the government's plan? Where is the government's plan? We desperately need minimum staffing levels. We need to support aged care workers with job security, with decent pay, not rely on your bungled retention bonus, your bungled retention bonus. We need better staff training. We need a better surge workforce strategy, and we need better transparency and accountability. Why have we been waiting so long for your plan? Why have we been waiting so long for transparency and accountability from this minister and this government? Why do we still not have them? The government has failed. This minister has failed. They've failed to protect our most vulnerable Australians. They've failed the families of those vulnerable Australians. They've failed the workers who care for them. Minister Colbeck is clearly not up to the job. It's time for solutions, it's time for action, and it's time for a new minister. Thank you, Senator Walsh. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the incredibly important issue of aged care, and it is with regret that I have to call out these very grubby tactics from Labor senators over the tragic issue of aged care deaths, including those people who have died from or with COVID-19. The Australian government is determined to ensure a safe environment exists in aged care facilities as we work together to contain the spread of COVID-19. We offer our deep condolences to those families who have lost loved ones. But let's have a debate on facts. Let's not see Labor senators turn their backs on the facts. Across the country, 97 per cent of aged care facilities have not had an outbreak of COVID-19, and that figure is 92 per cent in Victoria. 
Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, the federal government has announced funding of an additional $1.5 billion in new measures to respond to the impacts of COVID-19 on aged care. The fact is that some 60,000 residents in aged care facilities die every year. It's a tragic statistic, but that is a fact. But what Labor is attempting to do is attribute the deaths of some 450 aged care residents and seven home care residents to the minister. This is a disgraceful, disgraceful proposition and demonstrates how desperate the Labor Party has become. As I say, Labor has turned its back on the facts. First and foremost, here is a very critical fact in this debate. The Australian government's role is to fund and regulate aged care not to run aged care facilities. This is done by the state and territory governments, by private operators and not-for-profit operators such as churches. Where there are regulatory breaches, the Australian government, through the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, comes down very heavily on the operator to ensure there is appropriate ramifications, remedies and accountability for such breaches. The Commission is taking, at the moment, a proportionate, risk-based approach in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. Remember, this is unprecedented. The Commission continues to use the full range of its regulatory powers to ensure aged care consumers are safe and providers are delivering quality care and services consistent with the aged care quality standards. This is of particular importance in respect to the challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic. If a provider is not meeting its legislative obligations, the Commission may take regulatory action, including imposing sanctions or issuing a notice to agree to certain requirements called an NTA. The Commission has taken regulatory action during the pandemic in relation to services where there was a severe and immediate risk to care recipients due to the management of the outbreak. There have been 19 NTAs issued to providers since the beginning of the outbreak for this reason. 18 of these notices relate to residential services in Victoria, and one notice was issued to Anglicare New South Wales for Newmarch House. Uh, in New South Wales, of course. Uh, one NTA has been issued, however, that the details of which have not yet been published. Information about these notices is published on My Age Care after residents and relatives have been informed by the provider of the action taken by the Commission. So we need to have a brutally honest discussion about what is going on in aged care in this country at the moment as a result of the pandemic. Nearly all of the COVID-19 related deaths in aged care facilities have occurred in Victoria, and yet we have not seen that very important point being made by members opposite. So I just want to go through the numbers. And these are really tragic numbers, and again, I reiterate my condolences to the families and friends of those who have died in aged care, in including during this pandemic. And these, of course, relate to people who have died from or with COVID-19. 29 deaths in New South Wales, zero in the ACT, zero in the Northern Territory, one in Queensland, zero in South Australia, one in Tasmania, and 419 in Victoria. 419 in Victoria. So let's just reiterate that our government is a national government. Our policies and our plans are enacted across the nation. Our policies and our management of aged care facilities is no different in Victoria, other than Victoria has received greater funding because of the pressure it has been under due to the number of deaths it has suffered. The difference in Victoria between what is happening in other states is the alarmingly high rate of community transmission, which has been caused principally because of the Victorian government's failure to manage the spread of coronavirus in Victoria. It is a grim fact, but it is not contestable, as we now know, due to the evidence that has been presented to the COATS 
Commission of Inquiry. The hotel quarantine disaster to which nearly every active case can be linked is one of the principal causes of why there is such high levels of community transmission in Victoria, which has invariably meant such high number of deaths proportionate to every other state and territory in the country. So if I look at the contribution of Senators Walsh and, and Seawit, I, I want to reiterate that our plan and our policies in terms of combating COVID-19 and aged care facilities have absolutely worked in states which have worked effectively to suppress the community transmission of coronavirus. And I think all senators across on the other side of this chamber will understand that, but they are not being honest about the facts. The other critical issue in Victoria is the mismanagement of contact tracing. Contact tracing in New South Wales, for instance, has been managed extremely well. Every outbreak, there's an identification of where it's happened, and there is enormous resources being placed into contact tracing in New South Wales. That's not the case in Victoria. There's a huge lack of resources, and there are literally thousands of mystery cases, so that there has been huge issues in identifying the source of the coronavirus and in suppressing the spread of community transmission. As the Treasurer has said today, this represents one of the worst public policy failures we have seen uh, in, by any government in this nation. But the Morrison government continues to ensure and work very closely with the Victorian government and with all states and territories to suppress the spread of the coronavirus, including in aged care residential facilities. So we've initiated a number of important um, different initiatives to, of course, deal with the issue of the spread of coronavirus in aged care facilities. Of course, I've mentioned the $1.5 billion of additional funding and another $500 million, just $500 million was announced today. Uh, the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, which is actually uh, a, a collective effort between the Commonwealth and the state to make sure that there, when there is an outbreak that we can act urgently to address it. Massive support from the national medical stockpile, including the supply of some 14 million masks and 3 million gowns. Immediate support from the wonderful members of the Australian Defence Force and OSMAT personnel, um, pe personnel who are being dispatched urgently to facilities uh, which need that help. Of course, as soon as there is an outbreak in an aged care centre, uh, the workforce, anyone who comes into contact with the coronavirus, has got to isolate for at least 14 days, and that's why the response from ADF per personnel has been so magnificent. And of course, the other really significant thing that's happened in Victoria is that we've intervened. The Commonwealth has intervened to ensure that anyone in aged care who needs hospitalisation is immediately transferred to hospital. Uh, that was not happening, and that was deeply, deeply concerning. And we have now worked with the Victorian government to ensure that those defects in people who needed hospitalisation not being sent to hospital, that is now being remedied. And of course, we're also working very hard uh, with infection control and compliance spot checks. We as a government will continue to work with the Victorian government to manage the spread of COVID-19 in Victoria, but I think it is fair to say that Australians understand why there is such a major pressure in uh, Victoria, and I absolutely condemn um, senators opposite for the very wrong implications they've made in relation to the minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Polly. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on a matter of public importance. The decision by the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck, to turn his back on his accountability and responsibility to this parliament on the families, children, grandchildren, siblings and friends of each and every one of the older Australians who have died in aged care as a result of COVID-19, and on the 200,000 Australians in aged care and those who put themselves at risk every day to care for them. 
What we've been saying from this side of the chamber for some time is there needs to be a plan. The contributions this afternoon are no different to the contributions of last week when we were raising these issues of concern. But what we have is we've had our leader, Anthony Albanese, state very clearly his principles of his plan going forward for the aged care sector. And I think it's important that we outline that strategy, because we know the Prime Minister of the day, Mr Morrison, has no plan for the aged care sector in this country. He's had seven years to come up with some sort of strategy and plan, but hasn't got one. So the first point is minimum staffing levels in residential aged care. Second, to reduce the home care waiting lists for more people who can stay there in their own homes for longer. Three, to ensure transparency and accountability of funding. Four, independent measurement and public reporting as recommended by the Royal Commission. Just by the way, people, that was the Liberals calling the Royal Commission into their own failings. Five, ensure adequate PPE in every residential aged care home. Six, better staff training, including on infectious control. Seven, a better surge workforce strategy. Eight, provide additional resources so that the Royal Commission can inquire into COVID-19 without delaying its final report. Now, we had the minister come into this chamber last week and said, oh, he's had nothing sensible in terms of suggestions from the opposition. Well, I dispute that categorically. Our shadow minister has put forward strategies, but if he couldn't understand those strategies, there you have an eight-point plan from Mr Albanese that Mr Senator Colbeck, the minister responsible and the prime minister, can take it and run with it. That would be a very sensible idea. But let's talk about those deaths, the deaths that have been experienced in the aged care sector in this country during COVID-19. It's all very well for people to want to blame Victorian government for the deaths in this sector, but quite frankly, this government has known since January, at the very least, if not the end of last year, the consequences of what COVID-19, the potential it had to decimate older people, particularly those in residential care. And what did they do? They didn't do anything. They certainly didn't do enough. And what did we hear this afternoon? We heard the Minister for Health outline another Band-Aid, putting another Band-Aid on what is a broken system. Not the minister responsible for aged care, not had to get the Minister for Health because the Prime Minister, quite frankly, doesn't trust the Minister for Aged Care to make yet again another announcement. Now, we have known, as Senator Seawork has uh, so eloquently outlined in her contribution to this debate, none of the concerns that have been raised in relation to aged care, with the exception of COVID-19, but in terms of the failings of the sector to address the needs of older Australians, the failure of this government to ensure that there is a properly skilled, trained workforce that report after report after the report has highlighted the need to have national standard of training for those working in aged care. That just didn't happen in the last six months with COVID-19. There is no planning. We've had report after report, even their own workforce task force that brought down its own recommendations have not been heard by this government and certainly no action taken. Let's look at the app, the waste of money in developing an app that was going to trace the transmission of COVID-19. Another waste of money because that's failed. And yet those opposite want to continue to blame everyone else but take any responsibility. We know the hallmark of this government under Prime Minister Morrison is no transparency, no responsibility and no scrutiny. Even today, when they were putting that extra Band-Aid on, 
the aged care sector with announcing some more money. The minister walked away for aged care, walked away without answering all the journalist questions. You can run away from the journalists, but you can't run away, Minister, from scrutiny. You cannot run away from scrutiny of this chamber and the Australian people. For seven years, we've been waiting for a plan from those opposite. And we've all had relatives, whether they're our grandparents, our parents, or our aunties and uncles that have had the experience in residential aged care. And we know that there's been failing after failing after failing of all the reports that have highlighted the difficulties. And we know that those opposite realise long before COVID-19 hit our shores that the aged care sector was in crisis. Why were they in crisis? Because the funding instrument is broken. There isn't enough staff. We need to double the workforce in this country to deal with the ageing of our own population. In my home state of Tasmania, we need an extra 5,000 workers over the next decade. Where are those people coming from? But the irony is the people who work in this sector are committed, they're caring. Most of those who are working in this sector are women who are lowly paid. We talk about respecting those older Australians that have come before us because they're the ones that built this country. Well, it's about time that we use the light that has been shone on aged care right now to ensure there's adequate funding going forward. We need to know what it really costs to give the highest possible care to older Australians. We need to ensure that those working in this sector are there because they want to be there, because they're highly skilled, they're resourced with the resources they need to ensure the best outcomes for older Australians. But for the minister today, when he was asked about how many older Australians in residential care have died from neglect, he couldn't answer. And he said that, in his own words, that aged care sector really is about older people dying in residential <laughs> homes. I was staggered, absolutely staggered. Well, I can assure you my relatives, when they've had to go into residential care, never went in there believing that it was just a matter of course that they were going to die. They went in there expecting that they would be cared for and they would be supported and that they would get to live out their final years with good care, with comfort and to be surrounded by people who had time to give to them. This minister quite clearly is out of his depth, but the responsibility really lies at the top, and that's with the Prime Minister, because any minister responsible for the aged care sector in this country should sit around the Cabinet table. The sector want a Cabinet minister, because they know that if you're not sitting around that Cabinet table, you have no real say in the government when it comes to budget. We haven't had a minister in the last seven years. We've had seven ministers who have all failed, with most of them showing very little interest in this, set, this sector. Labor has always said over the last seven years that we believe there should be a minister sitting at that cabinet table. No accountability, no responsibility from this Prime Minister is going to be accepted by the Australian people. You have time, Prime Minister, step up take responsibility and do something now. Thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Davey. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. Um, I find the wording of this motion quite intriguing. The decision of the minister to turn his back on accountability and responsibility. But what decision is that? Is it his decision to respond to the Aged Care Royal Commission interim report within 25 days of it being uh, handed over? 
or is it his decision to work with the AHPPC and the Aged Care Quality and Safety Commissioner to develop and communicate guidelines and responses to the COVID pandemic in aged care facilities? Since the Royal Commission interim report, this minister has decided to invest nearly $500 million for additional home care packages, because we know as a government that home care leads to better outcomes for both our senior Australians and the budget. That is why our government has seen the number of people on home care packages almost triple since coming in. This minister also took the active decision as a result of the interim report to invest $25.5 million to improve medication management programs so we don't over-medicate and we get better health outcomes. And to support this, we've invested $10 million for additional dementia training and support for aged care workers and providers so we take better care of our most treasured Australians. This minister has also decided to invest nearly $5 million to help get young people out of our aged care. Now, this is an issue that has been kicked around for ages, but this minister decided to act. This minister established the Young People in Aged Care Action Plan, and this minister has seen a reduction in the number of young people in aged care facilities. Our government under this minister has not turned its back on aged care, not before COVID and not since. The Australian Health Sector Emergency Response Plan was developed and published on 18 February and was activated nine days later. In March, we announced funding to assess infection control training for aged care workers, set up an aged care rapid response unit in the Department of Health and the AHPPC released recommendations for aged care facilities. We initiated support for the aged care workforce, including the retention bonus and the surge workforce. And that is working. And I thank all of our surge workforce partners, including our dedicated Defence Force personnel, who are assisting to provide this emergency release service. Now, if any of this is evidence of the minister turning his back on his responsibilities, then Labor have a very different view of what responsibility means than I do. His responsibility as minister is to the aged care sector and the people who live in residential facilities, the people on home care packages and the workforce that supports them. But that is not the real problem here. No, Labor aren't offended by his uh, seeming to turn his back on his responsibility. Labor are purely offended by symbolism. As Senator Billick said in her contribution to this debate, they are offended that the minister, after providing the explanation he was requested to provide to the Senate, left to do his job, to deal with the crisis that is ongoing in our aged care facilities. Yes, he didn't sit here and listen to Labor grandstand and politicise the tragic circumstances that families are still suffering. He left to deal with the issue at hand, to ensure that his department and his responsibilities are delivered and met. The minister did not turn his back. He left to confront the problem, and Labor should be ashamed of, of saying that that was the wrong thing to do. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Davey. And the time for the discussion has expired. I shall now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page five of today's order of business. Are there any contributions in relation to documents? Senator McKim. Uh, Sorry, Acting Deputy President, you caught me a little bit by surprise there, but um, I uh, rise to take note of uh, a series of um, assessments of detention arrangements conducted by
the Commonwealth Ombudsman, and they are reports numbers 23 to 27 of 2020. And these reports contain uh, a litany of uh, examples of people who have been detained for long periods of time in Australia's immigration detention system, uh, some for uh, 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 well over five years. And I do want to um, refer uh, briefly to uh, one case, which is in report number 23 uh, of 2020. Uh, this uh, assessment by the Ombudsman found that uh, this person, and the reports are de-identified, de so I'll just refer to the person as Mr X, as the Ombudsman does. Uh, this person was found to be owed protection in October 2017. Uh, and yet his case has not yet been assessed under the, uh, against the guidelines under section 195A of the Migration Act. The Ombudsman's assessment um, has found that the Ombudsman is concerned that Mr X is likely to remain in immigration detention for a prolonged period while his immigration matters remain ongoing and that this poses a significant risk to Mr X's health and welfare. Uh, the Ombudsman has recommended that, in fact, the Department assess Mr X's claims against the guidelines under section 195A of the Act and that the Department commissions uh, a contemporary independent assessment of Mr X's risk to the community to inform the Minister's decision as part of any referral to the Minister for consideration of a bridging visa under section 195A of, uh, of the Act. Now, unfortunately, um, as is so often the case, um, the Department has um, rejected the Ombudsman's recommendation that, uh, that it commission a contemporary independent assessment of Mr X's risk to the community. And I just raise that one case because it's an exemplar of so many cases of people in immigration detention who are languishing there, having committed no crime. They are not in prison. They are in administrative detention, and this department is allowing them cruelly and callously to languish there. And I make these comments in the context of an immigration system that is being run by this government as a punishment for people rather than an administrative detention system. In a recent report on the current state of immigration detention, the Ombudsman has raised some incredibly distressing concerns. There are cases of people who have been held in immigration detention for over a decade, over 10 years. They are held at the pleasure of the minister. This is cruel and unconscionable punishment. The Ombudsman has also previously found there is excessive use of force by CERCO and departmental staff, and worse still, that complaints about use of force by detainees were incorrectly rejected by the department. We also know this government is in the process of legislating to try to take people's mobile phones away from them in immigration detention, and of course mobile phones are how a lot of the abuses that go on in immigration detention are brought to light. It is impossible to overstate the cruel nature of immigration detention in this country. This government has complete contempt for people in its care and is abrogating its duty of care to so many people who are in immigration detention. These are not prisons, despite the government's desperate attempts to make the conditions in them prison-like. We're in the middle of a pandemic. These are high-risk scenarios and facilities, and the government needs to come up with a plan to release significant numbers of low-risk people into the community so that they can be adequately supported there. There will one day be a royal commission into offshore detention and onshore immigration detention. And I hope the architects of these cruel and callous policies are held to account, that apologies 
are made and, most importantly, that we can try to assure that this dark and bloody chapter in our country's story is drawn to an end and never happens again. Thank you, Senator McKim. Are you seeking leave to continue your remarks? I do. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator McKim. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I uh, wish to take note of uh, document number one on page five, the President's report to the Senate, and seek leave to further to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Are there any other contributions on documents at this stage? Okay. Are there any? So I'll just double check that. Are there any further contributions on consideration of documents at this stage? Uh, are there any ministerial statements? Um, I'm advised that there are no committee memberships, so I'll move to messages from the House. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Treasury Laws Amendment More Flexible Superannuation Bill 2020 for concurrence. I call the Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the uh, bill be now read a first time. Uh, all those of that opinion say aye. Those opposed say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. The minister. I move that this bill will be now read a second time, and I, le I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, thank you, Minister. The the uh, question is that the bill be read a second time. No. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I move that the debate be now adjourned. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the debate be now adjourned. All of those opinion, uh, all those of that opinion, say aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The President has received a message from the House of Representatives informing the Senate of the appointment of Dr Lee and Mr Joyce in place of Ms Payne and Mr Zimmerman to the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit. I call the clerk. Business of the Senate, order of the day number one. Industry research and development, bankable feasibility study on high efficiency, low emissions coal plant in Collinsville program, instrument 2020. Motion for disallowance, resumption of debate. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Acting Madam Deputy President. Uh, it's good to uh, finish off speaking on this bill. Uh, I seem to recall last time we started off by pointing out that this side of the chamber is the side of the chamber that believes in jobs, in jobs for working class Queenslanders and all Australians. And I'd like to welcome back my coal loving patriot friend, Senator Canavan. Because if it wasn't for Senator Canavan, who had his finger on the pulse of the Queensland people, I probably wouldn't be a senator. But Matt Canavan listens to the people. And so does the LNP, and so does the Federal Coalition, because we know what matters is jobs. Is jobs. And all we want to do is help look at a scoping study to see if it's possible to put in a coal plant in North Queensland so that North Queenslanders can have some jobs. Because heaven knows the Queensland Labor Party is doing their best to destroy jobs. They brought in the reef regulations that are a threat to our cattle and cane industry, you know, two industries that are synonymous with the great state of Queensland, but that's not enough. No, 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 no. They want to destroy the coal industry as well. Tourism. And it goes on. They're subsidising a foreign wind farm to be built in a national park. That's right. 
a national wind farm, uh, a national multi, sorry, uh, multinational owned wind farm in a national park. But you know who they won't let in national parks? You know who they're kicking out of national parks in Queensland? Farmers. Australian beekeepers. Oh. Beekeepers. You know, national parks are where the beekeepers go to have a rest. The bees themselves, sorry, go to have a rest after they help pollinate all the fruit, all the trees that grow the fruit, etc., etc. And big shout out to Rodney Smith from Chinchilla. He's a, a beekeeper who took me up to Barracoola State Forest one day and showed me all how it works. And the bees love their eucalypts. The bees love their eucalypts. But I digress. I digress. And, and what's so annoying about this motion is the sheer blatant hypocrisy of it. The sheer blatant hypocrisy that we can't look at all forms of energy generation to power the industries that this country needs to get some jobs, get some economic growth, so we can get out of COVID. And I'll explain why. You see, the federal government's laid down $10 billion for the Clean Energy Fund. $10 billion. Another $5 billion for the Snowy Hydro Project. Another $3.5 billion for the Climate Solutions Package. $2.5 billion for the Emissions Reduction Fund. $1.5 billion for the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Another $1 billion for the Grid Reliability Fund and half a billion for the National Hydrogen Strategy. And how much is this? $24 billion. $24 billion. About 10,000 times more than what the subsidy is or what we're going to put in for a scoping study at Collinsville. You know, 10,000 to one. Is it that hard? Is it that hard? But it doesn't end there. It doesn't end there. The madness continues because, you see, the state Labor government, the Queensland state Labor government, is signing up off-take contracts with multinational companies to build wind farms. Now, what's so frustrating about this is that Queensland has twice as much supply as demand in the state of Queensland. So the most amount of demand that Queensland's ever had on one day February the 14th, 2018, it was 9.7 megawatts per hour. But on the supply side, it has 13 gigawatts in uh, coal and gas, and it already has about another four or five gigawatts in renewables. So it has plenty and plenty of supply. But that's not enough, because in order to meet their 50% meet their renewable target, they're going to basically build all these windmills and all these solar panels that they don't actually need. It's like going to the movies, 10 people going to the movies and ordering tickets for 30 seats. You don't need it. And of course, what's annoying about it is, is that this is undermining the, Queensland, the, the people of Queensland's own energy assets, the coal-fired power stations. The coal-fired power stations that are going to last until 2040 to 2050. We have all the energy needs we need in Queensland okay, until 2040, 2050. And yet they're going, the state Labor government is subsidising foreign multinationals to build wind farms that will be obsolete before the coal-powered fire stations become obsolete. But it doesn't end there because the cheapest operational cost, as, as shown in the Finkel report, in Australia for the production of energy was at Cogan Creek, $9 a megawatt. Calide and uh, Tarong was $17 a megawatt. You know, there's 200 years' worth of coal at Cogan Creek. It's sitting right there on the surface, mine mouth coal. You just scrape it up, put it straight in. And what's interesting is, is that 70, 60 to 70 per cent of the energy in this country is provided from 21 coal-powered fire stations. Now, to get renewables to make up that difference, AEMO says you're going to have to spend $100 billion in transmission lines to get the power to the market. Now, transmission lines are made up of lots and lots of switching gear. And in that switching gear is a product called sulphur hexafluoride. That has a global warming potential greater than carbon dioxide of 23,000 times. Now, why would you put a toxic synthetic gas into the atmosphere 
with a global warming potential 23,000 times greater than carbon dioxide, greater than carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And might I add, it actually admits, it actually admits because all molecules absorb and admit. And that's one of the big myths about carbon dioxide is that it traps heat. Nothing traps heat. Okay, Gustav Kirchhoff, okay, in the 1850s, said atoms absorb and emit at the same frequency. So carbon dioxide, it emits at four frequencies: 2.8, 4.3, and two degenerate uh, frequencies uh, vibrations at 14.8. Now, what's interesting is, is that the, the atmospheric window is between 9 and 11 microns. And why do we know that? Because Wine's law. The guy who got a Nobel Prize in 1911 for physics proved that the atmospheric window the Earth admits at about 10 microns. Okay? And what admits at 10 microns? What's the atmospheric uh, window at? Between 9 and 11. It's a function of pressure. pressure. It just happens to be sulphur hexafluoride. Now, why would you be putting the stuff that goes straight through the atmospheric window into the atmosphere? Not very smart at all, is it? But of course, it takes more than transmission to make renewables work. You know, the unicorn farmers over here, they think that they're going to just run manufacturing on green energy. Never going to happen. And you know why? Because you can't build big enough batteries to power industrial use. And even if you could, okay, it would cost a fortune. And I'll explain why. Because lithium batteries okay, are made from lithium, which is a 1% ore body. That means you've got to mine 100 tonnes of the stuff just to get one tonne of it. So you're going to be digging some very big holes in the ground to get this stuff out of the ground. And then it takes four intensive energy processes to extract the ore, the, the actual metal, out of the ore. And guess what? That's only the anode. You haven't even started on the cathode. That could be cobalt, nickel, who knows what? Another great big hole in the ground. And of course, the hypocrisy with all of this is do these solar farms and these wind farms, does the state government charge them an environmental bond when they're built? No. Mining companies have to put down an environmental bond when they start a, start a mine. But yet again, we're giving a free pass to renewables. Well, let me tell you, in 100 years' time, when the atmosphere is full of sulphur hexafluoride and nitrogen uh, trifluoride, which is the stuff in solar panels, Okay, that's the stuff used in solar panels. Not the stuff used in etching solar panels. The stuff used in etching solar panels is silicon tetrachloride. You probably don't hear of that because that's made in China, like neodymium, which is also made in China because it's a rare earth. And they're the only country that makes this filthy toxic stuff. But silicon tetrachloride is more toxic than nuclear waste. But of course, they'll never tell you about that, will they? No, of course not. So, Senator I, Rennick, no worries. Okay. I hate to interrupt, but your time has expired. Senator Ayres, just before you start, I'll just indicate, Senator Wish Wilson, I am aware that you want the call. We'll come to you, but uh, Senator Ayres has the call. I'll try not to uh, take up too much of the Senate's time uh, this afternoon uh, on this disallowance. I just say to, I just say to uh, those opposite that if you think that that contribution is good for your argument, if you think that's a very good idea to put that up front and centre, well, you're going to you're going to lose touch. You're going to you're going to lose touch with this debate. That was, with the greatest respect to Senator Rennick, an incoherent ramble that had no basis in science, no basis in economics, and no basis in engineering. I just say to you. I just say to you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, at the very, at the very least, Order. at the very least, if Senator Rennick believes that there is too much supply in the Queensland energy market, why on earth does he want to build a coal-fired power station? What on earth, what on earth do you want to do that for? Now, if you, if you look, if you look at the, Order. if you look at the company that this outfit over here wants to allocate $3.3 million worth of borrowed money to, a little bit of close examination of who is this outfit. Are they, are they, 
are they do they have a do they have a record Order. do they have a record of delivery Order. of any project any project anywhere in this country a power station is a very significant and Senator complicated Canavan. well I, I don't think Senator I don't Ayers, think you're a Senator Ayers, please resume your seat I will remind everyone that Senator Canavan, please cease the interjections. I will remind you that all interjections are disorderly, Senator Canavan. Senator Ayres, you have the call. What a bag of wind, really. What a bag of wind. That's what this is all about. It's about cheap politics. It's got nothing to do, nothing to do with the energy market, nothing to do with delivering cheap power for Australians, if that's what it was about, you would be on a very different path. What it's really about, what it's really about is a cruel hoax on the people of North Queensland. It's a hoax on the people who you claim that you want to represent. If you really wanted to demonstrate a commitment to the industries that are there and should be there, the resources industry, export coal, manufacturing, you would be on a very different path. If it, you would be on a very different path if you wanted a plan for investment in new jobs, if you had a plan for cheaper energy, if you wanted to deliver for the steel and aluminium sectors. But it's certainly, it's certainly not been evident in anything else that the Liberal National Party has done in Queensland. That's why Robbie Catter belled the cat the other day. He could see this plan for the fraud that it is. He could see straight through it. And when you look at who's there in Shine Energy, if, if, when you look at the personnel who are driving this corporate shell of a company, what you see are former Catter Australia Party people, former LNP people, not a single engineer or energy market expert, what, what, you see, what you see is these guys perpetrating a fraud on people in North Queensland who actually need an outfit that's prepared to stand up for North Queensland jobs. Now, Senator Canavan has never seen a good permanent coal miner's job that he hasn't wanted to turn into a casual, low-paid job. That's what you're all on about. Your, your, job, your job here is spruiking for people who want to strip, the, strip communities, strip jobs, drive wages down, drive jobs offshore. A close, examine, a close examination of Shine's uh, publicly available material, because none of their governance material is available publicly uh, on their website in the material that they provide just shows that it's a company that is not capable of delivering this project. There is no support for this project in the Brisbane Liberals. They are very clear. The Queensland LNP says very clearly we do not support this project. So what on earth are you doing here? The energy spokesman for the Queensland LNP says very clearly we are not for this project, but you're all down here posturing and posing a Order. bunch of carpetbaggers, a bunch of carpetbaggers who are here pretending to be something that they are not, pretending to be something that they are not. Former Productivity Commission economists, no friends of the workers, jumping on in the high vis, doing the press conferences, doing the podcasts, no record of delivery. The closest thing that this outfit opposite here have in terms of northern Australian infrastructure is their fraud of a northern Australian infrastructure fund, delivered a big fat zero, a big fat zero for northern Australia. So when people look in at this debate and they watch the way that this debate is being conducted, they ought to think clearly and carefully Whose interests are Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan really representing in this debate? 
Who, who are they? Who are Senator they? Ayers, Senator Ayres, resume your seat. You are getting very close to. I'll, I'll listen to the point of order, Senator Rennick, but before yeah. you stand, you are getting very close to a direct imputation on others in this place, and I would ask you to be very careful with your choice of words. Senator Rennick, did you wish to? Yeah, point of order. That was exactly uh, what I was going to say. An imputation that somehow this side of the chamber is corrupt. Uh, it's not the first time Senator Ayres has done that. He has absolutely no evidence. All we want to do is clearly state, stated before, was uh, protect jobs in North Queensland, and yet Senator Ayres continually walks into this chamber Sen and casts aspersions. It's, Senator Rennick, it's not an integrity. opportunity to debate the issue. I have already brought Senator Ayres' attention to Standing Order 193, and I would ask you, Senator Ayres, to choose your words carefully. I'll, I'll, I'll choose them very carefully, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and it was certainly not my intention. Certainly not my intention, and there's a high level of sensitivity over here. When I talk about whose interests, I don't mean whose pecuniary interests, I mean is it in the interests of jobs in North Queensland? Is it in the interests of lower power prices in Queensland? Is it in the interests of driving investment because of lower energy prices? It certainly isn't. It delivers nothing. What it does do is contribute to what, to what Mr Buckley, the, C, the, the energy expert at the Institute of Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, called energy policy chaos on steroids. That's what this is all about. More chaos, no energy plan, more disruption, more ideological fixations no focus on the practical things that are required to have a cogent energy plan that deals with the big challenges that Australia faces. Uh, I'll leave it there, Mr Acting Deputy President. Okay. Senator Wish Wilson, are you ready to go? Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, sadly, this, this august chamber that we are so privileged to be part of uh, is not the only place in the world at the moment where careful and rational argument has been defeated by short-term political interests and short-term economic advantage. The fact that this disallowance is before us today, that this grant has even got to this stage, is a clear sign that this parliament and this government has been corrupted. And when I talk about corruption, Acting Deputy President, I heard your contribution with the last speaker. I'm talking about institutional corruption. I'm talking about big business and big politics in bed together. That's what this is, clear and simple. So let's go through that. Let's go through that. So we have this small company, Shine Energy, that wants to get up a project the Collinsville coal fire power station in Queensland. Everybody, to a T, says this project's not economic. It's not viable. I could sit here and list, as long as my arm, the people that have come out and said that, including within the Liberal Party. On the other hand, we have a marginal seat going into a federal election. We have trouble within the LNP between the coalition partners, the National Party and the Liberal Party. We have senators, including senators in the chamber now, who are totally outspoken about wanting to promote coal. And we know this has caused division and concern within the Liberal Party. That's a matter of public record. But what we also have is a large international coal company, the tax dodging Glencore, a significant donor to the Liberal Party, who decides to throw their hat in with Shine Energy and become their partner. Now, why would Glencore do that? Well, look, they can make good political mileage out of this. A new coal-fired power station on the political agenda. Coal is not going away. It's still potentially a future generator of energy in this country, regardless of what the science says, regardless of what the energy experts say, regardless of what the economic experts say. So Glencore 
throw their considerable weight behind this project. And that gives it credibility. So what we have here is the perfect storm. And it reminds me of one of my favourite quotes from a favourite Australian author, David Gregory Roberts, who says, the only thing more ruthless and cynical in the business of big politics, and that's what we're in, Acting Deputy President, the only thing more ruthless and cynical than the business of big politics is the politics of big business. And when they get into get bed together, they're an unstoppable force. The fact that this is even before us today is a farce. It is a farce. It is the most egregious example of the fact that the Liberal National Party in government simply don't care how this looks anymore. They are so arrogant that they feel they can get away with providing $3.6 million of taxpayers' money to a company that's got no hope. And I agree with what Senator Ayer said earlier. It's actually offering a false hope to the Queensland people purely out of short-term political interests. And here I will say very clearly, Acting Deputy President, the political interests of the likes of Senator Canavan and Senator Rennick. They're the renegades within the Liberal National Party coalition that want this kind of project to get up. Now, it might just be a coincidence that the LNP retained this marginal seat and that this project was thrown into the political mix during an election campaign. And what a great thing to do politically. Wedges Labor puts them on the spot. We know that they're divided on climate policy and coal. Gives uh, certain LNP senators a chance to do one of their favourite pastimes and hobbies, which of course is to pour buckets on the Greens. And of course, a couple of very famous uh, Murdoch publications, the opportunity to do the same. And you get to promise jobs and a, a future for Queenslanders through a coal-fired power station in a marginal seat that desperately needs real leadership and real direction. That perfect storm. If that isn't institutional corruption or crony capitalism, they're both the same thing. I don't know what is. I don't know what crony capitalism is if it's not a big Liberal Party government giving a big international coal company money for a feasibility study for a power station that nobody thinks is viable. For a power source that nobody thinks is viable. In an industry that is very shortly going to be filled with stranded assets. Acting Deputy President, I want to talk a little bit about Tasmania because it's not just a Queensland debate. What we've seen in Parliament in the last week with not just this Collinsville coal dodgy grant, we've seen the government raising issues in the House last week to make the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, the CEFC, and its money available, the gas infrastructure and gas investment, an agency set up by the Greens and Labor to invest in renewable energy, an agency which the LNP have done everything they can over the last seven years to destroy. And of course, what better way to ruin the legacy than to open it up to invest in not renewables, but in fossil fuels. And of course, we've seen the initial proposals to as my colleague Senator Hanson Young says, take a chainsaw to Australia's already weak environmental laws at a time of a biodiversity and extinction crisis. So let's frame this up. While we've got this push on in federal parliament through, your, through the government to develop fossil fuels under cover of COVID, under cover of a pandemic, around the mantra jobs, 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 economic recovery, while we've got this occurring, the Liberal state government in Tasmania, in partnership with the Liberal federal government, are saying to Tasmanians, look, look at this fantastic project we've got, this Marinus link. We're going to build infrastructure to 
sell renewable energy to the to the grid. The Tasmanians don't see what's really going on. They don't see that that pet project, that pet political project, it is on the Prime Minister's priority list. Infrastructure, by the way, that even in an independent economic report released recently by the Small Business Council, not, not Greens or conservationists or anti-renewables, the Small Business Council released a report saying it wasn't viable and that it would actually drive up power prices in Tasmania. But putting that aside, this pet project is nothing but a fig leaf, a smokescreen to what this Liberal National Party government is trying to do around this country. And that is not only lock in business as usual, but ramp up fossil fuel production and infrastructure. In other words, give this industry that is a significant donor to the Liberal National Party a final leg up at a time following this catastrophic summer of fires. The third mass coral bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef in five years. Ten years ago, we didn't even think that was going to be possible in my lifetime, and we've seen it. At a time when you think we'd be going exactly the other way and all working together to transition to clean energy, to a renewable future, investing in new industries, new technology, new jobs. What do we get? We get more of the same. And the cynicism of using a pandemic and the fact that we have to grab whatever jobs and whatever investment we can get, when what we should be doing is setting up this country, not just for the next decade, but for the next 50 to 100 years, at a time of record low interest rates, a time we could invest billions of dollars in building a new future, not just that creates jobs and productivity, but also solves the great dilemmas and the great challenges of our time, like rising emissions and climate change. We're in the middle of a climate emergency and economic inequality. We did it after the Second World War. We went into significant debt and a decade of growth dividends retired that debt. We're in the same position now, uh, Acting Deputy President, but what are we getting at a time when Australians are calling out for leadership, at a time when Australians are calling out for a Green New Deal, for a new way forward? What do we get? We get $3.6 billion, $3.6 million in a feasibility study to a project that no one Order. is going to be viable. No one, perhaps, except those whose direct political interest is served, the national senators in this chamber. This is politics at its worst, acting deputy president. And I'm genuinely disgusted. I'm genuinely disgusted. And I haven't even gone in to the detail of the timeline that's led to this proposal that's before us today. But the fact that the money is even flowing, that the company was invited to apply for it two days after the government had announced they were giving the money to this company because they made this promise in an election campaign, a promise to shore up a marginal seat and to shore up their own power. Australians will see through this. Australians will see through this. This will not go well for the government. And my party, even if we're the only ones in this place, will continue to stand up for good governance and for a proper plan and a vision for this country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Canavan. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, look, Mr. President, I, Mr. Acting Deputy President, sorry, I, I do want to deal with some of the spurious arguments we've just heard from the previous speakers. But to start with, I'd like to return to the substantive issues facing this nation and this country and why we should seek to use our natural resources to grow and develop our nation and create jobs. Uh, uh, I, believe, I believe that we have a strong future as a country, as a manufacturing nation. I think we should be seeking to bring back manufacturing jobs here to this country that we have, unfortunately, for too long 
uh, seen, seen hobbled, hobbled our manufacturing industry and seen jobs disappear uh, to other countries. Uh, we know that in the facts, in the evidence, uh, uh, Mr uh, uh, Deputy President. We have to uh, face facts that the policies we have pursued, at least for the past 10 or so years, have been ones of failure for our manufacturing sector. We have to face facts, and particularly now, uh, after the coronavirus epidemic has shown the fragility of our supply chains, the importance of having domestic manufacturing, we need to face facts. And the facts are that over the last decade, has, it has been the first decade on record that the Australian manufacturing industry has gone backwards in, in real output, in real terms. The share of manufacturing as a percentage of our economy has been declining for some decades, as it has in most developed countries. But even during the 1980s, the 1990s, the 2000s, our manufacturing output continued to grow every decade, almost every year, even though it was a smaller share of the overall economy. The last 10 years have actually seen a decline, a decline in absolute terms, and that's a decline I think we should work to reverse. Uh, because of that decline, of course, we've seen fewer jobs in the manufacturing industry. In 1990, 1 1.2 million Australians worked in manufacturing. Today, the figure is around 900,000. It bottomed out at about 850,000 uh, mid last year. Uh, so we've lost about 300,000 jobs in manufacturing over that time, and that's something I think we should see seek to reverse. Now, I think it was summed up nicely, actually, by Senator Ayres, that apparently there are some industries we can support now, and some, and some uh, that are a third rail, at least for the Labor Party and certainly for the Greens, that we can't support. So Senator Ayres said we should focus on things. I picked up. He said we should focus on things, industries like export coal. We should export coal, according to Senator Ayres, uh, but of course, given his contribution uh, on behalf of the Labor Party, they don't think we should use coal here. We should export it to other countries but not use it here. That is the position of the modern Australian Labor Party, that somehow is it, it, is okay, it is okay for other countries to have access to our natural resources, to create jobs in their nation, to send back the goods for us saps to buy, but it's not good enough for us to use the same resources ourselves to create jobs in this nation. Well, I think that is a tower of absurdity, Mr Acting Deputy President, an absolute tower of absurdity that we would help, help empower, help arm other countries to compete against our own businesses but deny the same natural resources to the use of those same Australian businesses trying to compete on the world stage, trying to grow and develop their manufacturing base. It is ridiculous. Because as Senator Ayres made out, as he sort of implied—he didn't say it, but as he implied—there obviously is a market for the export of coal. The Labor Party think there is. There, there's, there's, there's people in these countries that are developing coal, that are building coal-fired power stations. In fact, in our region, roughly, roughly over the past decade, around three Hazelwood power stations. Uh, people might remember the Hazelwood coal-fired power station that shut in Victoria. It was 25 per cent of Victoria's electricity supply. Uh, roughly around three of those a week have been built in our region over the past decade. Three a week <laughs> over the past decade. And so, and so there is a very strong market for Australian big coal, particularly given the high quality of our coal, the low ash, predominantly low ash content, that will be in greater demand as countries seek to improve their air pollution and environmental circumstances in their countries. There's a great demand for that. So if there is a demand overseas, if other countries are using it and think it seems to be worthwhile for them to create manufacturing industries and create jobs, why would we deny ourselves access to the same resources? Why would we just say no, nothing, not at all? We can't even look at it, can't even look into it, can't even look into it. Uh, uh, the only reason you can fathom that that position would have any kind of coherence is because the Labor Party cannot support it because of the votes they need in inner city areas, the preferences they need from the Greens. That's why, that's why they have this absurd position where they'll apparently support coal mines but just not the use of the coal Australia. What they support what the Labor Party support is that there should be a direct channel basically from the coal mine to Japan or Korea or China, and we can't touch that. It's got to go, got to go straight from the mine on the ship overseas, but none of it can be touched or put to use uh, here in this country. Now look, Madam Acting President, well that is the public position of the Labor Party. The, the reality is that all of us here, uh, all of us here, every day, every day rely on our high quality Australian coal to get our energy, to get our electricity. In fact, today, I just checked the figures, or right now, I should say, right now, you can check it all the time. Right now in New South Wales, 80 per cent of our power, 80 percent of the power of this region, this area, is coming from coal fired power in New South Wales. 80 per cent. In Victoria, it's 67 per cent down here. Now, I'll tell you what, 
I've been, I think I've been the only North Queenslander to actually contribute in this debate. This is a project in North Queensland. A lot of people taking interest in North Queensland, which I welcome and love, but I'm the actual only North Queenslander to take, a, take an interest in it. I'll give you a guess what the figure of coal-fired power that's, coming, that's being generated in North Queensland right now. You don't have to check a live app. It's zero. There is no coal-fired power stations in North Queensland. The, the last coal-fired power stations in the country, the northernmost, is Stanwell, just west of where I live in Rockhampton. So everything north of that, everything north of that, there's no coal-fired power stations. None at all. None at all. So, so apparently, the position being held by a whole lot of southern Queenslanders here, as I said, they're welcome to have their views. But let's just put it out to be clear: the view of a bunch of southern Queenslanders in the Labor and Green parties is it's okay for us to rely on more than a majority, to rely the most on coal-fired power to power our homes, uh, to keep our lights on, to keep the factories running. That's okay. But those North Queenslanders, you can't touch it. You can't have any of it. You can't even think about building one there. Why, why, Mr Acting Deputy President, is, is, is are the Labor and the Greens Party so desperate to avoid giving or supporting a $3.5 I think it's $3 million feasibility study into something? Why are they so desperate to avoid even the question being asked? Because I think they might not like the answer. That is the reason. That is the reason. Because, because there has been, there has been, there has been a study put in, a study put in place into a coal-fired power station at Collinsville in recent years. In fact, it was commissioned by none other than Mr. Wayne Swan, the world's greatest treasurer, apparently, uh, according to some. He commissioned a study into a coal-fired power station at Collinsville. I think it was a deal he had to do with Mr. Bob Catter at the time. Uh, he commissioned it. He didn't really want to do it, but he was forced to do it. He commissioned it. It came back with a report in 2014, which found, and this I'm directly quoting from this GHD, a respected engineering company, uh, a GHD report. This is a direct quote. A major 800 megawatt coal fired power station will put strong downward pressure on electricity prices. <laughs> it was pretty clear. It was pretty clear that, guess what? You produce more power, you get lower power prices. It's not rocket science. And that, I think, is fundamentally why they don't want the question to be asked, because they're afraid of that answer, and that answer would make the position of the Labor Party, the absurd position about their, that we'll export coal but not use it, that absurd position, even harder to sustain if that answer was to come back. Now, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I did want to get on to some of the, and rebut some of the arguments that have been put forward here. There seems to be, I think, a little confusion in this place. I've been away for the while. It's my first day back for a couple of months. And, I think there's a little confusion about what democracy is. We are in a democratic chamber. We've all been elected here. In the other place, in the other place, they get election every three years. They've all been elected. But there seems to be a little confusion about exactly what democracy is. Because I thought, I thought we lived in a democratic system where peak governments and parties and all of us put our policies out before an election, take them to the people. There's a vote. There's a vote. And then the party that has the no most number of people over there in the other place gets to form a government, and the government generally, generally will seek to implement all those promises and policies that are put forward to the Australian people who are voted on. Sounds good. That it sounds like a pretty good system, I think, Senator Scar. I think we should seek to adopt it here in this country, or at least the Greens and Labor Party should get behind and support it. Because guess what has happened here in this instance? In this instance, all these words that have been bandied around, all the scandalous comments. Guess what has happened in this instance? The Liberal National Parties at, the la at last year's election, before the election, said to the Australian people, said to the people of Central and North Queensland, said to them, if we're elected, we will fund a feasibility study into a coal-fired power station at Collinsville. Given the previous work that's been done, given there's some argument for it, um, I don't have time, but given the ACCC report, which showed clearly that we need investment in base load and reliable power, and clearly there are some market failures preventing that investment we haven't seen a baseload power station built in this country for over 10 years. So given all that evidence, we said to the Australian people, we think it makes sense to have a look at this, to have a look at this. And we publicly said it, we openly said it to the Australian people, and, and they supported us. They, they voted for us. We, we achieved a majority in the, in the House of Representatives. That gave us the right to form a government. And now the government is implementing the promises it took to the Australian people. And apparently, apparently, that process that I've mapped out, and I don't think anyone can test that was the process, that process is the basis for a great scandal on, on the uh, views of what we've just heard from Senator Wish Wilson and, and Senator Ayres. I mean, have you ever heard anything more absurd that a government implementing its own election promises is, is, is the basis for some great scandal? Never heard now, of it. Never, never heard of it. It's never been done, apparently. Well, no, maybe they've it's never done it. They should try it. They should try it. Try it sometimes. Try it sometimes. 
But really, the real reason here, the real reason we come back to is why is this motion being moved? Let's just look a bit more into it. The motion is being moved here by Senator McAllister. Senator McAllister is from New South Wales. And if, and if you go to Senator McAllister's website on the New South Wales Labor Party site, it says that in 2003, Jenny founded, and I'm quoting, sorry, uh, Mr. Mr. President, I'm quoting here. In 2003, Jenny founded the Labor Environment Activist Network and served as one of its ignorable Lee. conveners. Yes, Lee. otherwise called Lee. Now, I notice Lee these days used the term Labor Environment Action Network, I think, but apparently it must have been an activist network to start with. That's very interesting. I didn't know that. But so Senator McAllister formed this group, this lean group, that is basically the Bob Brown wing of the Labor Party. And, 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 they, and they now are moving this motion to prevent jobs and investment in North Queensland. Where are the Queensland senators, Mr Act Deputy President? Where are the Labor Queensland senators? Where are the Labor Queensland senators? I don't think any of them have spoken. I don't think any of them have moved this motion. None of them have the guts in this place to come up and tell the people of Queensland why they don't support coal jobs. Why they don't? They're a bit shy on this, Mr. Acne President. They're a bit shy because they know they know that the people of Queensland have worked them out. They've worked them out, as as Miss Joanne Miller today, the former member for Ben Damber in the Queensland Parliament, has said. Labor would like to take the royalties from the coal industry in Queensland with one hand, and on the other hand they poke the industry in the eye. They have worked them out. The people of Queensland have worked you out. And until you get into this place and actually have the guts to come forward and put your arguments, not sit behind the lean group, the Bob Brown wing of the Labor Party, the people will still continue to desert the once proud Labor Party in Queensland. Because what did we see from Lean the other day? We saw from Lean. This, is a bit, this tells you a bit about them, who they are. Not many people probably know about Lean. I think you're about to hear a lot, lot more about them. The Lean Group the other day, uh, they came out. They sent an email to their supporters, apparently, uh, that uh, was reported in the Australian uh, last week. I think it was that the Labor Environment Action Network is launching a campaign to encourage people to junk their gas-powered household appliances. The email goes on to say that a residential gas to electric program comes with an added bonus that will free up gas for industry. They want people to get rid of their gas appliances. They, these guys, <laughs> this is their policy. Their policy is that people got to get rid of gas policies, gas, gas appliances. Because, Mr. Deputy President, I've heard, I've heard a lot of political parties over the years have wanted to come up with a policy, have wanted to come up with a program that can be a barbecue stopper. But I think this is the first time in Australian political history that a party's actually taken a literal barbecue stopper as their policy. <laughs> this policy is to shut down barbecues. Because I don't know about you, my, my, my barbecue is powered by good old LPG. That's what I hook up to it every week. Fire it up. Most Australians probably have a gas-fired barbecue. You could use coal. You could use coals, as some of those are out. I don't. Maybe I should, but I don't have a good old coal-fired power, coal-fired barbecue. I've got a gas-fired one, and and they want to shut them down. They want to stop all the barbecues in Australia. This is the madness that is coming. If you just scratch the surface of the modern Labor Party, it's the madness that is underneath, uh, and that is what people like Mr. Joel Fitzgibbon and the other places exposing. Uh, he's doing his best to try and cover it up with a few high-vis shirts, uh, but it's becoming increasingly difficult. As he said the other week, he might have to split away. He might have to split away. I don't think he has to form his own party. Come and join us. He'll, he'll fit in well in the Nats. We'll take him. We'll take him. Uh, a bit of polish, and he'll be right. So we, we, we need to expose this to the Australian people, Mr. Agnew. This debate's very important because it shows the actual motives. It shows the the direction the Labor Party is headed in this country. People hear the word Labor. And they think they must be do about something about jobs and workers, but that was a long, long time ago, Mr. Acne President. They now, they now, they want now want to now want to take people's gas appliances away from them. I didn't think it would get this crazy, but it has. This is from their own people. Want to want to take away people's barbecues. They don't want to support the use of our own natural resources to support our manufacturing industries. They basically now want to help out competing countries overseas with our own resources, with our own resources and then buy back solar panels and wind turbines at great subsidy to the cost of the Australian taxpayer. Well, I'm standing here as someone who wants to use our natural resources to create jobs in this country because I want to see our manufacturing sector come back to strength. And that won't happen. That won't happen while we deny Australians the use of our own God-given high-quality natural resources. Thank you. I've had an indication that Senator Rice is going to make a contribution remotely. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. We are debating an appalling decision tonight, an appalling decision to give away $3.6 million of yours and my taxpayer dollars, hard-earned taxpayer dollars, for a coal-fired power station. This decision 
ticks all of the boxes of bad decision making. At least four big ones, four big reasons as to why it is totally the wrong thing to be doing. And I'm going to talk through these in my contribution tonight. The first is that the last thing in the world that the world needs in a climate crisis is a new coal-fired power station. Secondly, a new coal-fired power station is totally economically irresponsible. Thirdly, it's just a cruel hoax. It's just teasing the North Queensland community with the prospects of jobs and economic development. That is just not going to happen. And fourthly, the process of giving this grant is totally corrupt. So I want to talk through these and finish up with what we need to do about it, because action outside this place, sadly, is going to be needed to get ourselves on a place where we can have hope for our future. And you just heard from Senator Canavan, we just heard from Senator Rennick. Sadly, there is no hope that this government, supported by their tinfoil hat-wearing sidekicks, One Nation, are going to come to their senses. They are not going to listen. I mean, time and time again, they have shown that they are not listening to the reality of what lies ahead for our world because of our climate crisis. They have their heads firmly in, their, in the sand, they have their fingers in, the, in their ears and they are saying, la, 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 as loudly as they can without getting a mouthful of sand. So let's start with the fact that the last thing the world needs is a new coal-fired power station. And in case someone has just woke, woken up from some Rip Van Winkle type sleep, they've been asleep for the last 30 years, here are the simple facts. The climate crisis is real. It's happening now and it's caused by the burning of coal and gas and oil. It fueled the unprecedented bushfires that we experienced last summer, that burnt the biggest area of forest burnt in Australia in one summer ever, and the biggest proportion of forest on a continent anywhere in the world ever, killing three billion animals. And it was the climate crisis that fueled the smoke that blanketed our cities for months on end. And it was the climate crisis that is creating the unprecedented drought that our farmers have been struggling with, that unprecedented drought that the Nationals, as represented by Senator Can Canavan, are in denial about the link between the climate crisis and the drought, and the unprecedented heat that's making these droughts get worse and worse and making it really difficult for us to grow food, destroying the livelihoods of our, fa of our farmers. And it's the climate crisis that is causing the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef and rising sea levels that threaten to wash away huge parts of our cities, pushing animals and plants, whole ecosystems to the brink of extinction. You get the picture. This is a crisis. It's an existential crisis for humanity and for the world. We are doing severe harm to life, to our life support systems and to ourselves, and we've got to stop. So what do we need to do so that it doesn't get worse? It's very simple. We've got to stop burning coal and gas and oil as soon as possible. There is no time to waste. There is no carbon budget left. Every tonne of carbon released into the atmosphere is doing us and the planet harm. The last thing we need to be doing is to be building new coal-fired power stations. And yes, I'll take Senator Canavan's um, point. We also don't need to be exporting coal for other countries' coal-fired power stations. Labor don't quite get the extent of this climate crisis either. But how does the government respond to this? We just heard Senator Canavan basically saying that everything was fine with burning fossil fuels. Basically, they are just totally in denial. They're saying that it doesn't matter because in their view, building a coal-fired power station might somehow be good for the Queensland economy. Which, of course, brings me to my second point. A new coal-fired power station for North Queensland does not stack up. It's cheaper to build renewable power than it is to build new coal. I mean, let me quote economist Frank Jotso, who specialises in climate and energy policy. And he makes it very clear that the high cost of building and running the plant, coupled with the falling cost of other energy sources, particularly renewables, means it's unlikely to be viable. In fact, his expert opinion 
is that the average cost of producing electricity from a new coal-fired plant, if one were built now, might be as, two, as high as two times higher than the average cost from wind and solar plants, even with the cost of smoothing out the intermittency of those plants with energy storage, i.e. the batteries or the pumped hydro or the concentrated solar thermal that might be needed, or the hydrogen that might be needed to store up the energy to buffer the, any intermittent factors. He says the financial cost of any new coal-fired power plant would be massive. Any new coal-fired power plant would need government support via subsidies and a guarantee that the carbon price would never be applied. It would need to be the taxpayer that underwrites all of this, and it would be the taxpayer that pays the inflated bills for decades to come. So total fail on economics, which is why my third point as to why this grant is so bad is so important. I mean, clearly this grant for a feasibility study is basically just the government tearing up $3.6 million and throwing it into the wind. They are doing it so it looks like they're doing something to try and buy votes, to give hope to people who are struggling, who want and deserve some economic security. This is just cruel. This power station isn't going to be built. It doesn't stack up. It's pretending to offer hope, economic security, jobs, when they are a mirage. And there's so much more that this government could be doing with $3.6 million to help transition away from the dirty industries of the past to a clean, jobs-rich economy. Things like, yes, massive investment in solar and wind, making hydrogen for domestic use and export, carbon farming, environmental restoration, health and aged care, education, investing in public housing, improving the ability to work remotely, like we are sort of managing to do here today, so that people can be living in remote areas and working with other people all across the country. This is where the jobs of the future are. This is what any government looking sensibly, strategically, about how to improve the fortunes of a town like Collinsville would do, instead of throwing them a bone that stinks to high heaven. It's a bone that should have been well and truly thrown out last century. But here is where it gets really stinky, because who are Shine Energy? who have had this $3.6 million windfall just sort of land in their laps. Shine Energy are a company that has no expertise in building coal-fired power stations and a company that's got links to big coal company Glencore, who just happened to be a mega donor to the coalition. And how did they get this $3.6 million? In a total farce of a process, where the grant was awarded two days before an application was even put in in a grants program that was invented just to give them the grant. In fact, on the 8th of February this oh, year, in the, when the country was still burning, Minister Taylor announced that Shine would receive up to $4 million of public money for a feasibility study into a so-called low-emission coal-fired power plant. Yes, you're right, for something that doesn't exist. And two days later, they were asked to apply, two days after they'd been announced as the winner, as the winner of this public money. And it gets worse. The company that would get this windfall gain, Shine Energy, has got connections with coal giant Glencore, who donate a whole heap of money to the coalition and would directly benefit from the coal power station's construction. Funnily enough, Glencore, of course, have been very actively lobbying the government to be supporting this power station and the coal industry overall. I mean, this stuff matters. This is corruption. People like to believe that Australia has good processes that we abide by the rule of law, undermining good processes, trashing good processes, not only leads to corrupt outcomes that favour the rich and powerful but, but, and leaving people and the environment in their wake, but they destroy trust in government. And trust in government matters. I mean, being in a pandemic makes that very clear. We need to be able to trust that our government is acting responsibly, is doing what's necessary to keep us safe. We need to trust in our government so we can have hope for a safe and a healthy future. I mean, trust in government is a critical thing. It's critical for a healthy, well-functioning society. But of course, when it comes to trashing trust, trust by rotting grants programs, the coalition's got form. You know, the Senate's still trying to uncover everything that went on with the sports rorts program, a $100 million pre-election rort 
that was all about buying votes, colour-coded spreadsheets going backwards and forwards, funding projects that suited them. We then, you know, Sports Minister Bridget McKenzie emailing the Prime Minister's office dozens of times about which projects would get approved in which electorates. And of course, during the, the sports rorts Senate inquiry, we've uncovered sports rorts two and sports rorts three, two more pre-election slush funds. Sports rorts two being the female facilities and water safety stream, $150 million that was funneled in the swimming pool in marginal coalition seats. Blatant pork barrelling. And then sports rorts three, which we uncovered just in the last couple of weeks, the $45 million pre-election cash splash, where 99% of the money went to seats that were either coalition seats or marginal seats without any requirement for an application, where the funding criteria has been described as light touch, i.e. just a nod and a wink between an MP and their mates so that they would have an election in their announcement to trumpet. Now, I personally know how hard it is when you're in a community that isn't a marginal electorate. I've lived in one all of my life. I was mayor of one. And when you're the mayor of a council that's in a safe Labor seat, the coalition just ignores you and Labor takes you when they're in government and Labor just takes you for, for granted when they are. It's incredibly frustrating to see your community miss out because of this corrupt process. And it's the same when we're shifting our con trying to shift our economy to a clean, green energy future. We're being held back by grants like this one, by massive billions of dollars of subsidies into the fossil fuel, it, uh, to the mining companies, making it them get cheaper diesel than you and I can get. I mean, instead of splashing our money help to help out their mates, propping up coal and gas and oil, there's so much that we could be doing to invest, to recover from the crisis that we're, they're currently in. We could be leading the world as a renewable energy giant. Renewable energy project could mean thousands and thousands of jobs across Australia, particularly in regional Australia. We could be building the sustainable transport and energy infrastructure that we need for this century. We could be building the affordable housing that's so critical for a fair and equitable society. But no, instead, the coalition is looking after their mates, big business and big politics working well together and not serving the interests of Australia, devastating Australia, in fact, through their refusal to act in the national interest. Look, I want to finish by focusing on what we, what we, the people of Australia, can do about it. Because as I said, we've heard from the contributions of this debate, they are not listening. They are listening to their mates. They are not listening to the people of Australia. We need to get more active. We need to get our friends and our families and our neighbours and our communities informed and active, and we need to turf this lot out of office. We can elect a government, which the Greens share power in, and we can then be on our way to be building a future that actually doesn't have this corruption as part of it, that is clean and green and fair, that we can feel hopeful about rather than despairing about. And you know what? I'm really looking forward to people getting on board because I'm very confident that the people of Australia will see through this. They will see that the only way out is to turf this lot out and to elect a much more, a, um, a, a, much, a, a government that is actually going to be working in the interests of people in the community. And I am really looking forward in working with the people of Australia in doing this. Thank you. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. This is a commitment that we took to the last election. And we, on this side, honour our commitments. And apparently, we heard tonight, only we on this side believe in honouring election commitments. It's something I'm quite proud of. Labor don't support mining and they don't support the regions who rely on it. Labor has just gone through an NT election claiming that they support the onshore oil and gas industry. Is that about to change? Are they about to follow their southern masters? It's no surprise last week when Labor stood up against mining jobs, the CFMEU announced that they are backing away from Queensland Labor. 
is our NT onshore oil and gas and future coal industry the next thing they're going to attack? But we don't need oil, gas, coal, etc., because we have renewables. Renewables, or the dull bludgers of the energy mix, as my good friend Senator Canavan calls them. Last week in this place, Senator McAllister brought up the Territory Sun Cable project, and I'm glad that she did. For those who aren't aware, this involves filling a, uh, a cattle station paddock on the Barclay full of solar panels and running an extension cord over to Singapore. Present estimates for the Sun Cable project in the Northern Territory are that it will cost about $25 billion. $25 billion, or over eight small modular reactors. And Labor brags about this number of $25 billion like it is something to be proud of. Let's not forget this project is predicated on a raft of technologies that do not exist. One only needs to look at Labor's history of fiscal mismanagement to understand how this massive expense rolls off their talking point sheets so easily. Compounding their gross lack of understanding of renewables is their adherence to the inane notion that solar and wind power is free. That's right. They tell people renewables are free or cheaper than coal and gas-fired power stations. Why? Because you are the hoaxes, Senator Ayres and Senator Rice. You are the hoaxes, not those of us on this side of this place. Because the sun shines and the wind blows only partially explains their position. But the most alarming element is that when Labor spends taxpayers' money on rebates and subsidies, they pretend that money came from nowhere. Indeed, they factor that spending into their argument to make the cost of renewables appear cheaper. Like all Labor governments I've seen in Australia, that economy is a false one. In reality, the sun shines less than half the time. The wind blows intermittently. When renewables do produce power, you need to have a means by which to store that power. Now, those of us on this side of the House know this, and the concept is one which we see, understand and plan for. Labor, on the other hand, prefer to remain in their fantasy world of unicorns and flying horses and of making announcements and pretending they will become a reality. As highlighted in the productivity report into Power and Water Authority in the Northern Territory, that came out earlier this year. This report highlighted the imminent collapse of significant portions of the NT power grid because while solar farms are being built everywhere, nobody actually thought to install a battery. Worse, they didn't even have any future plans to do so. That's right, all sun and no fun. When the sun sets, the solar power goes away and then Territorians must rely on something other than renewables. For more than four months every year, the monsoon season rolls across the top end of the NT and guess what? There's no sunlight. In Queensland right now, communities can have a coal-fired power station for about two billion. $2 billion is a great deal of money, but it's a fraction of the $25 billion of the solar power project in the Northern Territory. Now, my Queensland colleagues in the Senate assure me that the Sunshine State is in fact sunless for at least half of every day. I also know that in northern parts of Queensland, many areas are also affected by the seasonal monsoons inhibiting sunlight. How much impact do these attributes have on power in communities in Queensland? 
None, Madam Acting Deputy President. They have none. And do you know why? That's because Queensland has coal-fired power stations. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, um, Madam, Madam Acting Deputy President. Look, I rise um, just to um, put a few comments on the in the Hansard on this, and I rise as the Shadow Finance Minister because I think it is important to. Um, when we're having this discussion about where money is going at the moment, to remind everybody in this chamber that every cent of the $3.3 million feasibility um, study that's going to go to this project is borrowed money. Um, it is, it is, well, Senator, Senator Rennick, I sat and listened to you, um, and now I'm going to make a few comments myself. The $3.3 million is all borrowed money. and. Um, we think um, the government should consider that against um, the comments its own uh, members of its team have said in the sense of, well, it's fine because it was an election commitment so we can go ahead with it even though it costs $3.3 million because the project's not going to get up anyway. I mean, that's the comments of your own team, whether it be um, Mr Zimmerman, Mr Sharma, Mr Falinski. And we don't think that's right. We don't think we should be in a position where gross debt, I think as of uh, last Friday, was $768.6 billion, almost $300 billion of which was borrowed before the pandemic hit. We know that the budget for last year, although we'll wait for the final budget outcome, has a deficit of $85.8 billion. This financial year, the government in July was forecasting a deficit of $184.5 billion, and we know they've uh, spent additional, uh, made additional expenditure commitments uh, since that time. So, I would imagine the deficit will be uh, significantly bigger than that when we are given that update in October. And so, when you are making further expenditure decisions in the time when you've got record debt record deficits you're heading into your seventh and eighth budget delivering your seventh and eighth budget deficit in a row after promising a budget surplus in every year in your first term remember that commitment doesn't get spoken about very often anymore does it we will um, deliver a budget surplus in the first year and every year after that well it never happened never happened we will pay down debt never happened never ever happened and now we're in the situation where those fiscal conservatives over there uh, should be um, looking at ways to repair the budget. We've got, we find ourselves in a situation where we've got a project that seems to be universally accepted, won't get government funding to continue, but it's okay to hand out $3.3 million uh, just to keep, keep the Nats quiet. That's what it seems to be, because there hasn't been a very strong defence from the government members, from Liberal members, uh, on this point. Well, <laughs> we did have your contribution, Senator Rennick, and I reaffirm that we haven't had a very strong argument from uh, Liberal members of the coalition to defend this. Um, it's a payoff to the National Party. It's $3.3 million. Imagine what that $3.3 million could be used. I have witnesses before the COVID committee almost on a weekly basis who would have equal claim to that, whether it's about creating jobs or putting food on the table for families that are struggling or to pay for all the support for all the people that are excluded from JobKeeper, you name it. There's a whole range of worthy causes um, where you could actually argue the case for extra expenditure. I'm not sure a project which government's own members acknowledge will not get up without further government subsidy is the right way to be spending $3.3 million dollars in a time where we've got record debt, record deficit, we're heading into our seventh and eighth budget deficit under this government, and the Parliamentary Budget Office is telling us that we are going to be in deficit for the next decade. That's the financial situation we're in, and for some reason uh, those opposite who have argued the case tonight think it's fine to chuck $3.3 million to a private company whose project on all the information I've read, is unlikely to get up without further government expenditure. And if there isn't going to be further government expenditure, why should this $3.3 million be flushed away on a feasibility study that's apparently, according to government members, going nowhere? Mm -hmm.
Senator Colwick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I, I sum up for the government. This was a commitment the government took to the last election, yeah. Madam Acting Deputy President. We keep all our election commitments, including this one, to the people of North Queensland. We're creating jobs and opportunities for Australians, particularly as we move into a post-COVID-19 world. We want a stronger economy supported by affordable and reliable power. A vote to disallow is a vote against jobs in North Queensland. So the question is that the Industry Research and Development Bankable Feasibility Study on High Efficiency Low Emissions Coal Plant in Collinsville Program, Instrument 2020, be disallowed. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The ayes have, have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. I have to relieve you temporarily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what one do we do?
Stop the bells. The question is that business of the Senate order of the day number one be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Urquhart, tell of the ayes. Senator Brockman, tell of the noes. The result of the division is ayes 24, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the negative. I'll call the clerk. Government business order of the day number one, Coronavirus Economic Response Package Job Keeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. I'll give Senator Faruqi a moment to get to her seat. She was in continuation. Senator Faruqi. Um, I rise to continue my speech on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Bill. Women are already bearing the brunt of the economic impacts of the pandemic, so much so that economists have said that we are in a pink collar recession. Women lost their jobs twice as fast as men when the economy was shut down. Women are overrepresented as casual workers in industries most affected by shutdowns like retail and hospitality. Women are underrepresented in the few industries which received targeted stimulus, such as the construction sector. Young women have been forced to dip into their already meager superannuation balances at disproportionate rates to make it through the crisis, which is going to decimate their retirement savings. The government's approach to early childhood education and care was a double whammy for women and their earning potential. Not only did the government rip away access to free childcare, potentially one of the most significant boosts to women's capacity to enter and remain in the workforce in a generation, but it carved the highly feminized early learning and care workforce out of JobKeeper altogether, months before the scheme was originally scheduled to end. There has been no job creation for women during this crisis, and there is none planned for the recovery. Instead, women have been totally shafted and left to fend for themselves. I've said it before, and I'll say it again, our recovery plans must have women at the front and center of planning and decision-making. This recovery must be a feminist recovery. Creating this two-tiered JobKeeper system will also be a disaster. Can I remind the Chamber that we are in the middle of a pandemic and in the middle of a recession? This is not the time to be cutting the critical JobKeeper payment, which is $1,500 at the moment, and it's really barely just a living wage to begin with. A cut down to $1,200 and a staggeringly low $750 in the case of part-time workers will put extra stress on people at a time when, they should, when we should be doing everything we can to reduce anxiety and economic uncertainty and to ma maintain household liquidity. JobKeeper should remain at $1,500, and there should be no tiered system. The worst part is the government didn't need to package up cuts to workers' conditions and incomes with the extension of JobKeeper. We could enable the extension of JobKeeper and the existing flexibility measures for eligible businesses by simply changing the prescribed period of the existing act. We didn't need to bring down the payments. But of course, this government couldn't pass up the opportunity to wedge in some corporate welfare, weaken employment conditions for swathes of workers, and shift the cost of the recovery onto workers who are already doing it tough. 
We know that protecting people's incomes is one of the most effective mechanisms to cushion the blow of an economic downturn. We know that low incomes perpetuate recessions and depressions. We know that one of the key drivers of homelessness is unaffordable rents at the bottom of the private market. And yet, when the economy needs more stimulus, as it reopens, we see the government choosing contradictory policies, slashing JobKeeper and JobSeeker, and allowing businesses to cut workers' hours and wages will drive hundreds of thousands of people closer to poverty and homelessness. And this could not come at a worse time. Um, at the end of important eviction bans approaching. I mean, this cliff is upon us, and the federal government must extend a ban on evictions alongside the extension of JobKeeper and making sure that the current rate of job seeker remains. When the government finally introduced measures like the coronavirus supplement to job seeker and other social security payments and the JobKeeper wage subsidy earlier this year, what we saw from them was an acceptance that when crisis hits, economic and social reality beats ideology. The government was rightly afraid of the public health catastrophe, catastrophe that we faced. But let's not forget that this irresponsible, economically illiterate government actively encouraged workers as well to dip into their superannuation at the worst possible market conditions, shifting the cost of the pandemic onto ordinary workers and hollowing out their retirement savings. Yet even that theft of people's future security was an acknowledgement by the government um, that what the economy needs right now is cash flowing through it and that the state holds the levers to make that happen. The pandemic has exposed the great neoliberal lie that governments don't have the power to end poverty and homelessness, the lie that there is no alternative to inequality and in insecure work and housing, that they are unavoidable conditions of modern life. The government's response to this crisis was uncharacteristically interventionist because reality forced its hand. And what we are seeing now are desperate attempts at winding back that intervention before it's too late. To this government and their corporate backers emerging from this pandemic with a population that expects the state to provide an expanded, decent social safety net would be disastrous, sadly. The government could have chosen to simply extend the JobKeeper package, or even better, to improve it by expanding eligibility to all workers who need it and ensuring that all workers could access paid pandemic leave to protect their incomes and their jobs and their health and the job and the health of their family um, and the community. Instead, it's returning to form with vengeance, devaluing the sectors of the economy where women make up a high proportion of the workforce making policy decisions based on culture wars and backwards economic thinking, pushing people back into poverty and blaming them for it, putting the interests of business before the interests of ordinary people. And we cannot let them get away with it. The Greens will seek to fix this bill, and I urge the Labour Party and the crossbench to stand up for workers and the community by voting to maintain adequate income support and protect workers' pay and conditions. Together, we can force this government to give people the support that they need to keep them out of poverty and to ensure that workers are not the ones footing the bill for this pandemic. We can and must emerge from this pandemic safer and more secure, committed to building an economy and society with people's needs at the heart of it. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package, JobKeeper Job Payments Amendment Bill 2020. And I do so with great pleasure. Uh, and may I add that I welcome the Labor Party's support for this bill. Uh, it's great to see Senator Farrell in uh, earlier debate acknowledge how successful this program has been in trying to wrangle credit for the program for the Labor Party. Uh, but I welcome the support by the Labor Party of this bill nonetheless. Uh, this bill extends the prescribed period of the coronavirus payment framework for the JobKeeper payment from 31 December 2020 to 28 March 2021. This bill also amends the information sharing arrangements to enable the ATO <coughs> beg your pardon, to share JobKeeper payment information with Commonwealth, state and territory government agencies to assist them 
in their efforts to address the impacts of the coronavirus. And this would include such information as uptake of differing programs by area. The JobKeeper payment is a key part of the government's response to the significant economic consequences of the coronavirus pandemic. And these effects are still being felt by many, many businesses. And the government is extending and better targeting the JobKeeper payment to support businesses and their workers as they manage and recover from the economic effects of the coronavirus. Indeed, as a senator for Western Australia, I've travelled extensively across the state this year. As I know, uh, Senator Brockman has done, and I acknowledge his presence uh, in, and his, his commitment to uh, getting out into the regions. And, and he, I'm sure, would share the same sentiment that we're feeling is that, that, uh, as we get out and about, that this, uh, the, this response to the coronavirus pandemic in supporting businesses has been very, very significant. I've said uh, on this side, uh, I've said in this chamber many times before that I've heard some quite inspiring stories of uh, invention, ingenuity and adaption and resilience. And I've also heard many stories of those that have been hit hardest by the pandemic and hit hardest by the effects of the economic shutdown and the resulting economic shock. Businesses right across WA and those around the Perth metro area, uh, including also those in the Great Southern and right up the far north of our state, have all felt the impacts of the economic shock that has come as a result of the coronavirus. The industries and the impact that they have sustained have been substantially different. Of course, no two stories are the same, but the Morrison government has continued to back them. This pandemic is impacting businesses differently, whether you're across various parts of the state or indeed across the nation. It certainly has, and no two stories are the same. And this has been reflected in all of my conversations around Western Australia. Time and time again, I've heard stories of how JobKeeper saved jobs and allowed businesses to keep uh, their doors open. In Albany, uh, I was speaking with a business there in the south of my state, uh, Tony from the world of cars, who was going to have to let go of her staff. And it was on the day that she was about to announce to her staff that she was going to have to stand them down, that the announcement of JobKeeper came in. And that announcement came just at the perfect time, because it was only going to be later in that afternoon that she was going to deliver this most awful news to her staff that they were going to have to be stood down. But because of the JobKeeper uh, program, she was able to hang on to those 25 full-time employees because of this government's response. And as she told me this story, she was holding back the tears because you know, these are small business people. These are people that care deeply about their employees. They care deeply about their staff and they know what it would mean to them, but they also recognise what it would mean to their business had they lost that, those staff. The cost of holding on to staff, uh, sorry, of, of letting go of staff and then having to rehire them and retrain people is astronomical and it would be a major barrier to their businesses getting back up and running after we're through the impact of this economic shock. But we continue to listen to businesses like Tony and we continue to back them. We will continue to do everything we can to make sure that they are in the best possible position to bounce back in the recovery phase. On the 21st of July, the government announced that the JobKeeper payment will be extended for an additional six-month period from 28th of September 2020 to 28th of March 2021 with eligibility retested and targeted to those businesses most in need. In addition, the payment will be restructured into a two-tier system from the 28th of September 2020. Now, as I've gone around Perth, Perth is actually uh, doing remarkably well uh, at the other side of this, uh, through this pandemic. Uh, and businesses, uh, many of them are actually doing quite well. A good friend of mine is, uh, runs a plumbing business and he said he's actually never been busier. He's never been busier. But then you speak to other businesses, particularly those that are in the hospitality sector or the tourism sector. Uh, my travel up north uh, was in the East Kimberley. Now, Broome's doing quite well. That's, uh, that's in the West Kimberley. But in the East Kimberley, uh, businesses there are really, really suffering. Uh, they call the Great Northern Highway the longest cul-de-sac in the world right now because of the border closure. And 
the grey nomads that normally come up from the south to escape the winter cold get up there and they would often spend some time in Broome and then start heading east towards Kununurra and many of them will do a full lap around the country or quite possibly those coming from the east will, will start north and, and head into the Kimberley and start in Kununurra and, and head their way down all the way down to Perth. But because of the water closure there's a, there's a cul-de-sac essentially. And these businesses are, are really, 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 really struggling. And so the government recognises that there are businesses that are that are actually doing okay, and they're businesses that are not, that are still, because of the nature of their business and where they are, where they're situated, they're going to have differing uh, impacts. And so this legislation is all about supporting those businesses that maybe are experiencing, for some of them, their downturn actually came more recently than what others did right at the very beginning. And so we're responsive to that. We've recognised where the program can be improved. We've taken feedback. We've listened to businesses. We've listened to people on the ground. We've taken that feedback on board. And we're implementing it in such a way that gets the impact where it is most needed. These temporary amendments to the Fair Work Act 2019 support the practical operation of the JobKeeper scheme and help to keep Australians employed and connected to their workplaces. They've been absolutely critical in keeping more people in work. Madam Acting Deputy President, a survey of employers commissioned by the Attorney General's Department shows that the flexibility measures issued under the Temporary Fair Work Act amendments have been vital for business to survive the impact of the pandemic and save jobs. That is the singular focus of this legislation, but importantly of this government, to do what we can do as a government to ensure that we are protecting jobs at this critical time. And we cannot allow for uh, industrial issues to actually get in the way of a good common sense approach to keeping a job and enabling people to sustain in that job. And so this legislation goes to addressing the issues that uh, many businesses have been facing. And this flexibility of it is what employers have fed back to us, and it's why we have implemented it as part of this bill. Due to the ongoing economic impacts of the coronavirus and the extension of the JobKeeper payment scheme, the temporary changes in the Fair Work Act will be extended until the 28th of March 2021. However, the provisions about annual leave agreements will be repealed on the 28th of September 2020 as originally intended. Employers who qualify for the JobKeeper payment scheme on or after the 28th of 2020, September 2020 will be able to access the remaining temporary flexibilities in the Fair Work Act. Madam Acting Deputy President, businesses, as I've said, have had to deal with so much through this coronavirus economic, uh, the, the health issue and then the, the resulting economic impact. And it is this government's commitment to ensure that we're adapting and we're responsive to the needs as they come up. And in Western Australia, we need uh, to really see things energised to get back in a sustainable way. And I look forward to having uh, further contributions in the debate around what we need to be doing, because uh, it, it is more than just keeping people safe. We, of course, must keep our community safe and prevent the spread of the coronavirus, and, and everyone needs to be doing absolutely everything they can to do that. But we also need to be looking at what we can do. Uh, various levels of government, whether it's local government, state government or federal government, to ensure that we are creating the right economic environment so that businesses can actually can grow, can, can develop and take advantage of the opportunities that are being provided through economic stimulus, through programs that are uh, putting uh, resources into the, into the economy, capital into the economy. But none of that would be possible if businesses were having to let go of people because they couldn't hang on to them. It's only possible to take advantage of, of the stimulatory measures that are put in place by this government and even state governments because of the support that is there for businesses to hold on to their staff. And that's why this legislation is so critical. I'm very pleased that the opposition supports this and I look forward to hearing further debate. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Thank you, Madam.
President. I rise to speak on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020. And before I forget, I'd like to move the second reading amendment that circulated uh, in my name. This bill extends the end of um, JobKeeper from its original end date at the end of September through to the end of March next year. The bill almost also makes some changes in relation to the industrial relations arrangements, which are linked to the JobKeeper extension. And I know my colleague Senator Farrell has spoken uh, in his second reading speech on those. Labor welcomes this extension to JobKeeper. Unlike the Prime Minister, we never believed in the September snapback, not just in JobKeeper but for the coronavirus supplement either. It was always going to be an untenable for the September snapback to occur. With over 1.6 million Australians on unemployment benefits and more than 3.5 million Australians receiving JobKeeper, we also know there's another 400,000 Australians predicted to lose their jobs by Christmas. Those numbers alone tell you enough about what would have happened if the September snapback was allowed to happen. This bill simply legislates the extension of the JobKeeper program to the end of March. When it comes to extending JobKeeper until March, Labor fully supports that in extension. Indeed, we argued for it well before the government announced it as part of their economic and fiscal update in July this year. What this bill doesn't deal with is the payment rates, including the tapering uh, the government announced as part of their economic and fiscal update. The government intends to reduce um, JobKeeper rates for full-time employees from $1,500 to $1,200 a fortnight from the end of September and then from $1,200 to $1,000 a fortnight from the start of January. And it's solely in the Treasurer's power uh, to change those rates at any time. For those working less than 20 hours per week, the rates will be reduced from 1,500 to 750 for employees working less than 20 hours a week and then down to $600 in January. The issues around eligibility for JobKeeper are also in the Treasurer's power to change. These take me to two issues with JobKeeper arrangements that Labor continues to have concerns about. On eligibility, despite the government budgeting for over $101 billion to be spent on JobKeeper, it still leaves out millions of workers—casuals, workers at universities, aviation workers such as those at Donata, which this chamber has heard a lot about. They're all left out from the original JobKeeper and will continue to be left out by this latest version of the wage subsidy scheme. Because of this deliberate design feature to lock out large numbers of workers from JobKeeper, the unemployment queues are going to be longer than they could have been because of the choices of this government. When it comes to the payment rates of JobKeeper, we note that the government made the decision to reduce the rate of JobKeeper in two stages based on the economic conditions at forecast at that time. But since those change rates were announced, there have been a further deterioration in the outlook for both the economy and the unemployment uh, rate. Labor has been arguing that the level of support in the economy needs to be tailored to the economic circumstances of the time. Our position is a sensible one and one which is supported by the RBA and respected private sector economists. We need to get the economic recovery right and we need the interventions from government to be as good as they can be and in the national interest. What worries us on the Labor side is whilst we know how much support the government wants to remove from the economy, we don't have a plan for jobs for the economy. And this legislation offers nothing in mapping out a plan for jobs in the recovery stage. Australia desperately needs a plan for creating good, secure jobs. We need to be protecting the jobs people have now and a blueprint for growing new jobs into the future. And we need the government to show, show some urgency for all of those who are about to enter the labour market for the first time and for those who have lost their jobs or their businesses over the last six months. We all know that this government is big on slogans and spin. Snappy titles are easy to announce, job maker, job trainer, home builder, but living up to the titles is proving to be more difficult for this government. Job maker, when you look at that, the Department of Employment, i.e. the Department of Jobs, didn't even know about it until the Prime Minister announced it in his speech. The same department couldn't explain what job maker was, other than they weren't responsible for it. Job trainer, the usual big announcement, followed by, well, we don't know yet. We have to wait to find out what the skills focus will be, because guess what? That wasn't known when the announcement was made. The Skills Commission hadn't decided what the skills focus should be, but apparently it's coming soon. And Home Builder, again, the photo op on the 4th of June, and yet more than two months later, 
The government is just getting the application processes in place, and the last time Treasury appeared before the COVID committee just a couple of weeks ago, no successful applicants and no money out the door. Australians need more from this government than slogans and spin. The country needs a comprehensive jobs plan, a real plan, not a slogan. A plan that identifies where the opportunities are and outlines how the government is going to drive that plan. Witness after witness before the COVID committee, from a, as diverse a backgrounds as you could imagine, are all crying out for the same thing. They want a government that responds in a timely way. They want a government that takes their feedback seriously. They want support. They want certainty. They want to be valued for the jobs they do and for the businesses they run. And they are desperate for the government to drive confidence up across the country, because without confidence there will be no incentive to invest or to grow jobs. And in the end, what this is all about is the focus of the economic recovery. It has to be all about jobs. In terms of instilling confidence, I think there's a range of suggestions for the government to consider. Labor has been talking about the need for a national jobs plan for months. But there's other things that the government could be doing, taking responsibility for aged care, not using the Royal Commission as an excuse to do nothing. And the country will be immeasurably better off in so many ways if older Australians are cared for respectfully. Get an energy plan in place to drive investment and create jobs. Seriously look at how you can support women into work by making sure the early childhood sector supports them and doesn't make it harder for them. Support the university sector. Stop telling us how rich and undeserving they all are as thousands of jobs are cut and teachers, researchers, scientists are thrown into early retirement or onto the unemployment payments, many for the first time in their lives. Stop looking at IR through the single lens of flexibility for the employer. How about broadening that to uh, start dealing with the structural unfairness across our labour market faced by employees, the working people in this country who live hand to mouth, shift to shift, with little or no entitlements to leave? Insecure work. Let's imagine a better way for them. Stop undermining superannuation, a quick dollar now that can't be replaced. $33 billion already approved to leave accounts, hundreds and thousands of young people with zero balances who have to start again to save for their retirement. And it's an indictment on this government that early access super, that is, people's private savings, was the single biggest economic stimulus into the recovery from April to August this year. But this is just the start. Move beyond the media cycle and focus on delivery rather than the announcement. Because it's increasingly obvious the slogan, the spin, the marketing is always ready to go. But when it comes to the substance, the delivery and the outcomes for people on the ground, the government is missing in action. Madam Acting Deputy President, we know that the state of the budget is dire. High levels of debt and budget deficits which are going to be with us for the next decade, according to the Parliamentary Budget Office. This means that every dollar spent which needs to be borrowed needs to be appropriately targeted and prioritised. Prioritise to job creation, job security, keeping Australians safe, supporting families and the vulnerable to get through this really difficult economic time. It's so important to get the response to the pandemic right. It's so important to ensure that we have a proper plan on the other side that will support and grow the economy, because the consequences of not getting it right mean that more people will face unemployment, more families in hardship for longer. The time taken to reduce the unemployment rate will be longer and more businesses will hit the wall. JobKeeper has an important role to play going forward. We acknowledge that. We think the bill could be and should be strengthened to provide protections for working people so their wages aren't uh, able to fall be below the JobKeeper rate. And we are hopeful for the Senate's support and indeed for the government to consider that as a worthy amendment. We urge the Treasurer, when setting the rates, something that is not in this bill, to consider the economic circumstances of the time. A decision made in July may not be the right decision for Australians or for the economy in September. The parliament has granted the Treasurer these powers, these unprecedented powers, so the government can do the right thing. Consider the workers that they have excluded from JobKeeper. Consider the economic circumstances right now and make sure the unemployment queues are not one job longer than they need to be. Make sure when you withdraw the money from the economy that you don't jeopardise the economic recovery. You've been warned by the Reserve Bank to not pull out support too quickly. We know from the government's own figures that they are expecting another 400,000 workers to lose their jobs by Christmas. 
The last unemployment numbers we got said that for the first time in our history we had more than one million unemployed Australians. And so as the Treasurer gets his pen out to set the rates and to set the eligibility for JobKeeper, think about the Australian families that are depending on you to do the right thing by them. Thank you, Senator Gallagher. Appearing remotely, Senator Waters. Uh, thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to speak on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill of 2020. And what we have here is a bill that extends the time frame for JobKeeper, but it facilitates the cutting of the rate of JobKeeper. And it doesn't address the fact that so many people have missed out on JobKeeper. And moreover, it now reduces some workers' rights, um, even though their employer, uh, the business of that employer has now recovered. So whilst we support the extension of JobKeeper, there are some serious things in the tail of this bill. And I think we can all uh, acknowledge that this global pandemic has not only challenged us all this year, but it's really revealed the existing inequalities in society. We know that young people have lost their jobs at record rates and that came after an already too high youth unemployment rate. Um, we know that more women are now losing work than men. There's a disproportionate gendered impact there. And we know that the industries that have been hardest hit are where young people and women are overrepresented as workers. Now, we've said from day one that no one should be left behind. And the government, in its response, has chosen to leave people behind. Now, it had an opportunity with this bill to fix that and to broaden the coverage of eligibility for JobKeeper, but it's chosen not to do so. Now, when the crisis first hit, the Greens were proudly uh, the first to be calling for a wage guarantee, uh, for a wage and job guarantee. And so we welcomed um, the, the government's foray into this field. But sadly, so many people were left out. There was over a million casual workers that missed out on eligibility for JobKeeper simply because they hadn't been in a job for more than 12 months or at that magic date of the 1st of March, um, they didn't meet that employment criteria. And as I'm sure subsequent um, colleagues of mine will speak to, this had a massive disproportionate effect on gig economy workers, on people in the arts and recreation uh, sector, who don't do traditional hours. They work seasonally, they work gig to gig, um, and, and they've missed out on support. And there's been some hastily patched up promises that frankly still have not flowed to give people the help that they deserve. Um, we saw that childcare workers had JobKeeper removed from, um, from them prematurely. And of course, the free childcare has ended and has increased the pressure on many households um, when that should have been kept. And we saw universities who have already been subject to massive uh, successive cuts by this government were not eligible for JobKeeper either. I mean, some bizarre parallel universe where we're somehow meant to recover from a pandemic, but um, you know, there's no investment in the, in the training and the tertiary skills to do so. So this government now has come to us with a bill to extend um, the parameters and extend the Treasurer's ability to uh, to extend the parameters of JobKeeper, which we support, but they've left these things in the tail and they've failed to address that lack of coverage. Um, we think that JobKeeper and JobSeeker, for that matter, should continue at the current rates for as long as it is needed. That is how we get economic stimulus and it is how we help the community in a global pandemic. So we support this continuation, but we will be moving amendments, which my colleague Senator Faruqi um, has already mentioned, and he'll be uh, should be championing those amendments in the Senate. Um, the first of those is to address the fact that this bill creates a new category of employees. So this is where um, the employer who was previously able to uh, give JobKeeper to their workers because their, their business had been suffering um, to that relevant proportion. They've now recovered. They might have had up to a 10% cut in their profits, but they're essentially on the road to recovery. And yet, this bill allows those employers 
to have uh, huge powers to reduce their workers' hours up to 40%, which we know might actually be a greater than 40% in monetary terms if you're talking about penalty rates. Um, so businesses which are on the road to recovery and have essentially bounced back are now able, according to this bill, to reduce their workers' rights. Now, perhaps if they were still eligible for JobKeeper, we could, we could deal with that. But if they are on the road to recovery such that there's less than 10% of an impact on their business, they should not be given the right to slash their workers' hours by up to 40%. That's not how you protect people in a pandemic. That's not how you reduce unemployment figures in a pandemic. Um, so essentially, those employers are now um, feeling the economic benefit off the back of their own workers. So we'll be um, supporting amendments that have been moved by um, the opposition in that regard, and we have our own amendments drafted as well. Um, but we could be passing the good bits of this bill without having those sorts of nasty provisions included in it. Um, now, the other concern that we have is that this bill and the government has flagged um, sets us up for a two-tiered system. The bill um, sets people up who were previously working low hours and generally not by choice. It was generally all of the shifts that they could actually get. Um, for the first time, they had finally been earning a living wage and that original rate of 1500 was actually having a, a huge impact on pulling people out of poverty. Um, it was helping single parent families, was helping kids, was helping so many people actually meet their daily expenses. And yet um, we now see that the government wants to dump people who are often through no fault of their own working low, lower hours. It wants to dump those people onto below a living wage. Now, I can tell you something about those people. They're disproportionately women. And I've got some figures here. Um, many of the JobKeeper recipients who've previously earned less than the weekly minimum wage, so those low paid, low hours, insecure workers who I've already said are predominantly women, um, will now uh, in fact disproportionately affect, it's twice as many women as men that will be affected by that change. Twice as many women than men. Um, and of course, many of the industries with the highest proportion of workers who work less than 20 hours a week are uh, retail, accommodation and food, arts and rec. They've been hardest hit by COVID. And again, they're disproportionately worked in uh, by women. So I suppose we shouldn't be surprised that this government still hasn't got the memo about gender equality, despite it being the 21st century. But we should not be cutting people's income in a global pandemic at a time of economic crisis. So um, another unnecessary sting in the tail of this bill and another uh, issue on which we'll be moving amendments to excise um, those nasty bits that are frankly unconscionable in the situation that we're in. And I hope that we have support on that amendment. It's not clear to me um, where the opposition stands on that front and people will recall that uh, for a time they were saying that people that were getting paid more um, than their original wage, you know, didn't deserve that. And it was a bit bizarre to have the opposition party advocating for folk to be returned to below a living wage. Um, but such as the strange times that we live in, I do hope that they uh, have changed their perspective on that. And I, I do hope that they support our amendment when it comes to, um, to a vote. So here we have a bill which extends out JobKeeper um, and the date of, of uh, how long it will go for, but it doesn't fix the fact that so many millions of people have been left out from getting that necessary income support. Um, and I want to go to some of the categories of those people. So um, casual workers, temporary visa holders, university and childcare workers. So despite the fact that the scheme is still $44 billion under budget, this government does not want to help casual workers, university employees, childcare workers, temporary visa holders. And that is an unconscionable choice that this government is taking with this bill. So we will be moving uh, in the committee stage to expand JobKeeper to include those categories 
of people, of workers, into JobKeeper eligibility. Um, and so we have a choice here. The government has dipped its toe in the waters of, of the wage subsidy. It's been shown to really help people. It's necessary uh, in the global situation that we are in. And we urge the chamber to continue with these supports, not to slash them, um, not to continue to turn uh, a blind eye to folk who are missing out on that support and to actually start extending that support to the folk who need it. Uh, so um, with that, I will conclude my contributions, Acting Deputy uh, President, and I look forward to the committee stage of this bill. Thanks very much. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator Polly. Madam Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020. This bill seeks to extend the ability to make JobKeeper payments until the 28th of March 2021. The Labor Party supports this extension of JobKeeper as it is crucial in providing the support that Australians need to recover from the co occurring health and economic pandemic. However, grouped with this amendment are additional provisions which give no clear understanding on how companies can implement cuts to hours and wages. We feel that this bill can be used as a Trojan horse to introduce permanent changes which allow employers with minimum consultation to alter their employees' condition of employment. The Coronavirus Economic Response Package, passed by Parliament on 8 April this year, amended the Fair Work Act by inserting a new part which would temporarily enable employees to issue JobKeeper enabling directions. The directions were intended to provide for increased flexibility around employees' hours of work via new enabling stand-down directions, performance of duties and location of work. However, these directions also enabled employers and employees to make agreements for increased flexibility around annual leave and days and times of work. The Labor Party criticised this policy and as part of our negotiations with the ACT, the government agreed that the legislation would specify that the amendments would expire in September. The government's decision to extend JobKeeper for an additional six months means they also want to extend the JobKeeper enabling direction provisions. The bill does that at the same time as introducing a new category of employers who are able to access the JobKeeper flexibility, so-called legacy employers. Legacy employers are those who will no longer be eligible for JobKeeper, but according to the government, remain in distress. To qualify for this, employers must prove a mere 10 per cent drop in average business activity. These legacy employers will be able to access the extended flexibility arrangements. Why is the Morrison government giving companies which have been determined to no longer need financial support these additional rights? Well, the introduction of these thresholds is at least a concession to the public arguments Labor has made with respect to not extending the flexibility arrangements to businesses that have completely recovered. However, this rings alarm bells as these type of flexibility arrangements are often ones that employer groups have wanted for a long time, regardless of the pandemic. These work choice-like policies means that the Morrison government can sneak in this controversial legislation under the veil of a pandemic. This would have otherwise been subjected to lengthy scrutiny and negotiations. Policies such as this is something that the Liberals have failed to introduce for the past 20 years and now, bundled with the JobKeeper extension, will silently pass through. Employer groups will claim that these provisions have worked so well during the pandemic that they should be re retained indefinitely. The claim will be made that they allow businesses to employ more workers, but we cannot ignore that this will be on the basis that they are able to reduce and change existing hours for workers, their duties or location of work without any notice. This is effectively eroding the rights of workers. 
This legislation provides a provision which allows legacy employees to reduce employees' ordinary work hours, despite employees having to commit to a minimum of 60 per cent of normal working hours. This would result in many low-paid workers previously receiving JobKeeper experiencing a substantial pay cut. This is just another example of the Morrison government not looking out for those who are most vulnerable and leaving people behind in this pandemic. Thankfully, the one change to the existing flexibility arrangements is that annual leave provisions will be repealed. The annual leave provisions enabled employers to request that employees take annual leave. The Labor Party condemned this provision and so it is welcomed the improvement. With an additional 400,000 Australians expected to lose their jobs before Christmas, the unemployment rate at 7.5 per cent, a 22-year high, and people clearing out their superannuation accounts just to be able to cover their costs of living. It is clear that the economy is not going to go back to normal. Mr Prime Minister, there will be no snapback. Removing substantial JobKeeper support from the economy without a jobs plan is irresponsible. It's not the time to begin winding back that assistance before many people who would otherwise be unemployed are currently not because of JobKeeper. We need to keep it going for as long as it is needed. I'd like to touch, though, on some of the areas where there is still real concern, and that is. Uh, in relation to JobKeeper wage subsidy proposed by the Morrison government was never expanded out to support local government employees. And that particularly uh, would have been very beneficial in the Tasmanian community, uh, including those people who were uh, casual employees, visa holders and local government employees who still do not currently qualify for the payment. These workers were left to fend for themselves by this government. Despite moving amendments to this effect in the House of Representatives in the Parliament, the Morrison government did not support these workers. We will keep fighting on this side of the chamber for all Australians. The Treasurer has the ability to expand the coverage of JobKeeper to more workers. It really is only a stroke of a pen. The Prime Minister was happy to foist this issue onto Premiers, arguing that the responsibility for local government was their responsibility. They do not want to take responsibility for anything. That's a hallmark. That's what defines this government. No responsibility, no accountability, no transparency, just spin. That's what they're about, making announcements without delivering. Well, there's others who have been working really hard to protect their communities, and that is the leaders and state premiers around this country. But what do we see day in, day out in this chamber? And that is the government trying to blame Premier Dan Andrews, Andrews in Victoria uh, for the COVID-19 um, impacts on the aged care sector. We know that in my home state, as it is around the country, that local government workers are fundamental as key people working within our local communities and were very much um, in need of support and deserving of any support in relation to uh, JobKeeper. But if we want to then look at some other areas of real concern that affects my home state, and that's been the aviation sector, this government have left that sector high and dry without any support. So what we've seen is tens and thousands of airline workers, Qantas, Virgin, all losing jobs without any support from this government, which means the impact on Tasmania's tourism uh, has been devastating. We know that the state economy is going to be so badly impacted by this COVID-19 pandemic, the impact on the economy. When it comes to Tasmanians, if and when we see more flights out of our own state, my own airport in Launceston, we know airfares will be expensive. All of this goes to the detriment of the Tasmanian community. And let's turn our mind to the universities, how this government has in fact given them no support at all. And we've seen 
university lecturers, people working there, losing their jobs. And at the same time, it's this very government that is making it harder and harder for people to be able to go to university, increasing the costs of courses. Again, this has having a huge impact on my community down in Tasmania, and I know it will have huge impacts around the rest of the country. This Prime Minister has no real plan to get us out of this pandemic, to rebuild our economy, to give confidence to the Australian community that he is a Prime Minister of action and a man with vision and a man who will lead his government and be accountable, provide the transparency that this community needs. That sort of leadership is what they're needing now. And that's why you will find that, like in Victoria, the Victorians are turning to Dan Andrews as their premier for that leadership, as they are in West Australia, in Queensland, and even, might I say, in Tasmania, that the premier, a Liberal premier, is being responsive to what his community are telling them, what we need from this Prime Minister is for him to be able to step up, be accountable, take some responsibility for your failings and do something about it. Senator Seagrid. The Chair, I rise to make a contribution to the debate over the Coronavirus Economic Response Package JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020. This bill allows for the Treasurer to extend JobKeeper and, makes rule and make rules regarding the rate of pay and eligibility until 28 March 2021. It also allows the Minister for Social Security to extend the job seek payment beyond the end of December. And I say thank goodness um, that always should have been uh, there in terms of the capacity to be able to um, do that, because um, we know that this pandemic the impacts of it are going to last. So when the announcement was made about extending JobKeeper to March next year, the same should have been done at that time to, um, to the job seeker payment. Having said that, it doesn't mean that the minister will make that extension, and we are deeply, deeply concerned about the uncertainty that those on job seeker are facing right now. Because not only are they going to see a $300 cut per fortnight in a, couple of, in, a, in a month's time, or just under a month's time, they also don't know what's going to happen to them after December. For us, it is essential that further support is provided to Australians doing it tough. This pandemic has exposed just how flawed our social security system is and the inequality that exists in our country and how unequal we are. This pandemic very strongly risks extending that inequality because we know that different groups and different cohorts are being disproportionately impacted by this pandemic. Young people, women, older workers. This bill does a number of things, including creating a new class of employers called legacy employers. These are employers who received job, receive JobKeeper between March and September this year, but will be ineligible from September as they have recovered and will no longer meet the turnover tests of 30 per cent or 50 per cent decline in turnover. Although they will not receive the JobKeeper payment, legacy employ employers only need to demonstrate a 10 per cent decline in turnover in order to ex access the new flexibility measurements established by this bill. Legacy employers will be able to direct employees to vary or reduce their hours of work and alter the location, duration and duties of their work. Workers who were depending on JobKeeper will now have this payment ripped away and face losing over 40 per cent of their income for up to six months. In other words, condemning people to uncertainty, to the risk of losing um, hours and the risk of actually descending into poverty. People who work for businesses that have experienced a 10 per cent decline in turnover have no guarantee of minimum income, even though their employer is better off comparatively. Again, 
disproportionately impact, uh, impacting on so certain cohorts of Australians. People are going to be left behind. The government has not made the case for giving employers extraordinary powers to cut their workers' hours and wages whilst leaving workers without any guaranteed source of income. If the government believes that employers are so in need of support, the government should do something about it. They should not be funded by cuts to workers' wages. We can pass the extension of JobKeeper and the flexibility measures for people who continue to receive JobKeeper without creating the new class of legacy employers, which amounts, in our book, to corporate welfare. The Greens will move to excise this appalling uh, legacy employers' amendments and their powers from the bill. The government has announced their intention to cut the JobKeeper payment and introduce tiered payments. This will effectively mean low-paid workers do not get paid a living wage. Slashing payments for underemployed, low-income workers in insecure work will predominantly impact on women and young people. The government apparently will not hesitate to kick workers when they are down and throw vulnerable workers off a financial cliff in the midst of this pandemic and recession. While this is not in the current bill, we must use this opportunity to, vent, to prevent cuts for low-income workers and the establishment of a two-tiered system. The Greens will be moving amendments to prevent tiered payments to ensure low-income workers are protected. It should be noted that this bill does nothing to protect the millions of workers who have, left, who have been left behind by the government during this pandemic. The government continues to deny millions of workers across access to a wage subsidy they so desperately need and forcing casuals, temporary visa holders, childcare and university workers into unemployment. Again, people are left, being left behind. The Greens will be moving amendments to extend eligibility for JobKeeper to the millions of workers who have been left behind by this government and are struggling and depending on our hard-working social services and community sector. As I uh, said at the beginning of my contribution, this uh, bill also makes changes on the job, uh, makes job seeker changes. The bill extends the, pay the period over which the Social Security Minister can make legis legislative instruments to change the coronavirus supplement and related payments. This means the minister has the power to extend the coronavirus supplement until the 28th of March 2021. This change will bring a small amount of relief to the 2.3 million Australians receiving the coronavirus supplement. However, I want to make it clear that there are no guarantees that the minister will actually use this power to extend the coronavirus supplement from December to March. The minister has repeatedly said uh, or failed to commit that the payment of jobs, the job seeker payment, will not go back to $40 a day. I have asked on a number of occasions and have received no such assurance. And it is deeply distressing. Uh, to Australians that, in fact, this issue is still not resolved. As I said earlier, there is no way that anybody could foresee a future where you could manage to survive on $40 a day. We already know that the government has plans to wind back income support payments. The coronavirus supplement is being reduced by $300 a fortnight from the 25th of September. This means that 2.3 million people currently receiving the coronavirus supplement will see cuts to their income, taking them below the poverty line. The government is deliberately dropping all those people below the poverty line. I'm also extremely worried that the 1.1 million children who are living in these households will have their incomes cut in September. What does that mean to child poverty in this country? The ANU Centre for Social Research and Methods es estimates that the number of people in poverty will increase by 740,000 when the rate of job seeker reduces in September. The research has also found that the coronavirus supplement, supplement led to dramatic reductions in poverty rates and, and poverty gaps and housing stress amongst households who relied mostly on the job seeker payment. The payment rate of this group was 67. Sorry, the poverty rate of this group was 67% before the uh, COVID before COVID-19, 
but the supplement reduced the poverty rate to 6.8 per cent, thereby clearly, clearly demonstrating the value of having an adequate social security payment. Not only is the government taking $300 per fortnight of people, millions of unemployed people still don't have certainty about the rate of payment after December. This lack of certainty around the rate of, of job seeker payment means that people are unable to plan for their future, causing a great deal of anxiety and contributing even further to people's poor mental health, already adversely affected by this pandemic. Australians are incredibly distressed about their income dropping in September and then again in December. We are going to see a lot of hardship, people defaulting on their mortgages or having to leave their rental properties because of the choices this government is making. I am incredibly worried about what happens to Australians on low incomes when the supplement is cut. We will see people having to borrow money and get deeper and deeper into debt. This is particularly true for those cohorts that are particularly affected, such as young people, women and older people. The rates of numbers of people on the job seeker payment for over 50s in the three, co in the three cohorts, 50 to 55, 55 to 60 and 60 uh, plus, um, have more than doubled. All of them have more than doubled. And if you're over 60, I'm deeply, deeply concerned about their future and their ability to find work. And this government is condemning them to poverty by taking $300 a fortnight off them, further undermining their ability to have an adequate uh, quality of life as older people move into retirement. In the middle of a pandemic and recession, Amidst so much uncertainty, we should be providing an adequate, livable income to unemployed Australians. Not only is this obviously good for them, keeping them out of poverty, but it also helps stimulate our economy. As far as the minister is concerned, the job seeker payment will be dropping back to $40 a day after 31 December, because the government and the minister will not clarify and not commit hand on heart that it will not drop to $40 a day. This is at the exact same time our effective unemployment rate is predicted to reach 13 per cent. The $350 coronavirus supplement has had a, a huge impact on the lives of unemployed Australians. It has brought George job seeker above the poverty line. And I foreshadow, because I understand there's already been a second reader amendment moved, I foreshadow I'm moving a second reader amendment about the impact um, of removing uh, lowering the coronavirus supplement and, and calling for that to be uh, current rate to be maintained. Last week, ACOS asked community service workers what kind of impact the coronavirus supplement is having on the lives of people they help. A team leader from a housing and homelessness service said extra payments for COVID-19 meant people could pay for accommodation and eat. Imagine that. A child, youth and family service worker said that the double job seeker payment has meant that, for the first time in years, very low-income single mothers have been able to buy new winter clothes, replace broken white goods, repair cars. A practitioner from, a housing, from another housing and homeless service, service said, we work with rough, rough sleepers who have, not, who have not as yet been negatively affected by COVID-19. We are more likely to see an increase in rough sleeping if the additional funds for job seeker and job keeper cease and people from the private market lose their accommodation. For the first time, many people in our community on job seeker have been able to cover the essentials without needing to make difficult choices. We should all have the opportunity to afford fresh food, fresh fruit and vegetables, turn the heating on and buy essential medications. We cannot go back to $40 a day. And as I said, this is why I'll be moving a second reading amendment to call on the government to retain the full $550 COVID supplement and increase job seeker permanently. I particularly want to point out that people on DSP and carer payment are still missing out. I'm very disappointed to see that additional support for people on the disability support pension and carer payment is absent from the government's plans. Since March, 
We have, the Greens have been campaigning alongside the sector to have DSP and the care of, and care of payment recipients included in the coronavirus supplement. The government keeps telling us that disabled people and carers were excluded because they don't receive working age payments. Well, I can tell you now that people on, co on DSP and carer payment do work and have lost work due to COVID-19. Data from DSS shows that around 43 per cent of people on DSP have had their hours reduced compared to this time last year. Disabled people and their carers are doing it extremely tough and they have been since the start of the pandemic, experiencing higher costs when it comes to groceries, food deliveries, transport and PPE. It's likely that disabled people and carers will face longer periods of lockdown and quarantining and, re and return to work later because of the nature of COVID-19. I once again call on the government to provide the $550 corona supplement to people on the DSP and carer payment. We need to acknowledge the thousands of Australians on DSP and care of payment who, have had ex who need extra support during this crisis. This bill fails to close the gap and the, those gaps that are widening in our community because of COVID-19. It fails to address the critical need for income support above the poverty line. It fails to address the fact that those on DSP and care of payment are missing out. I want our government to be supporting every Australian who needs help through this crisis. We have a responsibility to do this. Thank you, Senator Seward. Um, Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package, a JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill 2020, a bill that offers, on one hand, a reduction in JobKeeper payments and, on the other hand, the extension of extreme and extraordinary industrial powers to companies without the need of them. The government has backed down on some earlier proposals, but there is no compromise. It is still a deliberate belting of secure work with the added insult of no JobKeeper payments. COVID-19 is a once-in-a-generational shock to our economy, to our healthcare system and to our society. Just look at some of the few facts. Underemployment is at 7.5 per cent, more than one million people without work. Alarmingly, close to 20 per cent are either un- or underemployed. Roy Morgan reports that consumer confidence is three quarters of what it was this time last year. The government's response should be leadership. It should be working in a bipartisan way, a way that should be above politics. During Australia's last economic crisis, the global financial crisis. That was how Labor operated. It showed leadership. It acted quickly. It saved this country from a recession. Instead, this Prime Minister and his government have been found wanting. He has done as he always does, but never enough to do the whole to support workers. Promising to have everyone's back, he legislated a JobKeeper policy that left millions of Australians without support. Mr Acting Deputy President, under the cover of COVID, the Prime Minister and his renegade backbench have acted to undermine our superannuation system. The effect, of would be, effect would be to see millions of Australians denied dignity in retirement. Why not help put back the money that would afford people dignity in retirement? But I won't be holding my breath. Because with this government, the policy is always the same. Austerity for working people in good times and even more austerity in the bad. And now here is this legislation before the Senate. They continue to seek to extend extreme powers to businesses, powers that continue their pre-COVID policy of wage suppression and insecure work. It would be one thing to keep powers for those businesses that are still doing it tough, but it is entirely another that they try to keep them for businesses doing better than ever. This government would have given these powers to companies like Dental Company, 1300 Smiles, who are paying out a dividend of which two thirds was funded by its JobKeeper payments, passing on the wage subsidy to shareholders. They would have given the power to cut hours and wages to companies like Adairs, who received more than $11 million in wage subsidies 
at the same time as its online sales soared. Why would they need these extreme and extraordinary powers? If you have enough to be paid dividends to your shareholders and you don't need to reduce the hours of your workforce or reduce their wages, profits are up and don't need to extraordinary powers to reduce wages. The government is yet to adequately explain why a business experiencing 10 per cent drop in revenue should be able to reduce a worker's hours by up to 40 per cent, with considerable wage loss when taking into account shifts and other penalties. Indeed, employers already have their ability to make changes to their operations by mechanisms in their relevant award or agreements that require the companies to consult with their workforce and their representatives over a suitable period of time. In the middle of the pandemic, this government has no plan for jobs. It wants people to spend and support the economy, but they need the certainty of secure employment where possible. And while I support the continuation of JobKeeper going, going, a much needed adjustment to the existing scheme is needed. There are more changes the Prime Minister could be bringing in this place. When the Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Treasurer Josh Frydenberg announced JobKeeper, the Treasurer said, Australians know their government has their back. Except they didn't have everyone's back. They didn't have the backs of casuals. They didn't have the backs of migrant workers. They didn't have the backs of those who work in the arts, in local government, in higher education or childcare. And they certainly didn't have the backs of those who work for companies like Donata, an aviation company the, comp the government excluded. While the workers at Donata are, getting, Donata are getting tired of hearing more talk from this government and no action to help them. Donata workers Natasha and Donna over their working lives have paid their fair share of tax. Mr Acting Deputy President, many of them worked for Qantas and still provide Quanta meals to Qantas passengers. Many are still being paid entitlements by Qantas. And yet because the sale of this catering arm to Donata, they are considered employees of Donata and are cut off from any government support. And now, with a cowardly announcement by Alan Joyce, the two and a half thousand jobs are to be replaced at Qantas with external companies like Donata. We will see workers who are currently receiving JobKeeper move to new companies performing the same work that have done for years and stop receiving JobKeeper. This is the cruel situation the Prime Minister and the missing Minister for Transport have created by abandoning the avi aviation industry. The government could right some wrongs, like the exclusion of migrant workers and international students from assessing JobKeeper or JobSeeker. So deplorable had been our treatment of these guests in our country that it is no wonder many are telling friends and family to reconsider studying or working in Australia. The future major cost to our economy. Despite countries such as the UK, Canada and Ireland offering Australians stuck abroad wage assistance, we are not returning the favour. Unions New South Wales recently published a survey of 5,000 international students and they found 60 per cent have lost their jobs, 31 per cent had their income to pay their rent, no longer had the income to pay their rent and were expected to be evicted soon. 26 per cent were sharing bedrooms to save money and 46 per cent were skipping meals on a regular basis. Well, I support the extension of JobKeeper to March and the introduction of eligibility criteria so companies making record profits can reduce their workers' hours and wages just as they can deliver bigger dividends. And there is much more that could be done to fix JobKeeper so that it offered some meaningful support to people who need it. There is much more that could be done to stop businesses like Qantas from taking more than half a billion dollars in public money and then abusing the spirit and intent of the financial support. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. 
I rise tonight to also make a contribution to this legislation. And um, as you've no doubt heard from many uh, Labor senators this evening and earlier today, um, Labor does support the extension of JobKeeper, but we um, continue to call for. Your mic has uh, stopped, uh, Senator Lyons. That's hands over if you give me a sign. <coughs> that sounds like it's back on. Yes. So Labor has called for improvements. In the first round of JobKeeper, we saw the uh, exclusion of local governments, of um, backpackers, of visa workers, of international students, and we saw real poverty and hardship amongst those groups. And I have to say, certainly when I've spoken to local government in Western Australia, they've been the absolute champions of looking after uh, residents, particularly seniors, and yet they have had to manage on their own. And of course, this new iteration of JobKeeper, this extension until March, also is lacking. We continue to exclude casuals, we continue to exclude um, what international students are left, and we're bringing a whole lot apparently back into South Australia. Um, we continue to um, <coughs> exclude visa workers, the ones who have remained here. And, uh, this scheme now drops the rate and makes it more difficult for employers to, um, to be eligible. So, of course, Labor was calling for the extension, and we thank the government for finally listening to us and extending it. But really, I think we need greater certainty than, than what we've seen, because what we know with this government is there's always a sting in the tail, and the sting in the tail in this extension is the cuts to people's incomes. Uh, those who have been surviving on JobKeeper and uh, making it harder for employers to access the payment. Um, I want to focus particularly on Western Australia because um, it is hard for us to get a bit of a look in, and I'm not saying that uh, with the perspective of a chip on my shoulder, but there are some particular fundamentals um, which have been ignored around Western Australia. And what I'd say at the outset is um, there are nine ministers amongst the Liberals in Western Australia, five of whom are cabinet ministers. And yet we've not seen any particular um, champion of Western Australia. And what we do see is those ministers simply towing the Prime Minister and the Treasurer's line, standing behind them nodding like we see those toy animals in, on the dashboards of car nodding in furious agreement. Yet Western Australia has some significant problems. What uh, a recent um, report by REMPLAN has shown is that five local government areas in Western Australia are, are amongst the ten uh, biggest users of JobKeeper. Now, I bet you haven't heard that from any of the West Australians on the government benches today talking about that. And um, in one of the minister's areas, um, Melissa Price, the member for Durack, uh, we have one of a couple of the highest users of JobKeeper in Shark Bay and Exmouth. Over 64 per cent of businesses in Exmouth and Shark Bay rely on JobKeeper—64 per cent. And there's a whole range of other local government areas in Miss Price's electorate, and yet where is she? Is she out there saying we can't afford to cut JobKeeper because it will damage those businesses in Exmouth and Shark Bay and across Denham more generally? No, she's not. She's completely silent on that. Shark Bay and Exmouth are second to Byron Bay. And that's not because the West Australian border is closed. It's because the Australian border is closed to the international uh, visitors who normally flock to those regions. But you would not hear that from um, Minister Price, who's simply missing in action on JobKeeper. Earlier tonight, I heard another West Australian government senator, a senator, beg your pardon, who'd recently been to Broome, say 
Broome's doing fine. Now, I don't know who he spoke to. Perhaps he walked down the main street of Broome and uh, spoke to a, a couple of businesses. Because Broome also has got high um, reliance on JobKeeper. Almost 50 per cent of businesses in Broome, again in Miss Price's electorate, rely on JobKeeper. And is Miss Price championing there for Broome to not cut rates, to not exclude employers? No. She's standing behind the Prime Minister and, and the Treasurer, certainly not representing the interests of West Australians. In Dundas, significant numbers of businesses—again, it's one of the top five LGA areas. That's largely in the electorate of Mr Rick Wilson in O'Connor. Where's Mr Wilson on this? Completely silent once again. I haven't heard him out there saying we can't have cuts to JobKeeper because it will affect significant voters in my electorate and it will damage local businesses. No, like Ms Price, he has been silent on the matter. The other hot spots in Western Australia, in the southwest, in the electorate of Forest, Ms Nola Marino, another Morrison government minister. We have uh, the tourist, the international hotspot tourist areas of Margaret River, beautiful country, wine growing, tourists flock there, very high um, use of JobKeeper. Where's Ms Marino, you might say? Well, she's with Ms. Price and Mr. O'Connor, uh, Mr. Wilson, completely silent. So we have these three large Western Australian regional electorates, Durack, O'Connor, and Forrest, and their Liberal members, two of whom are ministers with you would think some influence on the Treasurer and Mr. Morrison, and yet they're silent. They've just signed up to a JobKeeper scheme which will cut the take-home pay potentially of voters in those electorates and it will lock out eligible employers, employers who are currently eligible. It will lock some of them out in the future, and yet they've given it the big green tick. I want to look at the metro area. And again, the other point about these nine ministers is five of them are in Cabinet. You think they might be able to take a Western Australian perspective. But no, they've lined up with the Prime Minister and the Treasurer and said we've got to make a cut to people's take home pay and we have to uh, ensure that into the future some businesses will be ineligible. Let's look at the electorate of Pierce, our Attorney General, Mr. Porter. Now he's already on the record as not supporting Western Australia as are all the Liberals over the, board, the state border closures, when they lined up with Mr Clive Palmer. Not with the millions of voters in Western Australia did they line up. No, they didn't. They lined up behind Mr Palmer so much so that they were part of his court action to try and force open Western Australia, Western Australia's borders. Now, I'm not sure if perhaps they are not in WA enough or perhaps they are not you know, taking a test of the temperature. But something like more than 90 per cent of Western Australians think the borders should remain closed, but not the tiny little Liberal cohort, not the nine um, ministers and certainly not the five in Cabinet, although they did finally get the message a couple of weeks ago and have subsequently pulled out of the case uh, too little too late. But Mr Porter, the Attorney General, the member for Pierce, again, where is he on this? Well, Pierce is one of the metro, outer metro suburbs with a very high um, reliance on JobKeeper. And where is he on this? Completely silent. He's just signed up to cut local voters' um, take-home pay and make some of the voters ineligible. Another minister. Another cabinet minister, Mr Wyatt, in the seat of Haslark. High eligibility, high reliance on JobKeeper in that electorate. And where's he? Has he been out saying, hang on a minute, this is a bit unfair? 
This is going to make people um, take their take-home pay will be less. This might mean some uh, businesses in the seat of Hasluck will no longer be eligible. But no, he signed up as well. So they're all missing in action. Every single one of those ministers, the five cabinet ministers, all missing in action when it comes to paying Western Australia some attention of looking after the interests of Western Australian voters. We've seen this. They've got form. First of all, they backed Clive Palmer in over Western Australians' interests, and now they are backing in cuts to JobKeeper and making sure that some um, businesses into the future won't be eligible. Now, some might say that the Liberal Party only listens to the Chamber of Commerce. Well, guess what? The Chamber of Commerce is also saying this. It's got a survey out that says one in three Western Australian businesses are very concerned about what happens come March when, presumably, JobKeeper disappears. That um, confidence that we like to talk about in business is completely missing. One in three businesses. That's outstanding. That's a horrible statistic. And where are those cabinet ministers? And where are those other ministers? And where are those Western Australian backbenchers? They're all standing behind Mr Morrison and Mr Frydenberg, nodding in agreement, cutting out the interests of West Australian voters. Well, West Australians are watching. They're certainly very angry about what the Liberal Party have done in relation to Clive Palmer, and they will be just as angry about this. You cannot have five out of the ten local government areas across this country in Western Australia, across the electorates of Miss Price and Miss Marino, being the highest users of job keepers and those Liberals opposite from Western Australia just ignoring Western Australian voters and putting their own jobs and their own self-interest first. Senator Patrick. Mr um, Acting Deputy President, I rise to speak on the Coronavirus Economic Response Package, JobKeeper Payments Amendment Bill uh, 2020. On uh, January the 21st, Australia stood up its national incident room to deal with something referred to by most as the Wuhan coronavirus. Now, since that time, we've had a lot of we've we've had we've been through a lot. We've had Ruby Princess. We've had a first wave. We've had lockdowns. We've had emergency legislation for job keeper and job seeker. We've deployed the ADF to aid the civil power. We've had border closures. And we've got a second wave now, although hopefully uh, we're seeing that curve uh, flatten in Victoria. Now, our response to coronavirus, COVID-19, hasn't been perfect, but I think we've done OK. The federal and state governments have done OK. The public service have done OK. Healthcare workers have done a great job. And our emergency services and the ADF have done a, uh, a good job as well, and uh, I'm sure everyone in this chamber uh, is grateful for the work that they have done. But the response has been exactly that, a response. It's been reactive. We're seven months in, almost eight, and we don't have a plan. We know that uh, there is a vaccine in sight. We don't know how effective it will be. Will it be 50 per cent effective? Will it be 60 per cent? Will it be 90 per cent? We simply don't know. And so we're going to have to have a, uh, a, a plan that deals with those uh, p potential outcomes. We're likely, or it's po certainly possible, for us to have a third wave, perhaps even a fourth. We're already seeing... Uh, uh, contingencies, contingencies being put in place to deal with spot outbreaks. And yet, again, we're dealing with a response package, not a plan. 
and we should be dealing with a plan. And we shouldn't just be looking at this legislation and saying, does this do uh, uh, something positive? We ought to be looking at this in the context of a much broader economic plan that tells us how we're going to get from where we are now to a prosperous nation on the other side of COVID. We're getting a little, a little bit of information, but not enough. We need to have a plan that uh, does things like direct government procurement at maximising local benefit in our economies. We need to have a plan that encourages R&D. We need to have a plan, a plan that promotes manufacturing, that helps us out with uh, 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 re resilience and certainly ends the state we, where we've been in for the last uh, uh, 100 years where we're simply exporting rocks and other commodities. We need to be value-adding and building that resilience. We need to make sure that we, we take our raw commodities and we produce. We create jobs when we do so. We create wealth when we do so. Where's that plan? We need to uh, be looking at things like multinational tax avoidance, tax transparency data that, uh, that, that has been uh, made public by the tax office uh, in accordance with law shows that over five years we've had 221 companies that have earned $850 billion in revenue and paid zero tax. If we understand how we're dealing with uh, that sort of circumstance, then we can understand whether or not we can afford to be more generous or less generous. This legislation is being presented in the absence of a plan, and that's hugely problematic in my view. Now, I've been actually waiting for a plan since the commencement of this parliament. I'm, I remember sitting in this chamber listening to the Governor-General, His Excellency, and uh, no criticism of him. It, it wasn't his speech. It was the Prime Minister's speech. It had no inspiration in there. It, it talked about a pie and how that pie was going to be cut up. It didn't talk about making a bigger pie. It didn't talk about making a tastier pie. All of that was absence, absent. And I find myself in the same situation again. I'm wanting to see a big plan so I can see where this piece of legislation fits into that plan. But it's absent. It's left me with the view that we've got a Prime Minister who's managed well but is not a leader. Even at the lower level, the Senate is being passed to, asked to pass legislation that relies heavily on rules that no one's seen. Sure, we've seen media releases, I've seen some fact sheets, but uh, we do this time and time again in the Senate. We uh, just work on blind faith that uh, regulations will flow. I remember when we were uh, looking at uh, the SDL changes for the Murray-Darling back in May 2018. We were committing huge amounts of public money but had no idea of each of the projects around the country that were designed to help uh, uh, return water to the Murray-Darling. Just blind faith. And that's not the way we should do business. So um, I, I say to the government, whilst I support what you're trying to do with this legislation, proper process uh, demands that we should be seeing the rules before we consider the legislation. We, in, in effect, are granting a power to uh, allow uh, the, 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 the Treasurer to do uh, many different things that uh, we may have to correct at a later stage. Now, I understand when uh, JobKeeper 1.0 came along, we needed to be able to have flexibility. But uh, things have stabilised, and uh, so we need to be a little bit more careful as we grant powers to ministers to expend public money. Uh, we should be seeing the rules up front. Now, in relation to the bill, I indicate that I will uh, support the bill. I will ex uh, support the extension of uh, JobKeeper. That's the pragmatic thing to do. It, it's, it's about uh, making sure that we look after our businesses and we look after 
their employees. And we need to do it in a way that is flexible. So I, I even support the ideas behind the, the, the press releases and the fact sheets. We want to be able to target JobKeeper uh, in different ways for different areas of the, co of the economy uh, that are doing uh, things at different speeds. And again, the rules uh, should permit that. It's just uh, sad that we haven't been presented with the rules. Now there is another. There's a, certainly a contentious part about this bill, which I'm going to just address briefly, um, and that is uh, relating to legacy em employers. That's those employers who uh, are no longer uh, hitting the JobKeeper eligibility through either a 30 uh, per cent reduction uh, or a uh, 50 per cent reduction in the case of uh, large, uh, larger businesses. Uh, those that sit between uh, a 10 per cent reduction and a, and a 30 per cent reduction, the government wants to introduce changes to the Fair Work Act that gives businesses some flexibility. Now, whenever we have uh, that sort of legislation being put up, there is contention. And there is the need to balance out the, the needs of the business and, indeed, the needs of the workers. Because uh, anyone who's run a business, and I have, knows that actually to run a business you need to have a good workforce. So when, when uh, uh, workers and businesses uh, come together, you, know, uh, you, uh, you get productive outcomes. And uh, that, the, here, that, herein lies the problem with this uh, contentious part of the legislation. Uh, we could grant uh, powers for companies to have greater flexibility, but I point out that there is already flexibility in the current industrial relations legislation that permits employers to sit down with their employees, explain the circumstances that they're in and seek to make changes. There's nothing that stops that from occurring right now. And, uh, in trying to strike a balance to try and work out where uh, the better outcome lies, I've had to think about employers who look after their employees and I know that in those circumstances those conversations can occur. The employer can talk to the employee and they can work out something that will help both of them through the crisis. What worries me, however, is when you've got an employer who, who is not prepared to do that who might otherwise simply uh, treat their workers as cash cows rather than part of their team. And that's the only circumstance where I can think of where the IR changes that are being proposed will be necessary. In all other circumstances, I think the current rules will allow a good outcome. And so, uh, 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 in terms of the, the changes, I, it is a fine balance and it's not going to hold me over either way, but I will be supporting uh, Labor's amendment in relation to uh, legacy uh, employers, uh, and that is to remove the additional powers that, the, uh, that, that businesses are seeking, but I do so in recognition that there are already in place uh, industrial relations legislation that allow uh, workers and uh, employers to sit down and work out how to uh, work their way through a particular crisis. Um, I will support this bill. Uh, it brings uh, stability. It uh, helps us to look after businesses. It helps us to look after employees. Uh, and I commend it to the Senate. Senator Green. Thank you. There is no denying that JobKeeper has been an important lifeline, keeping Australians in work 
and businesses going. Labor knew from the outset that this country could, couldn't have had this support snapped back on September the 27th, as the Morrison government initially had planned. The opposition has always been constructive during this crisis, and I hope the government will continue to listen to our suggestions to improve our economic recovery. We called on the government to introduce wage subsidies, despite them ruling it out earlier this year. We called on the government to abandon its proposal to extend emergency IR powers to businesses that have fully recovered, and they have. We have called on the government to extend JobKeeper, and today they are doing that. So Labor will be supporting this legislation. I said at the beginning of this crisis in February in a meet, at a meeting with uh, tourism operators and business owners in Cairns that this pandemic would hit Cairns first and worst, and it has. More than 6,000 businesses in the Cairns region were relying on JobKeeper in July during a time of uncertainty over the future of the program. For too long, the LNP believed it could stick to its snapback strategy, which would have led to mass unemployment queues, particularly in regional Queensland. The member for Leichhardt at, at the time was out there saying that extending JobSeeker was a no-brainer, while the member for McKellar called, the, called for the scheme to be shut down even earlier than September. The government was saying one thing in Cairns, but another thing in Canberra. And it led to uh, uncertainty and confusion in the community. I have spoken to businesses, workers and community groups in regional Queensland, and the overwhelming consensus was that far north Queensland could not afford to have JobKeeper snapped back too early. I started a campaign calling on the government not to cancel JobKeeper too early. And it was supported, particularly by hospitality businesses, but also the community sector. This bill allows the Treasurer to make that extension. And so I want to thank all of the community groups, the hospitality businesses, people in the community who uh, supported this campaign and called on this extension. It should not have taken so long for the government to commit to that extension but I'm happy that we are here. As we know, this bill allows for an extension to changes to the Fair Work Act, which allows employers to reduce employee working hours down to the rate of the JobKeeper payment without breaching workplace conditions. Employers also retain the right to effectively cut the rate of pay for JobKeeper recipients who continue to work normal hours. Now, the government has since said that they want to extend this flexibility for workers who know, are no longer on JobKeeper. The perverse effects of these changes mean that a low-paid worker could have their hours cut to 60 per cent of their ordinary hours and earn less than the rate of JobKeeper. Now, Labor can see where the government is going on this. The government is testing their future plans for permanent industrial relations changes in the name of so-called flexibility, when really they are attacking decent jobs. Australia's lowest paid workers could lose up to $300 a week from their pay packets during the deepest economic crisis in our recent history the lowest paid workers, many essential workers who have helped us get through this crisis. Well, Labor will stand up for these low paid workers by fighting this change. It has also become clear that there are a number of things missing from this legislation. Firstly, we know that this legislation doesn't fix gaps in the JobKeeper, which Labor has been arguing for some time need to be fixed and can be fixed by the Treasurer. Too many Australians are being left out and being left behind, some by accident, but many deliberately. The Treasurer retains the power to include 1.1 million short-term casuals, university, local government workers and temporary visa holders in the job keeper program. He retains that right and yet he continues to leave them out of this program. 
The other thing missing from this legislation and from the government's overall response to the coronavirus response is a plan for jobs. Jobs. Actual jobs. Not re-announcements of previous measures or projects which are taking too long to get off the ground, or the promise of a project to be constructed in, say, 2022 or 2023, as we heard the other day with inland rail. Not fancy-sounding slogans without any substance. Not grants that sound great, but when the business applies for the grant, they find out they're not actually eligible, which is we know what happened with um, one of the arts uh, grants announcements and a Gold Coast arts company that is not eligible. For the first time in history, one million Australians are out of work. The government's own figures show that 400,000 will be out of work by Christmas. Despite being faced with mounting job losses and rising unemployment, this government's instinct is to remove substantial JobKeeper support from the economy without any plan to replace it. Without a plan for jobs. Without a plan of how those people who will lose their jobs before Christmas will find a job again. After seven years of the LNP, so many jobs in regional Queensland are at risk. We are facing an unprecedented economic crisis, and without a plan, the unemployment queues will continue to expand. Finally, can I say this? We know that the government's track record is to cut, sack and sell. We know that of the Morrison government, and we know that of the LNP in Queensland. The Morrison government doesn't have a plan for jobs. They don't have a plan to bring back manufacturing back home. They don't have a plan to bring forward infrastructure projects that regional Queenslanders desperately need. That is the glaring omission from this legislation. Lots of announcements, lots of press releases, but no plan for jobs. And regional Queenslanders who have been hit hardest by this economic crisis deserve better from this government. Thank you. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. This pandemic has changed our world. In January, none of us expected to be dialing in remotely to give a speech to Parliament here from my office in Melbourne. We didn't expect the closure of state borders to be one of the most talked about political decisions. And we didn't expect to be, to be, we'd be waiting every day to see whether the infection statistics, what they are like in our cities, sort of to you know, be racing to share the, the good news, as I have done with my, with my friends over social media in the last couple of days, that we've had another day when the number of new COVID cases is under 100. The impact of this virus has been profound. In my personal story, the main way it's impacted me has been through my son, John, who was one of the thousands of Victorians who caught the virus. He's no longer an active case, but like so many others, he's, he's still dealing with the long-term effects of having had COVID-19, and he's now living with me so I can help him recover. I also help care for my elderly mum, who has hardly been outside her house for the last six months. And caring during this pandemic has only highlighted how important caring for older Australians is. And for so many others, of course, the story has COVID has been a loss of work, the loss of certainty, the loss of income, and a deep worry about what the future looks like and how they're going to get through. So this pandemic has shown us how important a government's response is. And the Australian people overwhelmingly supported the government when Early on in the pandemic, they brought in doubling the rate of New Start to create the job seeker allowance and brought in JobKeeper. And so the Greens support JobKeeper, but not unconditionally. We need a people first response to COVID 19 that leaves no one behind, because we've seen the devastation that can occur in situations where governments can't or won't their citizens' welfare first. 
Very early on in this pandemic, we called for a wage guarantee, and we are glad the government took that step. But supporting that step doesn't mean that we become a sort of uncritical cheerleader. The truth is the government's response has left too many people behind. Casual workers, university students uh, and the university sector overall, artists, musicians and those working in the arts. We've seen childcare workers left behind, despite the vitally important work they do in our community. And women have, felt, have borne the brunt of the crisis in terms of child caring, in terms of the economic impact of casual work who've lost work in the crisis, and in so many other ways. And because twice as many women compared with men work part-time, women are going to be disproportionately affected when the job care payment for part-time workers is planned to be slashed in the coming months. But despite the nature of the crisis and despite the need to be looking after everybody, the coalition is still trying to make it easier for big companies and harder for workers. And in particular, we are particularly concerned with this legislation today that they are creating a new category of companies that are doing well enough so that they don't no longer receive JobKeeper, but they still get new powers that alters the balance between workers and employees, allowing employees to cut the hours by up cut workers' hours by up to 40 per cent, um, if that's what they want to do. But of course, these workers who are potentially going to have their hours cut by over 40 per cent, undermining the existing conditions in the Fair Work Act, their food bills aren't going to be cut by 40 per cent, their rent's not going to be cut by 40 per cent, their other um, outgoings and other expenses aren't going to be cut by 40 per cent. Let's be clear, in the middle of a pandemic with so many people struggling in a recession. It is profoundly cynical of the coalition to be trying to use this crisis to advance their ideological agenda of cutting workers' rights in the interest of big business. Because we can extend JobKeeper without cutting workers' rights. We can give people the support they need without shifting the balance between workers and employees, employers. And as we've seen with the second wave, in Melbourne, this pandemic creates enormous challenges. Now is not the time to be cutting support and making it harder for people who are already struggling with so much. Of them. There are ways this legislation can be improved, and the Greens will be moving amendments to this legislation to do just that. We want to see everyone accessing JobKeeper get the support they need and not to relegate some workers, vulnerable workers, to the second tier. We certainly should not be cutting people's income in the middle of a pandemic, and certainly not people who are on low hours and low pay and insecure work. We completely reject the idea that there should be a two-tiered system. We want to see the Fair Work Commission to be able to deal with eligibility disputes. And the Greens believe that all casuals should have access to JobKeeper, and university workers, and temporary visa holders, so many of the people have been left behind by this pandemic, but left behind by this government. In my office, has worked with one of my constituents who started a small business before the pandemic struck. They, like so many others, were devastated by the impacts of the pandemic. They went into lockdown and their income dropped off. On virtually every metric, our understanding is that they were eligible for JobKeeper, but they were denied access. And why? Because of the visa status of one of the business owners. This is a government that is happy to hand out millions of dollars in subsidies to mining companies, to propping up fossil fuel companies, to giving grants willy-nilly to their mates, whether it's be the $3.6 million to Shine Energy or the almost $200 million in sports rorts, but they won't provide support for a small business in Victoria because the business owner is a temporary visa holder trying to build a life in Australia. And I personally know any number of university students who pre-COVID had casual work, a lot of them working in hospitality or the arts, to top up their student allowance, because as we know, student allowance was not enough to live on, completely inadequate to live on. The only way that students can survive is to be doing part-time work. 
And of course, a lot of those part-time jobs, working in hospitality, working in retail, working in the arts, when COVID struck, they all went. And then students, they weren't covered by JobKeeper because like so many of them, they hadn't been working for one employer for more than 12 months. Now they've survived COVID so far because of the double rate of student allowance under the, the Job Seeker supplement. But they're desperately worried about what's going to happen when the extra supplement is found back because their jobs are not going to be coming back in a hurry. And so they're looking at you know, such uncertainty about the future. Will they be able to pay the rent? Will they be able to keep studying? We should not be putting our young people through this. Our best and brightest, our hope for the future, Australia's future through this. I mean, what does it do to your ability to study when you feel so uncertain about the future? I mean, it's hard enough to stay motivated and engaged when all of your studying is online, as it has been for the last six months. But when you have to worry about whether you're going to have to ditch your studies altogether because you worry about being able to survive, that you know, that is just putting young people through such, such pain and just is just not fair. It is not equitable, it is not fair, and it's not what we, in a country like Australia, should be doing. So we support the extension of JobKeeper, but let's be clear. We must and we, and we can improve this legislation. The government should be doing so much more. The Greens launched our Invest to Recover platform, outlining so much more that the government could be doing. A government-backed jobs and income guarantee to help create hundreds of thousands of jobs and ensuring that everybody has an income that they can live on. And in particular, this would guarantee those young people a job if they wanted one, or guarantee them a place for tertiary study, or guarantee them an adequate um, income to be able to live on because they, we cannot afford to leave our young people in the ranks of the long-term unemployed. We know from previous recessions that if, if once people are into the, the ranks of the long-term unemployed, it is very hard to get out of it. People need to have work, and there is so much work that, could be, that is there that could be done. There are the jobs that are there. Those, those jobs need to be being, need, need to be being filled and, and can be for providing work for, for Australians. We need to create those jobs, bold government investment in manufacturing and sustainable infrastructure to, to in those new jobs and opportunities and building the foundations of a fair and a clean economy. And we need massive government investment in services for our communities, in health, in education, in childcare, in aged care, in housing, in public services that would improve everyone's lives. There is so much that this government could be doing, so much more than they could be doing, to be supporting people in, those, in our, the difficult times that we are currently going through. Things could be radically different if we have the courage to strive for a better future. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Can you hear me this time? We can, thank you. Thank you. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want Australians to stop being slaves and to start living freely. Let's look at some facts. Australia's death toll from COVID stands at over 650. Let's compare Taiwan with a similar population of 24 million compared with Australia's 25. Taiwan with a similar population on a tiny island, higher population density, making virus transmission far easier. Taiwan close to mainland China, the virus source. Taiwan with an earlier importing of the virus into their shores than in Australia. Taiwan with far more people moving to and from China. Well, how many deaths have they suffered in Taiwan? Seven, not 700, seven. And while we locked up everyone in quarantine and trashed our economy and racked up massive debt for younger generations, Taiwan is steaming ahead. And that's, dis and that's despite its large markets in Europe and America suffering economically due to the virus, Taiwan has hardly had a blip. Why? How can that be? Several words, data, plan, leadership, 
trust and truth that's the secret to taiwan and other countries similar to taiwan they're not the only ones they acted quickly close their borders following size in two thousand and three i want to the central command center for epidemics by january twenty twenty the command center was coordinating the government's response to the coronavirus it quickly compiled a list of one hundred action items including border controls school and work policies public communication plans and resource assessments of hospitals Taiwan's government introduced a travel ban, ban on visitors from China, Hong Kong and Macau soon after the number of coronaviruses began to rise in mainland China. Anticipating the high demand for masks in late January, the Taiwanese government started rationing the existing supply of masks. Taiwan then leveraged the strength of its manufacturing sector and invested approximately $6.8 million to create 60 new mask production lines. This increased Taiwan's daily mask production capacity from 1.8 million masks to 8 million masks. This has been called Taiwan's mask miracle. The proof is in the pudding. They have, as I said, seven COVID deaths compared with Australia's 652, and yet they were exposed to it earlier. They have technology for early detection. The Taiwanese government has also used data technology to help medical personnel identify and trace suspected patients and high-risk individuals. The Taiwanese government also provides support for those put under quarantine. Local village leaders, for example, will bring a bag of basic supplies like food or books to quarantined individuals. They didn't lock up everyone. They locked up the sick and the vulnerable. And then they say, that's the way democracies are handling quarantine during the coronavirus outbreak. And it's very different from authoritarian governments. Compare Taiwan with mainland China. This is the case where democracies would, should, should leverage their data and technologies appropriately so they can triage people to the right place and follow up with appropriate care. We did not behave like a democracy. Taiwan's strategy was the opposite of ours. Taiwan isolated the sick and the vulnerable and let everyone else get on with their work and social lives. And they've had 190th, one, 190th of the deaths that Australia's had. Less. They've had about six, they had about eight percent. Taiwan focused on people's lives, remembering medium term and long term and immediate issues. People's health in Taiwan is number one. And because of that, their economy has continued beating hard. So as I said, the key ingredients, data, the Taiwanese had the data, they gathered the data. If they didn't have it, they went out and got it. And then they shared that data. They trusted their people. They developed a plan very quickly. And they shared that plan with their people. Contrast that with our prime minister's six months hibernation. Six months hibernation. Six months hibernation. And we still haven't seen a solid plan. We have been told lots of times what's happened and what has been happening and what has been done. But we aren't being told what will be done. The Taiwanese did. That's leadership. And the Taiwanese leaders trusted the people with the data and the facts and with the plan. And they shared the responsibility on business owners to manage their workplaces, to keep people safe. Contrast that with Australia. Severe lockdowns, severe punishments. And we, when we ran out of masks early on, our state and federal political leader said, masks are not effective. Don't worry about it. When we eventually built up a stockpile of masks, political leaders changed their tune and said masks are essential. Which one do we trust? Which story? Trust is built on truth. There's no way around that. Trust is built on truth. Trust is built on truth. When leaders lack data, lack a plan, lack trust and don't give trust, they are eventually exposed. And that's what we're seeing now. The Prime Minister, the Victorian Premier and the Queensland Premier have been exposed and are being exposed not just on coronavirus, on the mess our country was in before February, before the virus arrived on our shores. Think about the real issue here beyond coronavirus, the recovery. The Prime Minister, the Premiers are focused on recovering back to February. They haven't got a clue how to do it, but that's the economic level they want to get back to. We should be focused instead on the economic strength when we were number one in the world for gross per capita, gross domestic product per person, income per person. 
The coronavirus revealed, as we said early on in March, our country's demise since 1944. The loss of our manufacturing. We are now ranked with underdeveloped nations in the sophistication or the lack of sophistication of our manufacturing. Why? Because we've jacked up energy prices three times, triple what they were. We've replaced our, inter our independence with interdependency, which is really another word for dependency. We've destroyed our economic resilience, our economic sovereignty and productive capacity, thanks to the 1975, UN's 1975 Lima Agreement that Labor signed in 1975 and the Liberals ratified the next year. We shipped our jobs to China. That, can, that shipping of jobs and that destruction of our capacity, productive capacity, continued with the 1992 UN Rio Declaration that Labor signed and the Liberal Nationals implemented. Then the UN's 1996 Kyoto Pro Climate Protocol that destroyed our electricity sector and for which the Howard government stole farmers' rights to use the land that farmers had bought and owned. Then the UN's 20, 2015 Paris Agreement that the National Liberals signed to accelerate the destruction of industry, manufacturing, agriculture, trade, trade exposed industries. And then, as I said, we heard the Prime Minister's initial response. Six months hibernation, no plan, no data. Six months hibernation, no data, no plan. Six months hibernation. Stories about what we would rather, what we have done or what we did do rather than what we will do. Now we have calls for a plan, as I said, to get back to the February, February level of performance. Still no data, still no plan. And why after, after 80 years, almost 80 years of pandering to foreign gov agreements, we are living in declining living standards, higher costs of living. Why not aim to be number one in per capita income? Get down to the basics. That's where we were in the early years of our federation. But now, instead of having competitive uh, federalism, we have competitive welfareism, thanks to Chairman Dan. Chairman Dan, sloppiness in Victoria led to complete breakdown of the virus there and the rest of Mr. Uh, Senator Tab. Roberts, you must refer to uh, the Premier by his title or his correct name. Uh, Premier Daniel Andrews, thank you for the clarification. We said from the start in One Nation that we need to treat the virus seriously. We said we must put lives first. We said there's no manual. We said we were understanding. We said we would support an open checkbook, do whatever's necessary. And we said we would come looking and hold people accountable. Accountability. The Queensland Premier has said she's handed control to the Chief Health Officer, Dr Young, who honestly admitted that her sole responsibility is people's physical health. Who's going to manage the economic health? Who's going to manage people's mental health? Experts now estimate that the number of deaths from suicide will be far greater than the deaths from COVID. So Queensland, Labor has abdicated yet again. They've tossed over the running of the state to a health officer who's focused only on physical health, not mental health, not economic health. Just as the real Labor former MP, Joy Miller, courageously publicly said today, Labor has abandoned us. Labor has abandoned us in Queensland. I listened to Neil Breen on 4BC in the mornings and I commend him for holding the government accountable. Stories of Labor control freaks being so heartless. Twins flown to Sydney for 16 hours on a 16 hour trip rather than a half hour helicopter ride to Brisbane to get treatment. One of the twins dying. Cancer treatment for a bell and a woman denied just south of the border. An infant under cancer treatment in hospital alone and needing his mum. Abandoned. Suicides. A news agent in Corumban who couldn't, couldn't to get there from the Tweed, had to drive to Sydney, fly to Brisbane, drive to, and stay in, in quarantine, then drive to Corumban. I mean, these are insane things. And then the Queensland Premier, remember, welcomed the Black Lives Matter protesters. 30,000 people on our streets spreading the virus. The Prime Minister created the National Cabinet, which is handy for, handy for dodging the blame if it goes pear-shaped. And Senator Patrick, I must commend him for pointing out the messy failure the Prime Minister created a monster. The Premiers and the Prime Minister are making decisions without data. I wrote a letter, Madam Acting Deputy President, to the Queensland Premier some time ago, a few weeks ago, calling for her to provide the data on which she bases her decisions. She pointed to two websites. Our staff went there, no data. 
Let's look at the symptoms of what's going on in their nation. We've handed sovereignty to foreign agencies. Matthias Cormann, Senator Cormann, today, in, re in representing the Prime Minister, his response to my question was, we are going to live up to our international obligations. To hell with the international obligations. Let's put, foreign, let's put foreigners behind the Australian people. We have an obligation in this, in this Senate, in this Parliament, to Australian, Australian people. Look at the Water Act that's gutting our food production, Water Act of 2007 that's gutting our food production, our Murray-Darling Murray Basin. Look at our energy policy, where we've gone from the lowest cost of electricity to the highest cost of electricity. Why aren't Australians getting the benefit of our wonderful high, high energy, uh, low, low uh, pollution coal, clean coal? Why are our farmers losing their rights to use their land? Why are Hunter Valley coal miners with no protection, no safety protection, told to not report accidents will be sacked, no workers' compensation, no accident pay, 40% underpaid compared to permanents right next door to them in the same job on the same mine site, long service leave contributions not being tallied correctly and refusing to be um, audited until I came under the scene, no leave, no protection, abandoned by the state government, abandoned by federal government agencies, abandoned by the Hunter Valley CFMMU that made deals with employers, undermining these, uh, these miners. Local, state and federal Labor MPs like Mr Joel Fitzgibbon abandoning them. In Queensland, in Queensland Labor, controlling farmers, misquoting the science, misrepresenting the science to control farmers. So what we see is now control. <coughs> And we see from Katrina Grace Kelly writing in The Australian, after all this time, meaning seven months, we still haven't got a recovery plan. It's not just me that thinks this way. And then we've got Terry McCran waiting for Godot from one debacle to the next while we wait for a vaccine. This is hopeless. It is absolutely hopeless. It is an abdication of responsibility, an abdication of accountability. We need trust truth based on data for a plan to ensure recovery back to Australia being number one in the world for per capita income. We would start with just a simple plan to recover from COVID because at the moment, as I said in my introduction to this speech, Australians are slaves. We are slaves to COVID. We know that there's a, there's a second wave coming. It started in Victoria. What are we going to do? Is going to stay locked up until this is all and until everyone has had many, many waves and we lock down each time, that's no way to run a country. That's not leadership, that's abdication. We need strong leadership, like Taiwan, and we need to get it quickly. Instead of being slaves to COVID, we need to master COVID. Taiwan has shown us, Sweden has shown us to some extent. You don't have to agree with their ideas, but at least they've tried something. Israel has, has mastered COVID. Singapore is mastering COVID, South Korea, we're not the, Taiwan's not the only one. We need to get on with the job of eating humble pie, admitting our mistakes, getting the data, telling the truth, developing a plan, providing real leadership. That's what the people expect. That's what we deserve. And that's what One Nation is going to continue to push for. We are going to expose the shortfalls in this government, the shortfalls in the last 80 years of this government, and then we are going to put Australia on the right track. And we are keen to see the nationals today at least recognising some of the things we've been saying and doing. So there is hope, but we must get by with the truth, trust. Senator Roberts, your time has expired. Senator Ayres. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. It's become a bad habit of mine to um, reflect on the comments of the speaker who preceded me, and I don't intend to do it in relation to all of Senator Roberts' speech, but I just say this. Um, a speech that uh, presumably is produced for um, distribution in social media in Queensland, <clears throat> where the refrain, Australians are slaves, and an inference, more than an inference, that uh, other senators in here aren't putting their obligations to the Australian people first is deeply offensive and it's calculated for a pretty base political purpose and ought to be treated that way. I, have deep disagreements with um, the people who sit on the other side of this chamber and some of the characters who inhabit the, the sort of uh, southern end of the show. But I do think, I do think, that people actually are, in what sometimes in a misguided way, putting the national interest first. And I just, 
think that we all ought to reflect on those kind of comments and treat them, um, or at least, at least reflect on how language is important, and political language is especially important. Uh, now, the Labor Party, at the beginning of the pandemic, called for a wage subsidy package uh, to support the Australian economy. Uh, it was, I, I remember, because I was one of those people calling for it, it was rejected uh, by the government. Uh, we supported it because we could see the international evidence amassing comparable economies overseas that were adopting uh, a wage subsidy approach. The Scandinavian countries in Europe, uh, not least in Boris Johnson's United Kingdom. And we knew how important it was to preserve the relationship between workers and their employers. We knew how important it was to prevent mass layoffs and the catastrophic effect, particularly in our suburbs and regions, of long-term unemployment. Uh, and we knew that it was necessary because it would allow the Australian eco economy to recover more quickly. Now, we have cooperated uh, with the government's approach. Uh, we have criticised it, but we have taken a constructive approach uh, to dealing with the questions of stimulus in the economy. Um, but we do, we do think that the government has got some elements of this wrong. We do think that the early access for superannuation program, which has provided the lion's share of the stimulus package so far, has meant that low-income Australians' retirement incomes in the future have been squandered. We know that if the government had moved faster, thousands of jobs could have been saved. There are many people excluded from the JobKeeper package, a million casual workers, workers in local government, many of whom have already lost their jobs, particular workers in the university sector. It is still hard to fathom uh, why a government would take action that is so destructive to our national capability in research and teaching, but there will be mass layoffs in the university sector and that will have a devastating effect on Australia's research capability, uh, and that is not in the national interest. It will have a devastating effect on school leavers, and they're certainly have been able to get in the courses that they need to get into, and that will have a long-term devastating effect. Childcare workers excluded, arts and entertainment workers excluded, and of course we've seen the spectacle of food queues in all of our capital cities, of foreign visa workers, uh, and um, and uh, university students from overseas. There are also important design problems uh, that other speakers uh, have addressed. We've been deeply critical of the September cut-off date, the snapback. Well, now it's a taper off. We'll support the legislation because it's necessary to, because the alternative is a deeper catastrophe. But we do say that the conditions that necessitated a wage subsidy are still with us. And the withdrawal too early or the tapering off too early of uh, the wage subsidy program will have long-term serious effects in the Australian economy, in particular in terms of people's jobs. Snapback was always a bad idea. The government knew it was a bad idea. It is consistent with the government's, with the Morrison government's now tried and true approach. Step one, hold a press conference. Step two, announce a program with a focused, tested name. Step three, dodge questions. Step four, refuse any accountability and blame somebody else. It is a government by press conference. We've seen it in Home Builder, the government's home building scheme uh, that is an abject failure, announced at a press conference a portmanteau name that sounds like it came from a third-rate marketing agency, continually dodged questions, refused accountability. I imagine in no small part, because the minister responsible for it has other matters that he needs to attend to in the Victorian branch of the Liberal Party and possibly isn't focused upon his real responsibilities. We've seen it in aged care. 
We saw it in the arts rescue package. Big press conference, this time with a big arts and entertainment industry name, Mr Sebastian, announced on June 25, not a dollar spent. And in fact, the venue, the facility that they named it in, the business that they announced it with, hasn't got a Zac out of the program. Not a dollar. Uh, there's the COVID safe app. You, you can take the marketing boss out of Tourism Australia, but you can't take the marketing out of this Prime Minister. No matter how serious the national crisis, no matter how overwhelming the pandemic, this bloke, the member for Cook, doesn't have any other speed but marketing. The snapback didn't come, and that's a good thing. But it still lives in the name, it still lives in the imagination of many of the Liberals and Nationals on the other side. Take, for example, the member for New England, the seat where I grew up, Mr Joyce. In April, his electorate, one in five workers in the New England were receiving JobKeeper, JobKeeper at that stage. 5,205 businesses, 19,780 workers, jobs were supported by the JobKeeper package. The total fortnightly amount going into the New England economy, just under $30 million. However, he told local papers in May that he wanted the program to end as soon as possible. He said, I hear what the Labor Party have been talking about, and that is keeping these stimulus packages going longer, he said. Of course, our hearts say that could work, but of course the accountant side of us says it can't because it's money that's borrowed and money that has to be repaid. One of the peculiar things, he went on to say, people have got to understand is this money is borrowed from overseas and in many instances from China, which we have to pay back to them. Yet that was the source of the disease in the first place. And it sounded a little bit like Senator Roberts's recent contribution. It's an absurd approach. Following it through would have had devastating consequences for the people of New England, the people that Mr Joyce claims to represent. It's wrong, deeply wrong economically, but most importantly, it's in direct contradiction to what his own constituents say they need. Business New South Wales Regional Manager Joe Townsend said, we haven't seen the economy come back at all. It could be something that could be wrapped up just before the end, but as it stands, JobKeeper should remain in place. The government does have to be very smart about its physical budget and not overdo it, but given they have granted this, they should certainly see it through to the end. Who knows what will happen? if Mr Joyce is successful in his quest to regain the leadership of the National Party. Uh, the Australian people don't need, they don't need Mr Joyce with a stronger voice at the Cabinet table. The snapback was never based on economics or any coherent understanding of debt or how the economy works. It's always been a slogan. It's always been based in a, um, in a sort of call back to the, what Mr Frydenberg called the Reagan and Thatcher model. Um, now, we, we have a tough week coming up in front of us, I think. Payroll data from last week suggests that 50,000 Australians lost their jobs in August. Accounts data is coming out this Wednesday, and we know that there must be grim statistics coming because of the Treasurer's performance this morning, where he waved his arms around a lot and blamed the Premier of Victoria uh, for everything that was going wrong. We're still expecting 400,000 people to lose their jobs between now and Christmas. This is a deep and difficult recession and we cannot cut our way out of it. Um, we, what we need from this government is a plan for jobs. What we need from this government is a sustained commitment not to marketing not to announcements, but to follow through and deliver a package that will deliver jobs for Australians, particularly in our suburbs and in our regional centres. Thanks, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Ayers. I think we're now going to Senator Smith remotely. 
Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I also rise to speak in support of the Coronavirus Economic Response Package Amendment Bill 2020. And I do so because the future of this payment and the job seeker payment are of the most critical issues before our parliament at the moment. I'm speaking today remotely from my office in Adelaide, and it's important that I do so because I'm here speaking for Adelaide and I'm speaking for my state of South Australia. Because the future of JobKeeper is pertinent to our economic recovery in SA. Economically, in my state, we're already doing it tough before the pandemic. In June, it got worse. We reached our highest rate of unemployment in 20 years at 8.8%. Whilst we saw a welcome drop in July, we know that figure is likely to really be much higher than the figures reveal. The Treasurer himself has said that about the national figures. The real unemployment rate is probably well over what the real figures, what the reported figures are telling us. As of July 2020, for the first time in our history, more than 1 million Australians are unemployed. Almost 346,000 are young people, young Australians, at an unacceptable rate of 16.3 per cent. And many of those young Australians are in my state of South Australia. Of course, these statistics don't just tell us numbers. They, they don't just tell us a, a broad picture. They all contain individual stories, individual stories of young people, of families without jobs, losing hope, people who are scared about the future of our economy, scared about what a second wave in South Australia might bring. I've spoken to small business owners who are still struggling in SA to pay their bills each week. They've taken credit cards out, they've maxed them to the limit, paying the bills while waiting for the payments and support to come in. Owners have withdrawn their super under the early access scheme, often to the complete detriment of their super balances, just to pay the bills, just to keep their businesses afloat. The latest ABS data tells us that 71% of small businesses reported that revenue had decreased as a result of the pandemic. And while many of these businesses hope they can survive and recover, the fact is this depends on the case numbers remaining stable in South Australia, because for these businesses, they won't survive another lockdown. They need JobKeeper extended. Of course, it's not just small businesses, it's across our whole economy, whole sectors who have suffered terribly at the hands of this pandemic and continue to do it tough. At the start of the pandemic, the economic implications became rapidly clear what the impact would be of social distancing and isolation on our economy and our businesses and our way of life. And that's why early on it was Labor who called for the government to implement a wage subsidy with urgency. And as is often the case from the government side, they dismissed our idea at first. But eventually they saw the necessity of it and JobKeeper was born. But notwithstanding our support for JobKeeper, I mean, it was our idea, but notwithstanding our support for it and notwithstanding our support for this extension, there still remain considerable questions which have gone unanswered by the government. With mounting job losses and rising unemployment, substantial support is being removed from our economy without a jobs plan set to replace it. This support needs to be tailored to conditions in the economy, including rising unemployment. The Treasurer himself has extraordinary powers to set the rates and eligibility arrangements for the JobKeeper payment. The bill here doesn't specify the rate. The Treasurer alone has the power to decide what that rate is and who receives it. And yet we know there are millions of workers in Australia and struggling businesses who continue to be excluded from the JobKeeper payment. The most important test for this government's management of the recession and its aftermath will be what happens to jobs and what happens to businesses in Australia. Australian workers, businesses, communities, they all need a plan from the Morrison government that will promote growth, protect and create jobs support business, support jobs and set Australia up for an economy. And of course, it needs to be a plan that doesn't leave Australians behind. We are so committed to making sure that the most vulnerable Australians who have been hardest hit by this pandemic aren't left behind by any response the government takes. And that's something Labor has always fought for and will continue to fight for throughout this pandemic. Early on in the rollout of this scheme, we saw significant blunders from the government and significant challenges in the way that the scheme was implemented. Support was too slow, creating too much uncertainty and excluding too many people. There were one million casuals excluded, despite these workers being some of the hardest hit by the pandemic. We saw a bodge on the figures with the $60 billion JobKeeper bungle. 
and we saw years of underinvestment in Centrelink and the Australian Public Service exposed. As queues spiralled out the door for blocks and blocks as Australians sought to access JobSeeker and couldn't get the support they needed to do so. My office was one of the many offices which fielded countless calls during this time from South Australians, most of whom never ever expected to find themselves on social security payments, who had lost their jobs for no fault of their own and were now in the unemployment queue seeking support from their government. They had no idea how to navigate the Centrelink system, no idea what to do, waiting in queues for hours on end, sitting on phone lines, waiting for hours and hours on end to never get through to someone terrified about the future and unable to get that help when they needed. And a big part of that was the huge underinvestment of our government in our Australian public service and in Centrelink. We've also seen the government drag their feet on paid pandemic leave. No worker should ever have to choose between staying safe, staying healthy, keeping their community healthy and paying the bills, keeping a roof over their head. But perhaps one of the most disturbing aspects of the government's response during this crisis has been the handling of superannuation. Their early access scheme has forced 3 million vulnerable Australians to raid over $30 billion from their super account. This is at those workers' expense, not the government's expense, not a package expense, from these workers. Superannuation is a great labour reform, one of the greatest labour reforms, and an important equaliser in our community. But it is under attack by this government. And when it comes under attack, it is the most vulnerable workers in our community who pay the greatest price. It is women who pay the greatest price. It is young people who will pay the greatest price. The very idea of super, the very purpose of super is completely undermined if Australians are forced to raise it well before they reach retirement age. And of course, we know the attacks on superannuation from the government don't just end there through this scheme. They're there with government members taunting Australian workers with their ideas to scrap the legislated superannuation increase. And those in support of this idea argue that it will result in pay rises for Australian workers, but we know wage growth has been stagnant prior to the pandemic. Where is the evidence to support the idea that suddenly we'll see wage growth if we get rid of the superannuation increase? It's not there. This is a legislated increase. Australian workers expect it. It's essential to realising the promise of superannuation and what it can mean for our community, for my state. So while the minister may be ambivalent on it, Labor is not, and we will take the fight up on super right to the end, because we always stand for Australian workers. Throughout this crisis, Labor has worked responsibly and constructively with the government on the passage of legislation through the parliament to support Australians. We've done this because it's our priority to protect jobs, to help Australian workers, businesses, families and communities through and ensure that vulnerable Australians are supported and not left behind. We have been responsible and constructive and our support of this bill is part of that. But that doesn't mean we'll be silent where there are serious failures of implementation going on. Australians have worked together to combat this virus, but more work needs to be done by the government to ensure that the hardest hit Australians are not left out or left behind in the recovery. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Griff. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting uh, Deputy President. Through the early months of the pandemic, JobKeeper was a lifeline for business. Without any time to prepare or adjust and facing a sod sudden loss of demand, many businesses were preparing to lay off staff and close their doors. It could have been, and almost was, economic carnage. The job seeker subsidy, along with other government support and rent relief, meant businesses could keep going through the worst of the pandemic. Sadly, even with all of this support, not all businesses have managed to survive. And many of their staff have found themselves seeking new employers at the worst possible time. Many more businesses will fail in the months to come as support is withdrawn or reduced. And the cessation in most states of the commercial rent moratorium will further exaggerate this. The businesses that will survive are those which are able to adjust to the new reality. This could mean changing the business's products or changing processes, 
which will often mean having to move staff to new teams or, sadly, cutting back on staff numbers. Nobody, absolutely nobody in this place wants to see people left unemployed. Even when the economy is booming, the toll that unemployment takes on a person's financial and emotional position is brutal. And it's even worse when the economy is in recession and opportunities for re-employment are scarce. As a former small business owner, I've seen firsthand how important it is to adjust your workplace arrangements when you experience a downturn. Being able to move staff around, to adjust your focus and restructure your business gives you the best chance of long-term survival. Employees might not love the change, and neither do employers, but it's a lot better than having everything taken away from you and losing that business. I don't believe Parliament should be preventing people from saving their businesses and their employees' jobs. I know they are doing everything they can do to stay afloat, and I believe we should be backing them however we can. At the present time, we are all still dealing with a great deal of uncertainty. It will take some time for the economy to bounce back. It will be a real slog just to get back to where we were at the start of this year. The various state and uh, federal government support packages have helped many businesses survive and retain staff. They must continue, but they must also change. Freezing the economy has saved jobs. But it's also prevented the adjustments that are needed so we can return to growth after the pandemic has passed. JobKeeper has frozen the labour market. The rent moratorium has frozen the commercial real estate market. Easing back these arrangements is necessary to allow the economy to adjust to the new normal. It will be painful, but it will unfortunately be necessary so viable businesses can grow and hire staff. It's necessary so our economy can grow. Under this bill, the JobKeeper payment and workplace flexibility arrangements will be extended from the original September end date to the 28th of March next year. The bill also creates a new class of employer, what the government is calling le legacy employers. These are employers who no longer meet the threshold to qualify for JobKeeper, but who continue to experience at least a 10 per cent drop in turnover which means they'll be able to access modified, flex, uh, work, modified workplace flexibility arrangements. These modified arrangements mean, for instance, that instead of being able to negotiate an employee's hours anywhere down to zero as a result of the impact of COVID-19 on their business, they can only ask employees to reduce their hours to 60 per cent of their pre-COVID-19 hours. The modified arrangements also mean employers will have to give an employee seven days' notice of any proposed changes to times, days or location of work. This is up from the current three days, and employers must consult and invite feedback from their employees before making any changes. Labor's proposed amendments remove the provisions for legacy employers from this bill. This means businesses that no longer qualify for JobKeeper will not have ongoing access to flexible workplace measures, even these modified ones. I agree with Labor that employers who are back on their feet should no longer need to rely on such flexible workplace arrangements. But I don't agree with stripping these provisions from this bill. It is far too soon to wind them back. Not all of these businesses are truly back on their feet. These provisions will be important in helping many of the legacy employers continue to reconfigure their operations over coming months in order to keep their businesses viable. Legacy employers include those whose turnover is just below the eligibility threshold, which for most businesses is a 30 per cent drop in turnover. But an improvement in turnover is not necessarily a recovery. Turnover doesn't equal gross profit, which you use to pay your wages. Not in this environment. It is often just a less worse position. Many legacy employers will continue to run at a loss in the current environment. Let's also keep in mind that these reforms terminate in March. 
They are temporary measures, and I support them because they are temporary, with a clear end date. Labor also has an amendment that would require legacy employers to ensure employees are not paid less than the JobKeeper amount, even when their hours are cut. I am truly sympathetic to Labor's argument. We need to have a safety net for these workers. But struggling businesses shouldn't be paying for the top-up. That's the government's role. In the end, I think we can all agree that the best thing for employees is to ensure that the businesses which employ them survive the pandemic. And Centre Alliance will therefore be supporting this bill. Thank you, Senator Griff. Um, nobody else, no other speakers for this bill? I'll call the minister. Deputy President, I just draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum not present. Mm -hmm. uh, ring the bells. After call. Welcome back. Do we get preacher? Quorum form, stop the bells. I call the minister. All senators who have contributed to this important debate and commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher on sheet 1024 be agreed to. All of that. All in favour say aye. All those in favour say aye. You're aye. I'm here. You are? Sorry. All those are good. Sorry. All those against say no. No. I think the noes have it. The ayes have it. Ring the bells. You going to do this one? Well, I have to because we're it's a real oh. vision by the look of it. Cheers.
hosts dinner. Stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Gallagher on sheet 1024 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart teller for the ayes, Senator Dean Smith teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 21, noes 25. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Seawitt, can I ask you to move your second reading amendment so I can? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move my second reader amendment uh, to the bill as circulated in the chamber. That do you need me to read it out? Because I actually didn't read it out. When I've I got it circulated here on yeah. sheet 1016. That's right. Yes. Thank you, Senator Seawood. So the question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawood on sheet 1016 as circulated be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is the second reading amendment moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Seawitt tell of the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell of the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 4, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the negative. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to coronavirus economic response and for related purposes. Now we're resolving into committee and I, Senator Polly is going to take the chair. Thank you. For those who want to leave the chamber, please do so quietly. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills stand as printed. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Ac Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, I seek to uh, move uh, amendments on um, sheet uh, 1014. Um, am I able to speak to those uh, amendments? Yes, Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Madam Acting Deputy President's <coughs> President. Are these amendments removed? Um, no, no, no. The, sorry. Yes, all of the items. You're seeking, uh, Senator Farrell, to move all items on the sheet? Yes, all items on the sheet, yes. And you thank can... you. Thank Perfect. you for that. You can speak to those. But, but just to be clear, not to move items on sheet 1015. Okay, okay, okay. Now, these amendments remove all references to the so called legacy employers from the bill thereby removing access to the fair work flexibility provisions for businesses no longer eligible for government support. Labor believes the extension of job seeker, sorry, JobKeeper flexibility provisions are unnecessary. The same businesses doing well enough to lose all government support are now being allowed to take away the job security of their workers. The government is shifting the cost of supporting businesses onto ordinary workers. Uh, why should the pay of workers go down when the business re revenue is improving? How is, that a business, how is it that a business suffering a 10 per cent hit is allowed to inflict a 40 per cent uh, hit on their workers? Extending the fair work uh, flexibility provisions for people who are no longer receiving JobKeeper is a complete shift from what we were told when we first supported the Fair Work Act changes. We were told that the only reason the government wanted these sorts of changes was to make the job keeper payment operational. Now we discover uh, they want those same flexibilities to continue uh, for workplaces that used to be on JobKeeper but um, no longer use it. Uh, we have shifted from a uh, circumstance where the changes uh, were simply <coughs> uh, to make the payments operational to an argument from the government that part of the recovery is to cut some of the conditions of workers in Australia on apparently a temporary basis. The government has not made the case for these changes and as such Labor moves that it be removed from the bill. I urge all senators in this chamber to support these amendments. Leader of the government. Th thank you, Madam Acting. Uh, Deputy President, uh, the government will oppose these amendments. The workplace uh, flexibilities provided for by this bill will assist employers who are continuing to experience financial distress as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, overwhelmingly small businesses, uh, help them stay afloat and to keep their employees in a job. 
This includes employers who no longer qualify for JobKeeper but who continue to experience financial distress, a cohort which uh, is referred to as legacy employers, many of whom will be unable to put their employees back on full-time uh, hours and duties without having to cut jobs. These flexibilities were developed in close consultation with a range of stakeholders, including union movement and industry and employer group representatives. Uh, this is particularly likely, given the recent impact of the Victorian outbreak on the Australian economy, ongoing restrictions on businesses and economic uncertainty more broadly. The bill allows legacy employers greater flexibility so they can keep people employed and their businesses afloat. All of the flexibility measures in uh, this bill, uh, in the law as it stands, are accompanied by a suite of comprehensive safeguards for employees, reflecting the close consultation with stakeholders including the union movement, in the design of these provisions. These safe safeguards will continue under the bill alongside some new safeguards applying specifically to employees of legacy employers. Under the safeguards, employees of legacy employers cannot be stood down to zero hours under the provisions, but must still work at least 60 per cent of their pre-COVID ordinary hours and no less than two hours in a day on which they do work. Any direction issued by an employer must be reasonable. The employer must give notice to and consult with the employee or their representatives about the direction, and the direction must be put in writing. The Fair Work Commission is also available to resolve disputes about these provisions. Directions to reduce hours can only be given where the employee cannot be usefully employed for their normal hours of, or days of work. Directions about duties of work and location of work requires the employer to have information before, uh, before that leads the employer to reasonably believe that the direction is necessary to continue the employment of one or more employees of the employer. Existing protections within the fair work system, including unfair dismissal rules, general protections, anti-discrimination laws and work health and safety, um, all continue to apply as per usual. Crucially. None of the temporary Fair Work Act changes can reduce an employee's hourly right, and any penalty rights or allowances applicable to hours actually worked must always be paid as usual. Significant penalties apply under the Fair Work Act to employers who fail to meet their obligations or otherwise misuse the JobKeeper directions. The extension of the powers is temporary, and the provisions will be automatically repealed on 29 March 2021 with all terms and conditions reverting to normal on that date as though no direction or agreement had ever been made. Thank you, Senator. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I rise on behalf of the Greens to support um, the Labour Amendment. This amendment removes the new category of legacy employers. These are employers who are no longer eligible for JobKeeper, but they will still be able to use the flexibility measures such as reducing workers' hours by up to 40 per cent, changing dates, <laughs> locations and shift times. I mean, in allowing employers to reduce hours by up to 40 per cent, the government, what the government is actually doing is shifting the cost of recovery from businesses and the state to the workers. And this at a time when workers are suffering like nothing else. The government is suspending workers' entitlements without guaranteeing them support when workers need support at this time more than any time before. Thank you, Senator. The question is that items 2 to 8, 10 to 22, 25 to 27, 29, 30, 30A, 33, 34 and 36 to 38 of Schedule 2 stand as printed. Those, those who agree say aye. aye. All those against? No. Noes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Read the bell.
All right. Let you come back for you when it's done. Stop the bells. So the question is that items 2 to 8, 10 to 22, 25 to 27, 29, 30, 38, order 33, 34 and 36 to 38 of Schedule 2 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator uh, McGrath as teller, beg your pardon, Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. Uh, Sorry, it's late. <laughs> uh, Senator McGrath for the eyes and Senator McCarthy for the nose. <laughs>
Order. There being 26 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. So I believe now we want the second part. So the second part is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The senator, I'll just explain in a moment. Senator Farrell moved all of his by leave together, but they're separate. They have separate consequences. So we're just moving that. I believe that's what Senator Farrell wants us to do: is to move the second part. So, just just to be clear, so the question is that uh, two and nine to eleven on sheet one o one four by leave together. So the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. So. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, uh, Deputy President. Um, I seek to uh, move um, uh, all, uh, all amendments on uh, sheet 1015, and I uh, seek to uh, address those. Yep, and you can just move, Senator Farrell. Yes, thank you, and um, uh, Madam. Uh, <coughs> Deputy President, given that our previous amendment uh, was unsuccessful, Labor is moving this amendment because it's critical to protecting the pay and condition of low-paid uh, workers. If this bill is passed unamended, we could see a situation where businesses which have recovered to the point where their turnover decline is less than 10 per cent can cut the hours of their employees to the tune of 40 per cent. Let's not forget that, in income terms, it could actually be much more than that uh, because it's a cut to hours. If the hours that are cut are hours that attract penalty rates, then the worker may lose much more than 40 per cent of their take-home pay. A full-time retail worker, for instance, who normally works Wednesday to Sunday and who has their weekend shifts cut, which amounts to a 40 per cent cut in hours, would lose nearly half of their income. And uh, remembering that, of course, uh, retail workers have stayed at work by and large during this uh, pandemic. Uh, this amendment has the effect of ensuring no worker whose employer is no longer eligible for JobKeeper can cut their hours to the point where their take home pay is less than the prevailing JobKeeper rate. Not to support this amendment means the employees working for companies which, which, which are recovering will be worse off than the employees working for businesses which, by the government's own definition, are in stress. I urge all senators to support this amendment. Well, before I call any other senator or the minister, can I ask those senators who are not participating in the debate to either leave the chamber or sit quietly out of respect for your colleagues? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the government will not support uh, these amendments. The overarching intention of the temporary <coughs> industrial relations flexibility provisions in this bill is to keep businesses in business, to keep employees connected to their workplace, and to preserve as many jobs as possible. The provisions in this bill facilitate this outcome by, among other things, providing legacy employers the ability to reduce an employee's hours in certain circumstances to 60 per cent of their normal hours to take account of the fact that the business is in distress and greater flexibility means a greater chance to save jobs. Crucially, and something the proposed amendment apparently fails to recognise, the legacy business can only reduce hours where the employee cannot be usefully employed for their usual days or hours because of COVID-19. That is, the only employees who could ever be subject to a direction by the employer to have their hours reduced are those who could not be usefully employed to work their normal hours anyway. As such, any comparisons of income obtained by working full hours are deceptive and misleading, as working their full pre-COVID hours would simply not be possible for the employees we're talking about here. Imposing an artificial minimum income equivalent to JobKeeper payments, as this amendment proposes, may also see an employer forced to pay an employee not to work, as while the employee in question will be unable to be usefully employed for their normal days and hours, the amendment could have the effect of requiring them to be paid for those days and hours anyway. That's precisely the sort of thing that legacy employers, who by their nature must be financially distressed, simply cannot afford right now and which risks further job losses and business closures. 
Even if the cannot be usefully employed safeguard did not exist, an artificial minimum income may be too expensive for the financially distressed employers we're talking about here and could lead to job losses otherwise avoided through the temporary and moderate reduction in hours approach proposed by the bill in its current form. Finally, the amendment and the various claims of income reductions made by those opposite completely ignores the interaction with the social security system, which can operate to significantly offset the impact of a reduction in hours. Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Chair. It's a real shame that the government refuses to guarantee support to workers by their opposition to the previous amendment, which removes the new category of legacy employers. Uh, this amendment at least would prevent JobKeeper legacy employers from paying employees who have their hours cut less than the JobKeeper payment, and that payment would be employer-funded. There is no reason for anyone not to support this amendment, and the Greens support this amendment. Does any other senator wish to speak to this amendment? Okay, so the question is opposition amendment one on sheet 1015 be agreed to. Those that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. So the question is that um, number one on sheet 1015 is moved by Senator Farrell. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as oh Senator Davy as teller for the nose. Order, there being 25 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Negative, Negative sorry. <laughs> it's past my bedtime. I will just inform the Senate, as a number of requests for amendments have been circulated, I advise that, as required, senators proposing requests have circulated statements of reasons for framing them as requests, together with statements by the clerk on whether the amendments would be regarded as requests under the precedence of the Senate. Is, the, is it the wish of the committee that the statements accompanying the circulated requests be incorporated into Hansard immediately after the request to which they relate? There being no objection, it is so ordered. So, Senator Faruqi. Uh, thank you, Chair. I seek leave to, me, um, to move Green's amendments 1 and 2 on sheet 1008. Are you seeking leave to move them together? Together. Is yes. leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, these amendments actually broaden the scope of the Fair Work Commission's dispute resolution powers to deal with disputes relating to workers' eligibility for JobKeeper. The Fair Work Commission currently has the power to deal with disputes relating to JobKeeper directions given by employers, including when a worker has had their hours, duties or location of work changed. Um, the amendment would expand the Fair, Works Commission, Fair Work Commission's existing power to include issues relating to whether a worker is eligible for JobKeeper payments. Um, at the moment, the decision about whether a worker is eligible for JobKeeper is entirely at the employer's discretion, and workers have no way to dispute their employer's decision. Workers can make a tip-off to the ATO, however, they can't resolve individual cases because privacy laws prevent the ATO from providing updates or the result of the tip-off. Um, these amendments also support the one-in, all-in principle, which is a key element of the JobKeeper scheme. Um, they require participating employers to nominate all their eligible workers. Unfortunately, this principle is not enforced, leaving workers with no way to access the scheme if they have been left out. So broadening the Fair Work Commission's existing powers to deal with disputes relating to the eligibility for JobKeeper would ensure that workers are not missing out on payments that they are actually entitled to. I commend the amendments to the Senate. Uh, I think the minister was on his feet first. Yeah, and in any event, I've <laughs> just the way it goes. 
Um, the government would not be supporting uh, these amendments. The JobKeeper program was designed as a self-assessment scheme to allow it to be rolled out quickly and make it as uh, easy as possible for employers to participate. This has contributed to the strong uptake of the program. Eligibility for the JobKeeper program is set out in the JobKeeper payment rules. The rules require employers to provide all eligible employees with notice of their election to participate in the JobKeeper scheme. This must include information on how to provide a nomination form to the employer to participate in the JobKeeper scheme. An employer who refuses or fails to give such notice commits an offence under Section 8C of the Taxation Administration Act 1953, which is punishable on conviction by a fine not exceeding 20 penalty units, currently $4,400. I would encourage employees in the first instance to have a discussion with their employer if a disagreement arises about eligibility for the JobKeeper scheme. If this does not resolve the issue, employees can contact the Australian Tax Office, which is carriage of enforcement and compliance for the JobKeeper payment rules. The ITO is a tip-off line if employees consider there is an instance of improper employer behaviour. The Fair Work Commission's jurisdiction under the JobKeeper provisions of the Fair Work Act concerns the application and interpretation of those provisions. The Fair Work Commission is an industrial relations tribunal and does not have expertise in taxation matters. Senator Farrell. Uh, indicate that the uh, Labor Party is supporting these amendments. It was Labor that identified early on that some employers were planning to pick and choose which of their eligible employees would receive JobKeeper payment. The potential for employers to discriminate between eligible employees on a range of grounds was obvious. Experience from our MPs was that employees were being given no reason or otherwise totally spurious reasons for being excluded from the program. Thankfully, the Treasurer eventually listened and created one in all in principle. The one in all in rule requires employers who have decided to participate in the JobKeeper scheme to nominate all eligible employees for the scheme. The issue uh, this amendment seeks to address is the fact that, in a situation such as the one described above, there is no authority for the employee to go to challenge or appeal an employer's decision to exclude them from JobKeeper on eligibility grounds. The Fair Work Commission has previously reported that a large proportion of complaints about JobKeeper had been about eligibility, which was outside their jurisdiction. This amendment extends the Fair Work, Fair Work Commission's jurisdiction to deal with disputes about whether an employee is eligible for the JobKeeper scheme. Proposed section 789 GVA provides for the Fair Work Commission to deal with a dispute about eligible employees and stipulates that uh, on the extent, uh, to the extent that uh, it is possible, the Fair Work Commission must give effect to the one in, all in principle in dealing with disputes. <coughs> the Fair Work Commission may also, have, uh, may also make an order to give effect to the one in, all in principle, including an order that the employee is eligible for the JobKeeper payment. The Fair Work Commission <coughs> may deal with disputes about whether a relevant employee is an entity which is participating in JobKeeper scheme is an eligible employee for the purpose of the JobKeeper payment rules. So we therefore offer our support for this amendment. Does any other senator wish to speak to this amendment? <clears throat> in that case, the question is that Australian Greens amendments one and two on sheet 1008 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
you are ready to right to adjourn now. Yeah, no. Stop the bells. So the question is that one and two on sheet one double zero eight, as moved by Senator Faruqi. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The eyes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the eyes, and Senator Davy as teller for the nose. There being 24 ayes and 24 noes, the matter is negated. Uh, <coughs> it being 9.50 p.m., I shall report to the Senate. The committee reports to the Senate. I propose the question that the Senate do now adjourn. And I call Senator Henderson. Just a moment, Senator Henderson. I'm not sure the mic is working.